speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. The Adventures of Superman. Planet Krypton, home of a race of supermen, exploded into dust. The sole survivor was an infant boy who had been shot to earth in a sealed rocket. Today, that boy grown to manhood is known as Superman, sworn enemy of the forces of evil. To aid him in his never-ending fight for truth and justice, he masquerades as Clark Kent, crime reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper. His secret is carefully guarded. No one is aware that Kent is Superman. No one but you. <laughs> Join with us now on ABC as Superman saves an innocent boy from the electric chair in an exciting transcribed story of crime and courage entitled One Minute to Death. The night was clear but dark. There were stars in the black canopy of the sky, but a waning moon had long since dipped beneath the horizon when young Johnny Weber circled the modest shingled house on Pine Street in the suburbs of Metropolis. Moving silently across the soft cushion of the lawn, he stationed himself beneath a second-story window. Looking up, he whistled softly. A long moment of silence, broken only by the chirping of crickets and the hum of insects. Then, almost like a delayed echo, there was an answering whistle. Moving to the rear of the house, Johnny waited in a protected darkness. He saw a light go on in the kitchen, and then go off. A key turned in a lock. The rear door opened, and a young girl tiptoed down the four steps. Oh, I thought you'd never come. I had trouble getting a car. Well, did you get one? Yeah, but I gotta go pick it up now. It'll take me about 20 minutes. Whose car is it, Johnny? Uh, one of the boys. Hey, look, honey, you go get ready and then meet me out front. Whose car is it, Johnny? What's the difference whose car it is? All we're gonna do is drive it up to Glen Oaks, get married, and drive back. I want to know whose car you're borrowing. I told you, one of the boys. Oh, Laura, honey, we're killing time. You promised me that you wouldn't have anything more to do with that gang you used to hang around with. Baby, I'm not. I spent two hours calling up people trying to get a car. Nobody was home. Oh, well, we can wait. We don't have to do it tonight. Now, we've been waiting six months. If we don't do it tonight, we'll never do it. Baby, please, don't make it tougher than it is. You still haven't told me whose car it is. Maybe you wouldn't know if I did tell you. J -j just a guy. And anyway, baby, we're only taking it for the night, that's all. After we give it back in the morning, we're through with the car and we're through with him. I don't like you getting mixed up with those hoodlums again. I'm not getting mixed up. Baby, believe me. You go get ready. I'll be back in 20 minutes. Johnny, wait. You've got to promise me something. What? That you'll return the car in the morning and never have anything more to do with whoever you're borrowing it from. Sure, baby. Why not? On your word of honor, Johnny? On my word of honor. <laughs> Yeah. Matter of fact, I am, officer. All right, let's see your driver's license. Oh, sure, I'm on my way to pick up my girl. Yeah, we get married in Glen Oaks tonight. I guess I'm so happy about it, I forgot it was going so fast. Registration? Huh? Car registration. The owner's license. Let's see it. Oh, gosh, I forgot to get it. You see, I just borrowed this car for tonight. Oh? Who owns it? A friend of mine. What's his name? Uh, name's Tony. Tony what? Uh, I don't know his last name. Must be a real good friend. Well, you see, it's this way, uh... Yeah? Um, just borrowed the car for tonight on account of me and my girl. You yeah, see? you said that before. What, did I? Yeah. Guess I did. What have you got in the back? Oh, nothing. Turn your motor off. Well, look, officer, my girl's waiting for me. Turn it off. Okay. Let's have the key. Yeah. Well, what are you looking for? Anything I can find. Now sit tight while I open the trunk. Well, why don't you just give me a ticket for speeding and let me go? Gonna get a lot more than a ticket for speeding. Get your hands up. What? Get out. Hey, what's the idea? Come on, keep them up. What? I don't get this. Not much you don't. Where'd you get the radios? The what? The ten portable radios in the trunk. 
I don't know what you're talking about. Come clean, Johnny. Where'd you get them? I told you, this ain't my car. I borrowed it. I, I don't know nothing about no radios. How about the name of the man you borrowed the car from? You remember it now? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I do. It's Dinelli. Tony Dinelli. Where does he live? I don't know. Honest, I don't. How'd you get the car? I, I picked it up at the Turnpike Tavern. It's kind of a roadhouse on the Turnpike. Yes, I know where it is. Is Dinelli there? Uh, I guess so. He was there when he gave you the car, wasn't he? Yeah, but... I don't want to get mixed up with him. Why not? I just don't want to, that's all. You're going to have to get mixed up with him, Johnny. You see, he owns this car. That's right. There are ten new radios in the trunk that could have been stolen. Not by well, me. Well, we're taking a ride over to the Turnpike Tavern, and you're going to pick out Tony Dinelli for me, and I'm going to have a little talk with him. <laughs> Johnny, pick him out. I, I don't see him. Uh, sitting over there in that last booth with this girl. You'd better find him, son. Uh, that fat guy with the bald head knows him. He runs the place. Yeah. He's coming over. You looking for someone, officer? Yeah. Where's Tony? Tony who? Danelli. I don't know no Tony Danelli. Sure you know him. He comes in here all the time. He was sitting over there in that booth with this girl, Chicky, less than 20 minutes ago. Nobody was sitting in that booth all night. You got it wrong, kid. Are you lying? You're covering for Are him. You little... Punk. All right, that's enough. We run a straight joint here, officer. Yeah, I know. Okay, Johnny, let's go. I tell you, he's lying. Let's go. Hannigan, State Patrol, car 17 reporting. Have a burglary suspect. Request ownership check on black Chevrolet sedan, license 4Y6782. That is all. <laughs> You better give it to me straight, Johnny. You heard the ownership report. But the car belongs to a man named Walter Silsby on Cox's Lane, not to Tony Dinelli. Tell you, I got the car from Dinelli. I swear I. And you did. didn't know the radios were in the trunk. No, call my girl. Ask her what I was doing. All right, we'll ask her later. Right now, we're going over to Cox's Lane to ask Mister Silsby. <laughs> Must be his place, that shack. All right, keep walking in front of me, Johnny. Don't try anything. Why should I try anything? I didn't do nothing. Just keep walking. Okay, hold up. Knock on the door. Maybe he's not home. There's a light on. All right, try the door. See if it's open. <laughs> Step oh, inside. Remember, Johnny, I've got a gun in your back. I didn't do it. I swear I didn't do it. Three I, bullets in his could, chest and one in his I neck. I never saw the guy before. you got to believe me. you got to. It's not up to me, Johnny. I'm taking you in for murder. Arrested for murder, indicted, found guilty by a jury of his peers, and sentenced to die in the electric chair, young Johnny Weber, caught in a mesh of circumstantial evidence, now waits forgotten in a death house cell. Forgotten, saved by two people. One, Laura Williams, the girl he was about to marry. The other, Clark Kent, who, as crime reporter for the Metropolis Daily Planet, spent many hours at the trial and is convinced of Johnny's innocence. We find them both in Kent's office. All we've got left is a week, Mr. Kent. Isn't there some way of getting more time? Now, the governor won't grant a stay of execution unless we present new evidence. We haven't been able to get any. Yes, but how can we if they won't even let us talk to Johnny? Well, I'm expecting a call from the warden any minute now. I spent all morning at the DA's office, and he finally agreed to recommend that one of us be permitted to see Johnny. Oh. It's really up to the warden, but I'm pretty sure... Oh, wait a minute. That may be he now. Keep your fingers crossed. Clark Kent speaking. Oh, hello, warden. Yes, he said he was going to call you. I see. Well, thanks a lot. Yes, sir, I will. Thank you. Yes? Yes. Oh. One of us can see him at three this afternoon. Oh, thank heavens. You'd better go, Mr. Kent. I, I get all tied up inside and I wouldn't ask the right question. And it might be better, too, if Johnny didn't see me. I think maybe you're right. Now, what do we want to know? How to find Tony Dinelli. Mm -hmm. there, there, there must be a way. Tell Johnny he's got to give you the names of Dinelli's friends, the places he usually hangs out, anything he can tell you that might help. Okay. And, Mr. Kent. Yes? Tell Johnny not to give up hope. Tell him I haven't. And tell him I... I love him as much as I ever did. Hello, Johnny. Hello, Mr. Kent. They don't 
only give me two minutes, Johnny, so I'll have to talk fast. First of all, Laura wanted me to tell you not to give up hope. She hasn't, and she says she loves you as much as she ever did. Thanks. Now, about Tony Dinelli. Our only chance to get you out of this mess is to locate Dinelli. He blew out of town a long time ago. You can count on it. Chances are you're right, but someone must know where he is. Well, if they do, they won't talk. I know what happened. I know it like it was written in a book. What do you mean? Tony and Silsby pulled that radio store job together. Yeah. When Tony went to Silsby's house the next night to get his cut, they, they got into an argument. Tony maybe had a few drinks, he pulled his gun and blazed away. Uh -huh. And he took the old man's car. When he sobered up, he realized the car was hot. That's when I came along. Yeah, but Johnny, knowing how it happened doesn't help us. We've got to prove it. And we can't prove it unless we lay our hands on Dinelli. Forget it, Mr. Kent. Tony's gone and he won't come back. Till I burn. We'll find him if we can get a lead. Now, what about his friends? But they'll cover for him. Don't worry about their covering, Johnny. Let me handle that. Just tell me who they are. For instance, you testified Danelli was sitting in a booth at the Turnpike Tavern with a girl. Chicky. Chicky, do you know her last name? No. Well, was she Danelli's girl? Well, I guess so. One of them, anyway. Describe her for me. She's a platinum blonde, about five, three, or four. Kind of flashy, talks tough. No. Yeah. Used to be a cigarette girl in a joint before Tony picked her up. Go on. Well, that's about all. She's a cheap, hard-drinking dame like a hundred others. That doesn't help much, Johnny. Nothing distinctive about her, nothing different. The clothes she wears, her jewelry, or... Wait a minute. Tony gave her a ring with a great big green stone. An emerald? Emerald color, but it was too big to be real. Big around as a quarter. She wore it on her left hand. Now we're getting somewhere. She sounds like a good bet. Oh, you've got to find her first. We'll find her. Where does she hang out? Any one of a dozen gin mills on the south side. Okay, my time's up, Johnny. I think I've got enough. Don't give up hope now, and remember that Laura and I are plugging for you. Thanks. Uh, any message for Laura? Yes. Tell her to forget about me. You sure you want me to tell her that, Johnny? Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, no, no, Mr. Kent. Wait. Don't tell her that. Tell her I love her. Tell her no matter what happens, I'll always love her. How was he, Mr. Kent? How did he look? Fine, Laura, fine. Did you... Give him my message. I certainly did, and he said to tell you he loved you more than ever. Poor Johnny. Oh, oh, oh now look, young lady, no tears. We've got work to do. Uh, I'm sorry. We've got six nights to comb every bar, gin mill, and honky tonk on the south side. You think you can take it? I can take anything. It might mean staying out at all hours of the morning. What about your folks? They've practically disowned me now, so it doesn't matter. When do we start? Tonight. <laughs> Call it quits for the night. How many places did we cover? Seven. And that leaves five to go tomorrow night. Yes, but what if she shows up tomorrow at one of the places we covered tonight? We just got to keep rotating and trust to luck. All we know, she may be home sick or even dead. It's been ten weeks since Johnny last saw her. It all seems so useless. No, well, maybe not. I'll get a check and we can... What's the matter? Don't look now, but two couples just came in. One of the girls is a platinum blonde, and she's wearing a ring with a huge green stone. Oh, no. She's about the right height, too. Oh, I hope, I hope, I hope. Yeah, so do I. The captain's bringing them to the table next to us. Easy now. Don't look too interested. All right. She's got her left hand on the table. Take a look at the ring. Yes. What are you drinking, Chicky? Brandy and soda, like always. Brandy Did you hear that, Chicky? Uh -huh. Now, listen carefully, Laura. You've got to get acquainted with her. Huh? I'll tell you, we'll try pulling a fast one. I'll start an argument with you. I'll say, let's go home. You say, no, you want to stay. I'll grab your arm and you slap my face. And then what? I like as though I'm going to beat you up. Hmm? That's your cue to scream, you understand? Yes. One of those gorillas at her table is bound to come to your rescue. I see. I'll take a poke at him, he'll hit me, and I'll let him knock me out. Oh, no, no, I won't now, let you do that. Don't worry, he can't hurt me. Now, listen. Yes. They carry me out of here, but don't you follow. You what? stay behind. Thank the gorilla who saved you. Try to join their party. Tell them... Tell him you just got in from out of town. You have no money, no place to sleep. Uh-huh. Maybe, maybe one of them, Chicky, I hope, will offer to take you in. Well, I don't know whether I'm that good an actress. You've got to be, for Johnny's sake. Oh, I'll do my best. Okay, here we go. All right, come on, kid. I'm sick of this joint. Let's go home. No, I like it here. I want to stay. I said we're going home. Now, come on. You let go of my arm. I'll let go when I get you out of here. You'll let go now. Oh, why, you freshman snip. <laughs> Okay, pal, leave her be. Who asked you? Leave her be, I said. I'll take care of her, and you too. Oh, so that's how it is. Yeah. Okay, you punk. Ah! 
Clark Kent speaking. Mr. Kent, this is Laura. Laura, I've been waiting all morning to hear from you. Well, this is the first chance I had to get out. It worked, Mr. Kent. Yes, I know. What do you mean, you know? You went home with Chickie. But how... I waited outside the nightclub just to make sure. I followed you to her place, 274 Green Street. Yes, that's right. Where are you now? In a drugstore phone book. Yeah? She's got a hangover, and I came down to get some aspirin tablets. I don't suppose you've had a chance to learn anything. No, we got home at 5 o'clock, and she slept until 11.30. Well, don't rush it, Laura. Take it easy. Gain her confidence before you start pumping her. You might start by admiring that ring Danelli gave her. You know, the usual stuff. Did your boyfriend give it to you and so forth and so on? Got it. If she opens up and talks, fine. But if not, let it drop for a while. But Mr. Kent, we only had six days. I know, I know, but don't worry about that. If you can learn where Danelli's hiding out, the rest is easy. Oh, I'll do my best. Oh, and Laura. Yes. Chances are she's got a picture of Danelli somewhere in her room. Maybe even in her pocketbook. Get hold of it if you can. Well, I will if she lets me stay with her. Okay, I'll be here if you need me. Good luck, Laura. Oh, thank you. Feel any better now, Chicky? Yeah. Them aspirins and the coffee did the trick. Oh, brother, did I have a head. <laughs> you sure did. Oh, what time do we get in? Five o'clock. And then Bobo Love wanted to come up, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. I talked him out of it. Thanks, kid. Oh, he's all right, but he's got paws on him like an ape. But he sure flattened that punk who was trying to rough you up, didn't he? <laughs> he sure did. <laughs> One punch and the punk was out like a light. Oh, you feeling all right, kid? Oh, sure, I'm fine. Mm. Uh, Chickie, you did a nice thing bringing me home last night. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Oh, forget it, you're a good kid. Matter of fact, you're going to stay with me till you find a place of your own. You really mean that, Chickie? Why not? I got plenty of room here. What's today? Monday. What date? 16th. Let me see. You can stay with me until the 22nd. That's when my boyfriend will be back. Uh, wh- where is he, Chicky? Oh, well, he had to take it on the... La- I mean, he had to go away on kind of a trip. Is he a traveling salesman? Tony? <laughs> he should get a boot out of that. No, you see, he... He kind of got into a little jam, so he had a blow for a while. But he'll be back Sunday, the 22nd, on a... Kind of on Saturday, something's happening that'll... Put him in the clear. What's the matter, kid? Nothing. You got green around the gills. I... I was just... thinking... how nice it must be to... have a regular boyfriend. Yeah, it sure is. How about let's rustling up some breakfast, huh? And no, I'm not very hungry. Ah, come on. Snap out of it, kid. We'll find your boyfriend. <laughs> Yes, but it's not going to happen. Now, keep plugging, Laura. You're doing fine. But another day has gone by. Don't think about that. Just keep plugging. She talked about Tony for an hour last night, Mr. Kent, but I couldn't get her to tell me where he's hiding out. I'm getting worried. Don't worry, Laura. Don't be too anxious. But today is Thursday. Only two more days. What about the picture? Have you had a chance to look around? No, she's been with me every minute. Yeah. Why can't we have the police question? Uh-uh. Or force her to tell us where he is. No, no, you can't force her, Laura. Anyway, that would be a tip-off to Danelli. This is the best way, believe me. Just don't get panicky. Something's bound to break. Mr. Kent, I found a picture and two letters from Tony buried under some clothes in one of her bureau drawers. Good girl. Where are the letters from? Morganock, Pennsylvania. Where? Morganock. M-A-U-G-A-N-U-C-K. Morganock, Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah, I know. It's a coal mining town near Scranton. Shall I bring them right over? No. Where are you now? In the drugstore on the corner. You've got to verify the location if you can. He may have mailed the letters from another town. But, Mr. Kent, today's Saturday. It's our last day. Uh, I know, I know. Stay where you are. I'll come over. No, no, I can't do that. She only went out for a few minutes to pay her electric light bill. Either I've got to pull out altogether or go back to the room. I'll tell you what you do. Borrow an envelope from the druggist. Put the letters and the picture in it, seal it, write my name on it, and leave it there for me. I'll pick it up. All right, but then what? Talk to her when she gets back. Somehow mention Pennsylvania, the coal mines, you know. You might even tell her you've got a friend in Morganock. She's bound to react. Maybe even tell you that's where Danelli is. Oh, I hope you're right. I can't be very far wrong. You better go now. Okay. <laughs> Chickie. Hiya, Doc. 
A box of Kleenex, an orange stick, and a pint of rubbing alcohol. Uh, where you been keeping yourself these days, Chicky? I see your girlfriend a lot, but I don't see much of you. Uh, that was rubbing alcohol, right? Yeah, a pint. What girlfriend? Oh, the one's living with you. Dark hair, kind of nice looking. Comes in almost every day to use the pay telephone. Oh, yeah? Yeah, as a matter of fact, she was in just a few minutes ago. Left an envelope for some fella to pick up. She did? Yeah, yeah, this one. Oh, uh, let's see it, Doc. Mm, sure, sure. Clark Kent. Oh, yeah, I know this guy. Only she shouldn't have left it here for him. He's coming by the house. I'll I'll take it with me. Well, suits me. Uh, you finish wrapping that package, Doc. i got to make a phone call. Okay. <gasps> Where's that dirty, no-good sneak? Bobo, this is Chicky. Hiya, baby. I need you in a hurry, Bobo. What's up? Tell you when I see you. Pick me up at the corner of Green and have a mire and make it fast. Oh, back so soon? Yeah, I'm back. Come on in, Bobo. You remember Bobo? He's the one pasted that guy you were with the night we met. Oh, of course. It's nice to see you again. Skip the glad hand, sister. Lock the door, Chicky. Yeah. Well, what's the matter? Is something wrong? Not with us, sister. How about you? Chicky, what's he talking about? Get off it. Who are you stooling for, you little rat? I, I, I don't know what you mean. Maybe this will help you. <gasps> Where'd oh. you get these letters and this picture? As if I didn't. I, I never saw them before. <laughs> That's for life. You got them out of that drawer. No, no, I didn't. Are you stooling for the cops? Come on, answer me. Stop it. Stop. Answer me or I'll pull out every hair on your head. No, no. No what? Please. Please. Uh, she passed out. Get some water. Hey, look, what are you wasting time with her for? Let's load her in the car and take her for a one-way ride. I gotta find out who she's stooling for. The cops. Who do you think? It don't make no difference. You got the letters and the picture? Yeah, but I don't know how much she already told him. Who cares? That kid gets burned up in the big house tonight, but tomorrow Tony is clear. All we got to do... Get the water, Bobo. Okay, if that's the way you want it. There you are. Toss it in our face. Right. <laughs> Lift her up oh, and put her in a chair. Yeah. Oh, where am I? What happened? Quit stalling. You're right where you were, and you're going to stay here till you sing. Who's Clark Kent? I... I don't know. All of a sudden, you don't know nothing, do you? Oh, please. You knew enough to duck into the drugstore every day and call the cops, didn't you? Please, I can't stand it. Then talk. I I don't know anything. Let me work on it, Chicky. Nah, she'll just black out again. What you said before was the right pitch. Where can we do it? I know a place. Okay, we'll fix her, then we'll blow until tomorrow. Get a coat out of the closet. Come on now, up on your feet. Up. What are you going to do? Throw it over her shoulders. I'll go down first and get the car door open. You follow her and keep your gun in her back. Where are you taking me? Out for a little fresh air, sweetheart. <laughs> haired girl left the envelope for me, and then the blonde girl picked it up? Yeah, yeah, that's right, mister. Chicky, she, she's the blonde, said you were coming by the house, so there was no sense in leaving it here. I see. How long ago was this? Oh, I'd say 15, 20 minutes ago. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Say, are you the Clark Kent writes for the Daily Planet? Yes, that's right. Well, what do you know? You know, I'd like to ask you something, Mr. Kent. Uh, I'm sorry, but I have not time now. Some other time, maybe. Oh, okay. Well, drop by again. Yeah, sure thing. All right, looks like the lid's blown off this thing, and just when we were... Great Scott! Ducking into an alley, Clark Kent looks on in tense amazement as he watches Laura forced into the back of a dark green sedan, obviously at gunpoint. His first instinct is to go to her rescue, but he restrains himself. Can't start any trouble on the street. It would mean police cars, reporters, a front-page story, and a tip-off to Danelli. I'll have to follow them wherever they go as Superman. Almost before the sedan has pulled away from the curb, Kent has made the transformation from the conservative business suit of a newspaper crime reporter to the brilliant red and blue costume of Superman. Leaping high into the air, the only human being on Earth who numbers among his other amazing powers, the power of flight, follows the dark green sedan as it turns a corner and heads for the outskirts of the city. Twenty minutes later, in the darkening dusk of early evening, the car pulls into a narrow side road and comes to a stop. 
Okay, this is it. Get out. No, no, please, please, don't kill me. I'll tell you everything. It's too late now. Get out. Please, please. Come on, sister. No. Out you go. Stop it. You stay in the car, Chief. Right, but make it fast. Go. Go of my arms. Let go, I said. All right, sister, say your prayers. I'd advise you to say yours first. Say what is this? Where did you come from? Out of the blue. Don't move, Laura. Let him have it, Bobo. Try it again, Bobo. Nothing happens. Watch what happens now. Don't let her get away. She's got the letters and the picture in her handbag. Oh, not so fast, Chicky. Go of me, you big ape. Here's the bag, Laura. Hold on to it. You'll pay for this. You just wait. Let's go. Get up to the main road, Laura, and flag the first car that comes along. Tell them to send the police back here in a hurry. Okay. You got no right to do this. Let's not discuss right and wrong, Chicky. Just tell me one thing. Where's Tony Donnelly? How should I know? If you don't, who does? And you better tell me before the police get here, because when they do, it'll be too late. I didn't do nothing. Donnelly murdered a man, and you shielded him. You're an accessory. Would you like to spend ten years behind bars? Oh, what? A cheap punk who turned his mother in to save his own skin? Think it over, Chicky. I can make it easier for you if you play along. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I can believe that. You can believe it. Well? You know where he is. She saw the letters. Morgan Huck? I'm not saying any more. Okay, that's enough. There's a state police barracks two miles down the road. The man said he'd notify them. Good girl. Oh, but what's the use of all this now? It's too late. Too late for what? It's almost six o'clock. We can't get to Pennsylvania and back in time to save Charlie. We can't, but I can. Oh, your man must have passed a patrol car on the road. Here they come. Here, give me those letters and the picture. Hurry. I don't want to waste time with explanations. You'll have to tell them what happened. Yeah. Do, do you really think... Don't worry. Pick up the gun her gorilla friend dropped and hold it on Chicky until the police get here. Have you got it? Yes. Okay, they're here. So long and keep your chin up. Leaping into the now darkened sky, the man of steel hobbits for a moment above the narrow side road until he is certain the police are on the scene. Then, turning in midair, he heads north, almost with the speed of light, racing against the grim specter of death. <laughs> Hours later, in his guise of Clark Kent, he picks up Tony Dinelli's trail at a bar and grill in the coal mining town of Morganuck. But now, time is precious. It is 10.30, and Johnny Weber's execution is scheduled for 11. Every minute counts. The trail finally leads to a cheap rooming house at the edge of town. Once more in his true role, Superman knocks at Tony Donnelly's door. Open up, Donnelly. I know you're in there. Open up or I'll come in and get you. All right, if that's the way you want it, here goes. No time for horseplay in any way. I want that gun. It's probably the one you used to murder Walter Silsby. Would you like to make sure you don't give me any trouble on the trip back to Metropolis? Here's a little sleeping pill. Now to the state prison, but fast. I'm sorry, Superman, but there's nothing I can do about it. But they've got an innocent man in that execution room. This man is the murderer. That may be, but the only one who can stop it now is the governor, and there's no time. But I tell you... They're strapping him into the chair right now. They'll be pulling the switch at 11 sharp. Just one minute. There must be a way. There's got to be. Wait a minute. Yes, there is. Here, watch this punk for me. I'll be back. Racing into the prison yard, Superman's sharp eyes penetrate the darkness. In a split second, find what they want. The power lines running from the prison's electric generators. Leaping off the ground, he grips the heavily insulated wires in his hands. Rips them apart as though they were cotton thread. There's a shower of sparks and a great hissing and crackling as the severed wires writhe and twist like tortured snakes. And the entire prison is plunged into merciful, life-giving darkness. <laughs> Johnny, how does it feel to be married, people? <laughs> it feels wonderful, Mr. Kent. And it never would have happened if not for you. And Superman. Yes, don't forget Superman. You know, I was a little worried that the warden and the governor would be furious about those power lines being ripped apart. But they weren't. <laughs> it's too bad Superman isn't here so we could thank him personally. Well, Johnny, I'll tell you, he really is here. Is he? Where? Or shall we say, in spirit. <laughs> And so ends One Minute to Death on The Adventures of Superman, which come to you now each week at this same time over many of these ABC stations. Superman is a copyrighted transcribed feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines. <laughs> This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. 
Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. The Adventures of Superman. When the planet Krypton, home of a race of supermen, exploded into dust, the sole survivor was an infant boy who had been shot to Earth in a sealed rocket. Today, that boy, grown to manhood, is known as Superman, sworn enemy of the forces of evil. To aid him in his never-ending fight for truth and justice, he masquerades as Clark Kent, crime reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper. His secret is carefully guarded. No one is aware that Kent is Superman. No one but you. Join with us now on ABC as we embark on another of Superman's transcribed adventures as the Man of Steel in his guise of Clark Kent, crime reporter, pits his superhuman strength against a gang of killers in Death Rides the Roller Coaster. Our scene is the Happy Land Amusement Park on the outskirts of Metropolis. A crew of carpenters are busily engaged constructing a huge roller coaster while painters put the finishing touches on a new carousel. Outside the amusement park office, Nancy Bartlett, Happy Land's young owner, is talking with a man named Midway Martin. This is your last chance, Miss Bartlett. 15000 for the park, lock, stock, and barrel. Take it or leave it. I'll leave it, Mr. Martin. Good day. Not so fast. Let go of my arm. Let go, I said. Well, you dirty Get little... off this property before I have you thrown off. You won't talk so big after I get through with you. You don't frighten me, Martin. Not one bit. My father left Happy Land to me and asked me to keep it running. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. Midway Martin or no Midway Martin. Take a look. I'm building the highest and the longest roller coaster in the state. I'm putting in the largest and the fanciest carousel. I'm going to make Carnival Town your broken-down outfit look sick. And you can't stop me. Now get out. I'll get out when I'm good and ready. You'll get out now or I'll have you thrown out. Yeah, that'll be the day. Will it? See. Kelly? Fred Kelly? Hey, don't scare me none, sister. Oh, we'll see. Kelly? You calling me, Miss Nancy? Yes, come here. Now we'll see how tough you are, Martin. Something wrong, Miss Nancy? You know Midway Martin, don't you? Yeah, yeah sure. Hello, Kelly. Throw him out of the park. Huh? I said throw him out of the park. Okay. You heard him, Martin. Scram. I'll scram when I'm ready. Well, don't stand there, Kelly. Throw him out. Let's go, pal. Hey, now be careful, Kelly. You're liable to get hurt. Never mind. She said out, and that means out. You'll pay for this, sister. I'm not through with you, not by a long shot. Before I get done, you'll pay through the nose. Now, Nancy, you've just got to pull yourself together. You can't let this throw you. But, Lois, it can ruin me. Well, I borrowed $40,000 to open Happy Land this year. The five-mile sky chaser in the carousel alone cost almost thirty. I know, dear, but you're not ruined yet. We'll fight this if we have to slash it right across the front page of the planet. Oh, excuse me. Oh, come in, Clark. You remember Nancy Bartlett? Oh, sure thing. How are you, Nancy? Fine. Thank you, Mr. Kent. Wow, well, wait. You don't sound too fine. Something wrong? Well, just listen to this, Clark. What? An official high in the city department of buildings who asked that his name be withheld examined the new five-mile sky chaser at the Happy Land Amusement Park and declared it to be unsafe. No one examined it, Mr. Kent. It's a lie. What paper is that? The Daily Blade? Well, what other sheet would publish out-and-out lies? Yeah. And that's not all. Just listen uh, uh, down here. When questioned by a Daily Blade reporter, Nancy Bartlett, owner of the amusement park, was nervous and evasive. That's not true. Obviously, something is wrong at Happy Land. The is is in italics. Yeah. And Miss Bartlett is not too anxious to have it exposed. How do you like that? What's the point? Somebody at the Blade got a grudge against you, Nancy? No, it's Midway Martin. Who? Midway Martin. He owns a carnival town, an amusement park across the river. Oh. And when he learned I was building a new roller coaster and carousel, he got frightened. He made me an offer of 15000 for Happy Land. I refused, of course, and then he began to threaten me. Wow. Funny, I had to have him thrown out of the park. That was a week ago, and 
Now, this appeared in the paper today. Midway Martin, no doubt, has a friend on the Daily Blade. Well, Nancy Bartlett has more than one friend on the Daily Planet. And our circulation is double the blade. Oh, thanks, Lord. Thanks, nothing. We don't like yellow rumor circulating journalism. The only thing is, how are we going to handle this, Clark? Well, let's see. I assume the five-mile sky chaser is perfectly safe, Nancy. Of course it is. If you want the truth, Martin's roller coaster is a menace to life and limb. He had three accidents on it last year. Well, forget Martin. When did you plan to open Happy Land? Saturday, tomorrow. The parade starts in City Hall at 11, and we open the gates at 2. Well, and what we've got to do is get the planet to endorse the opening, to uh, sponsor it. We'll run a story in the next three editions tonight and tomorrow morning. Hey, wait a minute. I've got an idea. Who's going to lead the parade? Oh, I'd plan to, on a white horse. Well, can you get two white horses? I guess so. If you can, why don't you and Lois lead the parade? Uh, why me? To give it the paper's official blessing. You know, Daily Planet star girl reporter leads Happy Land Parade. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Lois, what'd you do? Oh, golly, I don't know. I'm not much of a horsewoman. Well, you don't have to be, Lois, really. These are parade horses. They behave perfectly. Well, okay, if it'll help any. Oh, here it is, Carol. Probably won't be able to sit down for a week. But... <laughs> <laughs> Still... Knock out a story, Lois. I'll talk the chief into giving it a first page block. Hey, wait. Uh, I'm not going to ride bareback, if that's what you're <laughs> thinking, Clark. No, no, no. Get this into the story. Superman will take the first ride on Happy Land's five-mile Sky Chaser. What? Mr. Kent, you're joking. Now, that doesn't convince all of Metropolis that the Sky Chaser is safe. Nothing will. I smell a rat. Hmm? Are you planning to wear a Superman costume, Mr. Kent? Why, do you think I'd look bad in it, Miss Lane? Well, I... Oh, please don't joke, Mr. Kent. Are you serious about Superman taking the first ride? Dead serious. He'll be there at 2 o'clock. Well, can I advertise it? Superman in person? You can. Clark, are you sure? As sure as I am of my own name. And now to the human side of the news. An innovation in amusement park openings is promised for tomorrow. Superman, the one and only Superman, will take the first ride on Happy Land's five-mile Sky Chaser, the longest, fastest roller coaster in the state. And Lois Lane, star girl reporter for the Metropolis Daily Planet, will leave the parade scheduled to start from City Hall at 11 o'clock. Midway Martin. No, 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 don't talk, just listen. I see that the paper's a Bartlett girl and a reporter from the planet are leading the parade tomorrow. There'll be two white horses. Now, here's what you gotta do. I'll send one of my boys over with a couple of small black... Figure. Oh, 50,000 at least, Beanie, maybe more. Story in the planet started the ball rolling, all right. Most of the local radio commentators picked it up. Yeah, I heard one last night. Superman's going to take the first ride on the roller coaster. That's right. Oh, boy, I sure wish I could ride with him. Well, now, maybe you will, Beanie. Do you think so? wonder what's holding up Lois and Nancy. I see the white horses, but... Oh, there they are. Can Miss Lane ride a horse? <laughs> we'll know in a minute. She's mounting now. Hey, not bad. There they go. Gee, this plane looks wonderful. He sure does. Oh, for a catfish, what's happening? The horses are bucking. Is that part of the act? No, something's wrong. They're galloping down the street, running wild. Heading right for the crowd. Get up on the sidewalk, Beanie. I'll be right Where back. Are you going? I'll see you later. Elbowing his way through the panic stricken crowd, Clark Kent reaches the comparative privacy of an alley between two buildings. In a matter of moments, he changes from the bespectacled newspaper reporter to the red and blue costumed figure of Superman. Leaping high over the milling crowd, the man of steel hovers above the open street, where the two white horses, obviously gone mad with pain and fright, are thundering along the asphalt with Lois and Nancy clinging to their backs. Only a scant 50 feet separates the crazed animals from a mob of equally crazed spectators when Superman drops between them like a plummet and, seizing a bridle rein in either hand, brings them to a rearing, screaming stop. Whoa, boys, whoa! All right, get off, get out of the saddle, quick! Holding the horses steady, the man of steel waits until Lois and Nancy have dismounted. Then, with a flick of a finger, he breaks both saddle girths and drops the saddles to the street. 
quickly his open hand passes over the sweating backs of the animals. Almost as though by magic, the horses quiet down. Easy, boys, easy. It's all over. Oh, Superman. What happened? How did they suddenly go crazy? Someone put thin glass vials containing acid crystals under their saddles. What? When you mounted, the vials broke and the acid burned into their hides. Oh, wow. How terrible. It might have been a lot worse. Another few seconds and a dozen people would have been trampled to death. I know. And if Midway Martin was responsible for this... If he was, he's guilty of attempted murder. Fred, this is Miss Lane and Mr. Ken of the Daily Planet. Fred Kelly, my crew boss. How do you do? You uh, heard what happened with the horses, I presume, Mr. Kelly? Fred was there. He saw it. Yeah, I sure did. Lucky thing Superman stopped them nags. Uh, Miss Bartlett tells me the horses were rented from a livery stable. That's right, the uh, McCaffrey's. Were they saddled when they were delivered, Mr. Kelly? Yes, sir, they were. Mm-hmm. But I checked the girths myself to make sure they were tight enough for Miss Nancy and this lady here mounted. Were you the only one who handled the horses? Yeah, just me and a boy from the stable. You know, Mr. Kelly, that someone put acid crystals under the saddles. Yes, ma'am. It sure was a low-down main trick. Well, that's an understatement. Do you think Midway Martin was responsible, Fred? Well, if he was and I could prove it, I'd take a whip to him. I don't think we can prove it, although there's no doubt in my mind that Martin was responsible. Obviously, he'll stop at nothing. Oh, he, he's a bad actor, that Martin. If I was you, Miss Nancy, I'd settle up with him. What do you mean, settle up, Fred? Make some kind of a deal, I guess. Uh, get him off your neck. You mean pay him off, Mr. Kelly? Yeah, you could call it that. Not on your life. I wouldn't give him ten cents. If you did, I'd never talk to you again. <laughs> Don't worry, Lois. I won't. Okay, okay. You're the boss. Uh, now, if you'll excuse me, i got to go check on a crew. We'll be opening the gates in 20 minutes. Oh, is it that late? 20 minutes to two. Mind if I go along with you, Kelly? No, sir. We'll be back at the office, Mr. Kent. Okay, I'll see you. I wanted to have a little talk with you, Kelly. Where can we go where we'd be alone? And I may have to use the telephone. I haven't time for much talking, Mr. Oh, this will just take a minute or two. Well, there's a pay phone in the chuck house. I don't think nobody's there now. Oh, that'll be fine. Where is the chuck house? Right over here. Good. After you. Thanks. All right, there's the phone. Fine, if I need it. What I wanted to talk to you about, Kelly, was your suggestion that Miss Bartlett might do well to buy Midway Martin off. If I was her, that's what I'd do. Yes, so I gathered. She's got a lot of dough sunk in this place. Oh, why take chances with that? What would it be worth to you if Miss Bartlett paid Martin off, Kelly? Huh? You heard me. What would your cut be? Look, fella. I don't know what you're talking about, but if it's what I think it is, go take a walk. Before I do, would you mind giving me that little glass vial in your right-hand trouser pocket? Huh? Ah, you get hard of hearing very conveniently, don't you? There's a little glass vial containing acid crystals in your trouser pocket, probably a spare. So what? So I'd like it. Okay. Here it is. Oh! Right on a button, and he's out cold. Martin? Yeah. Kelly. Yeah, I heard about the horses. It's bad. You didn't hear nothing yet. One of them Daily Planet reporters, a guy named Kent Court Wise. What do you mean? That extra vial of them acid crystals. Had it in my pocket and he knew it. How'd he know it? Don't ask me, but he did. Anyway, I just clipped him. He's laying here on the chuck house floor. Yeah, I give a tie him up. Stop him someplace and we get through. Through with what? Get hold of what? A hacksaw. One that will cut through metal. Bring it to the west end of the park. I'll be waiting for you. What you gonna do, Martin? You know what I'm gonna do. And this time, Superman's not gonna stop it. This time, she's a dead duck. We'll be back in a moment with part two of Death Rides the Roller Coaster. But first... Here is your ABC announcer. Now, back to the adventures of Superman and part two of Death Rides the Roller Coaster. (laughs) 
Making use of Superman's X-ray vision, the amazing ability to visually penetrate any substance but lead, Clark Kent discovered that Fred Kelly, the crew boss at the Happy Land Amusement Park, was in cahoots with Midway Martin. Allowing himself to be knocked out by Kelly, Kent listened in on a telephone conversation between Kelly and Martin. Learned that Martin was about to strike again. But where and how? As we continue now, Kelly has disappeared. Kent, who allowed himself to be bound and gagged and locked in a tool shed by the crew boss, has easily freed himself. It is now two o'clock. The gates have been thrown wide, and crowds have poured in for the official opening of Happy Land Amusement Park. On the loading platform of the new roller coaster, the giant five-mile sky chaser, Lois Lane, Nancy Bartlett, and Beanie, the Daily Planet copy boy, are becoming nervous and worried as the milling crowd waits impatiently for the advertised appearance of Superman. It's five minutes after two, Lois. Yes, Nancy, I know. I don't understand what happened to Clark. He said he'd meet us back at your office, didn't he? He said it isn't Mr. Kent I'm concerned about. There are thousands of people down there waiting to see Superman take the first ride on the roller coaster. No. We advertise that there are posters all over the park. If he doesn't show up, I'm ruined. Don't you worry, Miss Bartlett. If he said he'd show up, he will. Superman never breaks a promise. The trouble, though, Beanie, is that Superman didn't make this promise. Clark Kent did. Oh, I had a feeling something was going to happen. Oh, did you, Miss Lane? Oh, Superman, oh, thank heaven. Oh, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Sorry I was late, Miss Bartlett, but... It's uh, all right, just as long as you're here. Well, Clark Kent got himself into a little trouble in that delay. Clark? What happened to him? It was nothing serious. He learned that your crew boss, Kelly, is working with Midway Martin. Oh, no. Let's what? not worry about it now. You've got to show these people your roller coaster is safe. Get on the public address system, Miss Bartlett, and tell them that you and Miss Lane and myself are going to take the first ride. What about me, Superman? Oh, oh yes, yes, and Beanie. Oh, boy. Shall I do it now? Yes, please. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. Most of you have either read or heard the vile rumor that Happy Land's new five-mile sky chaser, the most modern roller coaster in the entire state, is dangerous and unsafe. This rumor has been circulated by a man to whom I refuse to sell Happy Land, and this is his way of seeking revenge. But fortunately, I happen to have some good friends. Standing here on the platform with me, ready to step into a roller coaster car and take the first ride on the Sky Chaser, are three people who want to prove to you. As Nancy Bartlett introduces Superman, Lois Lane, and Beanie to the cheering crowd, a terrifying scene is taking place at the far end of the amusement park, where the five mile Sky Chaser tracks make a breathtaking turn. Two men, Midway Martin, owner of Carnival Town, a rival amusement park, and Fred Kelly, crew boss at Happy Land, are hunched over a section of the roller coaster track. Kelly is working a hacksaw through the bright, shiny steel. That's the sharpest saw you can find, Kelly. It ain't the saw. These tracks are tempered steel. I saw the bill on them. They cost plenty. All right, all right. Just keep solid. You know what's gonna happen when that car hits his curve, Martin? And there's a piece of track missing? I know. Well, it ain't gonna be pretty. So what? I'm just telling you. Thanks. What about that reporter? Uh, what about him? I got him locked in a tool shed. What'll I do with him? Let him loose after the car jumps the track. Don't he know too much? Can't prove anything. Uh, okay. All through. Now lift the piece of track out. What you gonna do with it? Get rid of it. In the river. Come on, let's go. I'm coming. This is one place I don't want to be when that car hits a curve. I'm getting out of here and out of the park. We'll leave you me. <laughs> Superman, two representatives of the Metropolis Daily Plan, and I will take the first ride. Thank you. All right, Lois, hop in. You and Miss Bartlett take the front seat. Beanie and I'll sit in the rear. Oh, boy. <laughs> Is oh, boy, the extent of your vocabulary, Beanie? Gosh, no, but, but 
Oh, boy. <laughs> you all set, Lois? Miss Bartlett? So we're ready if you are. Okay, then let her roll. You know, I was just thinking back. Golly, it's been 15 years since I was on a roller coaster. <laughs> this is my first time. Well, you've got a thrill coming, Beanie. Hold your breath, though, when we take that first dip. Keep a firm grip on the bar and don't lean forward. When do we stop climbing? We're almost at the top. Golly, the people down there look just like a little bug. Yes, they certainly do. Well, here we are at the top. Oh. Okay, hold on now. Here we go. How is it, Beanie? Oh, boy. Oh. Wow. me free. We certainly did. Oh, you would have heard more, but I, I couldn't catch my breath. <laughs> Watch your tunnel coming up. Oh, Dad, the oh, You still with us, Beanie? Yeah, but... <laughs> oh, Beanie. Oh, boy. This car almost yanked me out of my seat. Hold on. Nothing, Beanie. There's a really sharp one down below. You can see it from here. Great, Scott. What's the matter? Brace yourselves. I've got to stop this car. Leaping from the rear seat, Superman drops behind the roller coaster car, now hurtling down the incline at better than a mile a minute, heading for death and destruction. His powerful hands reach out and grip the axle between the madly spinning wheels, and the muscles of his back and arms tighten like bands of steel as he calls on every ounce of his superhuman strength to stop the car in its headlong plunge to disaster. Sparks shoot up from the wheels as they grind into the rails. Slowly, almost inch by inch, the momentum of the car is checked until finally Superman brings it to a screaming, nerve-wracking stop at the bottom of the incline, less than a foot from the sharp curve where Martin and Kelly had removed a section of the track. What happened? There's a section of track missing on the curve. What do you mean? More of Martin's work. Why, how terrible. Now, listen to me. I don't want a word of this to get out. But Superman, he tried to kill us. Yes, I know. He was an attempt at at cold-blooded murder. We've got to prove Martin did it, and that may take some doing. No matter what... Listen, please. Obviously, you can't sell any tickets to the roller coaster. Obviously. Now, get back there and make some explanation to the crowd. I'll try to locate Clark Kent. He'll meet you in Miss Bartlett's office. Now, remember, not a word about this to anyone. Nancy, please, it's going to be all right, I promise you. Oh, can it be? You heard the crowd when I made the announcement that the roller coaster had to be closed. Why, they laughed and booed. I know, dear. I... Oh, boy, if I could only get my hands on that midway Martin, I'd fix him. Here comes Mr. Kent. Well, it's about time. Where have you been, Clark? Honestly, why is it you always manage to disappear when you're needed most? Probably because I'm needed more some other place. You don't know what happened, Mr. Kent. Yes, I do, Beanie. (laughs) Superman and I discussed it, and we've come to a decision. The best thing for you to do, Nancy, is to sell out to Midway Martin. What? What? (laughs) You see what you've done? You and your decisions. I'm sorry, but there's no other way. What do you mean, there's no other way, Clark? That man is a a potential murderer. I know. He made two attempts on our lives, and your only solution is to, well, just give him what he wants. Unfortunately, we can't prove anything. We haven't even tried to prove anything. I'm going to turn this case over to the police, and they'll prove something. Nancy. Yes? How much did Martin offer you for Happy Land? Fifteen thousand. Just twenty percent of what it's worth. I know, but you'd better call him up and tell him you'll take it. Oh, Clark Kent, are you crazy? I don't think so. Call him, Nancy. Tell him to come right over. Here's a thousand in cash to bind a deal, Miss Bartlett. I'll get the rest when we sign the bill of sale. All you got to do now is just give me a receipt for the thousand. You made a good deal, Mr. Martin. Well, I tell you, the way I figured, it's good all around. This is no racket for a woman. <laughs> Too tough. Yes, it seems to be tough. Why, sure. You got to be hard to run a business like this. Here's your receipt. That's that. Well, now that you own Happy Land, Mr. Martin, tell us something. Well, sure. What is it? You really don't think the five-mile sky chaser is unsafe, do you? Superman and you folks didn't take the first ride in it like you said you was going to. Huh? Oh, oh uh, no, no. Oh, that's right, we didn't. We, we, we started to, but you scared us off. <laughs> I figured I would. Then you don't think it's unsafe? Why, of course not. It's my way of knocking out competition. I see. Like they say, all's fair in love and war. Well, then, if you don't think the roller coaster is unsafe, you won't mind taking a ride on it to celebrate your buying Happy Land. Well, a 
breakfast. That's... I said you won't mind taking a ride on the roller coaster to celebrate this occasion. Oh, no, no, not me. I, uh, I don't ride on them Oh, things. just once, Mr. Martin. After all, you circulated the rumor that it was unsafe. Certainly, as the new owner, you should convince the crowd out there that it's perfectly safe. Nothing to it. You're not afraid, are you, Mr. Martin? Afraid? No, no, no. I ain't afraid, but, uh... But what? Uh, look, I gotta get oh, back. Oh, no, no, to no, don't leave us, Mr. Martin. We want you to take just one ride on the roller coaster. Let go of my arm, please, uh, Mr. Martin. Hey, are you crazy? How can you say a thing like that? Now, come on, let's take a ride. Throw this crack put off, Miss Bartlett, before I sock him one. Oh, but we want you to ride on your new roller coaster, Mr. Martin. You own it now. Hey, what's going on here? You own nothing. Oh, be a sport, Martin. Okay, pal, you wish, but this. <laughs> Oh, I... Oh. Hurt your hand, Mr. Martin? Oh, Martin, be careful. Don't worry. Let's go, Martin. Now, the deal's off. Give me back my dough. Well, here's your receipt. Nothing doing. The deal is still on, and you're going for a little ride on the roller coaster. You'll never get me on this thing. Oh, yes, we will if we have to carry you like this. You let me down. Let me down. Open the door, you... Beanie. You bet. Let me down. I'll let you down, you... Martin. In the roller coaster car. <laughs> Uh, please, please don't be right, right on that thing. Sorry, but as the new owner, you've got to test your merchandise. No, 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 I'll get, I'll get killed. What on earth are you talking about, Mr. Martin? You know this roller coaster is perfectly safe. No, no, it ain't. What do you mean? It ain't safe, I tell you. I'll get killed if I ride on it. Well, Mr. Martin, either you ride or you talk. Uh, what do you mean? Either you tell the crowd here in the park why the roller coaster is unsafe and who made it unsafe, or you ride. Well, do you ride or talk? I'll talk. Quick, hand me the microphone, Lois. Turn the volume up. Here. Thanks. Please stop the carousel and all rides and concessions. Everyone pay close attention. Attention, please. Ladies and gentlemen, a few days ago, rumors were circulated that the five-mile sky chaser here at Happy Land was unsafe. Those rumors were started by Midway Martin, owner of Carnival Town. Mr. Martin is here with us now, and he is about to tell you the truth. Go ahead, Martin. Right into the microphone. Well, I... I tried to ruin this place. I... I told lies about the roller coaster. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, everyone. What else did you do this afternoon? Well, I... I cut out a piece of the track so... so that there'd be an accident. Go ahead. Tell them who helped you. Fred Kelly. You confess this of your own free will? Yes. All right, that's all. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard Midway Martin's public confession. Now you know the truth. But for a fortunate circumstance, the presence of Superman, death would have ridden the roller coaster when it was tested less than an hour ago. Miss Bartlett is now arranging to have the track repaired. It will be safe and ready for use tonight. We hope you will all join with us from now on and enjoy everything the Happy Land Amusement Park has to offer. Thank you. And so ends Death Rides the Roller Coaster on The Adventures of Superman, which come to you now each week at this same time over many of these ABC stations. Superman is a copyrighted transcribed feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazine. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. The Adventures of Superman. When the planet Krypton, home of a race of supermen, exploded into dust, the sole survivor was an infant boy who had been shot to Earth in a sealed rocket. Today, that boy, grown to manhood, is known as Superman, sworn enemy of the forces of evil. To aid him in his never-ending fight for truth and justice, he masquerades as Clark Kent, crime reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper. 
His secret is carefully guarded. No one is aware that Kent is Superman. No one but you. Join with us now as we embark on another of Superman's exciting transcribed adventures as the Man of Steel solves a murder and a mystery in The Diamond of Death. The Fairmount Estate, Great Oaks, is situated on a hilltop in the exclusive Wellington section of Metropolis. From the scrolled iron gate that once ensured the privacy of an Italian prince, the broad green acres rise to the huge gabled house in terraced formality. Time has taken its toll of the Fairmounts, and there are only three who occupy the 27-room mansion. Aunt Margaret, her son John, and her niece Alice, whose father founded the now dwindling Fairmount fortune. As our story opens... Alice is alone in the drawing room, playing the piano. Is that the only piece you know? How many times have I told you not to sneak up behind me? That's good practice. You didn't hear me come in, did you? No, I didn't. And I don't like being spied on. Ever since you got that correspondence school detective course, you've been unbearable. <laughs> Gumshoeing around the house, frightening your mother half to death, picking at locks. It seems to me, John, it's about time you grew up. When I want your advice, I'll ask for it. You think you're pretty high and mighty because you're going to be 21 tomorrow. I believe you and me, when I'm 21, I won't be hanging around this barn of a house. Oh, what's the use? I'm going to my room. <laughs> what was that? It's Mama. Hey, Mama! Mama, what happened? Oh, John. John. Mama, what happened? Oh. What happened? Oh, my nerve pills. Oh, John, get them, please. John. They're on the dresser, John. Get a glass of water, too. Uh. Something frighten you, Aunt Margaret? Oh, Alice. Alice, darling. Are these the pills? Yes. Where's the water? Oh, shucks, I forgot. <laughs> Aunt Margaret, tell me what happened. Oh, it was a horrible one. I opened the door. And a great... Now, here's the water. Now, what made her scream? I don't know yet. Here you are, Aunt Margaret. Thank you, dear. Well, something must have happened. Did you arrive at that conclusion all by yourself? You don't have to get smart, Alec. Oh, please. Please, children. I'm sorry. What happened, Mama? Oh, give me a chance to catch my breath, John. Well, you want me to call the doctor? No. No, I'll be all right. It, it was just a terrible scare. Well, what scared you? I went across the hall to the library to get a book. Yeah? When I opened the library door, I saw a man climbing out the window. Holy cat! He turned to look at me, and his face was covered with a black handkerchief. A burglar? I, I tried to call out to him to stop, but, but all I could do was scream. You better look around outside. No, no, John. Huh? Help me up, Alice, dear. Yeah, but Mama, what if he's lurking around outside waiting for another chance to bust in? Oh, oh, thank you, dear. I'm sure I frightened him off, John. At any rate, there's something far more important. Alice's diamond pendant is in the safe in the library. Aunt Margaret, you don't think he... Oh, I hope not, dear. But come, we'll see. <laughs> Fourteen right. Seven left. There. Aunt Margaret, if anything happened to Daddy's diamond... You know in a moment. It was in this metal box. It's here. Oh, thank heaven. Well, you sure make a lot of fuss about a hunk of jewelry. So what if he did take it? It's insured. You wouldn't understand. Alice's father brought the diamond back from Africa, John. It's the only one of its kind, and it's worth a fortune. Hadn't we better call the police, Aunt Margaret? I don't think it's necessary, dear. Obviously, he tried to get into the safe and couldn't. All it would mean would be a lot of questions and nothing accomplished. <gasps> Someone's at the front door. Wait a minute. Don't anyone move. I'll look out the window and see what it is. John, be careful. Don't worry. man and a woman. Oh, yes, I forgot. 
They're probably from the Daily Planet. A Miss Lane called this afternoon about an interview with you, Alice. With me? Yes, about your birthday party tomorrow and the diamond. Close the window, John, and go down and let them in. But why would anyone want to interview me, Aunt Margaret? Why, you're a Fairmont, dear. And that makes you important. Come, I'll go down with you. I'm sorry I was late, Mrs. Richards, but Mr. Kent drove me up and somehow we got lost. Oh, sure. Always blame it on the driver. <laughs> oh, it's perfectly all right. And if we seem a little disorganized, it's... It's because we've had some excitement. Yeah, a burglar broke in and tried to steal my cousin Alice's diamond. What? John, don't exaggerate. Well, he did, didn't he? When did this happen? Just before you and Miss Lane arrived. Oh? I surprised a marauder in the upstairs library. Whether he was after the Fairmount diamond or not is a question. Did you notify the police? Well, frankly, no. I, I believed I frightened him off. I noticed a man out front when we drove up. You did? Yes. He was short and dark with a, one of those little hairline mustaches. Well, that's Mario. The chauffeur. It seems to me the police should be notified. Don't you think so, Clark? Wouldn't hurt. What's your chauffeur's last name, Mrs. Richards? Corelli. Yeah, Mario Philip Corelli. Oh. He was born in Sicily, and he's got a scar on his face where a black hand guy cut him with a knife. John, I'm sure Mr. Kent isn't interested in Mario's personal history. Oh, on the contrary, Mrs. Richards, I might very well be. I have a vague feeling I've seen him somewhere before. How long has he been with you? Three months. I wish, John, you'd learn not to answer questions for others. I'm perfectly capable of replying. Okay... Mario wasn't the man I saw in the library, Mr. Kent, if that's what you're thinking. This man was was tall and blonde. I see. Oh, this is all very interesting, but actually we came here to get a story on Miss Fairmount's birthday and nobody has paid any attention to her. Oh, that's quite all right. Oh, forgive me, Alice, dear. Of course, Aunt Margaret. You'll be 21 tomorrow, isn't that right? All of 21. And you're going to celebrate the occasion with a party? Aunt Margaret's giving me a party, yes. It'll be a masquerade with 200 invited guests. I see. Here at Great Oaks, I presume. Oh, most certainly. Well, that's fine. Now, about the Fairmount Diamond. Well, in accordance with the last wishes of my dear brother, Alice's father, I'll present the Fairmount Diamond to Alice at the party. Uh, that's if that burglar doesn't come back and steal it. John, that's not amusing. I think it's disgusting. You would. That will be enough, John. Uh, just one more thing, Mrs. Richards, and we'll go. May we have a photographer at the party? We'd like a shot of the presentation of the diamond. Well, by all means, and unless Alice has any objections. No. Good. Thank you so much for seeing us, and best wishes to you, Miss Fairmount. Yes, many happy returns of tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> and if I were you, Mrs. Richards, I'd certainly notify the police about that marauder. Yes. Yes, I think I shall. <laughs> Do you mean to say that you've dragged me down here to police headquarters because you vaguely remember having seen that chauffeur's face before? In essence. What do you mean, in essence? You could have seen his face in a, in a barber shop or a, a subway or any one of a million places. What makes you think he's a criminal? Uh, I've got a picture in my mind. What mind? And it's a rogues gallery picture with a number. <laughs> you know what you sound like? What? Fortune teller in a two-bit carnival. I see a picture. The picture has a number. <laughs> Uh, a short, dark man with a scar. All right, Lord. Okay, Swami. You hang around here all night while they dig up pictures for you. Where are you I'm going? going back to the office. I'm going to knock out the Fairmount Squib and home to bed. Okay. So long, Mystic. This is the guy you're looking for, Kent. Lois, here he is. I don't believe it. Come here, look. Well, it won't do me any good to look. I've never seen him. All right, then listen. Martin Corday, alias Matt Corey, alias Mitchell Corey, alias Mario Corday. They said his name was Corelli. That's the name he's using now, Mario Corelli. Listen. Arrested June 14th, 1938 on suspicion smuggling gems in the port of New York. Smuggling gems? Discharge insufficient evidence. Arrested March 12th, 1941, possession of stolen gems. Convicted two years state prison. Arrested Paris, France, 1945. Attempted smuggling of stolen jewels. My Clark. No disposition. Three arrests and one conviction, all on gem charges. Well, uh, I humble the public. Oh, oh, forget that. Here's our chance to get a real story on the Fairmont Diamond, not just a society page squib. 
Uh, slip this into the ready file, Moran, will you? We may be needing it. Okay. You mind if I use the phone? No, go ahead. You got her number, Lois? Huh? Who's? Uh, that woman at Great Oaks, uh, the, the, the aunt. Mrs. Richards? Yes. Well, just ask for the Great Oaks estate in Wellington. What are you calling to for? warn her to be careful until we get there. Oh, I see. Number, please. I'd like the Great Oaks estate in Wellington. I don't know the number, operator. One moment, please. Thank you. Well, you imagine the patience of the guy, Lois. Here he's been hanging around for three months, waiting to get his hands on that diamond, working as a chauffeur. But, Clark, Mrs. Richards said the man she found in the room was tall and blonde. Oh, he was probably a confederate. Here's your party. Oh, hello? Hello. Miss Richards? Yes? This is Clark Kent, Mrs. Richards. Who? Clark Kent. Miss Lane and I were at your place about an hour ago from the Daily Planet. Oh, yes, of course. I'm sorry, Mr. Kent. That's quite all right. My reason for calling, Mrs. Richards, is to tell you that we did a little checking on your chauffeur. A little what? We checked your chauffeur at police headquarters, and we find he has a record as a jewel thief. <gasps> now, don't get frightened or upset, Mrs. Richards. Oh, this is terrible. Well, Miss Lane and I are coming back to your place. We should be there in 20 minutes. Just keep calm. And, Mrs. Richards... Yes? Where is the Fairmount Diamond? It's in a safe in the upstairs library. Well, stay in the library until we get there. And keep your son with you. Yes, I will. I certainly will. Okay, see you in about 20 minutes. Hurry, Mr. Kent, please. We will. Okay, Lois, let's go. I don't know how to thank you, Mr. Kent, for having uncovered this... this horrible situation. I'm glad we were able to track him down. To think that we've been harboring a thief in our midst for almost three months... Why, it makes me shudder. Uh, I knew there was something fishy about him right from the beginning. I didn't like his looks. John, don't be childish. Well, I didn't. Excuse me, but Clark, how are we going to handle this? It's getting late. Well, we can't prefer charges against him because, so far as we know, he hasn't yet committed a crime. I assume, however, that Mrs. Richards intends firing him. Oh, immediately, Mr. Kent. Well, I'd like to question him first. Oh, give him the third degree, huh? No, just question him. Well, as far as I'm concerned, the sooner he leaves the property, the better I'll like him. Well, he'll leave tonight, but before he does, we might be able to trap him into admitting that he was after the diamond. John, hmm? would you like to lure him into the trap? Oh, sure. All right, where's his room? Well, it's over the garage. Is he there now? Well, he should be. You want me to find out? No, 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 Wait. Here's what you do. Huh? Go to his room and tell him your mother would like to see him to, uh... Ooh, discuss some errands that must be done early in the morning. Yeah. Things that have to be picked up for the birthday party. Yeah, okay. Then walk back here with him and bring him up here to the library. All right. Oh, Mr. Kent, do you think it's safe to send John over there alone? Oh, Mama. Perfectly safe, Mrs. Richards. You haven't given him any cause for suspicion. And I'm sure John can handle himself if he has to. Ah, uh, you see? Don't worry, Mrs. Richards. Well, very well. I'll be right back with him. You know, Clark, uh, he's liable to get ugly when you tell him we know about his criminal record. You don't have any more confidence in me than Mrs. Richards has in John, is that it? He might be on. Did that ever occur to you? Yes, but I doubt it. Incidentally, where's your niece, Mrs. Richards? That's right. We haven't seen her. Well, Alice was in her room when you called. I saw no point in telling her about Mario. I was afraid it might disturb her That was wise. She's probably overexcited about her birthday party as it is. Well, it wasn't so much that. I don't want you to misunderstand, but Alice had developed a sort of schoolgirlish infatuation for Mario. Oh? Oh, nothing serious, of course. Hey! Hey! Clark! What was that? Hey! It's John! Stay here. I'll go down. Hey! 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 Mr. Kent! Mr. Kent! What's the matter, John? What is it? Mario. He's dead. Someone shot him. Right between the eyes. We'll be back in a moment for part two of The Diamond of Death. But first, here is your ABC announcement. Sunday is a very special day on ABC to millions of listeners. Favorite people like Walter Winchell, Drew Pearson, Luella Parsons, and Jimmy Fiddler are included in the Sunday lineup. Now, the afternoon brings film actor Edward Arnold, portraying Mr. President, the lovely voice of young singing star Betty Clark, and the greatest story ever told offers a moving half-hour of drama from the Bible. Other highlights for Sunday on many ABC stations include Stop the Music, The Amazing Mr. Malone, Chance of a Lifetime, and Music with the Girls, which stars the all-girl orchestra and chorus with the top songs and music of the current Broadway and motion picture successes. 
Many of these favorites can be heard by you over this ABC station. So listen tomorrow, and remember, ABC is dressed in your Sunday best. Yes, be sure to hear Walter Winchell, Stop the Music, Luella Parsons, Drew Pearson, and many other great Sunday highlights over ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, tomorrow. And now, back to the adventures of Superman and the Diamond of Death. With the startling discovery that Mario Corelli, an international jewel thief posing as a chauffeur, was murdered in his room, the mystery surrounding an attempt to steal the fabulous Fairmount Diamond on the eve of Alice Fairmount's 21st birthday deepens. It is now past midnight. The police have completed their investigation at Great Oaks, the Fairmount estate, and have gone, leaving one uniformed man in the upstairs library where the diamond is locked in a safe. Mrs. Richards, Alice Fairmount's aunt, has retired. John Richards, Alice's cousin, is talking with the policeman in the library. Clark Kent, Lois Lane, and young Alice Fairmount are in the drawing room. There's only one possible explanation, Clark. The tall, blonde fellow Mrs. Richards frightened out of the library was Corelli's sidekick. When he failed to get the diamond, they had an argument, and Blondie let him have it. Uh-uh. Two things wrong. What? Nobody heard the shot. And according to the medical examiner, Corelli hadn't been dead 30 minutes when John found the body. Well, the shot could have been muffled, and what's the time got to do with it? What's the time got to do with it? Corelli was alive when we left here the first time. I saw him. That was about 9. Yes? I called Mrs. Richards from police headquarters at 9.30. We got back here at 5 minutes to 10, and the body was found at 10. That means he was murdered between 9.30 and 10. Uh, Miss Fairmount. Yes? How soon after Miss Lane and I left did you go to your room? I, uh, I, I don't quite remember the time. Well, now, Miss Lane and I left at nine. Would you say ten minutes, twenty minutes? Well, you see, I, I went for a little walk first. Oh? In the direction of the garage? Why, why, yes. Did you see Corelli? Yes. Please, I, I don't want you to think I'm I... not thinking anything, Miss Fairmont. You talked with Corelli? Just for a moment. He said he hoped my party was successful. That was all. Uh Then you went to your room? Yes. You rather liked Corelli, didn't you? Liked him? Well, is like too mild? No, of course not. I I found him interesting. Your aunt said he fascinated you. That's not true. He spoke French and Italian fluently, and I enjoyed talking to him. But as for anything else... Yes? There was nothing else. All Mr. Kent is trying to do, Miss Fairman... I know exactly what Mr. Kent is trying to do, and I resent it. Mario may have been a jewel thief, but I found him far more interesting company than my cousin John or my Aunt Margaret. I can understand that. This was my father's house. Tomorrow it'll be mine. If my Aunt Margaret objects to my likes and dislikes, well, it's just too bad. I'm afraid you misunderstand. No one's criticizing you. Certainly neither Miss Lane nor myself. But Corelli was murdered, and we're looking for a solution. Sorry, but I, I can't help you. I think you can. How? Would you invite us to your masquerade party tomorrow? Why, why, yes, if you'd like to come. We would, very much. Then of course you're invited. Will you be in costume? Well, I I don't know about Miss Lane, but I'll be in costume. A very interesting costume. Lovely as a gypsy girl, Miss Lane. Well, thank you, Mr. Kent. I wish I could say the same about your Superman costume. Oh. Don't you like it? Oh, the costume is beautiful. But? Skip it. I know, I know. You don't think I'd fill it out. Well, after all, Clark, there's only one Superman. Yeah, I suppose you're right. Oh, don't feel so bad about it. Oh, I don't at all. (laughs) In fact, I'm glad there's only one Superman. (laughs) You have no idea how glad... What's the matter? How long do we have to stay at this big but um, dull party? (laughs) (laughs) Until Mrs. Richards presents Alice with the diamond. Oh, hey, I I didn't tell you, but the house is surrounded by police. Oh, is it? Mm -hmm. I arranged it with Inspector Henderson. Good, that was smart. 
when Mrs. Richards arrives with the diamond, all the doors to this ballroom will be locked and guarded. Do you expect trouble? No, but if it comes, we'll be ready. Certainly done a job decorating this room, haven't they? Have. A fountain in the center is fabulous. Uh Oh, here comes Mrs. Richards. Oh, with son John tagging along? No. No, he's probably outside with the cops telling them how to guard the house. (laughs) (laughs) She's got the jewel case, Clark. This is it. I guess so. (laughs) As most of you know, it was my brother's wish that Alice be presented with the Fairmont Diamond on her 21st birthday. I shall hold it up for all of you to see. And then it will be my happy privilege to place the pendant around Alice's neck. Ah! Ah, The lights went out. Don't move, Lois. Stay where you are. Clark, it's ten minutes after three. The police gave up an hour ago, and you're still tramping around this empty ball. I know, I know. Will you take that silly Superman costume off and let's go? The diamond is gone. Just make up your mind to it. I can't. The doors were locked and guarded. I got to Mrs. Richards a few seconds after the lights went out and she screamed. Where could it have gone? I don't know. When the lights went on again, she was holding the plush box in her left hand and the gold pendant chain in her right. And then the diamond was gone, and if I've heard that once, I've heard it a dozen I'm times. I'm sorry, I'm only trying to... Clark, the police have searched the room, and everybody in it. I know, Lois. She was standing near the fountain. They searched the fountain. They drained the fountain, remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, I was, I was just thinking, you know, that the, the gold pendant chain and the box were cold... And the plush inside the box seemed to be damp. Come again? Golly, that's a fantastic idea, but if that's how it was done, it explains a lot of things. What's a fantastic idea? Clark. Uh, What? I'm asking you what. I think I know how the diamond disappeared so fast. You do? Easy, easy. Someone's coming down the stairs. Oh, it's Alice. Good heavens, are you people still here? From the looks of it, we'll be here all night. Now, Mr. Kent thinks he knows how the diamond disappeared. Mr. Kent, not really. Uh, I'll have to call the police to get them to do a little fast checking. uh, There's a phone in the powder room, that door over there. Oh, good. I'll be right back. Do you really think Mr. Kent knows, Miss Lane? It's hard to tell what Mr. Kent knows or doesn't know, but there's one easy way to find out. Come on. What are you going to do? Listen to what he tells the police. Uh, This is Clark Kent. Let me have Captain Reed, please. Captain Reed? He was here tonight, wasn't he? Yes, yes, he spoke to me. Hello, Ed. This is Kent. No, I'm still up here. Yeah. Well, I I think I've got the makings of a lead. No, not entirely, but I think the diamond was stolen last night. Not tonight. He's crazy. That's right. No, I can't prove it yet, but if my hunch is correct, I will. I think the girl's aunt, Mrs. Richards, is behind it. Oh, no. Shh. Can you get a search warrant to go through the entire house, Ed? Good. Yes, as soon as you can, if you will. Okay, I'll, I'll call back if I dig up anything else. Right. Uh, oh, but I... Let's go back where we were. I don't want him to know we were listening. He can't be serious about Aunt Margaret, now, don't he? say a word. Well, that's step number one. I'm going to take a look at Corelli's room above the garage. I'll be back in a few minutes. Uh, Mr. Kent... Let, let him go. But I'd like you to explain what he meant about Aunt Margaret. He won't anyway. I don't know what he's got up his sleeve, but whatever it is, I'm going to beat him to the punch. Take me to your aunt's room. What for? Just take me there. Who is it? Alice. Come in, dear. Oh, Miss Lane. I thought you'd left. No, I'm still here, Mrs. Richards. I thought perhaps you'd like to tell me how you arranged the disappearance of Alice's diamond. I beg your pardon? How did you make the diamond disappear and where is it? Alice, what is this? I don't know, Aunt Margaret. Alice knows nothing about this. Now, would you care to return the diamond to her or would you like me to call the police? I... I don't know what you're talking about. You look like you do. 
I'll give you ten seconds to produce the diamond, or I'll call the police. You won't call anyone, Miss Lane. Oh, oh, so you're in on it, too. Close the door, John. Yes, I'm in on it. Are you surprised? No. Not terribly. Stop pointing that gun at us, or can't you handle two women without a gun? Not the way I've got to handle you two. Where's Kent, John? He left. I saw him go out. He'll be back. Maybe yes, maybe no. But it'll be too late. You won't be able to tell him much. Don't talk so much, John. Do it and let's get away from here. All right, stand behind me. Miss Lane, what's he going to do? He... He's going... to kill us. Aunt Margaret, do it, John. You first, Alice. Oh, oh no! Oh, no. God! How about letting me have it first, John? Okay, pal. Try again. Oh, That's God. all for you, sonny boy. Oh. <laughs> Clark, I'm listening. How did you know they were behind it all? Well, you heard their confession. Yes, but... They planned to steal the diamond months ago, but the problem was disposing of it. Yes. That's how Corelli got into the picture. They framed an elaborate scheme for making it look like it was stolen, even to the story about the tall, blonde burglar. I see. But we threw a monkey wrench into the works when we dug up Corelli's record. You see, they were afraid he might implicate them if we cornered him. So they shot him between 9.30 when I called Mrs. Richards and 10 o'clock when John found his body. Yeah, I know all that, but what I don't know... Patience, patience. Now, wait a minute. Corelli, before he was murdered, either had built or built himself a metal mold in the shape of the diamond. But why? The morning of the masquerade party, they filled the mold with clear water and froze it solid, probably with the gold chain attached. Oh, I'd be... A few moments before Mrs. Richards presented it to Alice, it was removed from the mold and brought in. Uh Uh-huh. When John turned the lights out, she ripped it from the chain and dropped it into the fountain bowl where it melted. Well, sure... And you figured all that out just because the plush box and the gold chain were cold? Well, that started me thinking. Well, it's... It's remarkable. Huh? Uh, now, wait a minute. Just tell me one more thing. What? That horrible brat, John, he fired two shots at you. How did he miss? How... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh... I know. It wasn't you at all. It was Superman. Yeah. <laughs> or was it? Huh? Clark, please tell me. Huh. Was it you in that costume, or, or was it... Was it Superman? <laughs> Uh, that, Miss Lane, you'll have to figure out all by yourself. And so ends the Diamond of Death on The Adventures of Superman, which come to you now each week at this same time over many of these same ABC stations. Listen again next week when Superman solves another baffling mystery adventure. Superman is a copyrighted transcribed feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and brings you radio's most fabulous character in thrilling stories of action, mystery, and adventure. So be sure to listen when you hear the familiar cry... Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman! The role of Superman is played by Bud Collier, Lois Lane by Joan Alexander. Music is composed and played by John Garth. This is Jackson Beck reminding you to be sure to listen next week to The Adventures of Superman! This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the Sunshine Serial, presents The Adventures of Superman. Today, Superman and his search for the missing Lois Lane 
finds himself confused and baffled by a mystery with frighteningly ominous overtones. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, it's only once in a thousand years that someone comes along with such exciting prizes as those comic buttons Kellogg's Pep has been putting out. And uh, now that you've got a brand new series of 18 new buttons to collect, boy, that multiplies your fun over and over. Because it's such a swell surprise finding a button every time that you open a package of pet. And they're such swell prizes. Why, these new comic buttons, all 18 of them, are colored up bright as anything. They really show up when you pin them on your, your jacket or your dress or cap. And they're true-to-life pictures, too. The little Moose and Spud and, and Corky and Superman look just as real as they do in the funny papers. Yes, sir, you'll get a kick out of collecting this brand new series of pep comic buttons. And you don't have to spend any of your allowance to do it. No, sir, you don't even have to send in a box stop. You just ask Mom to keep stocked up with plenty of Kellogg's Pep. That's right. You can't buy these new comic buttons, but you get one as a prize in each package of that sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. The whole wheat flakes that taste so good and sunny that, well, you come a-running to breakfast. So be sure to remind Mom to get you some P-E-P, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. When Editor Perry White assigned three consecutive out-of-town correspondents to cover what appeared to be a simple story of an unusual drought in Freeville, and three times his assignment was rejected with no explanation, he hit the ceiling. After listening briefly to his furious rantings, Lois Lane requested the assignment. Editor White refused, told her this was apparently a man's job, and ordered her to get hold of Kent, who was at that time visiting in the hospital with Jim Olson. But ignoring his protests, the girl reporter dashed out of the office after saying, Have no fears, Chief. I'll find out what's cooking in Freeville and bring you back a bang-up story. The following day, White received the first of a series of telegrams from Lois. This one, which he read with satisfaction, said, No rainfall here in 26 days. Extremely unusual situation for Freeville area at this time of year. Native farmers panicky. Reaction to drought from members of newly established veteran farm community is high. Facts should make sensational story. More later. Lois. Now, now we're getting someplace. But a short while later the same day, three more telegrams arrived from Lois in rapid succession, each one more cryptic and disturbing than the other. As our story continues now, Clark Kent has just rushed into White's office in response to an urgent summons from the editor. Listen. What's the matter, Chief? What's up? I don't know, Kent. I don't know. Uh, maybe you can tell me. I'll give me some idea of what's biting you, and maybe I can help straighten you out. And these telegrams from Lois. That's what's biting me. I noticed she wasn't in the office. Where is she? In Freeville. What's she doing there? Covering a story, of course. Well, what else would she be doing there? Wait a minute. There? Well, you don't have to snap my head off. I just Oh, asked I'm where... sorry, Kent. I'm sorry. I, I'm upset. I... I had a feeling I shouldn't let her go, but she talked me out of sending you... You did, eh? ...and dashed off before I could do anything to stop her. And now I'm afraid... Now, wait a uh, minute. Wait a minute, Chief. Let's start from the beginning so I can have some idea what this is all about. Well, it's these blasted telegrams, oh, you All right, forget them for the moment. What's going on in Freeville? No, oh, I wish I knew. Well, what story did she go out there to cover? Well, here's the story, Kent. A few days ago, I noticed a small item in our wire service reports about what appeared to be an unprecedented drought in the Freeville area. Well, what's so sensational about that? Uh, it's very unusual out there. Hasn't happened in heaven knows how many years, and particularly at this time of year. I see. And what makes it even more important is the new Veterans Farm Community Project that's just been established out there. Oh? Uh -huh. Vets, just set up on farmland, facing ruin in their very first seasonal operation. Uh oh, what a tough break. Yes, it sure is. Well, I wanted a feature on that, so I assigned a correspondent near Freeville to cover it for us. And the next day, he turned the job down. What? That's not all. I gave the assignment successively to two other out-of-town correspondents. Each of them accepted, and then, within 24 hours, they turned it down. But why? I don't know why. But Lois was here when I received the third turn down and hit the ceiling. Where was I? At the hospital, visiting with Jim. Oh. I told her to get you, but she took the bull by the horns and hightailed it out of here before I could stop her. That's just like her. Well, this morning I get a wire from her indicating that she's on the trail of a good yarn. Mm -hmm. And I thought everything was okay until a few hours after that, I was handed the first of these three wires, all of them arriving within two hours. Let me see them. Oh, here, here. See if you can make any sense out of them. 
There's the first one. Mm -hmm. Sent out at 11.15 this morning. Believed necessary to remain here longer than first anticipated. Lois, well, what's wrong with that? Nothing. Except I didn't want her to take time enough to write a book. All I wanted was a Sunday feature story. I know, but it takes time to collect Okay, facts. okay. I was willing to accept that. Until I read the second one. Second one? That's the one wired at 12.10? Yeah, that's right. Read it. Awaiting orders to leave Freeville at once. Now, what in blazes does that mean? <laughs> First, she asks for more time than she wants orders to leave. This is confusing. Uh, well, that's an understatement. But if that baffles you, read the third and last wire I've received so far. Go ahead. Go ahead. Let's see. This one was dispatched at 1.10 this afternoon. It's an hour after the second one. That's right. It says, urgent and imperative, you wire me to return home at once. Great Scott. Yeah, how do you like that, huh? Well, I don't get it. It doesn't sound like Lois at all. It certainly doesn't. And maybe the run-in she had with that Zara character affected her head. No, no, Chief. It sounds mighty like there's something very fishy going on in Freeville. I think I'd better hop out there and see what's going on. Now, you wait a minute, Kent. But, Chief, no, I'm just... not going to have my two best reporters out on one story that even, uh, well, even Jim Collins could cover. Jim Olson, you mean? Uh, Jimmy Olson, yes. Oh, well, what about I say? Lois? Collins? Yes, you said Collins. Oh, I'm so excited. Well, what about Lois? She may be in Well, trouble. she's a big girl and she can take care of herself. Besides, going out there was all her own idea, so she can work it out herself, and that's fine. Okay, you're the boss, but I can't help feeling a little worried about it. Oh, forget it, forget it. Now, get going on that Sunday feature story about phony steers and fortune tellers. <laughs> just saw Beanie bringing you this telegram. It's important, so I took it from him yeah, and brought it in. Say, maybe it's from Lois. Well, uh, it's date marked Freeville, but I don't see it. Yeah, let me have it. All right, here. Now, don't get excited, Chief. What do you mean? What do you mean? What's the, what's the to get excited about? Yeah, you'll see. Good, good Godfrey. Look what this says. Yeah, I know. You know. Oh, I, I mean, I, I can guess. No, no, you can't. Read it. All right. Warn you to order Lois Lane out of Freeville immediately. Signed, a friend. Great Caesar's ghost. Now, what in the world is going on in Freeville? I don't know, Chief, but I don't like the sound of it. Neither do I, but there's only one way to find out, and that's just what I'm going to do. Now, wait, Kent, wait. Where are you? I'm going to zip out to Freeville. You'll hear from me later. So long. Rushing from Perry White's office clock, Kent dashes into an empty storeroom where, behind the locked door, he quickly slips down to the red and blue costume of Superman. A moment later, he opens a window. Up, up, and away! Zooming up into the sky, the Man of Steel takes a bearing from the sun, then streaks westward with the speed of light toward Freeville. At the same moment, Lois Lane, unaware of her friend's concern for her safety, is in the telegraph office in Freeville, where she is unsuccessfully trying to draw out the taciturn telegrapher, the stooped elderly man with a white walrus mustache. Now, look here, Mr. Sykes. I'm sure if you wanted to, you could tell me a lot of interesting things about what's happening here in Freeville. Couldn't you? Don't know nothing. Oh, that's what you've been saying for the past ten minutes. But I could make it very much worth your while. I mean, I, I'm quite willing to pay for any information. Don't you... know nothing. Oh, well, I guess it's... Except impo- in one thing. Yes? Eastbound Express due to go through here about 3.45. So what? Could flag her down to stop for you. No, thanks. I'm here to get a story, and I'm sticking until I get it. Train's a streamliner. Get you back home fast. Sorry, not interested. You're making a mistake, miss. Why? What's behind all the feeling that's so high in this town? Why does everyone refuse to talk? Why do they change the subject every time I mention the drought? In short, what's going on here? Don't know nothing. Except taint healthy here. Why? Is there some fatal disease in Freeville? Maybe. Oh, rubbish. Just the same, I warn you. Taint healthy here. Especially for strangers. It's all got to say. Momentarily shaken by the aged telegrapher's ominous warning, Lois Lane stares at him open-mouthed. Then, turning on her heel, she strides out of his office and into the street. Will Superman arrive before Lois, disregarding the warning, walks into trouble? We'll know more in a moment when we return for the startling climax of today's story. So stand by. Yes, sir, the mothers of all the gang are sure being rushed for lots of Kellogg's Pet these days. Because, of course, it's such a sunny, golden-toasted whole wheat flake cereal. 
And because it's the prize package where you get those exciting comic buttons in Pep's brand new series. Real true-to-life pictures of your favorite funny sheet characters. A brand new series of 18 different buttons, like uh, the Little Moose and uh, Judy and Corky and four from Dick Tracy and, and, and Vitamin Flintheart and Superman, of course. And you know, it's no end of fun to compare notes with your friends and see who's got the most different buttons and to trade duplicates, too. And these pep comic buttons are so easy to get. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. All you do is to look for your comic button inside each package of Kellogg's Pep. And look for some mighty swell eating at breakfast, too. Because Pep is called the Sunshine Cereal. It's doggone sunny tasting and delicious. And it's good for you. It gives you vitamin B1, an energy vitamin, and that important sunshine vitamin D that mom knows that, that you need so much. So tell mom that you'll eat lots of P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. As our story continues, Superman has arrived in Freeville and, resuming the guise and garb of mild-mannered Clark Kent, talks with the desk clerk at the Central Hotel. Can you tell me what room Lois Lane is in? Why, uh, she's, uh... Lois Lane? Yes, the Metropolis Daily Planet reporter. Uh, oh, oh yeah, yes, yes, Miss Lois Lane. Why, uh, <clears throat> uh, Miss Lane's not in her room. Uh, that is, uh... Yes? Well, she's, uh, she left here. Left? Uh, th that's right, sir, about, uh, ten minutes ago. You mean she checked out? Uh, excuse me, sir, I'm very... Oh, but wait a minute, wait a minute. I wonder what's wrong with him. Taxi, mister. Well, that depends. Tell me, did you by any chance pick up a young lady from the Central Hotel? Well, uh, I don't know. She's dark, rather pretty, and... Oh, you mean that newspaper gal from Metropolis? That's right. Nope, said she'd rather walk this time. Oh, I see. You any idea where she went? Mentioned something about going down the telegraph office at the depot. Want me to take you there? Yes, sir. Good. Right. And make it snappy, please. Right. Hang on. <laughs> Say you haven't seen Miss Lane, Mr. Sykes? Not for over an hour. Well, that's odd. The cab driver said she started walking over here about ten minutes ago. Certainly she should have been here by this time. Might have stopped somewhere on the way. No, I'd have seen her. How's that, mister? Uh, oh, and never mind. The point is she isn't here, nor any place between here and the hotel, and she couldn't have just vanished into thin air. Could be. Could be. Are you kidding? Nope. Stranger things than that have happened in this town. Well, great Scott, what in the world is going on here? Completely baffled by the strange and mysterious attitudes of the Freeville natives, Clark Kent is stunned into momentary immobility. What is going on in Freeville? Why do the natives refuse to discuss the drought? And who is behind the mysterious telegrams suggesting that Lois Lane be recalled from her assignment? And what is even more important, has Superman arrived on the scene too late to keep the girl reporter from plunging into trouble? This is just the beginning of a new and thrilling story, gang, so stay with us. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow to learn of more startling angles uncovered by Superman. Don't forget, tomorrow, join us again at this same time on this same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pet. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, what do you have, gang? Kellogg's Corn Flakes, Rice Krispies, Pep, or one of your other favorite Kellogg cereals? Well, you can take your pick every morning at breakfast when Mom sets out Kellogg's Variety. That's the white, green, and red package with ten individual packages, each with one serving just for you. One day you'll choose a, a shredded cereal, next day one that's popped, next day a flaked cereal made from corn, wheat, or rice. Everyone's a treat because it's a favorite Kellogg cereal. It's a grand variety to make breakfast a picnic of fun because it's Kellogg's Variety. Remind Mom to get you Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Up, up.
up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P E P Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the Sunshine Serial presents the Adventures of Superman. <laughs> much to do with Lois Lane's disappearance and the strangely tense attitude of the people in that area. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, it's just like having pictures of your favorite friends collecting those nifty comic buttons in that new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pet. Because every single one of those 18 different buttons has a picture of a favorite comic strip character straight from the funny papers. Boy, will you be proud of your collection. And is it fun collecting these pep comic buttons? There's the exciting moment every time Mom opens a new package of pep to see which button's inside. And if it happens to be a duplicate, why, that's even more fun because then you can trade with your pals. Like uh, swapping the little moose for uh, Cindy, maybe, or, or say, uh, Chief Brandon for Superman. So hop to it, gang. Get busy on your collection. Ask Mom to get you a package or two of Kellogg's Pet. Yes, sir. That's all there is to it. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy these comic buttons. You just look for one inside your package of Pet. That's Kellogg's Pep, you know, the sunshine cereal loaded with sunny gold and toasted flavor. And Pep's got something else, too. It's got extra amounts of energy vitamin B1 and that important sunshine vitamin D. So there's lots of reasons why Mom's glad to get you some P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. When Lois Lane dashed over to cover what appeared to be a routine on-the-scene investigation for a story of an unusual drought in the Freeville area, she found herself with more than she had bargained for. And soon after arriving at Freeville, center of the newly established veteran farm community project, she was convinced that there was more going on than just an unusual dry spell. Meanwhile, in Metropolis, Editor Perry White and Clark Kent were worried about a series of three mysteriously cryptic telegrams seemingly sent by Lois. But then they became really alarmed at the receipt of a fourth message which said, Warn you, order Lois Lane to quit Freeville at once or suffer consequences. Signed, a friend. Assuming his identity of Superman, Clark Kent rocketed out to Freeville, where he discovered that Lois was last seen going toward the telegraph office. Again in his guise of the mild-mannered reporter, Kent questioned Abner Sykes, the aged telegrapher, who said, Sorry, ain't seen Miss Lane for over an hour. No one seems to have seen her after she left the hotel on her way here. Doesn't that seem odd? Nope. What do you mean? She couldn't have vanished. Could be. Could be. Are you kidding? Nope. All kinds of strange things happen in this town. Now, look here, Mr. Sykes. Just what do you mean by that? Nothing, maybe. Sometimes I just talk too much. Now, this is one time you're not talking enough. I've got a hunch Miss Lane's in some kind of trouble, possibly something that even endangers her life. Maybe. Well, then, if you know something, I should know to help her. For the love of heaven, tell me what it is. Don't know nothing, I told you. You're just not talking, you mean. Healthier that way. Look, what's going on here in Freeville? What's everyone so frightened of? Don't know, mister. Okay, okay, we'll skip that for a minute. Just tell me this. Who sent the telegrams, signed Lois Lane, asking Perry White of the Metropolis Daily Planet to order her home? Who signed them? They, they were signed, Lois Lane. And right, she but... must have sent them. Not on your life. That's not like Lois, or someone else must have done it. Now think, who else sent wires to Perry White at the Daily Planet in Metropolis? Don't know. Send lots of messages. Can't expect to remember all of them. Uh, especially when it's more convenient to forget, huh? Hmm. I don't suppose you'd remember who sent the wire warning Perry White to take Miss Lane out of Freeville and signed it a friend, would you? Was a friend, maybe. Like who, for instance? Me. You sent that telegram? Yep. Why? She wouldn't pay no attention to my warning to get out of Freeville. Well, why did you want her to leave? Liked her. That's why. Oh. Didn't want to see her get mixed up with... With what? Don't know what exactly. Oh, what's going on, Mr. Sykes? Who'd want to harm Miss Lane? Don't know. Oh, this is driving me batty and getting me nowhere fast. Look, isn't there someone else in this crazy town I could talk to and get better sense out of? Might try Fred Leonard. Who's he? 
Fred runs the Freeville Gazette. The Gazette? Of course. I should have thought of that myself. A newspaper man will certainly want to help. Fred's more than a newspaper man, mister. Huh? What do you mean? Nothing. Sometimes I just talk too much. Oh, this is where I came in. Look, where can I find Fred Leonard now? At the Gazette office. Two blocks north, turn left. Okay, Mr. Sykes, and thanks for nothing. That's the whole story so far, Mr. Leonard, and frankly, I'm worried. Well, I wouldn't worry too much if I were you, Mr. Kent. How can I help it when Miss Lane seems to have disappeared and I can't seem to find out how or why or when? We'll find her, never you fear. After all, Freeville's not big enough to get lost in, you know. The point is, I don't think she's simply lost. Now, really, Mr. Kent, what else could have happened to her? I don't know, but I have a feeling it's something pretty serious. Oh? Why do you say that? Because there's something mighty peculiar going on here in Freeville. People look frightened. They they act furtive. They refuse to talk. Well, that's only because we're all worried about the drought, I guess. Well, maybe. After all, I'm sure you can appreciate the importance of rain in a farm community such as ours. Certainly I can, but... Well, then? But I feel there's something that goes deeper than that. A peculiar unrest, a tension among the veterans who've been settled on the government farm project. Oh, come now, Mr. Kent. Aren't you just exercising a vivid, creative imagination? Thanks for the compliment, Mr. Leonard. But I can't help wondering why that telegrapher, old Abner Sykes, wanted Lois to leave Freeville so badly that he resorted to sending us warning telegrams. Well, to understand that, you ought to know more about poor old Abner. Like what? Well, I... I don't like to say this, Mr. Kent. Matter of fact, I don't know how to tell you, but, um... Yes? Well, old Abner's a very lovable and harmless man who's been the telegrapher in this town for nearly 40 years. Afraid I don't follow you. Uh, it's just that, well, he he sort of has a reputation around town for what's politely referred to as uh, imagining things. You see? Oh? Yes. And so if I were you, I wouldn't put much stock in what the old man says. But he hasn't imagined Miss Lane's disappearance. That must be prima facie even to you. All right, George. Why didn't I think of this before? Think of what? My one and only roving reporter, Steve Lush, always knows the whereabouts of everyone in town, natives as well as strangers. Now, I bet if I locate him, he'd give us a line on Miss Lane that would remove all the mystery of her so-called disappearance. Where can you reach him? Well, let's see. Chances are he's at the... Uh, hello, Madge. Look, see if you can locate Steve Larson for me, will you? Uh, try the Hotel Central. Yeah, I'll hang on. Two to one, your troubles are over right now, Ken. I certainly hope so, at least where Miss Lane's concerned. <laughs> what else have you got to worry about? I still want to get at the bottom of this drought situation here. Nothing to it, just a quirk of... Na uh, hello, that you, Steve? Mr. Clark Kent of the Metropolis Daily Planet's over here at the office. He's trying to locate that other planet reporter, Lois Lane, who's... Yeah. Yeah, that's the one. Hey, see you this afternoon any time? That's so. When? Uh-huh. Okay, Steve, thanks. Got anything new to report? I see. No, no, no need to come in yet. Okay, so long. Well, did he have well, any... Well, your troubles are over, Mr. Kent. And like I told you, there was nothing to worry about. Larson knows where Lois is? Yeah, she's on the eastbound limited en route to Metropolis. What? Uh-huh. Added flag for a stop and got on board at 3.45 this afternoon. Satisfied? No, not quite. But look here. There's still something fishy going on. Why? Because Lois Lane would never leave until she got her story. She did get her story, Ken. What do you mean? She found out there's no story here except that we're suffering an unprecedented drought, so she packed up and left. Uh-uh. No, Mr. Leonard, I won't buy that. Because Lois would know as surely as I do that there's something more than that going on in Freeville. Are you insinuating Please that... don't misunderstand. I'm insinuating nothing. Now, you say she boarded the train at 3.45? That's right. Well, it's 4.10 now. I'd better hurry. Hey, wait, where are you going? To see if Lois Lane is on that train. But how are you going to do that? You'd be surprised. So long. I'll see you again. Soon. <laughs> Leaving the Freeville Gazette's editor, Clark Kent ducks around behind the one-story newspaper building. There, out of sight, he changes swiftly to the colorful garb of Superman. And a moment later, he leaps into the air. Up! Up! And away! <laughs> Speaking to the railroad station, the man of steel veers sharply. Then, following the gleaming double ribbon of steel rails, rockets eastward in pursuit of the flyer. Will he find Lois Lane aboard? We'll know more in a moment when we return for the exciting climax of today's story. So, stand by. 
Say, I happened to pass the schoolyard the other day when uh, some of the fellows and girls were swapping duplicate comic buttons. You know, from the new series that now come in packages of Kellogg's Pet. Well, the conversations they were carrying on would sound mighty funny to anybody who didn't know about those swell pet comic buttons. Like uh, one fellow would say, trade you Goofy for Pat Patton. And then another would come in and say, uh, I'll take that, and I have two Superman. Uh, who wants to trade? And then another would say, uh, uh, what do you offer for the little moose? Well, now, maybe that sounds like a, well, a good deal of double talk to you, but it means a lot to you, fellows and girls who are collecting those exciting pet comic buttons. Sure, because you're all mighty anxious to collect all 18 buttons in this new series. And these pet comic buttons are so easy to get. You don't have to send in a single penny, not even a box stop. Fact is, you can't buy them anywhere. But every time Mom opens a new package of Kellogg's Pep, there's your comic button inside, and it's your exclusive prize. And Pep's on the exclusive side, too, when it comes to good eating. You can't find another dish with that sunny, golden toasted flavor. So remember, gang, ask Mom to get you lots of P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. A moment ago, Clark Kent was informed by Fred Leonard, editor and publisher of the Freeville Gazette, that Lois Lane boarded the eastbound flyer for Metropolis at 345. Now, 30 minutes later, as Superman, he has overtaken the past express train, and hovering over it, his X-ray vision pierces each passenger car as he searches for the girl reporter. Don't see Lois anywhere on this train. Just to give Leonard the benefit of any doubt, I'll double-check by asking the conductor. Down to the observation platform. Go! You're sure you have no Lois Lane on this train, conductor? I have no one by that name, but a young lady did get aboard at Breville. Oh? Only one, too. Had his flag to stop for. I see. Well, could you help me locate her? Why, yeah, sure. She went right into the diner. Chances are she's still there. Come on, follow me. There she is, young fellow. Lady with a green hat, third table on your right. I see. That the gal you're looking for? No, that's not Lois Lane. Sorry. Your friend just isn't on this train, I guess. Not really surprised, but momentarily shocked nonetheless. Clark Kent realizes more fully than ever now that the mysterious goings-on in Freeville are responsible for Lois Lane's disappearance. And for the moment, even Superman feels helpless to find her. What has happened to the girl reporter? And what is behind the mystery that hangs like a heavy pall over Freeville? Tomorrow's episode is tense with drama and excitement, so don't miss a minute of it. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, it's more fun than a picnic gang to open up your own individual book and eat right out of the box. That's the famous Kell Bowl Pack in Kellogg's Variety. It saves washing dishes for Mom, and she likes Kellogg's Variety because it's got those nutritious Kellogg's cereals that are so good for you. Ten individual packages in all, different Kellogg's cereals like Pep, Rice Krispies, Corn Flakes, in a handy white, green, and red package. Just be sure it's Kellogg's, Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. 
Kellogg's Pep, the Sunshine Cereal, presents The Adventures of Superman. <laughs> Today, Clark Kent, anxious and worried about the mystery of Lois Lane's whereabouts, traces a last certain possibility on a tip from the Freeville Gazette's editor. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, one of the girls in the gang told me just the other day that she can't decide which is the most fun, adding a new comic button to her collection when Mom opens a new package of Kellogg's Pep or getting a duplicate so that she can trade with her friends for a different button. Well, either way, of course, you're getting a new button for your collection, and it's bound to be a beauty. Every single one of these 18 buttons in the new series is colorful and it's bright and it's nifty looking. Like that uh, picture of Brenda Starr with her long, soft red hair. Or Spud with his red suspenders and and that battered old top hat. Or Superman himself, complete to flying red cape and Superman insignia. What's more, it's easy as anything to collect these pet comic buttons. You don't have to send in any money, not even a box top. And you can't buy them anywhere, but you'll find a comic button in every package of Kellogg's Pep you open. And you'll find yourself a load of good eating in a package of Pep, too. A bowl of these crisp toasted whole wheat flakes is just the thing to wake up your appetite on a chilly morning. Pep is sunny and golden toasted, rich in a full wheat flavor that's doggone satisfying. So get Hep to Kellogg's Pep. Ask Mom to get you plenty of P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. Now, the adventures of Superman. After three local correspondents had mysteriously refused to cover what appeared to be a routine story of a dry spell in the Freeville area, Lois Lane, reporter for the Metropolis Daily Planet, flew to the scene. The next day, a telegram signed a friend, urging Editor White to order Lois home, sent Clark Kent as Superman streaking 2,000 miles to Freeville, where he discovered that Lois had disappeared. Old Abner Sykes, the local telegrapher, admitted sending the telegram, but refused to say any more. He denied knowing what had happened to the girl reporter, but suggested that Kent call on Fred Leonard, publisher and editor of the local newspaper. Leonard made a phone call, then told Kent that Lois was on a train bound for Metropolis. As Superman, Kent overtook the train, but Lois was not aboard. As we continue now, he has rocketed back to Freeville, where, once more in the guise and garb of Clark Kent, he faces Fred Leonard in the latter's office. Listen. Give me a bump steer, Mr. Leonard. For... What? What do you mean? Miss Lane isn't on the eastbound flyer. She isn't? No. Nope. What's more, she was not on it when it left Freeville this afternoon. But but she must have been, Mr. Kent. I tell you, she wasn't and isn't. I just left the conductor of the train, and he told you me... You just that... left the conductor? What? What are you talking about? Oh, uh, well, I, I mean, I just talked to him. He How said could that... you talk to him? The flyer left here at 345. No, but... must be more than 50 miles away Well, by never now. mind how I manage. The point is, I talked to him. He assures me that Miss Lane did not board the train in Freeville. Now, why did you tell me she did? Why, why, because Steve Larson, my, my reporter, he told me so. He did, eh? Yes, you were right here when I called him a few minutes before. You heard me. He ask. told you Miss Lane was on the eastbound flyer? That's right. I can't understand this. Steve usually knows what he's talking about. I don't understand it either yet, but I will before I leave here. Any idea where Steve Larson is now, Mr. Leonard? Why, let's see. It's just 4.30. He usually drops into the lunch wagon about this time. Lunch wagon? Where's that? Oh, just down the street. Most of us drop in there for coffee and a little gossip along about this time. Come on, I'll go over there with you. Fine. Let's go, Mr. Leonard. Just call me Steve. Everybody does. Okay, Steve. What made you say Miss Lane left here on the flyer? Because she did. Wait a minute. That's not true. Why? You see, Steve, Kent talked to the conductor on the flyer by radio telephone, I guess. And the conductor said Miss Lane didn't board the train here in Freeville. Oh, that's funny. She told me herself she was taking that train out of here at 345. Miss Lane told you that? Sure, on the phone. When was this? Let's see. 
It's been around 3.30 this afternoon. How did you happen to contact her? Well, I went over to the hotel around noon when I heard she was in town because, well, Fred and I thought an interview with a big city reporter might make a nice little story. Right, Fred? Right. Did you talk with her then? No, oh, Miss Lane wasn't there, so I left a message asking her to call me when she got in. Called about 3.30. Said she was sorry she couldn't see me, but she just about had time to catch 345. That's about the time the flyer goes through here, Kent. Uh-huh. Go on, Steve. Well, that's all. Fred here called me up a little while ago and said you were looking for Miss Lane. I said to tell you she was on the train on account of that's what she told me. That's strange. It sure is. Look, Kent. You sure she isn't on that train? Positive. Are you sure it was Miss Lane you spoke to? Well, the girl I talked to said she was Miss Lane. Of course... Never talked to her before. That may not have been Lois. Who else could it be? Exactly. What are you driving at, Kent? Simply that someone else may have called Steve and said she was Miss Lane in order to confuse us in the time of her disappearance. Disappearance? You mean... Yeah, Miss Lane seems to have disappeared, Steve. And this little bird... Go on. She didn't board the flyer at 3.45 today. She must be around down someplace. No, she's not in Freeville. What's more, she isn't anywhere within 25 miles of Freeman. What? How do you know that, Kent? Just take my word. But how I... can you know? You've only been here an hour or so. Look, Mr. Leonard, all I can tell you is I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> this big city reporters must carry a set of wings, eh, Fred? They sure must. Look, gentlemen, let's not waste time making jokes. Who represents the law in this town? Well, Sheriff Cleary, but he's over to the state capitol this weekend. Uh oh Well, then we'll have to get along without him. Will you two help me find Miss Lane? You bet. Anything we can do for a fellow newspaper man, Kent? Thanks. Well, this is the premise I'm working on. There's something very strange going on around here, and I think Miss Lane's disappearance is tied up with us. Something strange? What do you mean? Before Miss Lane came here, three local correspondents turned down a simple assignment to cover the drought you're suffering here. Now, they I think did, that Miss... Eh? Yes. You say uh, three correspondents turned down that assignment. That's right. Do you know anything about that? Not a thing. It's a funny one, isn't it, Fred? It sure is. But it gives me an idea. What's that? Miss Lane might have stumbled onto another story out here. Another story? Yep. And if she did, it might account for her disappearance. Uh-oh. Look, Mr. Leonard, if you know anything... I know quite a bit, Kent. But I don't want to talk about it here. Too many people around. Oh? I'll tell you what. Back in my office with me. I might be able to help you find Miss Lane. See you later, Steve. Right. <laughs> Suppose you tell me everything you know that might help us find Miss Lane. Okay, Kent. You're telling me about those three correspondents who turned down the assignment gave me an idea. And here it is. What? I suppose you've heard of the Veterans Farm Project in this county, haven't you? You mean the veteran homesteaders? Yep. Mm -hmm. 300 war veterans drawn by lot were given anywhere from 60 to 150 acres of reclaimed land in this county. Yes, I've heard of that, and it's a fine thing. But what's it got to do with Miss Lane? Just this. We've been having a little trouble with those veterans, Kent. At least with some of them. Really? What kind of trouble? Well, we've been having a bit of a dry spell, as you know. Except for a little fiddle and sprinkle now and then. We haven't had any rain for 29, no, 30 days now. I know, but... Now, please let me finish. I'm sorry. Now, if this drought keeps up much longer, the veterans' first crops will die on the ground. And that means most of the veterans will be ruined, even before they ever get a chance to get started. That would be a shame. And I don't want you to think I'm unsympathetic, Mr. Leonard, but my first problem is to find Miss Lane. I'm She's getting missing. to Miss Lane. But I've got to give you the rest of this first, much as I hate to. I'm sorry. Incidentally, I'm telling you this in strict confidence, Kent. I respect your confidence. Go ahead. Okay. Well, as I said, most of these homesteading veterans are facing ruin. And, well, some of them, the hotter heads among them, haven't been able to take it. What do you mean? Well, to put it frankly, and mind you, this isn't confidence, Kent. I understand. These uh, hotheads, we'll say, have been pillaging and robbing the native farmers and businessmen of the community. What? That's right. Farm equipment and livestock have been stolen. Village stores have been broken and entered. There even been two cases where a farmer and a storekeeper in Freeville were badly beaten when they attempted to protect their property. Wait, Scott, you mean to say the men who committed these acts of veterans? I sure hate to say so. Well, are you sure they are? Practically certain. Now, we've tried to ignore it. Ignore it? it. Yes, because we know what the veterans are up against. And a lot of us around here had boys in the war, too. We know what they went through and that the war, well, upset their nerves temporarily. So we've just tried to sit tight, realizing their futures are at stake in their respective farms, and open the reins and come and make everything all right. I see. I've even played these acts down in my paper, saying the culprits couldn't be identified. Although we're pretty sure who they are. That's very decent of you, Mr. Leonard, and I want to talk to you some more, some more about it. But again, I ask just what has all this to do with the disappearance of Miss Lane? You mean you don't see, Ken? Oh, no, frankly, I don't. Why, it's as plain as the nose on your face. First... 
three correspondents refused to cover the story of the drought for your fate. Well, yes, and but... And then Miss Lane, who's probably got more spunk than those other correspondents, comes on here and she disappears. Now do you get it? Puzzled, Clark Kent shakes his head. What does Fred Leonard mean? We'll return in a moment to find out, so stand by. Say, gang, if Mom's going shopping tomorrow for her weekend groceries, you better remind her to get you a package or two of Kellogg's Pep. Because you like to eat it for breakfast, of course, and also because you'll be getting another comic button for your collection. Maybe one of those in the new series that you haven't found yet. You know, like maybe, say, a Test True Heart or, or Pat Patton or Superman himself. Or maybe it'll be a duplicate so that you can have even more fun swapping with your pals. Whichever way it is, you'll have a new bright-colored pet comic button to wear on your jacket or your dress or cap. A real eye-catcher, believe me. And you know, the best part is these pet comic buttons are so easy to get. You don't send in a single penny, not even a box stop, and you can't buy them anywhere. But inside every package of Kellogg's Pep you open, there's your exclusive prize. And inside every package of Pep, there's a whale of a lot of good eating for you, too. Bowls of crisp golden toasted whole wheat flakes that sure do hit the spot for breakfast and for snacks, too. Pep is called the Sunshine Cereal. It's famous for sunny golden flavor that keeps your spoon coming right back for more and more. So remind Mom right now to get you some P-E-P, the Sunshine Cereal, Kellogg's Pep. A moment ago in the small editorial office of the Freeville Gazette, Fred Leonard, editor, told Kent that Lois's disappearance is tied up with the deep unrest among local veteran homesteaders. Puzzled. Kent shakes his head and says, Maybe I'm stupid, Mr. Leonard, but I don't get it. You don't? No, I can't see how trouble in the Veterans Farm Project can have anything to do with our correspondence quitting and Miss Lane's disappearance. Now look, if a big newspaper like the Metropolis Daily Planet published the stories of what's going on down here, how long do you think it would take the Veterans Administration and Congress to take steps against our vet homesteaders? Oh, I think I get it now. Well, Sure. Probably take their land away from them. Of course, and you think Miss Lane learned about what was going on here and is being held by the veterans to prevent her from wiring the stories to the Daily Planet. Well, I certainly hate to think but so. But you do think so. Well, yes. Oh, I can't believe it. I read about this project and about the one in Oregon, and I understand that the, the veterans are very carefully screened before they can apply for homesteads. They must have excellent characters and reputations. And... That's true. But hungry and desperate men... Particularly those who've been through a war, Kent, can easily be driven to do desperate things. Yes, I see what you mean. And if you're right, Miss Lane is in serious danger because she won't back down under threats. She'll defy them. I've got to get right out to the Veterans Project. Now, wait, Kent. I'll drive you out there. Good. Let's go. Rushing out of the one-story Freeville Gazette building, Clark Kent steps into the country editor's car and is on his way to the Veterans Farm Project area. The first step in what he hopes will be a successful search for Lois Lane. But the situation is not as simple as Fred Leonard would have Kent believe. And complications are now in motion that will make things difficult even for Superman. There's a startling surprise in tomorrow's exciting episode, so don't miss it. Yes, be sure to tune in again tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pet. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is the copywriter teacher appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at this same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, just think of the circus of fun you can have when Mom sets Kellogg's variety out on the table at breakfast. There's the business of picking out your own favorite Kellogg's cereal from this handy white, green, and red package with the ten individual packages. You'll take Kellogg's Corn Flakes or Pep or Rice Krispies or one of your other Kellogg favorites, and you'll have your own private box of cereal to open yourself. Then for sister, there's the cutout doll on the bottom of the tray to dress up and to play all sorts of games with. Don't miss out. Ask Mom to get you Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. 
P E P Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the Sunshine Cereal, presents The Adventures of Superman. <laughs> Today, though Superman despairingly faces a blank wall in his search for Lois Lane, he is little prepared for the shock dealt by the girl reporter herself. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. Say, I know a young fellow who's mighty handy with a pencil and crayons. And you should see the drawings he's made, copies of the pictures of funny paper characters on those comic buttons in that new series Kellogg's Pep is putting out. So every time he gets a new comic button, why, he has a new picture to draw. Now, I thought that maybe you'd like to try it, too. You can color them bright and red and, and black and blue and yellow, just like the Pep comic buttons. And those pictures are really easy to copy because the outlines are clear and sharp and the details are all there, like the picture of uh, Brenda Starr, for instance, or Tess Trueheart, or Superman himself. Now, if you don't want to let your friends get ahead of you, you better get busy. All you do is to ask Mom to get you some Kellogg's Pep. That's right. You don't have to send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't find these comic buttons anywhere. But there's one, a prize for you, in every package of Pep you open. And you'll go for Pep for another reason, too. Because it just plain tastes delicious. Pep is called the Sunshine Cereal. Sure, it's loaded with sunny, golden toasted flavor. A deep-down goodness that makes every bite taste better than the last. So ask Mom to keep you stocked up with P-E-P, the Sunshine Cereal, Kellogg's Pep. <laughs> Now, the adventures of Superman. When three correspondents mysteriously refused to cover a simple story of a drought in the Freeville area, Lois Lane, reporter for the Metropolis Daily Planet, flew to the scene and disappeared. As Superman, Clark Kent streaked 2,000 miles to Freeville, where Fred Leonard, editor and publisher of the little local paper, told him of homesteading war veterans who, facing ruin because of the drought, were committing acts of burglary and vandalism. Leonard hinted that Lois might have stumbled onto these stories and been seized by the veterans in order to prevent her from reporting them to the Daily Planet. As we continue now, Kent and Leonard have arrived at one of the veteran farm projects 20 miles from Freeville. They are approaching a husky, black-haired young man who is feeding a flock of chickens. Listen. That fellow feeding the chickens is Jerry Barton. He was an Air Force captain during the war, and he's now the head of the veterans' post out here, Kent. Well, he's the man I want to see, Mr. Leonard. These fellows are responsible for Miss Lane's disappearance, as you think. Uh, hold it. Hello, Barton. What do you want, Leonard? Uh, Barton, I want you to meet Clark Kent. He's a reporter for the Metropolis Daily Planet. How do you do? You a friend of this so-called newspaper editor, Mr. Kent? Why, he is. Uh, of course he is. Then excuse me for not shaking hands. Any friend of Fred Leonard's is no friend of mine. So state your business and then get off of my land. <laughs> That's being painfully blunt. Those are my sentiments. People around here will get just as much hospitality as they showed me and the other veterans on this project when we first came here. And that was just exactly zero. So I'm telling you again, state your business now, and... Look, then... you've got the wrong idea about the people of Freeville, Barton. We've done everything we could to help you and make you welcome. Are you kidding? Now, wait a minute, I no, just... No, want... I'm absolutely sincere. I know that this drought and what this drought means to you fellas, but it isn't our fault, you know. I wouldn't even swear to that. Be careful, Barton. Now, listen, please, both of you. I'm not afraid of you, Leonard. And I'm not what you and your dirty gang call a foreigner. So I can tell you exactly what I think. Which is what I aim to do right now. Please, Mr. Barton, let's try to get You stay out of this, Kent. Look here, I want to find I've been waiting for a chance to tell Mr. Editor Man here just what I think of him. And nobody's going to stop me now. I warn you, Barton, don't say anything you'll be sorry for. Don't worry, mister. Nobody could say anything he'd be sorry for to a pole cat like you. Who are you? Easy, I Mr. said Paul cat and I made it. Who else would try to keep a bunch of veterans, men who'd fought for their country and for you, from settling down on the land here and trying to make a living? I didn't try to stop you. I simply pointed out in my paper... And to the legislature. Yes, and to the legislature, too. That this land wasn't suitable for intensive farming. That's a lot of baloney, and you know Look, it. if you fellas don't stop this, I'm... Now, gonna... wait, Kent. Everyone knows this is reclaimed land and some of the best in the country. But we know that you and the Honorable Uncle Ed Clayton didn't want us here. Because you knew you couldn't bully us or honeysuckle us into voting the way you want us to. 
And particularly at this time because there's a special election coming up for Senate. What's that? That's a lie. And you didn't want us here because some of my buddies part their hair different from you natives. Some of us go to a different church. Or our skin happens to be a different color. That's so you... a serious accusation, yes, Mr. Barton. Yes, what's more, it's not true. The heck it isn't. What's more, you and your boss, the Honorable Uncle Ed, have got the backwoods natives stole in the poisonous belief that anyone who goes to a different church or whose skin is a different color is a foreigner. And so he's an enemy. I say that's a lie, and I Wait a minute, Mr. Leonard. Wait a minute. Calm down, both of you, and be sensible. You know this kind of argument never gets you anywhere. Kent, I, uh, I think we'd better be going. It's obvious we won't get anywhere with this man. Just a moment. Came out here for a reason, and I don't intend to lose any more time. Barton? Yes? A fellow reporter for the Daily Planet, a girl named Lois Lane, disappeared in Freeville a few hours ago. Disappeared? That's right. You know anything about it? Me? Shucks, no. Why should I? Well, let's put it this way. I, uh, I've heard of certain acts of vandalism committed by the veterans on this project. Oh. Oh, now I... And it's occurred to... Well, it occurred to me that if a big paper like the Daily Planet published the stories, it might make things rather, well, uncomfortable for you fellows. It could even mean the end of your homestead rights, you know. Go on, Mr. King. What are you driving at? Just this, Barton. If Miss Lane ran across those stories and prepared to publish them, some veterans might just see fit to try to prevent her. Why, of all the... Look, did Fred Leonard here put that idea in your head? Well... Don't try to get out of it. I know he did. I've heard these stories going around about fellas from this project stealing and pillaging and all that rot. Is it rot, Barton? It is, and you know it's rot. If it wasn't, why didn't you have the sheriff arrest the man you accused? Well, because we realized how hard-pressed you chaps were, and that the culprits were, well, just hotheads. You mean foreigners, don't you? I said hotheads. We didn't want to condemn all of you because a few irresponsible... Oh, go on. You would have jumped at a chance to arrest one of us, but you knew we were innocent. This is just another plan of yours to discredit us. This time, by George, you've gone too far. Easy, you look Barton. here, Barton. I've had enough of this. Come on, Mr. Leonard. Let's go. Mr. Barton, I'll be back to see you later, after I've found Miss Lane. I want to talk with you. I, uh, I'm really sorry for what happened, Kent. Forget it. Never should have lost my temper with that poor chap. After all, the drought is ruining him, so well... naturally his nerves are affected. I assure you, he doesn't know what he's saying. On the contrary, I thought he was well aware of what he was saying. No, look here, Kent. You, you don't mean you believe all that, that balded ash about me and Uncle Ed Clayton. Well, never mind that now or Uncle Ed either. I've got to find Miss Lane. Oh, of course. But I'm afraid you won't be able to get Barton's cooperation the state he's in. I don't need his cooperation at the moment. Look, Mr. Leonard, you drive your car down the road a mile or so, will you, and wait for me. There's something I want to do alone. Oh, what's that, man? Oh, nothing much. It's just a little idea I want to work out. Oh, very well, Kent. I'll be waiting for you. <laughs> Leaving Fred Leonard, Clark Kent walks across the road, enters a patch of woods where he swiftly resumes his true identity of Superman. And then, up, up, and away! Leaping up from the woods, Superman hovers first over Jerry Barton's farm, his keen eyes searching every inch of terrain at buildings below him. Then, failing to see any sign of Lois Lane, he streaks away, ranging in great sweeps and circles above the other farms of the homesteading war veterans. Dry, sun-parched acres now, on which haggard-faced men stand with faces upturned to the skies from which no rain descends. Finally, admitting defeat, Superman rockets back to the patch of woods, resumes his guise and garb of Clark Kent, and rejoins the waiting Fred Leonard in his car. Okay, Mr. Leonard, let's go. Right. How'd your idea work out? Oh, fair enough. Good. You want to start searching the veterans' barns, Kent? No, thanks. I've already done that. You what? Hmm? Oh, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm quite sure Miss Lane isn't anywhere around here. Oh, how can you be sure? I think Skip that... it, will you? Let's get back to town, if you don't mind, please. Oh, whatever you say. Thanks. You want to have another talk with that telegrapher, Abner Sykes? You're wasting your time, Kent. I told you about old Abner. He, well, he's a fine old chap, but, well, he always thinks people are in danger around here. Why, he Maybe you're right. What'd you say, Kent? Oh, nothing, nothing, Mr. Leonard. Just drop me at the telegraph office, if you will. Well, if you insist. But I still say you're wasting your time. Sykes, I intend to stay here until I find Miss Lane. You won't find her, young feller. But I must. I can't just ignore Take the fact Take my that advice. You... Grab the next train back to Metropolis. Ridiculous. There must be some way of Better finding still, out. Better still, 
Drive over to Rollins and board the eastbound plane. Get you way faster. Nothing doing, Mr. Sykes. As I said before, I'm not leaving here until I find Miss Lane. And then, not until I find out what's going on around here. Hmm. Well, maybe this will change your mind. What's that? Telegram just coming in for you. No use to paste it up. Read it on the tape. Let's see. Uh Uh-oh. Get out of Freeville at once, before it's too late. Signed, a friend. You see what I mean? Shocked and puzzled, Clark Kent stares at the words on the telegraph tape. The same threatening words used to warn Lois Lane to leave Freeville before she disappeared. What will happen now? We'll be back in a moment for the startling climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, you fellows and girls know what a kick you'd get out of meeting up with one of your friends unexpectedly. Well, there's the same sort of thrill for you when Mom opens a new package of Kellogg's Pet. First off, you're glad that there's more of that super delicious cereal to eat and... When you get one of those exciting comic buttons in that pet package, why, you're meeting up with an old funny sheet friend. Yes, sir, every single one of those comic strip characters is someone that you have known in the funny papers. For instance, there's uh, there's Brenda Starr, you remember her? And Cindy and Spud from Winning Winkle. And Goofy and Beezy from Harold Teen. And uh, Judy and Corky. And Superman, of course. Eighteen in all. And each one a humdinger for looks. So, how's about asking Mom, right now, to get some more Kellogg's Pet? That's how easy it is to get these comic buttons. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere, but you just look inside the pet package for your prize. Get a glimpse of those golden toasted whole wheat flakes, too, and your appetite will sit right up and take notice right away. Pet looks so crisp and inviting, and, and it tastes so doggone delicious that, well, you practically won't be able to resist it. So just make sure that Mom gets P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pet. In the little telegraph office operated by Abner Sykes in Freeville, Clark Kent has just received a telegram warning him to leave town at once. The aged telegrapher shakes his head and mutters, See what I mean, Mr. Kent? Yes. Now will you go back to Metropolis? Certainly not. Let's see, this telegram was sent from Rawlings. Where's that? About 30 miles south. 30 miles south. Well, that's where I'm going, because whoever sent this telegram probably knows where Miss Lane is and... Oh, gee, Jerusalem, look who's coming in. Great Scott. Lois. Lois, what's the matter? Quick, catch her, Mr. Kent. She's keeling over. Startled, Clark Kent springs forward as Lois Lane... Her face white, her eyes set in a glassy stare, moans, falls into his arms, unconscious. What has happened to the girl reporter? What is the answer to the strange goings-on in the sun-parched, drought-afflicted area of Freeville? Monday's episode is tense and exciting, gang, so don't miss a minute of it. Be sure to tune in again Monday. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, breakfast is a picnic all year round when there's Kellogg's variety on the table. That's the white, green, and red Kellogg package with ten individual packages, each one a serve-yourself portion of one of your favorite Kellogg cereals. Different Kellogg cereals to choose from, and whatever you pick, you know it'll be crisp and fresh and good because it's Kellogg's. One day you'll want Kellogg's Pep, the next Rice Krispies, then Corn Flakes, and on down the line. Just one thing, gang. Make sure that Mom gets Kellogg's. Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us on Monday for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look! 
Up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P E P Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the Sunshine Cereal presents the Adventures of Superman. <laughs> Today, Clark Kent and Lois Lane determined to fight the unknown dangerous elements that thwart their progress, little realizing the dire menace hanging over anyone who helps them. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, it'd be a tough job to locate a fellow or girl who doesn't get a kick out of the funny papers. So it's no wonder those nifty comic buttons in that new series Kellogg's Pep is putting out make such a big hit. Because every single character on every single one of those 18 different buttons is straight from the comic strips. Take Vitamin Flintheart, for instance. Why, you'd know him anytime with his slouch hat and his fuzzy fur coat. And Chief Brandon, why, he looks so real he could speak. Of course, Superman's an old favorite with his bright blue jersey and his Superman insignia. And remember, these pep comic buttons are done up in full color. Sure, they show up like anything when you wear them pinned on your jacket or your dresser cap. So hop to it, gang. Ask Mom to get you another box or two of Kellogg's Pep. That's the only way you can get these comic buttons, you know. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere, but you get this really terrific prize, plus a catchy sunny dish for breakfast in every package of that sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. Yes, sir, Pep's a prize when it comes to good eating, all right. So golden, toasted, and delicious that, well, you practically can't resist it. So ask Mom for lots of P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. <laughs> Now, the adventures of Superman. While covering a routine story of a drought in the farming area of Freeville, Lois Lane, reporter for the Metropolis Daily Planet, mysteriously disappeared. Fred Leonard, editor and publisher of the little local paper, told Clark Kent that a group of war veterans who had taken homesteads nearby and who were facing ruin because of the drought had been robbing and pillaging. And Leonard hinted that the veterans might have seized Lois to prevent her from wiring the stories of their vandalism to the Daily Planet. As Superman, Kent searched the farms of the veterans, and finding nothing, returned to Freeville, where he questioned Abner Sykes, the elderly telegrapher, whom he suspected of knowing more than he would admit. As they were talking, the door of the little telegraph office opened, and Lois staggered in, falling in a dead faint in Kent's arms. As we continue now, Kent has placed her on a chair, and with Abner Sykes, is trying to revive the girl reporter. Listen. Lois! Rub her hands, Mr. Sykes. I am rubbing them. Doesn't seem to have been injured. She must have suffered some shock. Told her to go back to Metropolis. Lois, talk to me. Told you to go, too. Oh, stop that nonsense. Hey, nonsense. You'll be sorry. Doesn't seem to be coming around. Where's the nearest doctor, Mr. Sykes? Doc Bedlow. Office over the bank. Well, get him on the phone, please. Tell him to rush right over here. Okay. Oh. No, wait a minute. Maybe... Yes, I think she's coming, too. Oh, good. Quick, get me a glass of water, please. I already got it on the bench in your hand there. Oh, oh, yes, thanks. Clark. Easy, Lois. Wait a minute now. Drink this. Come on. Don't try to talk yet. Drink this water. That's it. Wait a minute. Hold your head up. Come on. Drink all of it. Come on. Drink some more. That's the girl. Feel better now? Yes. Easy now. Now, wait a minute. Don't try to talk yet. Just rest a moment. No, I'm all right. I was just exhausted. I must have run about two miles. Ran two miles? Yes. You see... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. If you Mm. have to talk, suppose you start at the beginning and tell me everything that happened. Well, nothing happened until this afternoon. I just went around Freeville asking questions about the drought and nobody would answer me. All they did was look scared. Yes, I know. I had the same experience. I couldn't understand it. So this afternoon I started down here to see Mr. Sykes again. I had a feeling he knew a lot more than he was telling. Don't know nothing. You mean you're not talking? We let that pass for the moment. Go on, Lois. Well, I started to walk down from the hotel. It's just a couple of blocks from here, you know. I know. And I was going past a a broken down old building. The granary it was. Ain't used now, though. Pete Simpkins built a new one other end of town. I see. Well, whatever it was, I was going past it when somebody called my name. Miss Lane. So I stopped and looked around, but I didn't see anybody. 
And then this voice called me again. Miss Lane. This time I realized the voice came from the old granary. So without thinking, I just stepped toward the open door, and then somebody grabbed me. Get that sack over her head. Okay. Stop fighting, sister. Do you no good. There. There. That does it. Now, inside with her. There was chloroform soaked into that sack over my head. And soon I felt myself losing consciousness. I don't know how long I was out. But when I woke up, I was sitting on the ground in some cold, damp, musty place. It was kind of eerie. Almost pitch black. Except for a candle set quite a way back on the ground. Two men stood between me and the candle. But it was too dark to see their faces. And the small, flickering light threw weird shadows on the walls and made them seem enormous. I asked them who they were and what the meaning of this was. Never mind who we are, Miss Lane. All we got to say is that you're a lucky girl. Lucky? What do you mean? You're lucky you're not dead. Look, what's the meaning of all this? We don't like reporters in Freeville, that's all. Especially reporters from out of town. Why not? What have I done to you? Nothing. We just don't like reporters. Oh, stop playing mysterious. Just what is going on around here? Why does everybody seem so scared? Don't waste your breath asking questions, Miss Lane. Besides, asking questions ain't healthy around here. But, But why? What's behind all this? Ain't nothing to concern you. Now, the eastbound limited goes through Freeville at midnight. You get on it and don't come back. Now, look here. You can't help... You heard me get out of Freeville on the limited tonight and stay out. Understand? And suppose I refuse. That would be the last you'll ever refuse in this world, Miss Lee. Because I warn you, if you're still in town by morning, you won't be breathing. Get up on you. That's the whole story, Clark. Except that after that, they put the sack over my head again, and they made me climb up a tall ladder. A ladder? Yes, it seemed as if I climbed and climbed until suddenly the air got clearer. Say, must have been the old lead mine they took you to. A lead oh, mine? Oh, come to think of it, it did feel as if we were in a mine shaft. That's Mr. where Sykes. you were, all right. Lead, the one substance I can't see. The old Brewster mine. What did you say? How's that? Oh, oh no, nothing, Mr. Sykes, nothing, Lois. Uh, finish your story. How did you get back here? Oh, well, the men put me back in the car and drove a few minutes, and then they took me out and spun me around and around until I was so dizzy. Uh Then I heard them drive off. But by the time I stopped reeling and got the sack off my head, they were out of sight. Of course. I could see the lights of a town in the distance, and I started running toward it. Well, it turned out to be Freeville. Uh But I was pretty winded by the time I got here, and so... That's why you fainted. That's right. Poor kid, you had a rough time. Listen, Lois, did you get a look at the men at all? I mean, enough to identify them? No, I didn't, Clark. You see, they threw the sack over my head right away. Mm -hmm. And in the mine, it was too dark, I guess. That's right. Look, Clark, why do you suppose they don't want reporters around? What is going on in Freeville? I, I don't know exactly, but I do know this much. It's a lot of bad feeling out here against the war veterans on the Homestead Farm Project. The war? Uh huh. It's created an equal amount of bad feeling on the part of the veterans. How do you mean? Well, people have accused the veterans of pillaging and burglary and other acts of vandalism. What? And the veterans say that's a lie and accuse the political leaders of trying to discredit them and so get rid of them. I see. Well, why would anyone want to discredit the war veterans? According to Jerry Barton, head of the veterans post on the project, the politicians feel the veterans are a threat to their rule out here. Also, Jerry says they object to the fact that some of the veterans go to a different church or have a different colored skin for most of the natives out here. Why, what difference does that make? They're all Americans, aren't they? They all fought for their country, and all Americans are entitled to equal rights. That's right, but unfortunately, some people don't think so, Lois. Well, then they're bigots. They're un-American. Wait a minute, I'll take it easy. Well, I never heard... So far, we have only Jerry Barton's word on all this, but we're going to find out. Well, Mr. Sykes here will know. What about it, Mr. Sykes? Do you think our veterans are being pushed around and persecuted? Seven o'clock local will be in pretty soon, Miss Lane. Oh, now, Better look, take I'm... it. Oh, don't change the subject. Remember I asked you Remember what them something. fillers told you to I mind? don't care what they told me. They can't scare me, and neither can you. Look, Lois, maybe Mr. Sykes is right. Maybe you should go back to Metropolis. I'll stay oh, here. Yes, so... you'll stay here and scoop me on a big story. Oh, hmm? now, don't be ridiculous. Well, something I... far more important than a mere story going on here. Your life's in danger. You've already been threatened. So have you, I... mister. That telegram, remember? Oh, that. What telegram? No, it's nothing. Well, it's just a telegram some crackpot sent me suggesting that I leave town. But I still think Save that your you... breath, Clark. This sounds like big stuff to me, and I'm seeing it through with you. Yeah, well, I didn't really think you'd leave, but... You mean you're both staying? We certainly are. 
Well, so now that you know where we stand, Mr. Sykes, maybe you'll agree to help us by telling us what you know. I, uh, I don't know. Come on, Mr. Sykes. It's your duty as an American. Well, might be a good thing. I assure you, you won't regret it. What do you say? Well, hmm. Yep, reckon I will. Oh, that's wonderful. Now we're getting someplace. All right, Mr. Sykes, start talking. Eagerly, Clark Kent and Lois Lane wait for the white-haired old telegrapher to begin telling them what he knows of the mysterious goings-on in Freeville. What will he reveal? We'll be back in a moment for the startling climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, the other day, I was talking to a certain young lady who lives in our block, and she was telling me how she's going to knuckle down to collecting those swell comic buttons. You know, the new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pep? Of course, she's been collecting them right along, but now she's discovered that her brother is way ahead of her, so she's going to work even harder at it. And she has some duplicates that she wants to trade with her friends, and of course, any new ones that she gets will be pinned with the others right on her jacket. And she agreed that all 18 of those new pep comic buttons are doggone smart looking, including Tess Trueheart and Beezy and Superman and all the rest. So uh, maybe you'd better get busy on your collection, too. Just ask Mom to get you a good supply of Kellogg's Pep. That's how easy it is to get these exciting prizes. You don't send in any money, not even a box top. And you can't buy them anywhere. But you get a comic button every time you open a package of Kellogg's Pep. That's the sunshine cereal. Crisp golden flakes of good whole wheat that are loaded with catchy, sunny flavor. Good for you, too. Sure, with extra amounts of vitamin B1 and energy vitamin and good old sunshine vitamin D. Yes, sir, for a nifty dish for breakfast, tell Mom that you want P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. In his little telegraph office, old Abner Sykes has just agreed to tell Clark Kent and Lois Lane what deep, dark mystery is gripping Freeville. As we rejoin them now, Sykes gets up and walks toward the door. Where are you going, Mr. Sykes? Uh, close up. Close up? Yep, it's closing time. Oh, more private, too. Well, that's right, but why are you going out? Going to have a look around outside. Make sure nobody's spying. Be right back. Okay. He sure is frightened, isn't he, Clark? Yes, and so is everyone else in this crazy town. Uh-huh. It is everyone but my good friend and fellow newspaper man. Who do you mean? Local Gazette editor, Fred. What's that? Pistol shots. Good heavens, what do you Come think? Come on, follow me. What? Lois, look. On the sidewalk. <gasps> It's Mr. Sykes. Shocked, Clark Kent and Lois Lane stand outside the little telegraph office, where in the faint light from the open door, old Abner Sykes lies motionless on the ground, his eyes closed. Obviously, this was a deliberate attempt to keep the truth from Clark Kent and Lois Lane. But who shot the old telegrapher just before he could reveal the secret of the mystery that grips the town of Freeville? Don't miss tomorrow's tense and exciting episode as Superman and Lois Lane battle through a dark, tangling web of mystery and danger. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement... The Adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, get a load of this. In Kellogg's Variety, there are ten individual packages of cereal for you to choose from. Every morning you can have your own private box of cereal. Pick it out yourself, and it'll be one of your Kellogg favorites, like Pep, Rice Krispies, and Corn Flakes. Boy, that's a circus of fun. And that's Kellogg's Variety, the handy white, green, and red package with all those crisp, fresh Kellogg cereals that you like so much. Some flaked, some shredded, some popped, made from corn, wheat, rice. Just be sure that it's Kellogg's. Ask Mom to get Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. 
able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P E P Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the Sunshine Serial, presents The Adventures of Superman. Today, Clark Kent and Lois Lane's continued probing for information behind the mystery of Freeville brings them that much closer to the edge of doom. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, most fellas and girls think that surprises are more fun than anything. And that's why you members of the gang get such a kick out of it when Mom opens a new package of Kellogg's Pet. Because you never know exactly which comic button you're going to find inside. Could be any one of 18 in that new series, you know. Old favorite funny paper characters like uh, Brenda Starr and the Little Moose and Pat Patton and, and Tess Trueheart, Chief Brandon, Vitamin Flintheart, and Superman, of course. And if it's a duplicate comic button, you know, like one that you already have pinned on your jacket or your dresser cap, why, that's even more fun, because then you can exchange with your pals. And you know, the best part is, these pep comic buttons are so easy to collect. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop, and you can't buy them anywhere. All you do is to ask Mom to stock up on Kellogg's Pep and look for your prize in every package you open. That's Pep. The whole wheat flakes with the cereal, the crisp, fresh Kellogg cereal that's the doggone good tasting that every single spoonful calls for more. Yes, sir, Kellogg's Pep is the breakfast dish for you. So ask Mom to get P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. Arriving in Freeville to cover a routine story of a prolonged dry spell... Lois Lane was captured by two unknown men who finally released the girl reporter only after warning her to leave Freeville that night or die. Clark Kent, who, as we know, is Superman, believed that the threat to Lois was tied up somehow with the bad feeling existing between the local bigwigs and politicians and a group of war veterans who were homesteading nearby. Convinced that Abner Sykes, the close-mouthed telegrapher, knew a great deal about the mystery, Kent and Lois finally persuaded him to take them into his confidence. But before the old man could reveal what he knew, he was shot by an unseen assailant. As we continue now, the two reporters are in the corridor of the little local hospital, where they wait anxiously for word of Abner Sykes' condition. Listen. I do hope Mr. Sykes will pull through. Yeah, so do I, Lois. He seems gruff, but he's really such a sweet old man. Mm. Why would anyone want to shoot him? Oh, well, that's obvious, to keep him from talking, of course. Really? I am certain it's something big, very big. Yes, I suppose so. Oh, Clark, Mr. Sykes must pull Wait a minute, Lois. Here comes the doctor now. Oh, dear, I'm afraid of... You're up. He's smiling. He is? Uh-huh. Well, what's the good word, doctor? <laughs> that old Abner. Never saw the likes of him. Oh, what do you mean, doctor? How is Mr. Sykes? <laughs> He's fine, Candy. Just fine. Oh, how wonderful. There's not a thing wrong with him. Old Abner sheds bullets just like that Superman fella does. Sheds what? bullets? <laughs> That's right. You see, old Abner had made himself a bulletproof vest. Oh, no. A bulletproof vest? <laughs> Stitched it right into his red flannel underwear. Well, I'll be hanged. That's all, brother. <laughs> yep. I've known old Ab all my life and always said he was the smartest man in the county, even though he hardly ever opened his mouth. Yes, sir. I knew he knew what he was doing all the time, too. Wasn't taking any chances. What do you mean, Doctor? Wasn't taking any chances with whom? Uh, look, I'm just a medical man, Kent. Yes, I know, but and you I made don't st- meddle with politics or anything else outside my profession. But you just said Mr. Sykes was your friend. Yes, and somebody tried to shoot him, so it's your duty to find... My duty is to help the sick and injured. It's a sheriff's job to find the man who tried to kill Ab Sykes. Well, that's right, but I understand the sheriff is out of town. It's so still we... his job. You've got a family, and... Yeah, but that's neither here nor there. I came out to tell you that Abner's all right. He's just stunned from the force of the bullets. And he wants to see you two. Oh, you mean we can see him now? That's right, Miss Lane. You can go right on in. Oh, thank you, Doctor. Come on, Lois. (laughs) 
that you, Mr. Kidd? Yes, Mr. Sykes. Miss Lane with you? Uh-huh. Yes, I'm right here. Good. Come on over to the bed. Well, we're both mighty glad to know you weren't hurt. Are you sure you're all right now? Yep, just got a little pain in my chest is all. Oh, I'm sorry. But it's nothing. No great harm done. Oh, thanks to your bulletproof vest. Yep. Came in handy this time, did. You can say that again. Why, when we saw you lying on well, the ground, n- we were... never mind that now, Lois. Look, uh, Mr. Sykes, do you know who shot you? Yep, I do. Who was it? Tell you later. Why can't you tell us now? Well, I gotta tell you the whole story all at one time. Oh. But look, we've got to get... You the... and Miss Lane here sure got gumption, Kent. Thanks. That's look... what we need here in Freeville. Folks with gumption who'll stand up to them scalawags. What scalawags? Them was out to ruin Freeville. And maybe the whole country besides. Just what do you mean, Mr. Sykes? Well, can't tell you exactly, because some things I'm sure of and some I'm not quite so sure of. Well, suppose we start with the things you are sure of. Well, here's how it is. When we first heard about them war veterans coming in here... Hey, what is this? Uh Uh-oh. Hello, Mr. Kent. Oh, hi, Mr. Leonard. Abner, you old scally. Uh, what excuse in the world me, is... Mr. Clayton. Uh, yes, sir. What is it? I'd like you to meet a fellow newspaper man. Oh. Oh, a pleasure, I'm sure. Uh, Mr. Clark Cannon of the Metropolis Daily Planet. Meet the Honorable Edward C. Clayton, three times governor of this state. How do you do? Mr. Kent, it's an honor to make the acquaintance of a fine journalist such as you are reputed to be. Yeah, thank you. Miss Lane, may I present Mr. Clayton Lane, and uh, uh, Mr. Leonard? Did I, uh, did I hear you say Miss Lane, sir? Yes, you did. I'm Lois Lane, also of the Metropolis Daily Planet. Oh. Why, uh, why, this is the young lady who was reported missing, Mr. Clayton. Well, well I'm, uh, I'm delighted to meet you, my dear. As mm. soon as I heard you were missing, I said, uh, she'll show up all right. Nothing happens to folks in my state. No, sir, Bob. Well, something did happen this time. Uh, Huh? Uh, what's that? Oh, no, nothing, nothing. She's just joking. Lois, I'd like you to meet Fred Leonard, editor and publisher of the Freeville Gazette. How do you do, Leonard? Mr. Leonard? A pleasure to meet you, Miss Lane. Yes, indeed. Yes, it is a real pleasure to meet the representatives of so, so excellent a newspaper as the Daily Planet. Yes, sir, Bob. A great newspaper. Go away. Everybody, please go away. Huh? Why, why, Abner, I'm surprised at you. That's no way to talk to your friends who come over to see you as soon as they heard something had happened to you. Nothing happened to me. Nothing? Nope. Uh, well, what's all this I hear about somebody taking a shot at you? Why, yes, we were all upset when we heard about it, Abner, and we rushed right over here. Well, nothing to be upset about. Just go away and take them reporter folks away from me. What? Now, look here. You Mr. heard Sykes. me. Go away. You bother me. Now, now, Abner. Hey, what's gotten into you, Mr. Sykes? Lois. You're the one man who can tell us what's going on here in I Freedom. tell you, I don't know nothing. Look, Lois, I think we'd better run well, along. Look, what's gotten into you? Well, I'm sorry, Miss Lane. You and Mr. Kent got to let me alone. I'm a sick man. Can't stand questioning. And I don't know nothing. Well, I'll uh, think. Folks, folks, I, I think I'd better apologize for my friend Abner. Uh, after all, he, he did just suffer a great shock. Oh, yes, and he's sort of upset. Yeah. Maybe we'd all better just leave now, don't you think so, Mr. Clayton? Uh, yes, Fred, I do. I'm, uh, I'm sure Miss Lane, Mr. Kent will understand. Yes, yes, of course. Come on, Lois. But Clark... Come on, please. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Sykes. Hope you recover quickly. Yes, yes, indeed, Abner. That expresses the sentiments of us all, I'm sure. Uh, come on, Fred. Well, goodbye, Abner. See you again soon. Uh, Miss Lane, uh, Mr. Kent, I uh, I want to tell you again how happy I am to meet you. And, and I want you to know how much I think of your paper, The Daily Planet. Yes, sir, Bob. What this country needs is more fine papers like that, which spread the gospel of understanding and progress. Huh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Clayton. Yes, sir. You know, you know, we're all brothers under the stars and stripes. All of us Americans, that is. And the sooner we understand that, the sooner we'll all get along like brothers. Right, friend? That's absolutely right, Mr. Clayton. Yes, but there's something going on here that's uh, not it's very... It's nice to have met you, Mr. Clayton. Hope to see you again sometime. Come on, Lois. Oh, wait, wait. Uh, we've got a car. Can we drop you somewhere? Yes, uh, Thank you, a... no. We'd rather walk. Goodbye. Clark, uh, I want to Still angry and puzzled by what she has just seen and heard, 
Lois Lane is literally dragged by Clark Kent away from the Honorable Ed Clayton and editor Fred Leonard. What is going on? We'll know more in a moment when we return for the exciting climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, gang, you've heard of infantile paralysis, that dread disease that cripples so many, many children every year. Well, here in America, we're fighting infantile paralysis epidemics with all our power and our strength. We provide medical care for its victims. We train nurses and doctors to treat it. We're studying its cause and its prevention through research. And the service that carries on this fight is the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, supported by the annual March of Dimes. Every year across the country, grown-ups and children give their dimes and dollars. So how about putting part of your allowance to work? And remind Mom and Dad, too, to give their contributions to the annual March of Dimes. As we rejoin them now, Clark Kent and Lois Lane have returned to the Central Hotel in Freeville and are walking through the third floor corridor to their respective rooms. Lois, still furious, is trying to make sense out of Abner Sykes' strange behavior. Listen. You mean Mr. Sykes suddenly changed his tune because he was afraid of Mr. Clayton and Mr. Leonard? Is that what you're trying to say, Clark? I'm not sure, Lois. Either he was afraid of them or else... He just didn't want to reveal what he knew. But he was just about to tell us everything. I know. Well, that, that's because we're outsiders. So we're not involved in whatever's going on around here between the local bigwigs and politicians and the war veterans. Yes, but... And as you remember, Mr. Sykes said he wasn't sure of all his facts, just some of them. Now, my hunch is that he wanted our help in finding all the facts. Oh, hold it. Here's your room. Look, Clark, let's go back to the hospital. No. With Leonard and that flag-waving ex-governor gone, maybe No, we could... I, I don't think that's smart, Lars. And anyway, you need a rest after all you've gone through today. Oh, you're right. Gee, I... Oh, I am pretty tired. Of course you are. You've got a good night's sleep. I'll see you in the morning and we'll continue our investigation then. Okay, Clark. Good night. Good night, Lois. I'll knock on your door at 7 o'clock. Okay, Clark. What's the matter? Are you having trouble? Yes, the door is stuck. Here, wait a minute. I'll help you. Oh, never mind. Here it is. It's opening now. Look out, Lois. Look out, I said. Get back! Horrified, Clark Kent springs forward, his X-ray vision perceiving something within the room just as Lois enters it, and a violent explosion shatters the silence of the little village hotel. What has happened to the girl reporter? Is this the answer to Lois's defiance of the warning to get out of Freeville? What is going on in this sleepy little farming area? Don't miss tomorrow's thrilling episode, fellows and girls. Tune in, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, how'd you like to pick out your own favorite Kellogg's cereal every morning and open your own individual package yourself? Well, ask Mom to get Kellogg's Variety. That's the white, green, and red Kellogg package with ten one-serving packages of your own favorite Kellogg cereals, like Kellogg's Corn Flakes and Rice Krispies and Pep. And you know they're good because you've always liked Kellogg cereals so much. Every day you get your choice, and every day you treat yourself to one of your favorite Kellogg cereals for breakfast. So ask Mom to get you Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal presents... The Adventures of Superman.
Today, as Superman stalks the mysterious forces which hold Freeville in its evil clutches, events fraught with great danger move thick and fast against him. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, if you were the only fellow or girl in the world who was collecting those comic buttons in that new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pet, well, it wouldn't be half as much fun. What makes it exciting is that so many of your friends are collecting them, too, you know, so you can compare notes, and you can even trade duplicates. And it really means something when you wear all your comic buttons pinned on your jacket or your dresser cap for everybody to see how many you've collected. Yes, sir, there's a real thrill in adding any one of those 18 different pep comic buttons to your collection. Brenda Starr, or Goofy, or Beezy, or, or Superman, and all the rest. So remind Mom to get you plenty of Kellogg's Pep, because that's the only way you can get these new comic buttons. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop, and you can't buy them anywhere. But there's an exciting prize every time you open a package of that sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. There's good eating, too, because these are the whole wheat flakes with a sunny golden toasted flavor. What's more, Mom's glad to see you polish off your breakfast bowl of Kellogg's Pep, because Pep gives you energy vitamin B1, plus good old sunshine vitamin D that's extra important these wintry days when the sun's rays aren't quite so strong. So ask Mom to get P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. Now, the adventures of Superman. A prolonged dry spell in the area of Freeville, where 300 war veteran farmers face ruin, brought Lois Lane and then Clark Kent, reporters for the Metropolis Daily Planet, to the scene. And at once, things began to happen. First, unknown men warned Lois to leave Freeville at once or forfeit her life. Then Kent, who, as we know, is Superman, received a similar warning. Finally, old Abner Sykes, the local telegrapher, narrowly escaped death as he was about to reveal what he knew to the reporters. Returning to their hotel after learning that Sykes was all right, Kent had just said goodnight to Lois. And as she opened the door of her room and started to step inside, he suddenly lunged toward her, shouting a warning. Look out, Lois! Just as the explosion shattered the stillness, Clark Kent, whose X-ray vision had enabled him to see the danger to Lois a split second before, leaped forward with the speed of light and shielded the girl reporter from the searing flash with his own body. As we continue now, shaken but unhurt, Lois stares in wide-eyed astonishment at her wrecked hotel room. Listen. Good heavens. What what happened, Clark? Plenty. A booby trap just missed getting you, Lois. Uh, a booby trap? Yes, a charge of dynamite was set in a can on the floor of your room here. Good heavens. And a wire running from the can was attached to the doorknob. What? When you opened the door, you set off the charge. Good gracious, I, I might have been killed. That's exactly what was intended by whoever set this little trap. But but who set Undoubtedly, it? Undoubtedly, the same men who warned you to leave pre Freeville and tried to finish old Abner Sykes tonight were behind this. Why, of course, it must have been. Oh, sure. But what's it all about, Clark? What is going on in this town? I don't know yet, but believe me, I'm going to find out. Uh-oh, we're getting company. Oh, Miss Lane! Mr. Kent! What happened? Mr. Keeley, you're the manager of this hotel, aren't you? That's right, but what happened? Come in here, please. I want to talk to you. Oh, yes, Stand yes, back, of course. Everybody. Well, good gracious, look at this room. Pretty, isn't it? Look here, Mr. Keeley. Miss Lane, are you all right? Yes, saved by a miracle. Look, what kind of a place is Wait this a minute, anyway? Boss. Let me handle this, please. My word, Mr. Kent, the whole back of your suit coat is gone. Uh, it is? Yes, and your shirt is blackened. Really? Oh, Clark, you must have been burned when you shielded me from the bomb. Bomb? Why, you saved my life, but you were caught by the explosion. Oh, no. Oh, well, n- n- never mind that now, Lois. You see, I'm okay, and, and But I'll... I don't understand. Well, stop wasting time. Remember, Lois, somebody is using us by clay pigeons around here, and we've got to put a stop to it. Yes, Now, look, will somebody please tell me what happened here? That's what we want you to tell us, Mr. Keeler. Well, how can I tell is you Is it the custom to furnish a bomb with each room in your hotel? Well, how absurd, Mr. Kent. I can't believe there was a bomb. Oh, you oh can't. no. Well, that explosion you heard wasn't me cracking my bubble gum, Mr. Keeler. Well, well no, of course it not. It was you... a bomb, all right, and it was meant to do away with Miss Lane. Jump and she hustled. Now, who would do a thing like that? Well, we thought you might have some ideas on that subject. I? Yes. The bomb didn't walk in here by itself, you know. Somebody obviously brought it in. Well, yes, of course, but but I have no idea who did it. You haven't, eh? Well, certainly not. I, I think I'll call Sheriff Cleary at once. Perhaps he can find it. Oh, I forgot the sheriff's out of town. Is the sheriff the whole police force around here? Why, yes, he is, Miss Lane. After all, Freeville's a small place, well, you know. We'll have to get along without the sheriff, then. 
I think you can help us, Mr. Keeler, if you want to. Oh, naturally, I'll be happy to do anything I can to help clear up this terrible thing, Mr. Kemp. All right. Tell me this. Yes? What's behind the ill feeling between the local natives and politicians and the war veterans who've taken homesteads on the reclaimed land in this county? Well, I... I wouldn't know anything about that. Oh, here we go again, Clark. Yes, you're as bad as the others around here, Keeler. Well, now, look here. All right, we'll handle this our own way. We can't do anything until morning, and you need sleep, Lois. Yes, but I can't sleep in what's left of this mess. Well, I I can't tell you how much I regret this inconvenience to you, but uh, there's a vacant room across the hall, and then you can have that, Miss Lane. All right, I'll take it. Very good. Uh, Follow me, please. Seeing Lois Lane safely to another room, Kent returns to his own room, where he spends the night in a watchful vigil. But the little hotel is quiet, and so is Freeville. At 7.30 the next morning, Kent raps on Lois's door to awaken her. Then, after a hearty breakfast, the two reporters hurry to the small local hospital where the night before they had left Abner Sykes, the old telegrapher. I'd like to see Mr. Abner Sykes, please. He's not here. What? He isn't. He left the hospital about an hour ago. Oh, no. You know where he went? Back to his telegraph office, I guess. Doctor said there was nothing wrong with him. I see. All right, thanks very much. Come on, Lois. <laughs> You're looking for old Abner, eh? That's right. They told us at the hospital that he's... Well, Abner ain't around. We can see that, but what we want... tell us where to find him? Well, I don't know as you can, mister. Why? He went off on a little vacation, you see. What? Vacation? That's right. He got me out of bed about an hour ago, said he was plumb wore out, needed a little vacation. Uh Uh-oh. And told me to take over the office while he was gone. Oh, Clark. See, I spell him once in a while, holidays and so. Name's Lem Hawkins. Well, did he happen to say where he was going for his vacation last No, sir, he didn't. What'll we do, Clark? Mr. Sykes is the only one who might tell us the truth about what's going on in this town. I know, Lois. Look, Lem, don't you have any idea where Mr. Sykes went? No. All I know is he went south on Highway 319. 319? Yep. That's highway just below here. How long ago did he leave? Oh, half hour, maybe 45 minutes ago. Thanks very much. Come on, Lois. Okay. But where to now, Clark? Do you think we I'm ought to go... I'm going after Mr. Sykes. You're you... going after him? How? Uh, well, don't, don't, don't worry. I'll find transportation. Now, listen... Well, you don't I... even know where he is. I know enough. Now, please, let's stop wasting time. After all, you admit our best chance to solve this whole mystery is to get hold of Mr. Sykes, don't you? Well, certainly. But I've got a hunch he left so he wouldn't have to answer any questions. After somebody convinced him, it would mean his life. All right, I go along with you on that. But I've got to find him, so I want you to promise to sit tight in the hotel until I get back. Oh, now, wait a minute, Clark. I think I'd like to look over this Veterans Farm project. Uh Uh-uh, nothing doing. You've got to stay right here till I get back. But you said yourself you were sure the threats against us and everything else had something to do with the trouble between the veterans and the natives. I know, but you can't risk getting into any more trouble. I won't get into trouble. I'm just going to Please, Lois, do as I ask, just this once. Now, I assure you it's the safest and sanest thing to do. But, Clark, after all, I'm not a child. please. Well, I... Every second counts if I'm to catch up with Mr. Sykes. Oh, well. All right, Clark. You promise to sit tight and do nothing till I get back? Yes, I promise. Good, thanks. I'll be back as soon as I can. Well, good luck. Thanks. Now, oh, where can I change clothes? Oh, that empty granary across the street. I hate to leave Lois even for a few minutes, but I think she'll be safe in broad daylight, and I can only catch up with Abner Sykes as Superman. <laughs> Stepping into the deserted granary, Clark Kent swiftly strips down to the blue costume and red cape of Superman. Then, up, up, and away! (laughs) Leaping out and high into the sky, Superman rockets away above Highway 319 in pursuit of the old telegrapher, Abner Sykes. We'll return in a moment for the tense climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, gang, have you ever noticed how much Judy and Corky from Gasoline Alley look alike? Of course, uh, Judy's blonde and Corky's got dark hair, but they both have the same sort of button nose, and they're both mighty nice-looking kids. Yes, that's how clear and sharp the pictures of your favorite funny paper characters are on those comic buttons in the new series that you're all collecting from packages of Kellogg's Pet. That's one reason it's such an exciting hobby to collect them and to wear your collection pinned on your jacket or your dresser cap. And you'll also get a kick out of trading duplicates with your pals and checking up to see if you've collected more different comic strip characters than they have. So get busy, gang. Ask Mom to get you some more Kellogg's Pet. 
That's right. You don't have to send in any money, not even a box top. And you can't buy these comic buttons anywhere. But there's one inside every package of Kellogg's Pep. That's the mighty good eating, too, you're going to find, too. Pep is called the sunshine cereal, you know. It's loaded with catchy, sunny toasted flavor. Crisp and fresh as can be. So doggone delicious that, well, your spoon just naturally keeps digging in again and again for more. So tell Mom that you want Pep for breakfast every day. And get your prizes from P.E.P., the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. Returning to the Preville Hotel alone, Lois Lane is approached by a husky, sunburned young man who has apparently been waiting there for her. Are you Miss Lois Lane? Yes. I'm Jerry Barton. I'm one of the fellows of the Veterans Homestead Farm Project. Oh, yes, Mr. Barton. Mr. Kent told me about meeting you. Uh Uh-huh. Well, look, do you know where he is now? Why, no, I don't. But the hotel manager said you'd gone out with him early this morning. Yes, I did, but he just left to, uh... To look for someone we want to talk with. Oh, I see. Any idea how soon he'll be back? No, Mr. Barton, I haven't. Why? Well, it, it's kind of important that I see him right away. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, could you tell me about it? I'm a reporter for the Daily Planet, too, you know. Yes, uh, I know, but... Well, maybe you'll do as well as Mr. Kent on this. Oh, good. What is it? Well, look, you and Mr. Kent want to know what's going on around Freeville, don't you? Why we vets are in trouble with Fred Leonard and Uncle Ed Clayton and their gang? Why, yes. Well, I was just tipped off to something that's scheduled for this morning. And if you'll go there with me, it'll answer a lot of your questions. What do you mean? What's scheduled for this morning? Well, I haven't got time to explain, but you'll see when we get there. We've got to hurry if we're going to get there on time. Well, now, wait a minute. Can't you tell me more about this, uh, whatever it is? No, not now. There isn't time. But I'm sure you wouldn't want to miss this, Miss Lane. It, well, it'll tell you just about everything you want to know. Well, I I don't know, Mr. Why? You're here to get a story, aren't you? Yes, certainly, but I promise... Well, this is a story, a real humdinger of a story. Yes, but I promised Clark Kent that I'd wait This story won't wait, Miss Lane. If you want it, you've got to come with me now. Okay. I'll go with you. That's the way to talk, Miss Lane. I've got my car outside. Come on. Deciding to disregard Clark Kent's warning and to break her promise not to leave the hotel for any reason until he returns. Lois Lane walks out and rides away with Jerry Barton. What, if any, is the story Jerry Barton says he has for Lois? And what of Superman rocketing farther and farther away from Freeville on the trail of Abner Sykes, unaware that Lois has left the hotel with Jerry Barton? Is the girl reporter stepping into another trap? Tomorrow's episode is one of the most exciting in this series, so don't miss it. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, you can save Mom a lot of work and give yourself a load of fun with Kellogg's Variety at breakfast. Sure, you just open up one of those individual boxes of your favorite Kellogg's cereal, pour on milk, and eat right out of the box. That's the Kell Bowl Pack. It saves washing dishes, and it's more fun than a picnic. You know Kellogg's Variety is the white, green, and red Kellogg package with ten one-serving packages of favorites like Kellogg's Pep and Rice Krispies and Corn Flakes. Just be sure that Mom gets Kellogg's, Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, 
as Clark Kent trails the path of Abner Sykes, his only clue, Lois Lane dangerously pursues another lead to the vicious mystery enveloping the town of Freeville. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, Barney Google's been in the comic strips for a long, long time. Why, uh, somebody even wrote a song about him once, so he's bound to be one of the favorites in that new series of comic buttons Kellogg's Pep is putting out. Uh, maybe you've already got him in your collection. There are 18 new and different buttons at all, you know. Every single one a familiar funny paper character like Brenda Starr or, or Cindy and, and Spud from Winnie Winkle and the Little Moose and Goofy and Beezy from Harold Teen and, and Judy and Corky and Superman, of course. And are these comic buttons bright with color? Why, they look mighty smart on your jacket or your dress or cap. Yes, sir, you'll want to collect every one of these new series buttons. And you can, too. Sure, easy as anything. You just ask Mom to, to keep you supplied with plenty of Kellogg's Pet. That's right. You don't send in any money, not even a box top. And you can't buy these prizes anywhere, but you get a comic button in every package of Pep you open. And you get some mighty grand eating, too, because Pep is really terrific when it comes to sunny golden toasted flavor. Every single flake and every single spoonful is crisp and fresh and tasty as can be. A swell breakfast dish. That's the Sunshine Cereal Gang, P-E-P, -E Kellogg's Pet. Ask Mom to get you some today. And now, the adventures of Superman. Frightened townspeople who refuse to answer questions. Anonymous warnings to leave town. Attempts on the lives of the local telegrapher and Lois Lane. These are some of the strange circumstances baffling Lois and Clark Kent, reporters for the Daily Planet who are in Freeville, center of a farming area in the grip of a severe drought. Now, after once again running against a blank wall in an attempt to solve the mystery, Clark Kent and Superman left Freeville in pursuit of old Abner Sykes, the telegrapher, who had suddenly departed following the attempt on his life. Meanwhile, Lois was approached by Jerry Barton, head of a group of war veterans who had settled on homesteads nearby, who offered the key to the Freeville mystery. And as we continue now, the young veteran with Lois beside him is driving his car over a lonely country road. Listen. Now, can you tell me where we're going, Mr. Barton? Well, I... I don't know, Miss Lane. You don't know? Well, I mean, I... Uh, I don't I'm understand. Not sure. What is this? Are you taking... Take it easy, Miss Lane. What I'm trying to say is that one of the boys, a buddy of mine, is going to tell us where to go. Oh? Well, what is this mysterious thing we're going to? A meeting. What meeting? Well, I don't know that exactly. Either, what do you I, mean? Well, Phil Dyer, my buddy, says this meeting is arranged to shoot the works. He now, look a... here, Mr. Barton, I don't like this. You said you could lead me to a terrific story, the answer to all the mystery in Freeville. That's right. And now and you tell me you don't know where you're taking me, except that it's to some meeting or other, and you don't even know where the meeting is being held or anything about it. Oh, wait a minute, please. Who said I didn't know anything about it? You did. You I just said, said I didn't know exactly what it was, but I do know this. The big shots will be there. And what's more important, they're all set to lay their cards on the table, according to Phil. Really? And who are these big shots that you're talking about? They're the boys who run things in Freeville and in this part of the state. The ones who pull the political strings everybody here has to dance to. But or who else. are they? The guys who've been trying to discredit the homesteading war veterans around here. Those who spread the stories that we're hotheads and foreigners. That we've been burglarizing and beating up people. But... But why are they doing that? Why do they, they want... want to get rid of us, that's why. Get rid of you? Sure. Oh, we were great guys while we fought their war for them. But now we're not even good enough to make an honest living on the land that we protect. Wait a minute, will you? Who are these people that you're talking about? Well, you'll see that when we get there. But why can't you tell me now? Because I've tried to tell other people, and they wouldn't believe me. Or else they were afraid to believe me. Afraid? Yes, afraid. Everybody around here is afraid. So when Phil came in with the news about this meeting, I thought about your friend Kent. Because he seemed like a right Joe to me. A, like a guy who wouldn't faint when he saw his own shadow. Well, I wouldn't call Clark exactly brave. I Like I... I say, I've talked to other people who got cold feet as soon as they got the lowdown. So I decided I wouldn't take the chance of Kent or you running out the way the rest of them did. You're reporters for a big paper. You can help us by printing the truth. Look out for that girl! Don't worry these roads like the back of my own hand. Well, take it easy, will you, please? Yes, ma'am. All right. So I decided this time I'd just offer Kent a big story and not take a chance of scaring him off by telling him all about it beforehand. Well, Kent is away. 
So the same goes for you, Miss Lane. And, well, that's why I've been so mysterious. Well, I certainly hope this meeting or whatever it is will explain all this hocus-pocus that Clark and I have been running into here in Freeville. You bet it will. And besides, if... Uh Uh-oh. What's the matter? What are you stopping for? There's a car parked at the foot of the hill. See it? No. I don't see any car. Pull off the road on the right. Almost hidden by the brush there. You see it now? Oh. Oh, oh, yes. Well, what about it? Well, we're getting near the meeting place now, so we've got to be careful. Someone may be posted in that car as a guard. I see. Well... No. No, it's okay. How do you know? Oh, I recognize it. It's Phil Dyer's car. He said he'd be waiting near where the wood started. I just had to be sure. Well, of course. Look, is this meeting closed to you veteran homesteaders? <laughs> oh, and how? Then who are the people who... Wait a minute. I'll be quiet, please. I... I don't see your friend. No, he's not in the car. Must be nearby somewhere. Well, I'll give him the whistle. Okay, Jerry. Drive in here off the road. Why, he must have been behind that tree all the time. Uh Uh-huh. Check, Phil. Hold on, Miss Lane. It's going to be a little bumpy. Okay, I'm set. Okay, hold it, Jerry. Give your motor. Right. Okay. Get out, pal. From here in, you walk. Okay. Come on, Miss Lane. All right. Go ahead. Well, it sure took you long enough to get here, Jerry. Oh, sorry, Phil. I had to wait for Miss Lane at her hotel. Oh, Miss Lane, this is Phil Dyer. How do you do, Mr. Dyer? How do you do? Look, Jerry. Huh? I don't get this. I thought you were bringing that Daily Planet reporter, Clark Kent. Why, Clark he Kent went... had to go somewhere, so I came instead. You see, you I'm... You came instead? Holy smokes, Jerry, are you off your nut? This is no job for a I girl. know, Phil, Look, but Mr. I... Look, Mr. Dyer, this girl has been on plenty of tough assignments. Not as dangerous as this. Even more dangerous than this. You see, I'm a Daily Planet reporter, too. I don't care. This is tough business, and we can't let you take the chance of... Oh, now, don't be silly. I'm not. I'm just thinking... Oh, cut it out, Phil. You know that what we need is a reporter for a big city newspaper who isn't afraid to go out after the truth, who isn't scared to print it. Right, but a girl. This job is too dangerous, I tell you. Will you stop I had to bring her, Phil. There's no telling when Ken will be back, and I didn't dare wait. Well, you said this meeting was going to be today at noon, didn't you? That's right, All but right, I'm t- then. Let's stop wasting time and get to work. According to my watch, it's 11.15. Well, all right. I still don't like it, but if it's okay with you, it's Jerry... It's okay. Now, what do we do, Phil? Well, you start hiking along a narrow trail through these woods that starts at a point about 50 feet up ahead. Uh-huh. You well, follow the trail, and after you've gone about a mile and a half, mile you'll come to a stream. Okay. Follow that stream until it brings you out into a big clearing. Yeah. That's where the meeting's being held. Okay, I got it. Come on, Miss Lane. Now, wait a minute. Before we go, can't you give me some idea of what this meeting is about, Mr. Dyer? You'll see when you get there. Now, be careful, Jerry, because they'll be on the lookout for any outsiders. And if you get caught, well, it might be too bad. I know. Don't worry. We'll be careful. Who will be on the lookout? You'll find that out, too, Miss Lane. But look, Save it, Miss Lane, please. We've got oh. to get started now. So long, Phil. See you later. Right. And good luck to both of you. Thanks. Thanks guys. And remember, be careful. Okay. Come on, Miss Lane. Lead the way. I'm right behind you. A heart beating rapidly, Lois Lane follows Jerry Barton into the dense woods. As meanwhile, on the trail of the elderly telegrapher, Abner Sykes, Superman has arrived at a toll bridge 60 miles north of Freeville, where he is questioning the man in charge. Say you know Abner Sykes? Sure do, Superman. You're positive he hasn't come over this bridge in the past hour. Yep, I know he hasn't. That's strange. He was headed this way, and he's nowhere on the road ahead or behind. Well, maybe he turned off on a side road. Well, there are only two or three side roads, and I didn't see him on any of them. But I didn't search them thoroughly. I better go back and do that now. Hey, listen. What old Abner do? Huh? Must have been something important to have you after him. Well, he didn't do anything wrong, if that's what you mean. But he can help me on something important. Something very important. So I've got to find him. That's so. What's it all no about? No time to explain now. Thanks very much, though. Up and away! <laughs> Lucifer, jump right up into the sky! His mouth gaping, the bridge tender watches in amazement as Superman rockets away in search of Abner Sykes. Will he find the old telegrapher? And meanwhile, what of Lois Lane and Jerry Barton on their hazardous mission in the woods? 
We'll be back in a moment with the exciting climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, don't forget, gang, if you have duplicate comic buttons to trade in that swell new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pet, be sure to let your pals know about it. Tell them which duplicates you have and which comic strip characters you need. Then you can swap and have an exciting new pep comic button for your collection. You won't want to miss out on a single one of the 18 buttons in this new series because they're all true to life and bright colored as anything. Like the Little Moose, for instance, and, uh, and Pat Patton and Superman himself. Boy, do they look terrific when you wear your collection of pep comic buttons pinned on your jacket or your dress or cap. Why, you'll feel like really strutting around. And it's so easy to get these pep comic buttons. You don't send in a single penny, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. But every time that you open a package of Kellogg's Pep, there's your exciting prize. And look for some mighty good eating, too, because Pep is a super delicious breakfast dish. It's called the Sunshine Cereal. Every crispy whole wheat flake is loaded with golden toasted sunshine flavor that really hits just the right spot those cold winter mornings. Pep really gives breakfast and your day a wonderful lift. So ask Mom to get you plenty of P-E-P, the Sunshine Cereal, Kellogg's Pep. In the dense woods several miles from Freeville, Lois Lane is following Jerry Barton along a narrow, twisting trail, crowded with brambles and overhung by moss. Fire winded, finally breaks the silence. Look, Jerry, how much farther is this? I'm getting winded. Can't be much farther, Miss Lane. What? Phil said it was right. Hold it. What's the matter? I thought I heard something. Hey! Hey, Hear that? Yes. Somebody's coming this way. Quick, Miss Lane, get off the trail. We've got to hide. Hey! Oh! I don't know where Hank got me. Come over here and help me, look! Get down low, Miss Lane. They're coming this way. If they see us, we're dead pigeons. <laughs> Crouching in the thick brambles and damp moss, Lois Lane and Jerry Barton hold their breaths as the unseen men converge toward them. Will Lois and Jerry be discovered? What is the mysterious meeting which the war veterans are so eager to have Lois overhear? While Superman, many miles away, searches for Abner Sykes, whom he believes holds the key to the Freeville mystery. Tomorrow's episode is packed with thrills and suspense, so be sure not to miss it. Tune in, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, what's your favorite Kellogg's cereal for breakfast? Kellogg's Rice Krispies? Corn Flakes? Pep? Well, you can take your pick of ten individual boxes of different Kellogg's cereals every morning if you'll get Mom to set out Kellogg's variety. That's the white, green, and red Kellogg package with the grand lineup of Kellogg favorites. Some are flaked, some popped, some shredded, made from corn, wheat, or rice. Everyone's a favorite Kellogg cereal. Yes, sir, breakfast is a picnic all year round when Kellogg's Variety's on the table. So ask Mom for Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, Superman speeds his determined way to solve the mystery of Freeville. Little realizing that Lois Lane, proceeding on her own, now stands in dire peril of her very life. Hello, 
there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know what I think is particularly swell about those snappy comic buttons in that new series Kellogg's Pep is putting out? Well, I think they sort of hold our Superman gang together. All you fellas and girls have something in common because you're all collecting these exciting new comic buttons and having great fun, too. First of all, there's the thrill of seeing which button's inside every time that Mom opens a new package of Pep. If it's a brand new one, well, you can pin it with the others right on your jacket or your dress or cap. Or if it's a duplicate, you know, like one that you already have, why, that's even more fun because then you have the business of swapping with one of your pals. And you'll want every single one of these 18 new buttons, too, from Judy and Corky right on up to Superman. And you can get them. Sure, easy as anything. You just ask Mom to get you a package or two of Kellogg's Pet. And don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And remember, you can't buy these prizes anywhere, but look for one inside every package of Pet that you open. That's Kellogg's Pet, the sunshine cereal, the sunny golden toasted whole wheat flakes. Yes, sir, Pep certainly makes your appetite sit right up and take notice these cold winter mornings. It's such a solid, hearty sort of dish for breakfast. So remember, be sure that you ask Mom for P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. In Freeville, center of a farm area which is in the grip of a prolonged drought, Mysterious goings-on have involved Clark Kent and Lois Lane to the point where both reporters received anonymous warnings to leave town. And when they defied the threats, an attempt was made on Lois's life. An attempt was also made on the life of Abner Sykes, the local telegrapher, who was about to give them the key to the mystery before he was frightened into leaving Freeville without revealing his destination. Then, while Kent, as Superman, searched for the telegrapher, Lois joined forces with Jerry Barton, a young war veteran who led her through dense woods bound for a secret meeting which he promised would provide the answers to all her questions. But suddenly, as they approached the meeting place, men's voices were heard nearby. Jerry hastily led Lois off the trail. And as we continue now, they are crouching in a mass of brambles. Listen. Keep down low, Miss Lane. Those men spot us. We're dead pigeons. Why, Jerry? Who are they? They work for the big shot. I caught a glimpse of one of them. He's wearing yellow suspenders. He was wearing what? Yellow suspenders. Yellow su- gallus, as they call them down here. All the big shots follow us with them. Same as he does. But who is the big oh, shot? Miss Lane, they're getting closer. Hey, where in Darnation you been, Hank? I went to the spring for a drink. Mm. Why? You're supposed to watch the trail, that's why. Supposing some outsiders got in here. Oh, relax, Charlie. Couldn't know outsiders get in without my seeing them. Well, we can't be too careful. A couple of reporters from Metropolis came to Freeville yesterday. When I asked him questions. He must be in Clark and me. Uh, yeah, don't you fine. worry. They won't come tracing around here if they know what's good for them. Oh, well, they better not. I have most time for the meeting to get started. Let's get over there. Wait. Who's going to watch out back here? Great. You'll be along pretty soon. Come on. Okay, Miss Lane, come on. They're out of sight now. But don't make any more noise than you have to. Right. That guy Rafe may be lurking around, so watch it. Just follow me and don't say any more till we see how the land lies. All right, Jerry. Lead on. Walking swiftly, but as quietly as they can, Jerry Barton and Lois walk through the woods for a quarter of a mile. And suddenly, at a hand signal from Jerry, Lois stops. A little below them and just ahead stretches a large clearing in the woods, in which are some 200 sunburned, straw-hatted men and women, dressed in frayed overalls and calico dresses. A huge barbecue pit in which several pigs are roasting stands at one end of the clearing, and husky shirt-sleeved men wearing bright yellow suspenders serve meat and cold drinks to the crowd. A roughly built plank platform stands in the middle of the clearing. Alone on the platform... Another shirt-sleeved man with yellow suspenders works hard at a pipeless organ. We'll be able to hear everything from here, Miss Lane, but keep back behind the tree where they can't see you. Okay. This is one of those backwoods political rallies. Barbecue, music, and all the trimmings. And speeches? Yeah. That's what I brought you here to hear. Look, if this is just a political rally, why all the secrecy? And the guards out in the woods? Because the people running this show don't want what they call outsiders to know what's going on. But why? I don't see anything wrong. Well, here's where you find out, Miss Lane. Look. See those two men climbing up on the speaker's platform? Yes. They look familiar. Say, well, that's Mr. Leonard, the editor of the Freeville Gazette. That's right. And Mr. Clayton, the ex-governor of the state. The one they call Uncle Ed. 
Yeah. You know there was a contested senator election in the state. Yes, I know. And they're going to run it off next month. Uncle Ed wants to be our next senator. Oh, I get it. Oh, let's listen to him talk. Just keep your ears open, Miss Lane. And now what is it? Well, now you let me tell you. You see, this here is our state, yours and mine. But without asking us for our permission, a few fellas in Washington saw fit to dump a heap of rascal foreigners on us. Foreigners? Yes, sir. They dumped them foreigners right down in our front yard and told us to wait. What does he mean, Jerry? He'll tell you in just a moment. That's what he always says, Miss Lane. How dare he say that? He's a hate peddler. That's the regular hate preacher's line. Just listen to him. That's a man. What a dirty lie. The land we veterans got was state-owned, reclaimed swamp land that nobody ever wanted before. I know. This is terrible, Jerry. Clayton and his gang are trying to discredit us because they know they can't make men who fought a war against Nazis vote for old Uncle Ed. He knows that we'll work against him and try to wake the people up to the fact that he peddles the same poison Hitler did. I know, Jerry. I'm beginning to understand a lot about the mystery in Freeville now. Say anything to get No, but wait a minute. That's very strange. He actually yeah, yeah. Why, he must wait. be the outsiders belong to that car Ray found back in the road. Wait, no, wait a minute. Don't move, you two. Now, look here. Don't you point those rifles at us. Hank, this is that reporter gal I told you about. It is. Put yeah. those guns down, you fools. Don't move, I said, or this gun will go off. Now, you look here. We haven't done anything Shut up, wrong man. And... Shut up and turn around. Now, wait a minute. You two, Barton. Hank, come along. Uncle Ed will want to see you. See us? What for? You say goodbye. But you two are going on a long trip. I start walking. Trapped, Lois Lane and Jerry Barton have no choice but to turn and march into the clearing, crowded by the long rifles of the two burly men wearing yellow suspenders. What will happen? We'll be back in a moment with the tense climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, you fellows know how often the girls win out in uh, spelling bees or reading contests? Well, nowadays, I'm hearing of a lot of times when the girls are winning out in collecting comic buttons in that new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pep. 
Of course, uh, whenever that happens, the boys get busy right away, and the race is on. Good fun it is, too, because everybody gets a kick out of those true-to-life pictures of, of your favorite comic strip characters, like Chief Brandon with his uniform and his official badge, and Tess Trueheart with her red hat and long blonde hair, and Superman himself, complete with bright blue jersey and flying red cape and Superman insignia. So, fellas, don't you let those girls get ahead of you. And girls, don't let the fellas get ahead of you. Everybody, pitch in. It's easy, you know. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy these comic buttons anywhere. But every time that you open a package of Kellogg's Pep, there's your snappy prize. And there's some mighty snappy eating, too, because Pep is a whiz of a breakfast cereal. Tastes a crisp and sunny and golden toasted that, well, you practically can't resist it. Pep's good for you, too. Mom knows it's a grand dish to start off a cold, wintry day. So ask Mom to get P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. As Lois Lane and Jerry Barton were captured by Uncle Ed Clayton's followers, Superman, mystified by his failure to find old Abner Sykes, the telegrapher, has returned to the hotel in Freeville where he had left Lois. Finding Lois gone, he has resumed the guise and garb of reporter Clark Kent and is questioning Mr. Keeler, the hotel manager. Lane left the hotel, Mr. Keeler? That's right, Mr. Kent, a couple of hours ago. But she promised to stay right here. Was she alone? No, she went out with Jerry Barton. Jerry Barton? Yes, uh, he's that young fellow. I know who he is, but have you any idea where they went? Well, I noticed them drive off in the car. That's all I know. Scott, I gave Lewis strict orders not to leave the hotel. Uh, what's that? Uh, never mind. Thanks, Mr. Keeler. Thank uh, you. You're, you're welcome. I don't like this. Got to find Lois. I've got a hunch that this time she's walked into real trouble. <laughs> Hurrying from the hotel, Clark Kent steps into an areaway and swiftly resumes his true identity of Superman. Then, up, up, and away! Leaping high into the bright sky, the Man of Steel rockets away, bound for Jerry Barton's farm. But as we know, Jerry and Lois Lane are in serious trouble, a long distance away from his farm. What will happen to the young war veteran and girl reporter who are now in the hands of the men of hate? Will Superman be able to trace them? And in time, don't miss Monday's thrilling episode, fellows and girls. Be sure to tune in. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, there's almost no end to the fun you can have with Kellogg's Variety. That's the white, green, and red Kellogg package with ten individual packages of your favorite Kellogg cereals, like Corn Flakes and Rice Krispies and Pet. You can take your choice every morning. Pick out your own private box of cereal. Makes breakfast a picnic. And sister will get a kick out of the cutout dolls on the bottom of the tray. Cut them out and dress them up and play all sorts of games with them. Tell mom to be sure to get Kellogg's. Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us on Monday for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, Superman, alarmed to find Lois Lane gone, speedily sets out to find her, little realizing that the girl reporter is already in the clutches of Freeville's bigoted villains. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. Say, you know how much fun it is to look through a photograph album? Well, you know, you've got a sort of photograph album in full view for everybody to see when you wear your collection of pep comic buttons pinned on your jacket or your dresser cap. 
Yes, sir, these bright-colored comic buttons in that new series that Kellogg's Pep is putting out are true-to-life pictures of your favorite funny paper friends. And there are 18 new and different buttons in the series. Characters like Pat Patton and Tess Trueheart and Chief Brandon and Vitamin Flintheart and Superman, of course. Boy, is it a load of fun collecting these Pep comic buttons and swapping duplicates with your friends, too. Boy, you wouldn't want to miss out. So hop to it, gang. Ask Mom to get you plenty of Kellogg's Pep. That's right. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy these comic buttons anywhere. All you do is to look for your prize every time you open a new package of Kellogg's Pep. And look for some mighty delicious eating, too, because Pep is loaded with catchy, sunny flavor, a golden toasted flavor that's got come on in every bite. Pep is called the Sunshine Cereal. It's mighty good for you with all that sunshine vitamin D plus energy vitamin B1. So, gang, get your good eating and exciting prizes from P.E.P., the Sunshine Cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. Soon after arriving in the farming area of Freeville to cover the story of a strange and ruinous drought, Clark Kent and Lois Lane received anonymous warnings to get out. And when they ignored the threats, an attempt was made on Lois's life. Then Abner Sykes, the elderly local telegrapher, was also attacked. Frightened, Sykes left the vicinity. And while Kent, a Superman, searched for the telegrapher, Lois went with Jerry Barton, a young war veteran, to a secret political rally held in the woods. There, they heard the Honorable Edward C. Clayton, known to the natives as Uncle Ed, ex-governor and now a candidate for senator, make a vicious, un-American speech. But before Lois and Jerry could leave, they were discovered by Uncle Ed's henchmen. And as we continue now, they stand in a far corner of a large clearing, guarded by a burly man with a rifle. Across the clearing, Uncle Ed is shaking hands with his departing followers, the local farmers and villagers, and their wives. Listen. Now look here, you. I'd advise you to put that rifle down and let us pass her up. I'd advise you to stay right where you are, Miss Lane. This gun is loaded, you know. That goes for you too, Bart. Nothing doing. You'd you better can't do make... what the man says, Miss Lane. Why should I, Jerry? After hold all, it. I'm. No, a... Hold it. Here comes Uncle Ed in prison. Oh, good. I want to tell him just what I think of an ex-governor and a man who wants to be senator making such a rabble-rousing speech and trying to turn one group of Americans against another. Well, well, what's this? Uh, seems to me I see the faces of two old friends. Friends, huh? <laughs> why, why, Miss Lane? It does me good to see your charming face again. Oh. Barton my hand, sir. Well, how, hold on, Mr. Clayton. Why? These folks can't be your friends. They they spy. Huh? What's that? Yeah, Hank and me caught them snooping around. How dare you call us spies? Why, of this? course you're not spies, Miss Lane. Why, why spies are emissaries from the enemy. But we haven't any enemies around here. Why, well, we're all brothers, fellow Americans, that is. Listen, you old friend. Now, Clark. look, you don't get it, Uncle Ed. This gal is a reporter from a big paper well, in the I know that, Charlie. I know that. I know she's a reporter from the Daily Planet. Great news. Newspaper, which spreads the gospel of liberty, fraternity, and free speech. Isn't that right, Miss Lane? Well, well, yes. But how dare you? Yes, get... sir. I always say, I always say that you can't have liberty without free speech. Yes, but free mm. speech doesn't yeah. mean the right to tell lies in order to incite people to violence. Huh? It doesn't give you license to turn one group against another the way you just did in your speech, Mister Clayton. You're well, right, my it. dear Miss Lane. I, I wasn't turning nobody against nobody. What do you call it when you say the war veterans who've been given homesteads in this county are foreign? Well, well, you I... know that's not true. <laughs> you know that they're all good Americans, boys who fought and bled for America. Well, now, well, now well, let, no. lots of them are foreigners. You can tell by the names and where the folks come from. According to the Bill of Rights, my bigoted friend, every American, regardless of how he spells his name or or parts his hair or or how he chooses to worship his God, is entitled to equal rights. And what's more, I fought the war with thousands of the men that you call foreigners. I fought by their side and I saw them die. Well, Nobody them. asked them what church they belonged to when they sent them out to fight the Germans and Japs. You bet they did. And no bullet ever drew a color line either. You see, that's just what I mean. What you what mean? You mean? Uh, yes, sir. That's exactly what I mean. All brothers under the grand old stars and stripes. Brother Americans, oh, that is. brother. Uh, you may quote me on that in your great paper, Miss Lane. I'll quote you, all right, you, you hypocritical windbag. I'll quote the un-Americanism, the, the, the Nazism that you just said. No, no, you won't do no such thing. Oh, yeah. County, you're not uh, going to get easy the there, Charlie. Easy, like I say. I believe in free speech. 
I believe in everything that says in the Bill of Rights and in the glorious Constitution. I'll just bet you do. Come on, Jerry. Uh, now, hold go. on there. Hold... Look here, Uncle Ed. You ain't going to let these two just walk Why, out. Why, of course I am, Charlie. Why not? They're friends of mine. But, but I tell However, you... however, Charlie, I, I want you and Hank to escort them. Uh, just so they'll be safe. Uh, you know what I mean? Well, Don't I... bother. I know the way. Uh, Come on, Miss Lane. Now, just a minute, friend Barton. Just a minute. Some what? of my other friends around here just might get the wrong idea about you, like uh, Charlie and Hank did. So I'm sending these two boys along with you to, uh, well, to make sure nothing will happen. Uh, Charlie, take them around by Cider Creek. Uh, meet less folks that way. But, but that... Uh... Oh, 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 yeah, I, I get it. Uh, Hank, uh, come over here. Wait a minute. We don't need your guard, Mr. Clayton. Of course we don't. We'd rather go along. No, no, don't argue, five friends. Uh, this here's my state, you know, and I personally see to it that nothing happens to anybody in it. Oh. So uh, you go along with the boys now. Well, I, I got to be getting along myself now, so good luck to you, Miss Lane. You, Mr. Barton. I don't like this, Miss Lane. He's up to something. What do you mean, Jerry? Well, he's being so nice to us. Okay, stop. okay. Get going, you two. Straight ahead. Come on, Jerry. I want to get back to see though anyway and see Clark Kent. Clayton mentioned Cider Creek. I know these parts pretty well. I never heard of any Cider Creek. You didn't? No. And besides, the way we're heading now, upstream, that's just the opposite way of the way we want to go. Well, gee, that's funny. Wait a minute. Let's stop a minute. Now, what are you stopping for? Keep them moving. Wait. I want to get something straight. First, I never heard of any Cider Creek. And second, I can tell from the sun that we're heading in the wrong direction. Yeah, well, me and my rifle says you're heading the right way, see? Get moving. But why are we going... Get on, get... Come on, Jerry. There's no use arguing. Well, okay. But something tells me we're in for trouble, Miss Lane. Bad trouble. Easily, Lois Lane and Jerry Barton walk in the direction indicated by Charlie and Hank. Follow silently, holding their rifles at the alert. Meanwhile, finding nobody at Jerry Barton's farm, Superman has arrived at the Legion Post, situated at a crossroads in the heart of the veterans' farm community. Once more, in his guise of Clark Kent, he is speaking to the only person there, a red-headed veteran named Don Smith. See, Don, Miss Lane left Freeville a couple of hours ago with Jerry Barton. I'm rather worried about it. Miss Lane's with Jerry. You've got nothing to worry about, Mr. Kent. And I can't be too sure. After all, one attempt was already made on her life. I hope you don't think we veterans were responsible. Well, no, but I... Don't believe everything you hear around Freeville. Certain people, important people, are trying to discredit us veterans and get us out of the state. I know, and I intend to find out about that. Right now, though, I'm worried about Miss Lane. Haven't you any idea where Jerry Barton is? All I can tell you, Mr. Kent, is that Jerry and Phil Dyer, another one of our boys, is on the trail of something important today. What is this something important, Don? I don't know. And I couldn't tell you if I did. They ought to be back any time now. Relax. <laughs> I guess I'll have to. Don't worry. Jerry and Phil know their way around. They... Uh-oh. Excuse me. What's the matter? Time for the weather report. Bet you we got the same old malarkey. What's that? Well... Oh, wait a minute. Weather There's forecast Mr. Cheerful now. Weather vicinity. Heavy rains. Continuing rains? through the day and into the night. For tomorrow? Ah, I heard enough. Same old stuff, all right. Wait a minute, Don. That means your dry spell is broken. Are you kidding? We've been getting reports of rain every day for the past month. You have? Sure. This is supposed to be the rainy season out here, you know. I know. So every day, every day, the weatherman says that it's raining here. And every day he's talking through his hat. Well, that's strange. You're telling me. Very strange. I wonder... What? No, no, it can't be. Just the same, I'll look into that as soon as I find Lois. Oh, where are your friends and Miss Lane? Why don't they get easy, back? Easy, easy, Mr. Kent. They'll be back any minute, I'm sure. I certainly hope so. But frankly, I'm worried, Don. Badly worried. Dreadfully, Clark Kent paces the floor of the little Legion post, waiting for Jerry Barton and Phil Dyer to return with Lois Lane. What is happening to Lois and Jerry Barton? We'll be back in a moment to find out, so stand by. Say, there's a girl in our neighborhood who's always been mighty fond of Brenda Starr. Follows her adventures regularly in the funny papers, so she was mighty thrilled when she found that Brenda is one of the characters in that new series of comic buttons that that Kellogg's Pep is putting out. So thrilled, in fact, that she started to specialize in collecting Brenda Starr buttons. And she already has five of them pinned right on her jacket. Of course, most of the fellows and girls in the gang think that it's more fun to collect different buttons. And that's why uh, they want Cindy and and Vitamin Flint Heart and 
Superman and all the others. Of course, however you do it, it's doggone exciting fun. As you know, the best part is these comic buttons are so easy to get. You don't send in any money, not even the box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. But there's one of these exciting prizes in every package of Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. The crisp, tender whole wheat flakes with that catchy sunshine flavor. Makes a mighty good eating for breakfast. So crisp and, and fresh and toasty that, well, you want to pitch right in and eat hearty. And that's always a good idea on a cold morning. Yes, sir, Kellogg's Pep is mighty good for you. Mom knows that. So remind her to get plenty of P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. Closely guarded and followed by two armed men, yellow suspender-wearing followers of Uncle Ed Clayton, Lois Lane and Jerry Barton have proceeded to follow an almost impenetrable trail through a dense forest. Now they are ordered to halt. I wonder what we're stopping here for. Because from here on in, you go alone. What? Alone? Yeah, you don't need no more escort. But where are we? How do we get out to the... Well, you know, straight ahead about 50 yards, and you'll have nothing to worry about. Wait a minute. Does that take us out on the highway? Yeah. End of the trail, sort of. And the beginning of a new road. A new road? I don't like the sound of this, Jerry. No, neither do I. Get along with you now. Don't try coming back this way, because we'll be waiting. Go on. Well, all right. But that highway better be there. Come on, Miss Lane. Okay. But keep your eyes open, Jerry. Remember what I said now? Don't try coming back this way. Just keep right on walking. Yeah, just keep on walking till you fetch up in the quicksand, Bob. <laughs> yeah. They'll be in that quicksand in a minute. When we hear them thrashing and yelling, we'll know they'll never give us nor Uncle Ed no more trouble. Smiling evilly, the two men stand by and watch cold-bloodedly as Lois Lane and Jerry Barton unwittingly walk directly toward a hidden quicksand bog. And what seems like certain death. What will happen as Superman, still unaware of their predicament, waits fretfully for news of them? There's a thrill a minute in tomorrow's exciting episode, gang, so don't miss it. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, what'll you have, gang? Kellogg's Corn Flakes, Rice Krispies, Pep, or one of your other favorite Kellogg cereals? Well, you can take your pick every morning at breakfast when Mom sets out Kellogg's Variety. Sure, that's the white, green, and red package with ten individual packages, each one a serving just for you. One day you'll choose a shredded cereal, next day uh, one that's pop, next day a flake cereal made from corn, wheat, or rice. Everyone's a treat because it's a favorite Kellogg's cereal. It's a grand variety to make breakfast a picnic of fun because it's Kellogg's variety. Remind Mom to get you Kellogg's variety and be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, Superman gets a hunch that means the beginning of the end of the evil mystery strangling the town of Freevale. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, I'll bet there's nothing that you look forward to more eagerly than following the adventures of your favorite characters in the funny papers. That's why those comic buttons in the new series that come as prizes and packages of Kellogg's Pet are making such a hit. Because it's just as if these folks like the Little Moose and uh, Goofy and Beezy and Superman had come alive. You have their bright colored pictures on sturdy white enameled metal buttons that you're mighty proud to wear pinned on your jacket or your dresser cap. 
Yes, sir, every single one of these 18 new and different buttons is a honey. And remember, these pep comic buttons are easy to get. You don't have to spend a single penny of your allowance. You don't even have to send in a box stop. Actually, you can't buy these buttons anywhere. They come only as prizes in packages of Kellogg's Pep. That's P-E-P, the sunshine cereal. Yes, and Pep's a dish that's just right for breakfast these cold mornings. It's so sunny and, and golden toasted and delicious. Why, that famous sunshine flavor is so doggone tantalizing, your spoon keeps digging in for more. And before you know it, your bowl's polished clean as a whistle. Mom likes that because Pep's so good for you. So ask her to get you some Kellogg's Pep next time she goes shopping. And now, the adventures of Superman. While Superman searched for them, Lois Lane and Jerry Barton, a young war veteran, were eavesdropping at a secret political rally in the woods at which Edward C. Clayton, rabble-rousing ex-governor and senatorial candidate, made a vicious, un-American speech. Discovered by Clayton's henchmen, Lois and Jerry, to their surprise, were greeted cordially by Clayton, who assigned two men to escort them safely through the woods. After a long walk, the men instructed them to continue straight ahead, saying they would soon reach a highway. The men then departed, chuckling over the fact that the girl reporter and the war veteran were headed directly toward a deadly bog of quicksand. As we continue now, Lois and Jerry have emerged from the trees, where before them stretches what appears to be a mossy clearing. Listen. Look, Jerry, you can see the highway through those trees. Gee, our tough friends were on the level after all. Well, it's a highway, all right, Miss Lane. But it's miles from where we left my car. I wonder what was the idea they're bringing us way out here. Well, Clayton said we might get hurt if we ran into any of his followers. Maybe that's why he sent us the long way round. Maybe. But I wouldn't trust that guy as far as I can throw a Sherman tank, Miss Lane. Well, neither would I, but he wouldn't dare let anything happen to us. I don't know about that. Well, we'll talk about him later. Right now, I'm anxious to get back to Freeville and tell Clark Kent all about this, Jerry. Have you got your breath back? Sure. Come on, then. Let's go. Okay. When we get on the highway, we'll fire the car and we get... Jerry! Look out! What the... Jerry! I... I can't walk! Gee, who's the Miss Lane? We've walked into a quicksand floor. Oh, no! Yes! Look... Stop threshing around. It'll only pull you under faster. But, but I've got... Try to work your way over that limb. It's hanging over the edge of the bog. But... We can but, get get a hold of those branches. We can pull ourselves out. But I... I can't move. I keep sinking deeper. you got to keep trying, Miss Lane. You've got to. It's no use, Jerry. I'm almost down to my waist now. Try to keep calm, Miss Lane. I'm getting closer to that tree. No, you're not. You're... You're thinking, you! Help! Help! No use yelling. That's no use. Help! Nobody can hear us on the highway. It's too far. There's nobody around here. But those men who led us here, Charlie and Hank, they can't be far away. Charlie! Hank! Don't waste your breath Help! calling them. Stop it, Miss Lane. Can't you see they planned for us to fall in this bog? What? Sure. Do you remember that Clayton rat told him to take us by way of Cider Creek? But I said there wasn't any Cider Creek. Oh, oh! Well, he obviously meant for them to lead us into this quicksand. Get rid of us that way so that we couldn't spread the story of how he's feeding natives hate poison down here. Oh, if I can only get my hands on him. I'm afraid you never will, Jerry. Look, it's over my waist now. In a few minutes. Don't lose your head, Miss oh. Lane. I'll get to that limb somehow. Oh, Jerry... Clark told me not to leave the hotel. He said I'd get into trouble if I did. Never mind that now. Just take it easy. While I try to reach that tree. As Lois Lane feels herself being dragged deeper and deeper into the bottomless depths of treacherous quicksand, Jerry Barton continues his valiant but hopeless attempt to reach the overhanging branch of a nearby tree. A feat which, in his heart, he knows is hopeless. But meanwhile, several miles away at the Veterans Legion post, Superman, in disguise of Clark Kent, is questioning Phil Dyer, a friend of Jerry Barton's, who has just come in. Well, tell me about this political meeting you say Jerry took Miss Lane to, Dyer. Well, Mr. Kent, I found out this morning that Ed Clayton was going to hold a hate rally back in the woods for the natives around here. You mean the ex-governor, the one they call Uncle Ed? Yeah, that's the one. He's running for senator now, you know. Yes. When I found out what precautions his gang was taking to keep all outsiders away from the meeting, I figured it was big stuff. 
So I told Jerry, and we decided to smuggle you in. Now, wait a minute, but... wait a minute. What, what do you mean they were taking precautions to keep outsiders away? What precautions? Oh, Uncle Ed had guards spread all through the woods. Tough gents with rifles and pistols. Uh-oh, and you let Miss Lane walk into that setup? No, I didn't want to, Mr. Kent, but she insisted. Yeah, she would. I did my best to argue her out of it. Oh, all right, never mind that now. Wh- where is this meeting being held? About nine miles south of here in a big clearing near Puddler's Stream. Thanks very much, Dyer. I'll see you later. Well, uh, wait. I- I'll drive you over in my car. Oh, thanks, but I, uh, I have my own transportation. So long. <laughs> Hurrying from the Legion Post Park, Kent steps into a grove of trees, strips off his business suit to reveal the blue costume and red cape of Superman. Then, up, up, and away! <laughs> Leaping high into the air, Superman rockets away to the south, over fields and woods, and checks his flight above a large clearing near a stream, where a rough plank platform stands. That must be the clearing Phil Dyer meant. Nobody here now, though. Lois and Jerry must have left with the others and gone back to Freeville. Well, that's a relief. Now I can turn back. Wait a minute. What's that? Every sense alert, Superman poses motionless in in midair. As far in the distance, over the sounds of birds and stream and rustling trees, he hears a faint call, a human call for help. He listens, his amazingly acute hearing strained, his X-ray vision piercing the forest. Then, that's a man and a woman calling for help. Away! Great Scott. Lois and Jerry Barton, unconscious and being dragged under the surface of a quicksand bog. Down to them. Down! (laughs) Lois. Jerry. Oh, if only I'm not too late. I've got to get them to a doctor in a hurry. Up with them now. There we are. Up and away! Clenching the unconscious Lois Lane and Jerry Barton free of the treacherous quicksand, Superman streaks away to find a doctor. Have the men of hate succeeded in silencing Lois and Jerry? We'll find out in just a moment. So stand by. You know, when Mom opens a new package of Kellogg's Pep, it's a real occasion. In the first place, you're always glad to have plenty of Pep to eat for breakfast. And then every package means that you get a new comic button to add to your collection. And that's an extra thrill. If it's a duplicate, why, that's even more fun because then you can trade with your friends. And you know, fellows and girls tell me that these new series comic buttons are just about the best-looking things they ever saw. First off, they're true-to-life pictures of your favorite funny paper characters like Judy and Carkey and, and Vitamin Flintheart and Superman himself. Then they're done up in such bright colors that, well, you're proud to wear them pinned on your jacket or your dress or cap. So... Hop to it, gang. Get all 18 different buttons in this new series. And you don't have to send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere, but you'll find your exclusive prize in every package of Kellogg's Pep you open. That's the Sunshine Cereal. Tastes so catchy and golden at breakfast that you want to eat lots, which is always a good idea because Pep's particularly good for you these wintry days when there's not so much sunshine around. Pep helps keep your supply up of, of good old sunshine vitamin D. Yes, sir. Mom will be glad to get you some P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. After bringing Lois Lane and Jerry Barton to the home of a nearby country doctor, Superman soon learned that they would be all right. Then, leaving, he reappeared a short time later in the guise and garb of Clark Kent. And as we rejoin our friends now in the doctor's library, Lois and Jerry, wearing clothing donated by the doctor and his wife, sit in large chairs, relating their experience to Kent. You see, Clark... Uncle Ed Clayton wanted to get rid of Jerry and me so we couldn't report the kind of un-American poison we heard him feeding the natives down here. That's right. No, no, I I don't think that's the reason. Why, of course it is. We know now that it was his men who tried to scare you and me out of town. He did that so we couldn't find out how he's working to discredit the war veterans who've been given homesteads in this county. Men who represent a threat to his vicious political machine. She's right, Mr. Kent. Clayton knows that if he doesn't get rid of us veterans, we'll get rid of him eventually. Well, that may be true, Jerry, Why, but Jerry I still... tells me that Uncle Ed owns most of the town. The hotel, Fred Leonard's newspaper, practically everything. Yeah. Sure. Why, Fred Leonard is Uncle Ed's stooge, Ken. And that's why everybody walked away when we tried to question them, Clark. They were either working for Uncle Ed or else Or they were... were afraid of his goon squad. That's right. He's undoubtedly given orders not to talk to strangers. 
particularly reporters who would let the rest of the country know that the Honorable Ed Clayton, three times governor and now candidate for the Senate, has set up a regular little Nazi Germany right in this state. Well, that was waste effort, Lois, because the rest of the country already suspects that Clayton is a hate monger and rabble rouser. What? Well, then, then why don't they do something about it? That's a matter for the people of this state themselves to handle, Jerry. Oh, I see. No, Uncle Ed didn't try to get rid of you to keep his rotten tactics a secret, and the people of Freeville weren't worried about us discovering that either. Well, then why did they all look so frightened, and why did they walk away when we tried to question them? Because we questioned them about the drought. So what? I don't see what you're driving at. Neither do I, Kent. I'm not exactly sure myself, but something happened at the Legion Post today, and... Wait a minute. You, you said Clayton said something about the drought at his meeting in the woods today? Oh, yes, but it wasn't important. Well, tell me again what he said, Lawrence. It's really a laugh, Clark. He said he'd been praying to heaven to help him in his fight against the foreign war veterans. To heaven? Yes, and he said that heaven had answered his prayers. What? Uh-huh. He said that because of his prayers, there'd been no rain. <laughs> and what was more, there wouldn't be any rain until the veterans' crops were completely ruined and the veterans were broken financially and forced to leave the state. Clayton said that? He certainly did, didn't he, Jerry? That's right. Why, can you imagine that windbag claiming to have a direct line to heaven? Why, that's blasphemy, that's what it is. And utter nonsense, which anybody in his right mind would laugh at. I don't know, Lois. Maybe Clayton knew what he was talking about. What? Are you out of your mind, Clark? Oh, I, I don't mean that I believe his prayers had anything to do with the drought, but... But maybe, just maybe, we've stumbled on the wildest, most amazing plot in history. <laughs> Puzzled, Lois Lane and Jerry Barton stare at Clark Kent, wondering what he can possibly mean by saying they may have stumbled on the most amazing plot in history. Does Kent suspect that Uncle Ed Clayton, the politician who plays on ignorant men's prejudices, can be responsible for a drought? How could that be? Don't fail to be with us tomorrow when Kent explains his theory, and more exciting and surprising things happen. Tune in tomorrow, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at this same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, it's more fun than a picnic gang to open up your own individual package of your favorite Kellogg cereal, pour on milk, and eat right out of the box. That's the Kell Bowl Pack in Kellogg's Variety. Saves washing dishes, and Mom likes Kellogg's Variety because it's got those nutritious Kellogg cereals that are so good for you. Ten packages in all, different Kellogg cereals like Pep and Rice Krispies and Corn Flakes in a handy white, green, and red package. Just be sure it's Kellogg's, Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the Sunshine Cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, as Superman tries to prove his conviction that Freeville's drought is man-made, he is unaware of the brutal obstacles planted in his way. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, there's one thing that I'm sure about, and that's that both fellas and girls hate to miss out on anything exciting. That's why all the gang's getting such a kick out of collecting those nifty comic buttons in that new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pet. Because you're really in the swim when you sport a jacket or a dress or cap with these colorful buttons pinned on it. You want everybody to, to know how many different funny paper characters you've collected, too. Old favorites like Chief Brandon and Tess Trueheart and, and Superman himself. And, you know, it's even more exciting to trade duplicates with your friends. 
And these pet comic buttons are so doggone good-looking that, well, you just show me a fellow or girl who, who would want to miss out on even one of the 18 new and different buttons in the series. Now, how you get these pep comic buttons is important. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. All you do is to ask Mom to get you a good supply of Kellogg's Pep and look inside every package for your prize. And you'll find some mighty swell eating in a package of Pep, too. A breakfast dish with a sunny, golden toasted flavor that's mighty satisfying these cold, wintry mornings. Every single whole wheat flake is crisp. Every spoonful gives your morning appetite a real lift. So ask Mom to get you some P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. When Lois Lane, reporter for the Metropolis Daily Planet, heard Uncle Ed Clayton, ex-governor and now a candidate for the Senate, make a vicious, un-American speech against the war veterans who had taken homesteads in his county... She thought she had solved the mystery of Freeville. But Clark Kent, who as we know is Superman, said she was not entirely right and declared that the recent attacks on Lois, a young war veteran named Jerry Barton, and on old Abner Sykes, the local telegrapher, were somehow tied up with a prolonged dry spell in the community. As we continue now, Kent is querying Lois and Jerry Barton about their recent experience with the demagogue Ed Clayton. Listen. Now, let me get this straight, Lois. You say that in his speech at that secret rally, Uncle Ed said his prayers were responsible for the drought? That's right, Clark. He said heaven wouldn't let any rain fall until the veterans' crops were ruined and they were forced to leave the state. Did you ever hear such nonsense? And blasphemy. Uh, that's blasphemy, all right, but I think it's a tip-off to what is probably the most amazing plot in history. A plot? Well, what do you mean, Mr. Kent? Well, it's just a foggy notion at the moment, Jerry. It'll sound wild and incredible, but... Will you please tell us what you're driving at, Clark? Oh, wait a minute, Lord. Let's go over this one step at a time. You came to Freeville to cover a simple human interest story on the drought, didn't you? Well, yes, of course. Well, when you but... tried to talk to the natives, they looked frightened and walked away without answering, right? Well, yes, but that's because practically everyone around Freeville works for Uncle Ed Clayton, or has other reasons to be afraid of him, and they know he doesn't like strangers around, particularly reporters who would discover that the Honorable Mr. Clayton has practically set up a little Nazi Germany in this state. That's right, Mr. Kent, and that's why Clayton's men tried to get rid of Miss Lane and me in that quick sandbog when they caught us listening in on that speech that he made to his followers. No, Jerry. Uh -uh. Clayton knows that the rest of the country is pretty well aware of his being a rabble-rouser and hate-monger. He wasn't afraid of your discovering that. Well, then why does he resort to secret meetings? Because he'd rather no one other than his faithful followers would know what he'd said about the drought. The drought? Mm -hmm. You mean that nonsense about his prayers causing it? That's right. Look, I may be thick, Clark, but I don't get it. Oh, neither do I. Well, look, why, despite this being the rainy season, and despite the fact that the weather reports called for rain practically every day for the past month, has there been no rain? I don't know, but... Mr. Kent, you don't really believe that Ed Clayton's prayers had anything to do with it, do you? Of course not. But I'm not so sure that Ed Clayton himself doesn't have something to do with it. Are you kidding? Look, you just Wait said Wait a minute, that Jerry. We're... Clark, are you trying to say that you think Uncle Ed, by some, some hocus-pocus or other, keeps the rain away from Freeville? That's my hunch, Lois. Oh, now, look, Clark. I told you it would sound wild and incredible. Wild and incredible? Why, it sounds crazy, mad, just out of this world. It certainly does. Well, I never Wait, heard I... anything so ridiculous in my whole life. Now, look, Uncle but... Ed Clayton, the rain preventer. Well, I only... And that from you, a newspaper reporter. If you listen just for a Listen's moment, a I'll... Lot. For my money, Uncle Ed is simply taking advantage of an unusual drought to play on the superstitions and prejudices of the natives. I think that's the answer, Kent. Clayton would do anything to get rid of us veterans because he knows that the men who fought Hitler won't stand for his setting himself up as a Hitler right here in the USA. Well, that's true, but... but... as for his being able to cause a drought, but just in order to break us and drive us out of the state, well, that's just plain silly. And how? Okay, you both had your say and you may be right, but before I say more, I'm going to take a little trip and I'd like you to come along, Lois. Where are you going? To the nearest weather observation station. Happen to know where that is, Jerry? Sure, that's in Rawlings, about 18 miles north of here. Fine. Now, well, wait I... a minute. Why do you want to go there, Clark? You called me a bum reporter a moment ago. Don't you, as a good reporter, think that 30 days of rain predictions followed by 30 days of drought deserves a statement from a meteorologist? Well, yes. How do we get to Rawlings, Jerry? Oh, that's easy. Just about every northbound train out of Freeville goes through Rawlings. Okay. Now, look, you lay low until we get back, Jerry. Okay, Mr. Don't King. worry. You fellas are not licked yet. Sit tight until you hear from us. Come on, Lois. <laughs> Leaving Jerry Barton, Kent and Lois go to the Freeville Depot and take a train to Rawlings. But a short time later, they're in the office of John Murray, chief county meteorologist, where they question the weatherman. 
Murray. How can you explain the fact that your weather predictions have been wrong for 30 days? Frankly, Mr. Kent, I can't explain it. You see, our predictions are based on reports which come in constantly by teletype from as many as 1,000 to 1,500 observers. That many observers? That's right, Miss Lane. They are men stationed throughout the country at levels ranging from 1,000 to 30,000 feet above sea level to report on the precipitation, atmospheric pressure, wind velocity, and so on in their areas. Yes. Then we record all reports on surface synoptic and pressure charts. I see. From all that data assembled and charted, we're then able to predict with reasonable accuracy the weather in a given area up to 72 hours in advance. And how come you've been so wrong about Freeville? I can't understand it. Ordinarily, there's a good deal of rain in that area during this season. Well, would you call it a, a freak of nature? I can't give any other explanation. Usually, when such a phenomenon occurs, we can trace some warm air currents which evaporate the moisture in the saturated clouds, thus causing drought. But... Wait a minute. What, what, what's that about warm air currents, Mr. Murray? Well, during the war, our meteorologists in the African desert saw their predictions go haywire, then discovered that freak air currents, apparently coming from nowhere, suddenly spiraled up from the desert sand. I see. But there's no desert around Freeville. I know, Kent. There are mountains, of course, and they often affect the atmosphere and rain clouds. But mountains never caused a situation like this, did they? No, never to my knowledge. This drought has me stumped. Well, I guess that's that, Clark. Excuse me, Lois. Look, Mr. Murray, you say that warm air currents can evaporate the moisture in a saturated cloud? That's right. Well, have you ever heard of anyone being able to uh, create warm air currents in amounts large enough to affect rainfall? Oh, well, King. Oh, come now, Clark. Are you still harping on that now? Just a minute, Now, Lois. stop being silly. Clark has the wild idea, Mr. Murray, that Lois. Uncle, uh, uh, that that somebody might be deliberately doing something to prevent the rain from falling over Freeville. Did you ever hear anything so absurd? Well, is it absurd, Mr. Murray? I'm afraid it is, Kent. There, you see? Of course, there are a lot of experiments being conducted. I won't say that in time precipitation won't be able to be controlled over a given area, but... But you don't think anyone's discovered a way of doing that yet? I'm afraid not. You know the old saying, everybody talks about the weather, but nobody can do anything about it. Are you satisfied now, Clark? Uh, not exactly, but it seems I'm overruled by experts. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Murray. You're quite welcome. I hope you won't be too hard on me in your newspaper. Oh, no, of course not. It isn't your fault. Right. Goodbye, and thanks again. Goodbye, Mr. Murray. Goodbye. Well, what do we do now? We didn't get much of a story to put on the wires, Clark. And, oh, if I know the chief, he's going to be hopping mad. Uh, if I could only find old Abner. What did you say? Abner Sykes, you know, the old Freeville telegrapher. Good grief, I forgot all about him. Weren't you able to find him, Clark? No, and that's another thing I can't understand. He just seems to have disappeared. Now, come on, let's get out of here. Well, that proves my theory, then. Hmm? What theory? That after somebody tried to shoot him, undoubtedly one of dear old Uncle Ed's hootlums, Sykes just up and left Freeville. Well, could be, but that also proves my theory. What's your theory? That after Sykes knows something very important, something Uncle Ed Clayton didn't want him to tell us. And my hunch is that what he knows is the secret of the drought. What are you talking about, Clark? You just heard that it isn't a secret. It's a freak, a freak of nature. Maybe, but... Look, Lois, there's a nice-looking restaurant across the street. Go on over and have something to eat while you wait there for me, will you? Wait for you? Where are you going? I, uh, uh I've got a little idea I want to check. Oh, no. Now, now, go on. Be a good girl and have dinner without me. I'll be back soon. So long. Hurrying away from Lois, Clark Kent walks around the municipal building, stops in a dark areaway, and then strips to the blue costume and red cape of Superman. Well, maybe I am all wet, but I want to have a look around Freeville again just to double-check. Up! And away! Leaping up into the twilight sky, Superman rockets away to the Freeville area of village, farms, and spreading woodland, where, for several minutes, he moves slowly through the air, searching the terrain below him. Then he streaks away to the looming mountains, swooping and coasting above them, his keen eyes continuously probing. Finally, as the evening closes in, he shakes his head ruefully. Well, looks as if Lois, Jerry Barton, and Mr. Murray were right and I was wrong, because there's nothing the least bit suspicious around here. This drought must be a natural one, freak of nature, so that's that. Huh, wait a minute. What's that far over there in the woods? It looks like... Yes, it is. Away! Calling on every ounce of speed in his muscles, Superman rockets away toward the distant woods, where something has excited his interest. What has he seen? We'll be back in a moment to find out, so stand by. 
You know, it seems like every time two or more kids get together these days, they start right off talking about those swell comic buttons in the new series from packages of Kellogg's Pep. At school recess or after school or on weekends, you fellows and girls are mighty busy comparing notes on how many pep comic buttons you've collected so far. And trading duplicates, too. Boy, that's a load of fun. Maybe you have two little moose buttons, but you don't have a Superman yet. And then uh, maybe one of your friends has a duplicate Superman but needs the little moose. So you swap. And each one has a new comic button to add to his collection. And you know, the best part is, your fun keeps right on. Sure, because there were 18 different buttons in this new series. So, how's about asking Mom to get you some more Kellogg's Pep? You don't send in any money for these swell prizes, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. But you get a comic button every time you open a new package of Kellogg's Pep. That's Pep, the sunshine cereal. The good whole wheat flakes with a catchy sunshine flavor. So crisp and tender and fresh that, well, it makes you glad when breakfast time rolls around. Why, Pep tastes a doggone toasty and golden. Your appetite warms right up on a cold morning. So, gang, get your prizes and your good eating in P.E.P., the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. As we rejoin him now, Superman has arrived over a patch of woods high on a mountain slope. Looking down, he observes a mass of flames whose flickering brightness had drawn his attention from far away. There's a cabin on fire. Uh Uh-oh, a man inside the cabin, unconscious. Down to him. Down! Ah, There he is. Now, let's... Great Scott! It's the Freeville Telegrapher. Old Abner Sykes! For a startled moment, Superman stares at the unconscious old man for whom he had searched in vain. The one person he is certain can solve the riddle which has so far stumped him. The relation between the drought and Uncle Ed Clayton, the man of hate. Then a split second later, Superman streaks upward from the blazing cabin with Abner Sykes in his arms. Will the telegrapher live and be able to reveal what he knows about the mystery of the Freeville drought? We'll know more tomorrow, gang. So don't miss the next thrilling episode in this exciting story of mystery and intrigue. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow. Same time, same station. Remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pet. Superman is brought to you at the same time, Monday through Friday. Say, gang, breakfast is a picnic all year round when there's Kellogg's variety on the table. That's the white, green, and red Kellogg package with ten individual packages. Each one a serve-yourself portion of one of your favorite Kellogg cereals. Different Kellogg cereals to choose from. And whatever you pick, you know it'll be crisp and fresh and good because it's Kellogg's. One day you'll want Kellogg's Pep, the next Rice Krispies, and then Corn Flakes, and so on down the line. So ask Mom to get Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet... More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, Clark Kent and Lois Lane wait anxiously for the recovery of Abner Sykes, fully realizing that the old telegrapher possesses the only key to Freeville's mysterious and devastating drought. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, it's hard to tell who's having the most fun collecting those swell comic buttons in that new series from packages of Kellogg's Pep. The fellas or the girls. Fact is, all you members of the gang are having a whale of a lot of fun, and there's a lot of rivalry to see whether fellas or girls can collect the most different buttons. Well, it's almost like a race. And these pictures of your favorite comic strip characters are so doggone bright and smart looking, everybody wants to collect all 18 in the series. That's right. 18 different comic strip characters and all, like Brenda Starr and, and Cindy and Spud and the Little Moose and uh, Goofy and Beezy and Judy and Corky and Superman, of course. So you better hop to it, gang. 
and these exciting comic buttons are really easy to get, you just ask Mom to get you a good supply of Kellogg's Pet and look for your prize inside every package you open. That's right. You don't have to send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy these comic buttons anywhere, but you get one plus loads of good breakfast eating in every package of Kellogg's Pet. The whole wheat flakes with a catchy golden toasted flavor that always tastes like more. Pep's good for you, too. It has extra amounts of energy, vitamin B1, and good old sunshine vitamin D. So ask Mom to get P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. Incredible as it seemed, Clark Kent, who, as we know, is Superman, was unable to down to the suspicion that Uncle Ed Clayton, rabble-rousing ex-governor and senatorial candidate, was somehow responsible for the prolonged drought in the Freeville area, where 300 war veterans who strongly opposed Uncle Ed's un-American tactics had taken homesteads. After a thorough search of the area failed to verify his suspicions, however, Superman was about to admit he had been mistaken when he spotted a fire in a patch of woods on a distant mountain slope. Streaking there, he found a small cabin ablaze, and in the cabin, the unconscious figure of old Abner Sykes, the local telegrapher who had recently disappeared. As we continue now in a restaurant many miles away, Lois Lane has been called to the telephone. Listen. Hello? That you, Lois? Yes, Clark. That's right. Listen. Look, want... Clark, I thought you were coming right back. Where are you? Well, about 80 or 90 miles away. 80 or now 90 look... miles away? Yes, in the mountains. Clark, what him. are you talking about? How could you be that far away? You only left here a half an hour ago. Oh, look, Lois, will you please stop interrupting? This is important. But how... Oh, all right. What is it, Clark? I get this. The municipal building, which is across the street from where you are, should be deserted by now. Yes. Also, it'll be dark out in front. Well, what of it? If you'll walk across the street, a friend of ours will pick you up and bring you out here. What friend will bring me where? Will you please stop asking questions and do as you're told? We haven't any time to lose. You're certainly being mysterious, I must say. I don't see oh, what... Oh, Lois, why don't you cooperate Oh, for all right, all right. I'll pay my dinner check immediately and go across the street. And there, a little man with a long white beard and a magic carpet will be waiting for me, I suppose, right? Well, you're pretty close, but... What? Get going, Lois. I'll see you later. So long. So long. <laughs> Trust Clark Kent to be mysterious. And all the time, I'm sure he's just building atmosphere so he can keep me waiting out here for an hour and then show up with some cock and bull story about how they... <gasps> Hope I didn't keep you waiting long, Miss Lane. Superman! That's right. You ready to take a little ride with me? Ride? With you? Uh-huh. Why, certain... Uh, wait a minute. What? Are you the friend Clark Kent said would call for me? Yes. Now, if you're ready... Where is Clark? Well... And since when are you running a taxi service for him? Look, Miss Lane, I'm afraid some people across the street have spotted me, and that means there'll be a crowd around us in a moment, so if you're ready, let's get going. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Yes, of course I'm ready. All right, up with you then. There. Now, up and away! You all right, Miss Lane? Oh, yes. Regular airplanes are going to seem pretty tame after this. And I take it you like Kent's taxi service. Yes. So that reminds me. What? What are you doing here? And where is Clark? And how do Uh you... Oh, one question at a time, Miss Lane. It just happens that the story you and Kent are working on interests me. Oh, you mean the story about... I mean Uncle Ed Clayton's attempt to rule this state as a tyrannical demagogue and to promote anti-racial hate makes him a menace to America and to everything America stands for. It certainly does. But look... About Clark. What? Apparently, you were just in contact with him. What's well, he I just doing? made a little discovery, and I'm leaving Kent and you to follow it through. Really? What is it? You'll see for yourself in a moment. Hang on. Here we go down to those woods. Now! There we are, Miss Lane. Yes, but... But where are we? See that little cabin? Or the charred remains of a cabin just up the hill there? Oh, yes. Well, go on up. You'll find Clark Kent in there, and a surprise. A surprise? Yes. I'll see you later. But wait a minute, Superman. Kent will explain everything. Goodbye, Miss Lane. Up and away! Rocketing up from the little clearing, Superman disappears like a bolt into the sky. But unknown to Lois Lane, who hurries up the narrow winding path to the half-burned little cabin clinging to the side of the wooded mountain, the Man of Steel has plummeted to Earth on the other side of the cabin. There, swiftly resuming his guise and garb of Clark Kent, he slips around to the door just as Lois arrives, somewhat out of breath. Oh, there you are, Clark. Hello, Lois. What's going on here? What is this Come all inside. about? I've got a surprise for you. Really? Mm-hmm. Superman said he discovered something. Is that it? You bet. 
Watch where you step, Lois. We have uh, have a little fire here, as you can see. A little fire? There's practically nothing left of this cabin. Now listen, Wait Clark. What... Look. <gasps> Who? Who's that man lying on the couch? Whom does it look like? What? Why, it's Abner Sykes. That's right. But but where did you find him? How are you he... feeling now, Mr. Sykes? Oh, might better. Good. Look, how did that you find... That Superman fella get my condenser? Yes, he got it. Now, wait a minute. Okay, I'll set up the receiver then and... Oh! Nope, can't make it yet. Too weak. Well, you'd better rest a while. You had a bad time. Look, Clark, I wish you'd tell what me what... What time is it? It's, uh... Just ten minutes of eight in the evening. Yes, and time you told got me got a what... few minutes left to get my strength back then. Signals don't usually come in four eight. Tell me more about these signals, what Mr. Sykes. What in heaven's name are you talking about? And what are you doing here, Mr. Sykes? And why Hold on, Miss t- Lane. Don't nobody talk to me till I get my strength back. No, but listen. Won't say nothing. Better be quiet, Lois. Just relax for a few minutes. Relax? Good heavens, of all the maddening people I ever saw. Clark, you've got to tell me, what is all this? What is Mr. Sykes doing in these mountains in a burned-out cabin? Hiding out, for one thing, Lois. But why? And, also... and why did he leave Freeville so suddenly the other day? For the reason that you figured. He was afraid the same man or men who shot at him would try again. You mean Uncle Ed Clayton's men? I think so. That right, Mr. Sykes? He ain't ready to talk yet. Well, go on, Clark, you tell me. Why did Clayton's men try to shoot him? Because Mr. Sykes knows something. Something he was going to tell us. And unless I'm very much mistaken, it has something to do with the drought in Freeville. What do you mean? Well, that's what I want Mr. Sykes to tell us. Oh, well, listen, Mr. Sykes. Quiet. He ain't talking yet. Oh, for the love of Mike, how long is this... Easy, Lois. Go- Wait a minute. He did have a pretty rough time. You see, somebody hit him on the head a little while ago, knocked him unconscious, and then set this cabin on fire. Good heavens! Then how did you... Well, I... uh, I mean, Superman got here just in time to save him and and save what's left of this cabin. And he saved my shortwave receiver. That's the important thing. Oh? Are you ready to talk now? Uh, yep. Well, who struck you and set the cabin on fire? The scientist feller. And another one. Who? What scientist fellow? Same one I went to see yesterday about them signals I've been picking up. Feller works for the county. What signals are you talking about, and why did you... Should have known better than to go to him when Uncle Ed gives out all the jobs in this county. You mean Mr. Clayton was responsible for this last attack on you, too? Yep. But why, Mr. Sykes? Just what is this all about? Dry spell in Freeville. I knew it. All right, keep talking, Mr. Sykes. What about the dry spell? Well, listen, I'm dead wrong, and I'm pretty sure I ain't now, count what happened to me. That dry spell ain't a natural one. It's being caused by some mechanical means. Now we're getting someplace. Keep talking, Mr. Sykes. His eyes gleaming, Clark Kent orders old Abner Sykes to continue talking, while Lois Lane sits by, a look of shocked amazement on her face. What does the old telegrapher mean? We'll know more in a moment when we return for the tense climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, you've probably heard the older folks talk about perpetual motion. You know, something that never stops moving. Well, one young fellow told me the other day that he thinks that these comic buttons in the new series from packages of Kellogg's Pep are perpetual fun. Sure, no sooner do you add a new button to your collection than you're already on the lookout for another. And, of course, when you get a duplicate, why, you can swap with your friends. And these buttons are so terrific looking, you're proud to wear them pinned on your jacket or your dress or cap. Take uh, Vitamin Flintheart, for instance, with his fuzzy fur coat and that slouch hat. Or Superman himself, complete with red cape and Superman insignia. Yes, sir, you'll want to collect all 18 of these new series comic buttons. And you can do. Sure, easy as anything. You don't have to send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. But you'll find a comic button, an exclusive prize, in every package of Kellogg's Pep you open. And believe me, gang, you'll like these toasted flakes of good whole wheat with their catchy sunshine flavor. You'll want to eat a bowl of pep for breakfast every single morning. Delicious is the word for Kellogg's pep. So ask mom to keep you supplied with plenty of P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's pep. In his little half-burned cabin in the mountains, old Abner Sykes has just startled Clark Kent and Lois Lane by saying, Listen, I'm dead wrong. I'm pretty sure I ain't now, count of what happened to me. That dry spell in Freeville ain't a natural one. It's being caused by some mechanical means. What? That's what I thought. Now can you tell us who's doing it, Mr. Sykes? Well, the way I got it lined up, Mr. Kent, 
It's being caused by Uncle Ed Clayton. Clayton. To bust them war veterans off their homesteads and drive them out of the state. Oh, huh? nonsense. That's what Clark's been saying, but it's too silly for words. No, it isn't, Lois. I told of you. Of course it is. How could Uncle Ed Clayton or any other human being cause a drought? Oh, I don't know. Do you, Mr. Sykes? Don't exactly know how yet, but I can prove Uncle Ed's doing it. How? You'll see. What time is it now? Uh, it's, uh, just two minutes to wait. No. Oh, well, just two minutes to go now, then. So I gotta work fast. Where's the condenser that Superman filler brought, eh? Mr. I've Kent? already installed it in your short wave set. Okay, then. Here goes. Here goes what? You'll hear in a minute, Miss Lane. Oh, now, look, Clark, I do think this is a lot of nonsense. Quiet, Lois. But, Clark, Please, nobody... Lois, be quiet for just a minute. Well, Mr. Sykes? Won't be long now, Mr. Kidd. Them signals should be coming in any second. What signals? You'll see. Oh, sure, we'll see. If you ask me, I think Lois, this is all... please. Oh, all right. Get ready, Mr. Kent. Here she comes. Tensely, Clark Kent and old Abner Sykes lean closer to the shortwave receiver. And despite her skepticism, Lois Lane leans forward, too. What are they about to hear? Can it be possible that Clark Kent's suspicions were correct and that Uncle Ed Clayton, the rabble-rousing demagogue, is able to defy the forces of nature and cause a man-made drought? Tomorrow's episode is swift and exciting, so don't miss it. Tune in, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, just think of the circus of fun, gang, when Mom sets Kellogg's variety out on the table at breakfast. There's the business of picking out your own favorite Kellogg cereal from this handy white, green, and red package with the ten individual packages. You'll uh, take Kellogg's Corn Flakes or, or Pep or Rice Krispies or one of your other Kellogg favorites. And you'll have your own private box of cereal to open yourself. Then for Sister, there's the cutout doll on the bottom of the tray to dress up and to play all sorts of games with. So ask Mom to get you Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, while Superman, with the help of Abner Sykes, comes close to a solution of the mystery, Freeville's murderous bigots make plans to stop him at any cost. Hello there, gang. This is your pal, Dan McCullough. You know, fellas and girls tell me that it's almost like a birthday every time Mother opens a new package of Kellogg's Pet. Because not only do you know that you're in for some mighty swell eating, but you also get a brand new bright colored comic button. It's an exclusive prize from Pep. Maybe it'll be a true to life picture of Vitamin Flintheart, all dressed up in a, in a woolly fur coat and red scarf and black slouch hat. Or maybe Tess Trueheart, heart shaped hat and long blonde hair and all. Maybe Superman himself, his red cape flying in the wind. And if it's a duplicate, well that's even more fun because then you can trade with your pals. So, gang, you better get busy. Just ask Mom to get you a package or two of Kellogg's Pet. That's right, you don't have to send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy these terrific comic buttons anywhere. All you do is to ask Mom to get you plenty of Kellogg's Pet and look for your prize inside every package you open. Pep's a prize when it comes to good eating, too. It tastes a doggone sunny and golden. It's as cheerful as bright golden sunshine at the breakfast table. Why, your very first spoonful of those toasted whole wheat flakes tells you... This is going to be good. 
Yes, sir. Pep's the dish for breakfast these winter mornings. So ask Mom for P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. Working on a hunch, Clark Kent has set out to prove that Uncle Ed Clayton, the rabble-rousing ex-governor who is now a candidate for the Senate, is somehow responsible for the unnatural drought that threatens the existence of several hundred war veteran homesteaders. As Superman, he saved the life of old Abner Sykes, the aged Freeville telegrapher, who, because he knows too much, had been struck on the head and left unconscious in a burning cabin in the mountains. Sykes blamed the attack on men connected with Uncle Ed Clayton and confirmed Kent's hunch when he said... Now I'm sure Uncle Ed's causing this drought, and I'll prove it. As we continue, in the half-burned little mountain cabin, Abner Sykes has turned on his shortwave radio receiver. To his companions, Clark Kent and Lois Lane, the elderly telegrapher explains... Really? Eight o'clock. In a minute, you'll be hearing them signals. What signals? Radio signals I pick up every night at this time. That is, when there's been rain predicted for Freeville. So what? I don't understand what that has to do... Eh, just you listen, Miss Lane. Now, here they come. Well, I don't hear anything except a lot of static. Don't you hear that? Did that? Did that? Yes, Is that but... the signal you were talking about? Nope. That there's the code from the sending station, Mr. Kent. The signals follow right after. Oh, I see. They'll be coming through now. Say, what's happening? Yeah, reception's petering out, that's what. Don't you hear? Why, yes, What's but... the matter? I don't know. Never done that before. Hey, something's wrong. Where's my screwdriver? Oh, now, look, Clark. Fun's fun. But after all, when two grown men actually believe that another man, a human being, can cause a drought, that's too much. I know it seems cockeyed, Lois, but I tell what you, you that... What you tell it... me makes no more sense than what Uncle Ed tells the superstitious backwoods people, that the drought was sent by heaven to punish the war veterans because some of their parents were born in a foreign country. It's the same thing at all, Lois. This is a scientific possibility. Hey, you ain't so smart as I thought you was, Mr. Kent. Why? What do you mean? Well, well, you put this condenser in wrong, that's why. Oh? Oh, bright boy. That's why we lost the code. Yeah, have it fixed in the jiffy, though. Sorry, I messed it up. Does that mean we lose those signals you were talking about? Nope. They usually last an hour or two. An hour or two? That long? Yep, sometimes three, four hours. There. That ought to do it. I hope so. Yeah, turn around again and see. I don't hear the code, Mr. Sykes. Nope, you're the signals either. They don't understand it. I, uh, I believe this is where we came in, Jim. Now, wait, wait, wait. I got an idea. XC3, colon HJ4. XC3, colon HJ4. Come in, Doc. Oh, now that's the first bit of sense I've heard here this evening. You boys need a doctor, all right. Oh, Lois. Sorry. XC3, HJ4. XC3, HJ4. Come in, Doc. Whom are you calling, Mr. Sykes? Another radio ham. Lives over to Rollins. I want to ask him... Evening, to... Ford, XC3. Evening, Abner. Oh, there he is. Evening, Doc. Listen, you been getting them funny signals tonight? Yes, I have, Abner. Came in promptly about eight as usual. Did you get them? Nope. There was something wrong with my condenser. Hey, you hear anything to count for their not being on now? Well, the last direction said something about 30 miles. I've noticed that there's usually a break when they say more than a few miles. What is this? Yes, that must be it, then. You're much obliged, Doc. Good night. Good night, Abner. Look, Mr. Sykes, just what is all this double talk now, about? Now, wait, Mr. Kent. Them signals will be on any minute again. You just be patient. In just a minute, I'm going to be fresh out of patience, because I still can't believe that these signals, or whatever they are, have anything to do with Uncle Ed causing a drought. Oh, is that so? Then how come when I told that feller in the county agricultural office about them signals and told him I figured they had something to do with the drought, he followed me back here and tried to kill me, eh? He did? Yep, he did. And I figured it's because he owes his job to Uncle Ed Clayton, just like everybody else in the county office does. So he hot-footed it to Uncle Ed with what I said, and Ed told him to get me. Hey, what do you think now, eh? I think that's a long jump to an even longer conclusion. Maybe not, Lois. Oh, now, look, Clark. I realize that Uncle Ed is a demagogue, the most vicious sort of hate monger and rabble rouser. But to think that he or, or any other mortal can stop rain from falling... Wait a minute, Lois. Wait a minute. Isn't that the cold coming through again, Mr. Sykes? Yep, it is. Sit tight, because now you're really going to hear something.
tensely, Clark Kent and old Abner Sykes leaned toward the shortwave loudspeaker, waiting for what the old man called the signals to come through. But meanwhile, in what he refers to as his simple little place, but which is in reality a magnificent colonial mansion set in broad acres overlooking a river, Uncle Ed Clayton sits in his library with Fred Leonard, editor of the Freeville Gazette. Uh, trouble with you, Fred, is that you're a warrior. Maybe, but What I... if that Jerry Barton fella and the newspaper gal did get away? Well, they can't hurt us none. I'm not so sure, Mr. Clayton. They heard you make that speech at the rally today, you know. So what? They can't prove nothing. Not even that I had anything to do with the boys leading them into that quicksand bog. Anyhow, all I care about is that no-count Abner Sykes being taken care of. You, uh... You are sure he was taken care of, ain't you, Fred? Well, Clarkson says so, Mr. Clayton. You can depend on him. Well, then, like I say, there ain't nothing to worry about. Why, them war veterans will be busted and pulling up stakes in another couple of weeks, and then we'll have things all our own way again, just the way we always did. I hope you're right. I know I am. And besides... Yeah, we'll answer the phone. Ed Clayton speaking. Oh? Oh, yes, Homer. Huh? Yeah. What's that? Give me that again. What's the matter? Just a minute, Fred. You sure about that, Homer? You did, huh? Okay. Good thing you called me. Right. Bye. What is it, Mr. Clayton? What is it? Well, just you listen to this. That old coot having a sight ain't no more dead than we are. What? That's right, son. Homer just heard him talk on the shortwave radio transmitter. But, but that's impossible. Clarkson said... Clarkson that... lied, cunts, on him. And he'll pay for this. That don't matter right now. Them two Daily Planet reporters, Clark Kent and Miss Lane, are still around, and they're friendly with Ab Sykes. I know so, they are. So what you gotta do, Fred, is personally see to it that old Abner don't tell him what he knows. Understand? You mean you want? I to... mean you gotta take care of Ab Sykes yourself tonight. But Governor, don't I... give me no butt, son. Abner's out to that cabin of his right now. Now you get in your car with Hank and drive out there lickety split. And when you get there, well, you know what to do. I know what to do, Mister Clayton. Good. And just in case them Daily Planet reporters is out there with Abner, we'll just make sure they stay there. Forever. What will happen at the little cabin in the mountains when the murder-bent Fred Leonard meets with our friends? We'll be back in a moment with the tense climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, gang, if you should happen to help your mother with the weekend shopping, and if she should happen to need a new package or two of Kellogg's Pet, don't you forget to remind her, because this sunny golden toasted cereal makes a real hit for breakfast these winter mornings. And because that's how you get those snappy comic buttons in that new series that all the gang's collecting. That's right, you get a comic button every time you open a package of Pet. Real humdingers they are, too. Bright colored pictures of your favorite comic strip characters on sturdy white enameled metal buttons that you can wear pinned right on your jacket or your dress or cap. There's Cindy and the Little Moose and, and Superman. Eighteen different buttons in all. So you better get busy on your collection. Make sure that Mom keeps stocked up on Kellogg's Pep because that's the only way you can get these exciting prizes. You don't send it any money, not even a box stop, and you can't buy them anywhere. But you'll find a comic button in every package of Pep you open. That's Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Pep, the whole wheat flakes with a come-on flavor for breakfast. It's golden, toasted, and crisp that, well, you practically can't resist them. Pep's good for you, too. Sure, Mom knows that. Makes a grand dish to, to give that right start to your winter days. So remind her to stock up on P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. <laughs> In Abner Sykes' little mountain cabin, the old telegrapher and Clark Kent are listening tense feet of voices issuing from the loudspeaker of the shortwave radio. Even Lois Lane, who has been skeptical, is interested. Hey, listen, Mr. Kent. I think them signals about to commence again. I'm listening. About six hey. miles south, southwest of K. Over. You hear that? Six miles south, southwest of K. Over. Six miles southwest. What does that mean, Clark? Not quite sure, Lois, but I think... Turn sharp three miles north. And watch Drifton just off east. Over. Three miles north, then Drifton east. Any more? Over. Oh, oh, oh. Quiet, please. please. That's all for now. Check from pass. Over and out. Right. We'll check further from pass. Over and out. What gibberish. K. R. Pass. I wonder... Well, might as well turn it off. Won't be no more signals for a while. You wonder what, Clark? About all those peculiar directions. Tell me, Mr. Sykes, do you know of any... uh... Well, towns or mountains or something in this section which begin with K and R? 
Keener. Uh -huh. I know there's see. a Rawlings car. Say, that's right. It's not far from Freeville. Yep, and there's a Kennecott Junction, about 30 miles north of here. Good, and pass. That might refer to a mountain pass. Might be good time pass, top of Mount Peel. Good. I think I've got the answer. Really? What is it? No time to explain now. I've got to move fast. You two stay here. Where are you hey? going, Clark? Got a little job to do. I won't be long. You wait here. Hurrying from the little cabin, Clark Kent stops in the darkness and swiftly resumes his true identity of Superman. Then... If I'm right, I'll have the answer to the drought tonight. Up! Up! And away! <laughs> Leaping up from the dark mountain slope, Superman rockets away through the starlit sky. And in his haste, he does not look backward to the half-hidden, rutted road climbing to Abner Sykes' cabin, on which, at this moment, a car containing two armed men is toiling up the slope. Uncle Ed, the demagogue, has ordered Fred Leonard to do away with old Abner tonight, and to do likewise to any Daily Planet reporter found with him. What will happen to old Abner and to Lois Lane as Superman speaks farther and farther away? And what will the Man of Steel discover on his meteoric flight? Monday's suspenseful climax is full of thrills and surprises, fellows and girls. So don't fail to be with us. Tune in Monday, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, get a load of this. In Kellogg's Variety, there were ten individual packages of cereal for you to choose from. Every morning you can have your own private box of cereal. You can pick it out yourself. And it'll be one of your Kellogg favorites, like pepper or Rice Krispies or Corn Flakes. Boy, that's a circus of fun. That's Kellogg's Variety, the handy white, green, and red package with all those crisp, fresh Kellogg cereals that you like so much. Some flaked, some shredded, some popped, made from corn, wheat, or rice. Just be sure it's Kellogg's. Ask Mom to get Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us on Monday for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, -E Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, as Superman uncovers the key to the plot behind Freeville's drought, he is unaware that Lois Lane and Abner Sykes are face to face with death. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, if somebody should just hand you a full set of that new series of 18 comic buttons from packages of Kellogg's Pet all at once, it wouldn't be half so much fun as collecting them right along. Of course, you're always mighty proud to wear these slick-looking buttons on your jacket or your dress or cap, but you'd hate to miss the thrill of seeing which button is inside when Mom opens a new package of Pet. And you'd sort of feel out of it if you couldn't trade duplicates with your pals and, and sort of race with them to see who can collect the most different buttons. Yes, sir, it's loads more fun to collect these pep comic buttons one by one. Brenda Starr and, and Goofy and BC and Superman and all the rest. And you know, they're so easy to get. You don't have to send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. You just ask Mom to get you plenty of that sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep, and look for a new comic button inside every package you open. And look for some mighty terrific eating, too, because these good whole wheat flakes are loaded with catchy sunshine flavor that invites you right back for more, which is a mighty good thing because Pep's so good for you with added energy vitamin B1 plus good old sunshine vitamin D that helps build strong bones and teeth. So get your good eating and your exciting prizes, gang, from P.E.P., -E the sunshine cereal Kellogg's Pep. And now the adventures of Superman. 
Incredible as it seems to Lois, Clark Kent suspects that Uncle Ed Clayton, political hate monger and candidate for the Senate, is somehow responsible for the prolonged drought in the Freeville area, an unusual and disastrous drought which is bankrupting hundreds of war veteran farmers. As Superman, Kent saved the life of Abner Sykes, the elderly telegrapher who had been attacked by Uncle Ed's henchmen and left to die in his burning mountain cabin. Then old Abner told Kent and Lois Lane of what he called strange signals that he picked up on his shortwave radio. And when Kent, too, heard the mysterious signals, he left to investigate as Superman. Meanwhile, learning that old Abner was still alive, Uncle Ed sent two men to do away with him. And as we continue now, the men have stopped their car at the foot of a narrow, rutted mountain road, at the crest of which, silhouetted against a pale moon, is the half-burned little cabin in which Lois and Abner Sykes await the return of Kent. Listen. Okay, Hank. Get out. What's the idea, Fred? Why don't we drive right up to the cabin? Because we're playing it safe. Come on now, get out. I don't get it, Fred. Ain't nothing to this job. Ain't nobody but that old cool Abner Sykes up to the cabin. Can't tell. Those reporters might be with him. What reporters? Those two from Metropolis. Clark Kent and the Lane girl. Oh, them. Well, if they are there, we'll take care of them, too. Right. Uh, don't walk so far out on the road. Moon shining down on us. They might look down from the cabin and see us. Not much chance of that. Ain't much moon. We're not taking any chances. This job was messed up once today. Uncle Ed won't like it if it's messed up again. It won't be. Not with me on the job. That's what you said this afternoon. When you were going to get rid of the lane girl and that war veteran, Jerry Barton. I know, I know. Look, I can't figure that out, Fred. Why, Charlie and me walked them almost up to the quicksand bog and made them keep going. I just can't figure out how they come to be still alive. You must have messed it up somehow. That's why Uncle Ed told me to handle this business tonight. Hold it, Hank. What's the matter? Somebody just opened the door of the cabin. You see? Yeah. Hey, it's a gal. Uh-huh. Can't be sure from here, but I think it's that reporter. It is, huh? Well, just step out of the way, Fred. I'll take care of her right now. Put your rifle down, you fool. Why, I can't miss it from here. Put the gun down, I said. You want to warn old Abner and maybe that other reporter, Kent, that we're here? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess you're right. I know I am. Don't move now. She's looking around. Maybe she heard the car pull up. No, I don't think so. She went back in the cabin. Come on, Hank. Okay. But watch your step. I don't want them to hear us until we open the cabin door and walk in. Proceeding with caution, the would-be assassins approach closer and closer to the tiny cabin where Lois Lane and Abner Sykes await the return of Clark Kent. But meanwhile, having searched over Rawlings and Kennecott Junction, the two locations identified in the mysterious shortwave radio signals, Kent, as Superman, is now stationed in a rugged, windy pass atop Mount Peel, the loftiest range in the area, about 60 miles from Abner Sykes' cabin. Well, this is the third location mentioned in that mysterious code. I've been here 15 minutes, but I haven't seen a thing yet. Maybe Sykes and I misinterpreted those radio signals. Well, unless something happens soon, I'll have to give up and go. Wait a minute, what's that? Sounds like a plane. Yes, I was pretty sure a plane was mixed up in this. Now, where? I can hear it, but I can't see it. It's strange. It's coming closer. It's held by the sound. I still can't see it. Wait a minute. I think I see it now. Yes, dead ahead and flying high. A small cabin job, camouflaged. Well, this is very interesting. I want a better look at that plane. Up and away! Leaping high from the mountain pass, Superman streaks toward the small camouflaged cabin plane which cruises through the dark sky. Then, checking his meteoric flight above the plane, the Man of Steel hovers closely above it, unseen. His keen eyes probing the hull of the ship to observe the two men in the cabin. His amazingly acute hearing attuned to their conversation. Where's the next one, Emery? Should That's be dead ahead in line with the pass if those last directions were accurate. Well, they haven't been wrong yet. No. There it is. A little above and off to the left. See it, Carson? Yeah, I see it. Get ready. All set. Okay, here we go, then. How are they going? I don't see... Uh-oh, think I get it. 
Well, I guess I'll just follow them for a while. Away! They dove right into this cloud. Something's dropping from the plane. Little pellets. Can't tell what they are, but I've got a hunch. Oh, there they go out of the cloud. I'd better listen to their conversation again. Away! How are we doing, Emery? Oh, it ain't gonna rain no more, no more. Over Freeville, that is. That's what you think, brother. <laughs> There's plenty of rain up here, huh? You said it. Plenty. Yes, it is raining right behind us. Well, this confirms my suspicions because I had a hunch they were doing it this way. Just to make sure, I'll watch and wait for a double check. What's next for old Uncle Ed's boy, son? Uncle Ed, eh? Let's see. Here we are. About three miles to east. Three miles to east. Right. Here we go. Three miles to east. Oh, yes, I see it. Now I'll confirm my hunch about their method of operation. There it is, Em. A nice big one. Those homesteaders can sure use that. Yeah, but they'll never get a chance to. Get ready to take her down. Okay. No, I think not, boys. I've seen enough. Now I think I'll join you. Down to that plane. Down! Emery, look! Hey, Jehoshaphat, look what? Permit me to introduce myself, gentlemen. My name is Superman. What? Superman? Correct. At the moment, the protector of rain-bearing clouds. Ah, 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 I wouldn't go for that pistol if I were you, Mr. Emery. That's the good little man. Hand it over. Thank you. Take her down, Mr. Carson. I said take her down, please. No, not up into that rain cloud. As you pointed out a moment ago, the war veterans in Freeville will be glad to see it. And this time they're going to get it. Because from now on, Uncle Ed's man-made drought is ended. Now, now look here. Very clever of you to make the clouds spill their moisture before reaching Freeville. Look, we didn't mean any harm, Superman. That's right. You see, I... That no harm. I suppose your ingenious method of creating a drought, your attempt to ruin several hundred war veterans who fought for their country, is your idea of a joke, eh? No, no. You, you don't understand. I understand everything, my whining friends. Take this plane down it. No, wait a minute. On second thought, head for Abner Sykes' cabin. I believe you know where that is, Carson. Who, who me? Why, why no, Stop I... Stop lying. I know you tried to murder old Abner today. No, no, I didn't. Head for the cabin, I said. We'll let Mr. Sykes and Miss Lane be in on the last act of this dirty little play. Now go on. Open it up and make time. Grimly, Superman directs the two trembling henchmen of Uncle Ed Clayton toward Abner Sykes' little cabin, 50 miles away, where, at this moment, Lois Lane and the elderly telegrapher are in deadly peril. Stand by for the tense climax of today's episode. Say, you know something I've noticed lately? Well, the girls and the gang have a few tricks up their sleeves when it comes to displaying their collection of comic buttons in that new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pet. Some of them pin them in sort of formations or designs on their jackets or dresses. Of course, uh, it doesn't really matter how you wear your pep comic buttons as long as you wear them because you want everybody to see how many you've collected and how smart-looking they are, too. Why, the pictures of your favorite comic strip characters look so real, why, they could almost speak. Old friends like Judy and Corky and, and Superman himself. So it's no wonder that both fellas and girls want to collect all 18 buttons in this new series. And they're easy to get, you know. Sure, you just remind Mom to get you a package or two of that sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep, and you'll find a comic button inside every package you open. That's right. You don't have to send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy these swell prizes anywhere. But you get them, along with a mighty delicious dish for breakfast, in packages of the toasted whole wheat flakes with that catchy sunshine flavor. Yes, sir, gang, Pep's a prize itself, but it comes to good eating. So ask Mom for P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. In Abner Sykes' little cabin, Lois Lane has begun to be worried over the absence of Clark Kent. Returning from the door, she says to the old telegrapher, I'm worried, Mr. Sykes. I can't understand where Clark is. The way I size Mr. Kent up, he's a mighty smart young fella, Miss Lane. Uh, you don't have to worry none about him. But how could he investigate those radio signals at night and in these mountains? Yeah, I don't know, but like I say, I, I reckon he's smart enough to look out for himself. Well, maybe. But just the same, I can't help being worried. 
And if he doesn't come back right away, I'm going out to look for him. Hey, who oh, is that? that must be caught now. Oh, no, Miss Lane, it isn't Ken at all. <laughs> Wait, hey, what in tarnation? Good heavens. Put your hands up, Abner. Mr. Leonard. Yes, yeah, and Uncle Ed's no count man, Charlie. Uh, now, look here, you Shut two. Up, Abner. What do you two want? Why are you pointing those guns at us? Can't you guess, Miss Lane? Why, why no. Well, this is really the end of the trail for you, Miss Lane. And for Abner Sykes, too. Oh, no. Get set to let him have it, Hank. Her face drained of color, Lois Lane looks at the rifles in the hands of Fred Leonard and Hank. Rifles that are pointed steadily at her and Abner Sykes. Superman, hardly 50 miles away, could cover the distance to the cabin with the speed of light. But at present, unaware of his friend's peril, the Man of Steel is in a plane, which will require several minutes to reach the little mountain cabin. So what will happen to Lois and old Abner? We'll find that out tomorrow, gang, as just what is the secret method of preventing rainfall discovered by Superman. So don't fail to be with us then. Tune in tomorrow, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, how'd you like to pick out your own favorite Kellogg cereal every morning and open your own individual package yourself? Well, ask Mom to get Kellogg's Variety. That's the white, green, and red Kellogg package with ten one-serving packages of your favorite Kellogg cereals like Kellogg's Corn Flakes and Rice Krispies and Pep. And you know they're good because you've always liked Kellogg cereals. And every day you get your choice and you treat yourself to one of your favorite Kellogg cereals for breakfast. So ask Mom to get Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, as Superman exposes the bigoted Ed Clayton and saves Freeville from inevitable deterioration, alarming news awaits his return to Metropolis. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. Say, I'll bet nowadays when Mom asks you to run an errand to the grocery store, you start out like a streak of lightning because she's pretty sure to be sending for some Kellogg's Pep. Folks like it that well for breakfast. And that means another bright-colored comic button to add to your collection of that exciting new series. There were 18 new and different buttons at all, you know. Old-time favorites like Judy and Corky and, and Pat Patton, Tess Trueheart, Chief Brandon, and, and Vitamin Printheart, and Superman himself. And say, if you happen to get a duplicate, well, that's even more fun because then you can swap with your pals. And you know the best part is you don't have to send in a single penny to get these keen-looking buttons, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. They come only as prizes. One in every package of that sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. That's the come-on dish for breakfast, you know. The whole wheat flakes with a catchy sunshine flavor that really tickles your taste like anything. Why, a bowl of Kellogg's Pep looks a doggone sunny and golden and tastes so sunny and golden toasted that, well, you just show me a fellow or girl who can resist eating hearty. So ask Mom to get you plenty of P.E.P., the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now the adventures of Superman. Superman's belief that the drought in the Freeville area was mechanically induced in order to ruin a community of farmer war veterans was startling substantiated when the Man of Steel intercepted a camouflaged cabin plane which was performing strange gyrations in the sky. 
Then, from the occupants of the plane, he learned the mystery of the drought and the fact that Uncle Ed Clayton, a hate-mongering senatorial candidate, was behind it. But at the same time, unknown to Superman, Lois Lane and Abner Sykes were waiting for him in the old telegrapher's mountain cabin or in grave danger from two of Uncle Ed's henchmen. And as we continue now, Superman is in the camouflaged plane with the two captured pilots, heading toward the cabin some 40 miles away. Suddenly, topping a tall ridge, the man of steel's X-ray vision pierces the dark miles ahead and reveals a shocking scene. Listen. Great Scott. Two men aiming rifles at Lois and Mr. Sykes. Oh, and over. Busting open the cabin door, Superman leaps from the plane, leaving the two pilots to stare after him open-mouthed as he flashes through the starry sky like a meteor whirled from its orbit. With the speed of light, the figure in red and blue rushes down upon the tiny cabin, where at that instant, facing the guns in the hands of Ed Clayton's henchman, Lois Lane gasps. No, don't. Don't shoot. Don't waste your breath, Miss Lane. Them fellers work for Ed Clayton. He won't stop at nothing. Not even murder. You're right, Abner. Uncle Ed's word is law in this here state. And he says you and this newspaper gal dies. So here it comes. You mean here I come? My glory be. Up with those guns. Seizing the rifles of the would-be assassins, Superman thrust them upward, even as they squeeze the triggers and the deadly leaden pellets scream up through the burned cabin roof. Then, not pausing, Superman seizes the pop-eyed gunmen by the scruffs of their necks, wraps their heads sharply together, and as they fall unconscious, he turns to Lois and Sykes. I'm going to take these two characters with me. You, Miss Lane, and Mr. Sykes take their car and drive to state police headquarters at the county seat. Clark Kent will be waiting for you there. But Superman... Up and away! I must pick up that plane again because the evidence I need is in it. Oh, great Scott, where is... Uh Uh-oh, there it is. And the pilot's making a desperate attempt to get away. Well, I'm sorry, my friends. You're coming back with me to face the music. Away! Zooming down on the fleeing planes, Superman dumps the two unconscious would-be assassins in with the now panicky flyers. Then, grasping the plane's landing gear, he propels the aircraft with the speed of light toward the county airport. And a few minutes later, he delivers all four of Clayton's men to the state police. Meanwhile, in the sumptuous library of his palatial mansion on the river, Clayton is listening to startling news on his telephone. What? Rain? In Freeville? Well, that can't be! I, I can't understand it! Hey, you don't have to tell me the rain will save them veterans. I know that too well. Yeah, hey, you darn tootin', I'll see about it. And right this minute, something went wrong, but I'm gonna... I'm afraid you won't do anything about it, Mr. Clayton. What? Uh, oh, uh, uh, look, uh, I, uh, I'll call you back later, Homer. Bye. Well, well, if it ain't my old friend, Mr. Kent. Mighty nice of you to drop in on me, sir. I don't think you'll feel the same way about that when you hear why. Well, if it isn't Miss Lane and my old friend Major Renshaw of the state police. Hello, Miss Clayton. (laughs) We've come here to... Why, nothing makes me so happy as to have my good friends around me. (laughs) You know, that's, that's one of the blessings of these fine old United States. A man can get together with his friends in peace and freedom. You can skip the flag waving, Clayton. Yes, Mr. Clayton. You can let your hair down now. <laughs> you sure are amusing people. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, you, oh, let me offer you some refreshments. You know, nothing elaborate, you understand. I'm a poor, simple man, oh, but uh, brother, I'll, I'll be proud stay. to serve you what I can. Wait a minute. Stay where you are, Mr. Clayton. We've hey. got something to say to you. Oh, hey. you, you have? Yes. For one thing, we wanted to tell you that it's raining in Freeville. Oh, is that so? Well, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, it's wonderful. What? Yeah. You, know, you know, I've been worrying about them poor homestead and war veterans uh, uh, being busted by the drought. And is that why you yeah. caused the drought, Mr. Clayton? I? I caused the drought? <laughs> that's a good joke, son. <laughs> really? Well, we don't think it's so funny. We yeah. certainly don't. You see, Mr. Clayton, we know all about your so clever yeah. plan. We learned about it from your two plane pilots, Carson and Emery. They confessed everything. Eh? Huh? Uh, confess, you say? That's right. Yes, they admitted they'd been hired by you to fly into the rain clouds before the clouds reached the Freeville area. Then, also at your orders, they dropped dry ice, which resulted in saturating the moisture-laden clouds to a point where they released their rain at once, and always on the other side of the mountains. Oh, now, now, uh, you must know that's preposterous, son. Why, I Oh, no, it isn't. I've just found out that the same thing was done as an experiment in upstate New York a few months ago. And that's where you must have gotten your idea. Why, 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 that's ridiculous, I say. No use, Clayton. 
Your men confessed. But I... What's more, we located a shortwave radio shack at the edge of your own estate, where your man was in contact with an observer some distance away, and from which he radioed the direction of the approaching rain clouds to your pilots in the plane. Incidentally, your radio man and the observer have confessed, too. Now, are you ready to come along with me quietly, Mr. Oh, now, 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 wait a minute, friends. Wait a minute. Why, uh, this is obviously a plot against me. Yes, sir. My enemies are trying to do me in. My political enemies, that is. Oh, come now. Now, why Mr. should I do a thing like this? Why, why, why should I cause a drought to injure the citizens of my own beloved state? Your own beloved state. Don't make me laugh. Why, Miss Wayne? Clayton, why? you did this deliberately to ruin the war veterans who'd settled on homesteads here. You wanted to bankrupt them and so drive them out of the state. I didn't do no such thing, Kent. Why, you I feared I... them because you knew that men who had fought for America wouldn't stand for the kind of un-American government you'd set up when you were governor. A kind of government you now wanted to perpetuate as senator. Why, why how dare you call me un-American, sir? Why, I'll fight to the last drop of my blood for the grand old Constitution. You would, eh? Well, the Constitution guarantees equal rights to every American, regardless of race or creed or color. But you've been trying to deprive the veterans of their simple right to make an honest living. That ain't true. It is true. I know because I heard you stir up the backwoods folks against the veterans by saying that the boys were foreigners because some of their parents were born abroad. Now, you look here. You're making a big mistake. Oh, no, I'm not, Mr. Clayton. I Don't know waste that... your breath on him, Lois. He's licked now, stripped of all power in this state, and so is his party. Oh, am I? Right. And it's a safe bet you'll spend the rest of your life in jail. All right, come along, Clayton. Oh, no, Major. I ain't going with you. Don't be a fool, Clayton. Don't move, any of you. Look out, Major. He's got a gun. Yes, I have. I aim to use it, too. Put that gun down, Clayton. No, I ain't a-putting it down till I put a bullet in each one of you. Because Uncle Ed Clayton ain't a-never going to no jail. No, sir, he's... Listen to me. Be sensible, Clayton. I'm done listening, Major. You're all done living. Yes, you and these two pesky reporters. Wait, Clayton. Don't move, Kenton. You either, Major. Now, permit me to say goodbye, brother Americans. <laughs> Moving back a step, Uncle Ed Clayton le levels his pistol at Clark Kent, Lois Lane at Major Renshaw. And as Kent hesitates, not knowing how to act without revealing himself as Superman, the man of hate's finger begins to squeeze the trigger. What will happen? We'll return in a moment to find out. So stand by. You know, gang, all the time we're hearing about young fellows and girls who were hurt or killed in traffic accidents. Now, uh, maybe you think... It can't happen to me. Well, it can happen to you if you're not careful. That's why Mom and Dad are always cautioning you about things like jaywalking and, and playing in the streets and, and hitching rides on cars or trucks. It just doesn't pay to take a chance. And say, uh, about riding your bicycle, here are a few don'ts to keep in mind. Don't ride with two people on a bike. And don't ride your bike in the dusk or darkness without front and rear lights. And don't shoot out into the street from behind a parked car. And don't race another bicycle on the sidewalk. These things are important, gang. Don't give an accident a single chance to catch up with you. In the library of his mansion, Uncle Ed Clayton has leveled a pistol at Clark Kent Lois Lane at Major Renshaw of the state police. But just as Clayton is about to squeeze the trigger, Clark Kent goes into action. His foot, guided by muscles of steel, jerks backward. And the rug on which they all stand sweeps backward with him, spilling Ed Clayton, Major Renshaw, and Lois Lane into sprawling heap. The pistol shot goes wildly into the floor. Then Clayton speaks no more as Kent, hurling himself forward, throws a smashing blow at the chin of the infuriated demagogue. A moment later, Ed Clayton, unconscious, is handcuffed by Renshaw. Nice work, Kent. It certainly was. Why, Clark, you... You were wonderful. That from you, Lois? Yes, from me. And I owe you an apology, too. Oh, no, this is too much. Everything you said about this story out here was right. But I sneered at you and I... No, wait a minute. Stop, Lois. You're turning my head. Look, why don't you get on Clayton's phone and give this story to Perry White? I'm sure Major Renshaw will excuse us. Why, sure. Go right ahead. You two have earned a scoop. Clayton will be quiet until the highway patrol car gets here to take him away. Thanks, Major. Go ahead, Lois. Call the plant. No, you call, Clark. After all, it is your story. Now I know I'm dreaming. Look, I tell you what. We'll split my life. Okay, it's a deal. Right. And thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Wait till the chief gets a load of this story. It'll curl the few hairs he has left on his head. That's the story, Chief. Major Renshaw is waiting for a patrol car to take Clayton to the calaboose now, and Lois and I are going with him. Yeah. What? You kidding? What's up, Clark? What do you mean I should come back and leave Lois here? What's... Leave... What? When was this? What, what, Clark? Just a moment, Lois. 
Yes, I hear you, Chief. I see. Well, that does make a difference. What? What makes a difference? Right. I'll come back at once, Chief. Oh. Be there in a few minutes. I, I, I mean, I'll, I'll leave at once. Right. So long. What is it, Clark? You'll have to finish up the story down here alone, Lois. I've got to get back to Metropolis in a hurry. But why? What happened? No time to tell you. So long. See you later. Rushing away from the surprised Lois Lane, Clark Kent leaves Ed Clayton's house by the rear door, strips off his business suit, and then as Superman rockets up into the air, bound for Metropolis. What did Editor Perry White tell Kent that caused him to leave in such haste? What has happened in Metropolis? We can tell you this much, gang. Superman and you are in for the surprise of your lives tomorrow when the Man of Steel confronts one of the most baffling adventures of his entire career. So whatever you do, don't fail to hear tomorrow's episode. Tune in. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, you can save Mom a lot of work and give yourself a load of fun with Kellogg's Variety at breakfast. Sure, open up one of those individual boxes of your favorite Kellogg cereal, pour on milk, and eat right out of the box. That's the Kell Bowl Pack, and it saves washing dishes. And it's more fun than a picnic. You know, Kellogg's Variety is the white, green, and red Kellogg package with ten one-serving packages of favorites like Kellogg's Pep and Rice Krispies and Corn Flakes. But be sure Mom gets Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents The Adventures of Superman. Today, Clark Kent and his friends Batman and Robin are shocked by a startling revelation that leads to an incredible mystery. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, those comic buttons you're all collecting in the new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pep sure do make a hit when you wear them pinned on your jacket or your dresser cap. They show up so clear and bright that, well, folks take a second look. And no wonder the pictures of your favorite comic strip characters are true to life. They're straight from the funny papers. You know uh, Vitamin Flintheart by his fuzzy fur coat and that slouch hat, and Brenda Starr by her long, wavy red hair. And Superman by his red insignia and cape flying in the wind. And all the others in this new series of 18 different buttons. Boy, is it fun to work on your collection of pet comic buttons and to trade duplicates with your friends. Now, you won't want to miss out, so get busy, gang. Ask Mom to get you a package or two of that sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pet. That's right. You don't have to send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy these prizes anywhere. You just look for your new comic button in every package of Kellogg's Pep you open. And see how Pep brightens up your breakfast, too. Those golden toasted flakes of real whole wheat are so crisp and so fresh and so full up with catchy sunshine flavor that, well, your every spoonful calls you right back for more. So ask Mom to get plenty of P.E.P., the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now the adventures of Superman. Following his spectacular solution of the Freeville mystery and the arrest of the Honorable Ed Clayton, political demagogue, Clark Kent telephoned editor Perry White in Metropolis to relay the sensational story of the man-made drought. White then gave Kent a piece of information which sent the reporter rocketing back to Metropolis in the fastest way possible, as Superman. Today, as we join him, once more in his guise and garb of Clark Kent, he is entering Editor White's office in the Daily Planet. Listen. Hello, Chief. Uh, great Caesar's ghost. Kent. Well, that's right, but why the surprise? Well, how, 
How, how did you get here so, so, so soon? Well, what difference does that make? Difference? Why, why, I was just talking with you on that. Oh, forget uh, that for the moment. What's going on here, Chief? I wish I knew. Look, you're not sick, are you? No. No, I'm not sick. Well, then what is the matter with you? You tell me that something terrific is going on and you need me here at once. When I get here, you make noises like a, a like an expiring fish. You can't. I, I, I always said it was impossible. But maybe you are at that. Maybe I'm what? Will you please tell me what you're talking about? Yes, I'll tell you. But you tell me something first, will you? Well, certainly. What do you want to know? Now, look. I talked to you on the telephone only a few minutes ago, right? Yes, but what? At that time, uh, you were in Freeville, oh, 1,500 oh. miles away. Well, uh, so you could get from Freeville uh, how, uh, to Metropolis, a distance of 1,500 miles in uh, 10 minutes, I, uh, uh, unless uh, unless you are Superman. No, no, wait, uh, wait. Now, can you explain? Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, Chief. Uh, uh, how, how do you know I, I called you from uh, Freeville? Huh. Well, I... Uh, well, didn't you? Uh, did, did I say so? Well, of course you did. And you're not going to get out of it any... Uh, but, uh, Hey, wait a minute. Uh, what's the matter? Now that you mention it, I don't remember that you did say you were calling from Freeville. Oh? Ah, so that's the answer. Huh? Uh, you were right here in Metropolis when you called me. Probably uh, right around the corner, huh? Well, all I can say, Chief, is that you're pretty sharp. Yeah, sharp as a butter knife. <sighs> Boy, I ought to have my head examined for thinking, even for a second, that you could be Superman. Oh, not at all, Chief. Why do you... Oh, skip it, skip it, skip it. Yeah, Where's right. Lois? Didn't you come back with you? No, she stayed in Freeville to cover Ed Clayton's trial in the special election for Senator. Good, good. Hey, now, look, will you please tell me what terrific something has been going on here that required my immediate presence? No, Pat. Well, frankly, I don't know much about it, Ken. You don't know much? Inspector Henderson called about an hour ago and asked for you. Oh, really? What's up? Well, I tell you, I don't know. All Henderson would tell me is that the most sensational story in years is going to break today, and for some special but secret reason, he wants you to come over to police headquarters as soon as you can. Well, sounds interesting. I'll hop right over to headquarters. Uh, now, wait a minute, wait a minute, Kent. You, you can't see Henderson right now. Well, why? You just said he wanted me to I know, to... I know, but he called again a few minutes ago just before you came in. Well? And this time he said for you to sit tight, if and when you got in. Not to stir a step from this office until he calls you. Well, that's odd. He said he'd probably call within the next 10 or 15 minutes. Oh, maybe that's the inspector now. I'll take it. Never mind. I've got it. Hello? Who? No, no, no. I can't see him today, Miss Backrack. I'm very busy, Betty. Uh, sorry, sorry. False alarm? Yeah, a fellow from the club with too much time in his hands looking for a place to waste it. Oh. He pounded my ear all last evening with his theory on the monkey burglar, and I guess he wants to continue the discussion. Monkey burglar? What's that? What's that? Don't you read your own newspapers? <laughs> your voice is changing, Chief. And you what? forget I've been away for a few days. Oh, that's right. Well, well, the monkey burglar is the hottest story in Metropolis right now, Kent. Is that so? Tell me something about it. Great Caesar. Maybe that's why he's calling you in. Now, look, Chief, this is all Greek to me. I know what a monkey is and I know what a burglar is, but I don't see the connection. Well, here it is, Kent. Now, for the last few days, or nights, rather, we've had a series of sensational robberies in Metropolis. How do you mean sensational? Well... This fellow, who was obviously an amazing acrobat, is walking up the walls of very fashionable apartment buildings and apartment hotels. Walking up the wall? Yes. Letting himself in through the window to some millionaire's quarters, looting the place. Then he goes out the same way he came in. No kidding. And get this. In each case, he's robbed a building with doormen, elevator men, and even watchmen. But none of them has ever seen him. Hey, that sounds incredible, Chief. Yes, I know. But... Look, if, as you say, no one saw him, how do you know he goes up the walls of the buildings? Well, a couple of his victims have seen him slip in through the window and, after rifling their apartment, slip out the same window. Well, maybe he used a fire escape. Huh, that would be easy. Except that he robs apartments only on the side of the buildings in each case where there are no fire escapes. Oh, I see. Well, look, Chief, if one or two others of this uh, monkey burglar's victims saw him, as you say, they should be able to identify him. Yes, but they say they can't because it was always too dark when the burglary took place. Uh, but it does sound a little fishy to me that none of his victims can tell us anything about the fellow. It does to me, too. And that's why I say I think Henderson is holding out on us for some reason. So I want you to... Uh, just a minute. Hello? Oh, hello, Inspector. Yes, yes, he's here. Is that Henderson? Yes. Uh, what's that, Inspector? Well, he's... Okay. Right, Inspector. Don't hang up. Bye. Oh, I wanted to talk to him, Chief. He said he hasn't time to talk now, but he wants you to get right over to headquarters because the big story he mentioned is about to break. Oh, that's all I want to know. I'm on my way, Chief. Okay, but don't forget about the monkey burglar. How could I forget? I'll phone you from headquarters as soon as I get the lowdown. So long. You've got both Perry White and me sitting on tax. What is this terrific story you're going to let me in on? You'll see, Kent. And you'll agree it's terrific. 
Why, in all my years on the force, I've never seen or heard of anything like this. Hey, this gets better and better. No. No, it gets worse and worse. What do you mean? You know, a police officer isn't easily shocked, Kent. Especially when he's been on the force as long as I have. Oh, I know, but what... But I'm... I'm shocked now. Shocked to my very toes. Shocked about what? Look, will you for heaven's sake please tell me what this is all about, Inspector? All right, here it is. Kent, I know who the monkey burglar is. You... You do? Yes. And that's what's shocked me so. Really? Well, I'd like to see this combination, monkey, acrobat, and magician. Who is he? You'll see him. He's on his way here now. Ought to be here any minute, in fact. Hey, I don't get it, Inspector. You ought to be tickled to death to catch this fellow. But instead, you look as if you've been forced to lock up your own son or nephew or... Well, it's almost that bad. What? Yeah. Oh, just a minute, Ken. Yes? Healy, Inspector. He's here. Should I bring him in? Yeah. Yeah, bring him right in, Healy. Right, sir. Here comes our monkey burglar now. You really got me curious, Inspector. I can hardly wait to see this phenomenon. Well, hang on to your hat, Kent. Because in just a few seconds, you're going to get the shock of your life. Almost breathless with curiosity and excitement, Clark Kent stands beside the grim-faced Inspector Henderson, his eyes on the door through which the mysterious monkey burglar will enter. Who is he? Well, we'll know in a moment when we return to the startling climax of today's episode. So stand by. You know, nobody wants to miss out on a good thing. And that's why all the fellows and girls in the gang are mighty busy these days collecting that new series of comic buttons from packages of Kellogg's Pet. Think of it, 18 new and different pictures of your favorite comic strip characters. Among others, there's Brenda Starr and, and Cindy and Spud and, and the Little Moose and Goofy and Beezy and Judy and Corky and Superman, of course. Every single one is a true-to-life picture of some funny paper friend. Every single picture is so bright-colored and gleaming that, well, you're mighty proud to wear your pet comic buttons pinned on your jacket or dress or cap. And, of course, you wouldn't want to miss the fun of swapping duplicates with your friends. So hop to it, gang. And now, you don't have to send in any money, not even a box stop. Fact is, you can't buy these comic buttons anywhere. But every time Mom opens a new package of that sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep, there's a comic button for your collection. And every time Mom dishes out a bowl of Pep for your breakfast, she's handing you some mighty swell eating because these toasted whole wheat flakes are crisp and fresh. They taste sunny and golden. Why, why they're delicious. So remind Mom right now that you'll eat lots of P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. <laughs> In Inspector Henderson's office, where he is waiting for the mysterious monkey burglar to be ushered in, Clark Kent starts in surprise, then steps forward, smiling and hand outstretched, as the door opens and Sergeant Healy ushers two figures into the office. Both figures, a man and a boy, are clothed in tight-fitting costumes and capes, and they wear bat-like hoods and masks. Batman and Robin. Well, how are you? Hello, Clark. Hi, Mr. Kent. Hi. How's tricks, Inspector? Hello, Inspector. Hello. Say, you fellas gave me a start. Inspector Anderson here told me to expect the monkey burglar to walk in and hear you. The monkey burglar? Uh Uh-huh, that's right, Robin. Inspector Anderson said that... No, I've been reading about that lad, Inspector. Now I gather you call Robin and me and Kent here in to give you a hand in running him down, right? Not quite, Batman. We've already run him down. You have? Who is he? He's right here in this room. What? Oh, wait a minute. What do you mean, Inspector? There's just Batman and Mr. Kent and I here. And you and Sergeant Healy. Why, you can't possibly mean you think one of us is the monkey burglar, can you? I can, and I do. But, but who? Are you you don't know how much it hurts me to say this, gentlemen. But the person we've come to know as the monkey burglar is Robin. Me? What? Robin? Oh, of all the ridiculous... Now, wait a minute, Inspector. You heard me. I now have positive proof that Robin is the mysterious monkey burglar. Put the cuffs on him, Healy. Speechless for a moment, Clark Kent, Batman, and Robin can only stare open-mouthed as Sergeant Healy steps forward and snaps a handcuff on the wrist of Batman's young companion. Come along, son. Robin, as we know, has always been with Batman, a stalwart defender of law and order, striving at the danger of his life to protect the weak against the strong and uphold the laws of his city and country. And yet Inspector Henderson has just said he has positive proof that Robin is the amazingly acrobatic thief. What can this mean? 
We'll learn more about this startling situation tomorrow, so don't fail to be with us then. Yes, be sure to tune in tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Say, gang, don't forget that this is Boy Scout Week. It celebrates the 37th anniversary of the Boy Scouts of America. Our scouts right here in America and in 50 other nations are doing a swell job working to make this a better world. Let's back them up all the way. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pet, the sunshine cereal. Say, what's your favorite Kellogg's cereal for breakfast? Kellogg's Rice Krispies, Corn Flakes, Pep? Well, you can take your pick of ten individual boxes of different Kellogg's cereals every morning if you'll get Mom to set out Kellogg's Variety. Sure, that's the white, green, and red Kellogg package with a grand lineup of Kellogg favorites. Some are flaked, some pop, some shredded, made from corn, wheat, or rice. Yes, sir, breakfast is a picnic all year round when Kellogg's variety is on the table. So ask Mom for Kellogg's variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Clark Kent and Batman feel secure that Robin has an alibi, only to realize that their young friend is not free to account for his past activity. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, this business of collecting comic buttons in that new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pet is one game where the girls have just as much chance to win out as the fellas. Of course, uh, that makes for a race that's mighty exciting fun. And it's fun that'll last, too, for a long, long time. Because no sooner do you have a new button when Mom opens a new package of pep, than you're looking forward to getting another one. Or if you happen to get a duplicate, well, that's even more fun, because then you can shop around among your friends and see who has a pep comic button to swap with you. Yes, sir, you'll want the fun of collecting all 18 comic strip characters in this new series. Tess Trueheart and, and Chief Brandon and Superman and all the rest. So, gang, hop to it. Keep working on your collection. And remember that you don't have to send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy these pep comic buttons anywhere, but you'll find your exclusive prize every time you open a package of Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. That's pep, the whole wheat flakes that taste so crisp and, and golden and delicious on a frosty morning that, well, you get a good start on a good day. Believe me, nobody wants to resist this gold and toasted breakfast cereal. It's super delicious. So remind Mom to get you plenty of P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. When police inspector Henderson called Clark Kent, he told the reporter that a sensational story was about to break and asked him to hurry over to police headquarters at once. There, Henderson announced that he now knew the identity of the mysterious thief whom the newspapers had nicknamed the Monkey Burglar, an amazing acrobat who scaled the outside walls of fashionable apartment buildings and robbed the wealthy occupants. After advising Kent to prepare for a shock, Henderson opened his office door and admitted the famous Batman and Robin, his young companion. Then the inspector stunned his visitors by pointing a stern finger at Robin and saying, Gentlemen... I have positive proof that Robin, Batman's companion, is the thief we know as the monkey burglar. 
As we continue now, Kent, Batman, and Robin stand in speechless astonishment as Sergeant Haley at Henderson's command steps forward and snaps a handcuff on Robin's wrist. Then Batman finds his voice. Listen. Wait a minute. Have you lost your mind, Inspector? Certainly not, Batman. I you know... You must it. have. How can you say that Robin is the monkey bird? Why, of all the... Take it easy, Batman. He's probably kidding. No, I'm kidding. not. What a joke. Excuse me if I don't laugh. I'm not joking, Robin. You're what? not. Well, cut it out, Inspector. This has gone I far I tell enough. you, I'm not joking. I know Robin is the mysterious monkey burglar, and I can prove it. Nonsense. Yeah? I only wish it were nonsense, Ken. Well, now, look. You As can't... I told you before, finding this out about Robin was one of the greatest shocks of my life. Look, Inspector, a joke's a joke. But this one's gone far enough. Take those handcuffs off, you, Lee. Go ahead. Take them off for a few minutes. Yeah, please do. They bore me. Now, uh, wait outside, Healy, please. Right. All right. Now that you've had your little fun, Inspector, will you please tell me seriously why you got us all down here? Yes, I haven't time for tomfoolery. There's plenty Will of... you fellows please get wise to the fact that I'm dead serious? Robin is the monkey burglar. And somebody's a monkey's uncle. Quiet, Robin. I have definite proof that he's a young acrobat who's been making the whole police force look like... Like, like, like... Like, like monkey? Well, go ahead and laugh. You can't laugh Robin out of this rap. Now, wait, Inspector. Why do you accuse Robin? Because he was seen by a couple of his victims. And they're on their way down here to identify him now. Identify him? Why, you're... Who are they? Well, one of them is Nelson Spaulding, the banker. Who was in bed when Robin came in through the window of his 20th floor apartment. 20th floor apartment? That's right, Kent. The boy apparently scaled the side wall, picking handholds in the stone and using his rope on the ledges to climb 20 stories. Pretty neat, huh? Bet you didn't think it was in me. Oh, cut the comedy, Robin. Go on, Inspector. Well, the moon was shining into the room, so Spaulding managed to get a good look at the prowler. And he said it was Robin? No. No, but he said the monkey burglar was a youngster about five feet tall, weighing about 110 pounds. Hey, those are my measurements, but exactly. What else? He was wearing a skin-tight costume and tight red jacket. Uh-oh. And a bat-like hood and half mask. Well, that... Also, he carried a rope. Well, that's a nice description of Robin, all certainly right. is, Batman. Oh, yes. And Spaulding said the robber was armed. Oh, now, wait a minute. I never carried a gun in my life. Of course not. That makes it obvious that somebody was impersonating Robin, Inspector. Sure it does. Oh, no, it doesn't. Can you find me another youngster in Metropolis, exactly Robin's size, who is also an amazing acrobat and rope expert? Well, oh, it's possible. Yeah? And yeah, you got to show me. Now, here's what Roger Hartley, another victim, told us. Hartley, the steel magnet? That's right. He says the young prowler locked him in a closet before he rifled the apartment. But Hartley's bed lamp was on, so he got a look at him first. Well? He gave us the same description Spaulding did. Great Scott. But, but it wasn't me. Why, of course it wasn't, Robin. Look, Inspector, this is ridiculous. Now, you've known Robin a long time, and you know he's always been on the side of law and order. I know he used to be, Kent. Well, he's But he's not anymore. Oh. And I've got the facts to prove it. What facts? Just that two men say they saw the burglars. Well, they're highly reputable men, and... Well, that's all of the better. When you bring Robin face to face with them, I'll bet you a new suit of clothes they say that Robin isn't the monkey bird. Okay, Batman. I'll take that bet. As soon as Spaulding and Harvey... Get... Oh, just a minute. Yeah? Oh, they are, huh? Yeah. Okay, we'll be right there. Mr. Spaulding and Mr. Hartley are here now. Come on, let's go to the lineup room. Leaving his office, Inspector Henderson motions to Sergeant Healy to fall in beside Robin. Followed by Kenton Batman, he leads the way to a room built like a small theater. There, Robin is placed on a brightly lighted stage. And first, Nelson Spaulding, the distinguished banker, is ushered into the room. Is he the one who burglarized your apartment? Yes. He's the one, Inspector. Uh-oh. Thank you, Mr. Spaulding. You may go now. Healy, bring Mr. Hartley in here. Look at this boy carefully, Mr. Hartley. Is he the one who entered your apartment last night, locked you in a closet, and then rifled your place? Yes. He's the one, Inspector. Oh, no. Easy, Batman. Thank you, Mr. Hartley. You may go now. I'll get in touch with you later. Very well, Inspector. Good night. Well, Batman, are you satisfied now? No, of course not. I still say this is absolutely ridiculous. It's open and shut that somebody's impersonating Robin to throw the police off the track. I go along with you on that, Batman. Yeah, well, I don't buy it at all. 
Didn't you both just hear Mr. Spaulding and Mr. Hartley identify Robin? Yes, of course we did. But Mr. Spaulding saw the prowler by moonlight in the shadows of his room. That's right. And Mr. Hartley saw him only for a few seconds in the light of a small bed lamp. Both of them were startled, and if the youngster were dressed uh, uh, like Robin, it were about Robin's size. Oh, yes, and if he just scaled a 20-story building, a trick hardly any boy but Robin can do, for my money it was Robin. And any jury in the land will say so. Well, that's just circumstantial evidence, Inspector. Yeah, well, it's good enough for me. Oh, wait, I'm Inspector, wait. wait. What? I'm going to knock your theory into a cock hat right now. Yeah? Well, go ahead. Okay. Mr. Hartley was robbed last night. Mr. Spaulding was robbed the night before last, right? Right. And three other millionaires were robbed on the three preceding nights. Huh, nothing cheap about us monkey burglars, is it? Let's just stick to Spaulding and Hartley for the moment, Inspector. They were robbed the night, the night before last. Now, it just happens that I can't provide an alibi for Robin because I've been out of town for the last couple of weeks. So I did... just got back this morning. So did I. But I'm sure that Robin can alibi himself. Yeah? Well, Robin, where were you last night and the night before last at 11 o'clock? The time at which each of the robberies were pulled. Oh, that's easy. I was, um... Well? Go on, tell him, Robin. Oh, jeepers, I I can't tell him, Batman. You what? I thought so. Why can't you tell, Robin? Well, I... You've got to tell us. But I can't. Look, Robin, you know there's a serious charge against you. Oh, unless you're going to count for your movements last night and the night before, you'll be in trouble. I know it, Mr. Kent, but I can't tell you where I was. I... I just can't. Ooh, I've heard enough. Robin, I'm satisfied he's the monkey burglar, all right. Book him and lock him up, Healy. Stricken, Batman and Clark Kent can only stand helplessly by as Robin, his face pale, is led away by Sergeant Healy. Why did Robin refuse to account for his whereabouts on the nights of the robberies? Can he be the monkey burglar? We'll be back in a moment to find out. So stand by. You know, gang, it's a load of fun to read stories about buried treasure. And uh, did you ever stop to think that there's a treasure buried in every package of Kellogg's Pat? Yes, sir. A treasure of doggone good eating, plus an exciting prize. A bright-colored comic button to add to your collection of the new series. Maybe it'll be a, a new comic strip character that you don't have yet, like Pat Patton or, or Cindy or Superman himself. And if it should be a duplicate, why, that's even more fun because then you can swap with your pals and, and still have a different button to wear pinned on your jacket or your dress or your cap. And believe me, every single one of those 18 new pep comic buttons is a real humdinger. So how's about reminding Mom right now to get you some more Kellogg's Pep? That's the only way you can get these comic buttons, you know. You can't buy them anywhere, and you don't send in a single penny, not even a box stop. They come only as exclusive prizes in your packages of that sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pet. Pep's in a class by itself when it comes to good breakfast eating, too. Crisp and golden toasted whole wheat flakes loaded with catchy sunshine flavor. As for good sound nutrition these wintry days, Mom knows how good for you Pep is. So ask her to get lots of P-E-P... The Sunshine Cereal, Kellogg's Pep. Formally charged with being the daring monkey burglar, Robin has been fingerprinted and locked in a cell in the juvenile quarters of the city jail. Now, an hour later, Batman and Clark Kent are permitted to visit him, and we join them in his cell. Why wouldn't you tell Inspector Henderson what you did last night and the night before? You ought to know that, Batman. I ought to know. What do you mean, Robin? I can't tell you, Mr. Kent... I forgot I can tell you, because you know who I am. I know. Oh, you mean that you're Dick Grayson? Sure. Oh, I think I get it now. You uh -oh. see, I went to the movies with Jim Olsen last night, and then stayed at his house overnight. Uh-huh. And the night before, I was at Charlie Singh's house. His father is the chemist at the health department, you know. He was helping us with our chemistry lessons. Oh, so that's it. Sure. Neither Jimmy nor Charlie Singh know I'm Robin. They only know me as Dick Grayson. So they can't provide an alibi for me. Unless I reveal to them and to the whole world that Dick Grayson and Robin are one and the same. Uh-oh. Of course I can't do that. No, no, you can't. But we can't let you go to jail either for crimes you didn't commit. What do you suggest we do, Clark? Oh, you got me, Batman. This is one of the toughest problems I've ever faced. Frankly, Batman and Clark Kent, who is really Superman, look at each other. Unable to see a way out of this strange web of incriminating circumstantial evidence. They admit that Robin's identity cannot be revealed. But without revealing his identity, how can he be saved from a long prison term? 
Well, you can be sure that Superman and Batman are not going to stand by idly for long. And tomorrow they hit on a daring plan. So be sure to find out what it is and if it succeeds. So be with us again tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at this same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, there's almost no end to the fun you can have with Kellogg's variety. That's the white, green, and red Kellogg package with ten individual packages of your favorite Kellogg cereals, like Corn Flakes and Rice Krispies and Pep. You can take your choice every morning. Pick out your own private box of cereal. Makes breakfast a picnic. And sister will get a kick out of the cutout dolls on the on the bottom of the tray. Cut them out and dress them up and play all sorts of games with them. So tell mom to be sure to get Kellogg's. Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents The Adventures of Superman. Today, as Clark Kent and Batman plan a trap for the monkey burglar, they are unaware that Robin, spotted by the burglar's henchman, is dangerously unprotected. But first... Here's a surprise for you. Gang, this is Superman. I want to introduce you to Miss Doris McFerrin, who is the editor of Radio Mirror magazine. Miss McFerrin. Thank you, Superman, and hello, fellas and girls. I came over here today to tell you about something Radio Mirror has done this month that it's never done before. Our editor's page has come out with a special tribute to Superman. Because he's done so much to show folks how important it is to respect each other's rights and to get along together. We've been watching this program for a long time, and we think, more than any other show, Superman makes us all want to do the right thing. Listening to your program's good fun, too. That's Radio Mirror's tribute to Superman and to the people behind him. Thank you, Miss McFerrin. That's thanks from me and from the whole Superman staff. And thanks, too, Miss McFerrin, from the Kellogg Company. Makers of Kellogg's Pep. Kellogg is mighty proud to be part of a program like Superman, a show that stands for all the things that are good and, and wholesome and right. Just like Kellogg's Pep adds the wholesome touch to breakfast for growing fellas and girls. Pep with its famous whole wheat nutrition. Pep that tastes so good. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. And now the adventures of Superman. Identified as wearing a costume similar to Robin's and displaying a similar acrobatic skill, an unknown boy has been electrifying Metropolis by scaling the walls of skyscraper apartments and robbing the wealthy occupants. Inspector Henderson brought Robin face to face with two of the victims, each of whom said that Batman's young companion is definitely the spectacular thief whom the newspapers called the Monkey Burglar. Then, to the dismay of Batman and Clark Kent, Robin refused to account for his whereabouts during the robberies and was promptly arrested and jailed. Later, he explained to Batman and Kent that he could not provide an alibi without revealing his identity as Dick Grayson. And as we continue now in Robin's cell, Batman says to Kent, We can't let Robin be sentenced for crimes he didn't commit, Clark. And he can't reveal his identity as Dick Grayson either. What do you suggest we do? Uh, I wish I knew, Batman, but it looks pretty bad. Sure it does. Oh, don't you worry, Robin. We'll get you out of this some way. You hope. The monkey burglar, whoever he is, seems to have me roped, tied, and branded. Well, obviously what we've got to do is find out who the monkey burglar really is. If I could only tell Henderson that the idea of Robin being a thief is ridiculous on the face of it, because he doesn't need the money. I've got plenty, you know. Well, he could only do that by revealing your identity as Bruce Wayne. Exactly. 
And we're right back where we started. Wait a minute, Batman. What? Just thought of something. Let's go see Inspector Henderson. What for? Got a little idea, which, if it works, might lead us to the monkey burglar. Gee, what is it, Mr. Kent? I'll tell you later, Robin. Meanwhile, keep your chin up. If Inspector Henderson will play ball with us, we'll have you free in jig time. Come on, Batman, let's get out of here. Listen a moment, Inspector. Look, the you're mo- wasting your time, Kent. But I tell you, According I'll ha- to the law, I can hold Robin for 48 hours before he comes up for bail. I know you're And, and I'm if only... you think you can talk me into releasing him before that... But you've got to release him, Inspector. That's the only way we can find the monkey burglar. I've already got the monkey burglar. Oh. If you mean Robin, Inspector, you're all wet. Now, just a minute, now, Wait a minute, wait a minute, both of you. Listen to me, Inspector. It's no use, I... Kent. But I only... The evidence I've got against Robin is airtight. What evidence? Yes. Just because a thief dresses up like Robin and a couple of fuddy duddies mistake him in the, the dark is no... The witnesses are highly responsible men. They made a mistake the same as you did. If you'll now just you open your eyes, please, Batman... Please, wait a minute. Cut it out. I know you're upset, Batman, but quiet down, will you? Well, I tell... Please. Okay, Clark. I'm sorry, Inspector. Forget it. Now, look, Inspector... You've known Batman and Robin a long time, haven't you? Yes. And on many occasions, they've been of great aid to the police department, right? Well, yes. You've never had the slightest reason to question their honesty and integrity, have you? Certainly not. Thanks. But... What does that prove? It proves that Robin is entitled to the benefit of the doubt. And it there proves There is that... no doubt, Kent. Oh, of course Robin there... was positively identified as the monkey burglar by two victims of the monkey burglar. I still say that's please, a lot... Please, Batman, wait a minute. Let me handle this. Well, okay, okay. Now, look, Inspector. Mr. Spaulding, the banker, says he saw this monkey burglar in his room by moonlight, didn't he? That's right. And then he saw Robin face to face and identified Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. The fellow he saw was Robin size, wearing a similar costume and a hood and half mask. Right. Under those conditions, isn't it conceivable that Mr. Spaulding could very easily mistake the prowler for Robin? Which is obviously what he was meant to do well, because the fellow was impersonating Robin. Oh, rats. The prowler was a youngster, and he climbed the face of a 20-story building using only his hands and a rope. But that... And Robin's the only remarkable kid acrobat and rope expert I ever heard of. Ah, that you ever heard of. But that doesn't mean that Robin is the only remarkable acrobat or rope expert. Don't you see at least the possibility that somebody just as good at those things as Robin is deliberately posing as our young friend in order to throw the police off his track? Why, it's as plain as the nose on your face. Well, yes... Yes, I admit that's a possibility, ah. but I think it's pretty far-fetched. Certainly not more far-fetched than believing Robin's a thief. Oh, come on, Inspector. Come on, give us a chance to clear this boy. Release no, him and... No, can't I can't. But I... The mayor, the newspapers, all the big shots in this town have been riding me on this case, demanding that I catch the monkey burglar. Well, that's just it. I think we can catch the real burglar and recover some of the loot if you'll cooperate. But we've got to act fast. Huh? Yeah? How? Well, I've got a little plan, but it depends on your releasing Robin for 48 hours. I'll be responsible for it. So him, will I. And so will Perry White and the Daily Planet. Oh, now, look, just... just for 48 hours, Inspector. What can you lose? Well... Just for 48 hours. I guarantee that if we haven't caught the real monkey burglar by that time, we'll turn Robin back to you. That's a fair deal. How about it, Inspector? Well, before I commit myself, what's your plan, Kent? Uh, well, I'd, I'd rather not discuss it yet. It isn't quite perfected. Oh, but now, wait a minute. No, wait a no, minute. No, 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 I've heard that line from you before. Okay, but have I ever given you a bum steer? Well, no, but... All right, then be a good sport and play ball, Inspector. I don't think that deep in your heart you believe Robin is guilty either, so give us a chance to clear him, huh? Oh, drat you, Kent. You could talk the hind leg off of a mule. Then you'll do it? Yes. Yes, I'll release him. That's wonderful. Thanks a lot, Inspector. But only for 48 hours, mind you. That's a bargain. Make out the necessary papers, Inspector. One of us will be right back to pick him up. Come on, Batman. Okay, Ken. Look, Clark, 48 hours doesn't give us much time. What's your plan? I haven't time to explain now, Batman, but if you'll just do as I say and not interrupt me, I think we can put it over. All right, what do you want me to do? First, I want you to take Robin over to Jim Olson's house. To Jim's house? What for? I think he'd be safe there. Tell him to stay there, not to stir out of the house for any reason. Okay, then what? Then you come to the Daily Planet. I ought to have everything worked out by then. But what are you... No more questions now, Batman. i got to get going. I'll explain everything at the planet. So long. Turning away from Batman, Clark Kent hurries from police headquarters. What is his plan to trap the real monkey burglar and so clear Robin? We'll be back in a moment to find out and to uncover a new and startling development. So stand by. You know, gang, if, if you should ever happen to be kind of blue, I'll bet you could cheer yourself right up just by taking a look at some of those comic buttons in that new series you're collecting from packages of Kellogg's Pet. <laughs> They're sure to hand you a laugh. 
Take a vitamin Flintheart, for instance. With his old-fashioned fur coat and his black slouch hat and the way he wears his shaggy white hair so long. Then there's Goofy from the comic strip Harold Dean. Oh, he has such a silly grin on his face. And you'll get a kick out of that Superman button, too, because he reminds you of all the wonderful adventures he's had. Believe me, gang, you can't beat the fun of collecting all 18 pep comic buttons in that new series. So uh, ask Mom to get you some more Kellogg's Pep when she's marketing tomorrow. That's the only way you can get these snappy new comic buttons, you know. You can't buy them, and you don't send in any money, not even a box stop. But there's a comic button and exclusive prize in every package of Kellogg's Pep you open. And Pep's a prize when it comes to breakfast, too. Makes a dish so golden, toasted, and catchy, and, and crisp that, well, you practically can't resist it. That wonderful sunshine flavor is really something to shout about. So ask Mom for P E P. The sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. Following Clark Kent's instructions, Batman has taken Robin to Jimmy Olsen's house. Then, resuming the dress and manner of Bruce Wayne, the wealthy playboy, he tags him to the Daily Planet, where we join him now in Kent's office. Okay, Clark. Robin's at Jim Olsen's house with strict orders to stay undercover. Now, start talking about your plan. Okay, Bruce, here it is. We know that the monkey burglar has been impersonating Robin to keep the police off his own track. Right. So it stands to reason he wouldn't pull off any more robberies while Robin was known to be in jail, would he? Well, of course not. Say, wait a minute. Is that why you got Henderson to release Robin? Well, naturally. With Robin loose, our acrobatic thief will feel free once again to do his stuff. And that's where you and I come in. You mean we nab him in the act, eh? Right. Oh, that's a tall order. Even for Batman and Superman. Why? How do we know where he's going to strike? Well, the way things shape up, we can be fairly sure. How? Well, I've discovered since I left you that most of the fashionable apartment buildings in Metropolis, where the big money people live, put on special guards today to protect the buildings from the monkey burglar. Uh-uh, that's not so good. If we're to catch the fellow, I mean. He'll spot the guards and shy off. Right. But not all the classy apartments put on guards, and one of them that didn't is the one we're interested in. All right, but just the same... Wait a minute, listen. I've just done a page one story for the planet, which will be on the streets in an hour. The story announces the release of Robin from jail. Oh? And it also lists the buildings which have hired special guards. I see, but... Another little story, which I had moved from page 10 to page 1, tells about Mr. and Mrs. Harvey Sims, the oil millionaires who collect precious jewels. What about them? They've rented an apartment for the rest of the winter in the Windsor Arms. They moved in yesterday with their jewel collection and all. Oh, you mean... Yes, the Windsor Arms is not one of the buildings listed as hiring special guards to watch out for the monkey burglars. So you think our friend will make a try for the Sims jewels? Mm -hmm. If he works according to pattern, as most thieves do, he will. He only works on millionaires, you know. Yes, I know. Then you and I will be waiting near the Windsor Arms tonight. We'll be up in the sky where we have a good view as Superman and Batman. And when our friend shows up... We grab him. Right. Now, if the trap works, and I've got a hunch it will... Robin will be cleared tonight. Eagerly, Clark Kent and Bruce Wayne, who are really the famous Superman and Batman, complete their plans for the trap which they hope will net the mysterious monkey burglar and clear Robin. But meanwhile, in a small apartment in another part of the city, a thin, wiry man in shirt sleeves, wearing a hat on the back of his head and smoking a cigar, answers the telephone. Hello? Hello? Yeah, who's this? Jonesy. Oh, Listen, yeah, Jonesy. The cops let that kid Robin go. I know, I just seen it in the papers. Did you tell him? Sure, sure. He left the city jail in a taxi. Good, oh, good. Where'd he go? To a little house over on West Willow Street. Some people named Olson live there. Well, is he still there? Sure. Slim is watching the place while I came over to the corner to phone you. Good boy, Jonesy. This works out swell, just swell. Now you and Slim stay there. I'll be right out. It's getting dark, so everything will be hunky-dory. What are you going to do, Spider? What do you suppose, Dopey? You and Slim stay right where you are. I'll be right out. Hanging up the phone, the little man puts on his coat, jams his hat down low over his forehead, and leaves his apartment, his pig-like eyes gleaming as he pats a suspicious bulge near his left arm. This is a development neither Superman nor Batman foresaw. Now what will happen to Robin? And perhaps to Jimmy, too as Superman and Batman set their trap for the monkey burglar, who in turn is setting his trap for Robin. Monday's episode is packed with suspense and action, so don't miss it, whatever you do. Tune in Monday, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman.
Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Hey, what do you have, gang? Kellogg's Corn Flakes, Rice Krispies, Pep, or one of your other favorite Kellogg cereals? Why, you can take your pick every morning at breakfast when Mom sets out Kellogg's Variety. That's the white, green, and red package with ten individual packages, each one a serving just for you. One day you'll choose a shredded cereal, next day one that's popped, and next day a flake cereal made from corn, wheat, or rice. Everyone's a treat because it's a favorite Kellogg cereal. Make breakfast a picnic of fun. Remind Mom to get you... Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us on Monday for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the Sunshine Cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, Superman and Batman face the desperate fact that so far, everything that has happened has succeeded only in making the case against Robin very much blacker. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, it seems like there's no lack of something to talk about when any of you fellas or girls get together, and no lack of something to do, because all the gang's collecting those exciting comic buttons in the new series from packages of Kellogg's Pep. So you all want to compare notes on how many buttons everybody's collected. And there's quite a business of trading duplicates, too. That's a swell way to add to your collection. Fact is, it seems like you might feel kind of out of things if you're not collecting pep comic buttons. And these exciting prizes are so doggone smart looking. Full bright comic strip colors, the pictures of old funny paper favorites like Pat Patton and, and Cindy and Superman show up like anything when you wear your comic buttons pinned on your jacket or your dress or your cap. So hop to it, gang. Now, you don't have to send in any money, not even a box stop, and you can't buy these comic buttons anywhere, but you'll find one inside every package of Kellogg's Pep you open. That's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Pep, the golden toasted whole wheat flakes with that catchy sunshine flavor. Yes, sir, and Pep's good for you, too. Mom knows that. It gives you added amounts of an energy vitamin, B1, and that good old sunshine vitamin D. So get your good eating and your exciting prizes, gang, from P.E.P., the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. As you know, Robin, young companion of the famous Batman, has been arrested, accused of being the so-called monkey burglar, a daring acrobatic young thief who, wearing a costume, hood, and mask similar to Robin's, has been scaling the outside walls of exclusive skyscraper apartments and robbing the wealthy occupants. Clark Kent finally persuaded Inspector Henderson to release the youngster for 48 hours, promising to produce the real monkey burglar in that time or return Robin to custody. Then, while Batman took his young companion to Jimmy Olsen's house, Kent baited a trap for the mysterious thief, unaware that a man called Spider had had Robin trailed to Jimmy's house. As we continue that evening, Spider has stopped his car on the quiet street where Jimmy lives and lightly sounded his horn. A heavy-set man emerges from the shadows and strolls over to the car. Listen. That you, Spider? Yeah. What gives, Jonesy? That Robin kid's still in there. Yeah? Where? In that frame house across the street. The one where the hedge is. Oh. Who's in there with him? Young guy and his mother. Olsen, their name is. You sure that Batman guy ain't around? Positive. He brought Robin here and then Van Most. Good. I wouldn't want to tangle with him. Uh, me eat a spider. Okay. Now, this should be a fight. We're slim. Down at the corner. You want I should get him? To, to help us handle two kids and an old dame? Nah. We'll pick him up on the way back. Get in. Get in? You heard me. Get in the car. I'm going to run it up in front of the house. Okay. Uh, 
What are we going to do, Spider? We're going to fix it so the monkey burglar can operate again tonight. I got a bit of a job picked out for him. Yeah? How you going to fix it? By taking care of this Robin character, that's how. You mean you're going to... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this has worked out perfect, Jonesy. It's unnatural. Uh-huh. But what if this guy... Hold it. Ro- this the place? Yeah. Okay, get out. Oh, wait, Spider. You didn't tell me what to do yet. I'll tell you, I'll tell you. Now, get out. Okay. Yeah. We'll leave the door open and the motor running. Come okay, on. Okay, but uh, will you please tell me? Now, listen, Jonesy. Now, here's what we're going to do. You walk up to the door, see? Ring the bell. <laughs> Swiftly issuing instructions, the man called Spider leads his henchman up the steps to Jimmy Olsen's door. Meanwhile, unaware of the impending danger to Robin and Jimmy, Superman carrying Batman hurtles through the dark sky and checks his flight above the tall, exclusive apartment building known as the Windsor Arms. Here we are, Batman. That's the Windsor Arms just below us. I see. Where's that oil millionaire's apartment, do you know? Yes, I checked and learned that Mr. Sims occupies the entire 18th floor. Oh, that'll be a tough climb for Mr. Monkey Burglar. Not at all. He's climbed as high as 22 stories. Yeah, that's right. Well, we're all set for him if he only shows up. I think he will. My story in the Daily Planet says Mr. Sims and his wife have their valuable jewel collection in their apartment. Uh Uh-huh. There are no special guards patrolling the building to watch out for our friends. Mm, This setup is made to order for him, all right. Certainly is. That's why I'm so sure he'll show up. He's got to. It's the only way we can clear Robin. Yes, I know. Uh Uh-oh. Ten o'clock. It's pretty late. Where is that human fly? It's still too early for him. Most of his jobs are pulled around 11. Oh. Well, here's hoping he shows up a little earlier tonight. We drew a blank tonight. Take it easy, chum. According to the record, this is about the time the monkey burglar goes to work. Well, I wish you'd check in and punch the time clock. Just waiting around up here in the sky is getting me down. Well, I should have brought a reading lamp and a book for you. Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I am doing a lot of griping. Forget it. But I'm worried about Robin. Inspector Henderson is practically convinced he's the monkey burglar. We'll unconvince him as soon as we... Wait a minute. What's that? What? You see our friend? No, but I thought I heard something. Naturally, I couldn't hear anything but the wind way up here. But everything looks quiet down below. Oh, there it is again. What is it? A radio. And it's that... Yes, it's in that police patrol car going past down there. Oh. Hang on, Batman. We're going down over that squad car to listen in. Down! That's the squad car just beneath us, Batman. Oh, I can see that. Quiet, what? wait a minute. There goes the radio again. Listen. Cars 1763. Go to 1116. West Willow Street at once. Hey, that's Jim Olsen's address. What? I can't understand. Police officer wounded in gunfight. Gunfight at Jim's house. Good grief. Hang on, Batman. We're going out there and fast. Better rip. Up and away. Alarmed, Superman rockets up from his position above the speeding radio car and streaks away toward Jimmy Olsen's house, carrying the equally worried Batman. Like a meteor torn from its orbit, the Man of Steel flashes along the dark skyways, and a moment later, he plummets to Earth before the Olsen's brightly lighted little frame house. There, he and Batman find that one police squad car has already arrived, and an officer is holding back a small crowd. Inside the house in the living room, a police sergeant is administering first aid to a patrolman who has been wounded in the leg. Quickly, Superman and Batman buttonhole Lieutenant O'Brien. Lieutenant... Where are Jim and Robin? What happened? As I get it from Patrolman Ross, that's him on the car seat. Yes. yes. He was walking up the street to his home. He lives just a block away. Yes. Go on. He heard a rumpus going on at the Olsen door here. And then saw two men coming down the steps, dragging two boys. Jim and, and Robin? Yeah. Well, Ross came on the double, calling to them, and both men fired at him. Oh. A bullet got him in the leg and he dropped. Then by the time he got his own gun out and let go at them... They dumped the two boys in the, in the car at the curb and stepped away. Holy smoke. Did the officer hit one then? We don't know. They drove away so fast. Great Scott. Oh, heaven only knows where Robin and Jim are now, Superman. Or what's happened to them. With the color drained from their faces, Superman and Batman stand rigid, shocked, wondering what may have happened to Robin and Jimmy Olsen. We'll know more when we return in a moment with the dramatic climax of today's episode. So stand by. 
Say, fellas, you wouldn't like it, would you, if the girls in your crowd should collect more comic buttons than you did? Well, then you better hop to it. And be sure to be on hand every time Mom opens a new package of Kellogg's Pet. Because, from what I've seen, the girls are getting along mighty fast. Why, I've seen them wearing more comic buttons than, than you can shake a stick at. Pictures of Pat Patton and Tess Trueheart and Chief Brandon and, and Vitamin Flintheart, Judy and Corky, Superman himself, and, and all the rest of those 18 different buttons in this new series. That's right, 18 different characters in all. Each one bright-colored and clear-cut and just about the smartest thing you ever laid eyes on. Now, you'd sure hate to miss out on a single one, so you better get busy. First, ask Mom to get you a good supply of Kellogg's Pep, because that's the only way you can get these keen-looking comic buttons. You can't buy them anywhere, and you don't send in any money, not even a box stop. But you get one in every package of Kellogg's Pep you open. And say, here's something else you get in a box of Kellogg's Pep. Doggone swell eating! Yes, sir, Pep tastes so toasty and delicious that, well, your spoon keeps digging right in for more. So ask Mom for P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. As we return now, it is an hour later. Superman and Batman have failed to find any trace of Robin and Jimmy Olsen. And now with Superman and his guys of Clark Kent, they are in Inspector Henderson's office at police headquarters. Look, Inspector, hasn't Patrolman Ross been able to give any description of the men who took Jim and Robin away? No, Kent, none at all. But how is it, it possible? It was dark, you know. And he didn't get closer than 50 feet to them before he was shot. Yeah. And I understand Mrs. Olsen didn't see them either, because she was upstairs at the time. That's right, Batman. Nope. Nope, we haven't a single clue, except that Ross thinks they took the boys away in a Chevy sedan. And as you know, there are any number of cars like that in Metropolis. Yes, we can't count on that as a clue. Uh, I can't figure it out. The Olsen house wasn't robbed. The boys don't have any money. What do you suppose was the purpose of taking them away? I don't know. I think I can guess why. Yeah? Well, go ahead, Clark. If you have any ideas, for heaven's sakes, let's have them. Well, I think the reason oh, they... Oh, took... just a minute, Kent. Okay. Yeah? Oh, yeah, Sealy. What? What's that? What's up, Inspector? Where? When? Uh-huh. Well, I'll be a horse's neck. So that's the answer. What? Huh? Anything about Robin and Jim? Wait right there, Healy. I'll be right out. You bet I will. Right. So long. What happened, Inspector? Yes, and what are you glaring at me for? Because you and your friend Kent here took me for a sleigh ride, Batman. What? Now, wait a minute. What do you mean, Inspector? I mean that Robin's done it again. What? Robin's done what again? I'm not so sure you don't know. But just to clear all possible doubts, I'll tell you. Robin was up to his monkey burglar tricks again tonight. What? Oh, no. That's oh, yeah. He scaled the outside wall of the Windsor Arms apartments. The Windsor Arms? Climbed 18 stories, then entered and robbed the apartment of Mr. and Mrs. Howard Sims, the oil millionaire. Oh, what no. I tell you? Yeah, he locked up Mr. and Mrs. Sims in another room. Then he lifted their jewel collection, which is worth over a quarter of a million dollars. Right, Scott. Now, wait, Inspector. It couldn't have been Robin. It was, was Robin, all right. Robin, the monkey burglar. Because, again, the description given by both Mr. and Mrs. Sims identified But how could it have been? That's why Robin was supposedly abducted from Jim Olson's house tonight. So he could rob the Sims place. Are you kidding? No. And nobody's kidding me either. Robin is the monkey burglar. And there's not a doubt in the world about it. Completely flabbergasted, Clark Kent and Batman see the iron jaws of a cunning trap closing around Robin. And realize to their dismay that if they had waited above the Windsor Arms apartments only a short time longer, they would have captured the real monkey burglar. Robin, now branded a thief by the police, is missing. And so is Jimmy Olsen. Where are they, and what has happened to them? Rarely have Superman and Batman faced such a bewildering predicament as the one in which they are forced to fight a clever, ruthless foe was unknown to them. So be with us tomorrow when they seek to come to grips with the elusive monkey burglar and meet an even bigger surprise. For a thrill a minute, be sure to tune in tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Hey, it's more fun than a picnic gang to open up your own individual package of your favorite Kellogg's cereal, pour on milk, and eat right out of the box. 
That's the Kell Bowl Pack in Kellogg's Variety. Saves washing dishes, and Mom likes Kellogg's Variety because it's got those nutritious Kellogg cereals that are so good for you. Ten packages in all, different Kellogg cereals like Pep and Rice Krispies, Corn Flakes, in a handy white, green, and red package. Just be sure it's Kellogg's. Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Though Clark Kent determinedly faces the tremendous problem of proving Robin's innocence, he little expects the startling events that come his way. Before we continue with today's episode, let me introduce a gentleman who merits your attention, Mr. Willard Johnson, Vice President of the National Conference of Christians and Jews. Mr. Johnson. Fellows and girls... I'm here today officially to salute Superman and all those who are associated in bringing you this program for some mighty fine work in promoting fair play and good sportsmanship among Americans of different races. I sincerely believe that Superman has demonstrated how, when people work together and understand each other, they can drive out un-Americanism, develop a feeling of brotherhood among all races, creeds, and colors, and so go a long way toward ending wars and creating lasting peace. And we of the National Conference of Christians and Jews want you, Superman, to know how grateful are all people of goodwill for your work in rooting out hatred and for showing young people and their parents how to live the way of brotherhood. For this, Superman, we present to you and to the producers of this program, to your sponsors, the Kellogg Company, and to the Mutual Broadcasting System, This award of distinguished merit. Well, I'm honored, Mr. Johnson, on behalf of all those who helped make this program possible, to accept this award with sincere gratitude. And also with our assurance that we will continue our efforts to root out and expose all that is un American. And now, the adventures of Superman. When Robin, the young companion of Batman, was arrested and accused of being the spectacular monkey burglar who had all Metropolis in a dither, Clark Kent persuaded Inspector Henderson to release the youngster for 48 hours. Then Kent baited a trap by placing a story in the Daily Planet saying that a millionaire with a valuable jewel collection had moved into the exclusive Windsor Arms apartments. After that, as Superman, he took Batman, and together they hovered in the sky above the building, waiting for the mysterious thief to appear. But an alarming radio message intercepted by Superman sent them streaking to Jimmy Olsen's house, where they discovered that Jimmy and Robin had been taken away by two men. A short time later at police headquarters, they learned that the daring monkey burglar had struck again. As we continue now, Inspector Henderson, furious with Kent and Batman, is more than ever convinced he was right in the first place. Listen. Now, there isn't a bit of doubt left in my mind that Robin is the monkey burglar. Nonsense. You're all wrong, Inspector. Oh, no, I'm not. Robin's Confederates put on a phony abduction act tonight to try to fool us. Oh, Inspector. Then, was... while we were wasting time looking for Robin and Jim Olson, Robin broke into the Sims apartment and got away with a quarter of a million dollars in jewels. Of all the... Nonsense. Stop telling me it's nonsense, Kent. And you too, Batman. Why, it's as plain as day. Yes, except that you're mixed up, Inspector. Oh, yeah? What do you mean? Well, my guess is that the monkey burglar or his Confederates were watching the city jail today... And when Robin was released, they trailed him and Batman to Jim Olsen's house. Yes, and I was dumb enough to let them do it. Then they took Robin away, so he wouldn't have an alibi for the time in which the Sims apartment was robbed. Oh, no, that Of really... course, that's what happened. Sure. But then, what happened to Robin and to Jim Olsen? Where are they? And that's what we've got to find out. I'm sure you don't have to worry about Robin. Why? Why? Because he's in some nice, safe place with the Sims jewels laughing his head off at me. Oh, oh. you're off the track, Inspector. Oh, I am, huh? Sure you are, if you call Robin a thief. 
Why, that boy's as honest as the day is long. That's right, and in case you've forgotten, he risked his life more than once to help the police department. That may be, but he's turned bad. Oh. And let me tell you this, Batman. I'm not so sure you don't know a lot more about this than you're letting on. What? Why, you Oh, now, be... Inspector, Hold you... it, Kent. You, Batman, knew Robin was at Jim Olsen's house tonight because you brought him there. Furthermore, everybody knows you and Robin are as close as brothers. Now, look, if you're insinuating... Wait a minute, Inspector. Wait a minute. I knew where Robin was, too. Might just as well accuse me of being in with a monkey burglar. Oh, that's ridiculous. You were just dumb, Kent. Dumb? Why? For believing that hooey about somebody impersonating Robin. Oh. And I was even dumber for letting you sell me that bill of goods. Now, look here, here, wait, here. wait a minute. Yes? Yes, this is Inspector Henderson. Oh! Oh. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. Uh, put him on. Uh, thanks to you two guys, I am really in the soup. Oh, what do you mean, Inspector? Because now the mayor... Uh, yes? Uh, yes, I'm right here, Mr. Mayor. Uh, what's on your... Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir, I know about it. Well, I'm... I'm doing everything possible. Yes, I do know who the monkey burglar is, but That's I haven't... what been... you think. Look, I'm worried, Clark. Relax, Batman. But I tell you, I'm doing everything possible. How can I with Robin and Jim? I know, I know, but you've got to take it easy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I was just leaving for that. Right, sir? Yes, I understand. Good night. Now listen, Inspector. Oh, I... you listen. You've got me on the spot now for releasing Robin. Well, the mayor, the citizens' committee, the newspapers, everybody wants my scalp. I'd wish yeah, sorry, but it's that... all your fault, both of you. Why ought I have my head examined for listening to you two in the first place? Oh, now look, all this is getting us no place. We haven't been able to pick up Robin and Jim's trail, so I suggest I'll that we find Robin. And believe me, when I do, he won't get out of my hands again. Where are you going to look for? Yes. Him? At the last place he was seen, of course. Was Sim's apartment in the Windsor Arms. But Robin wasn't there, I well, tell just you. Just the same. That's the place to start from, Batman. Because the monkey burglar knows where Jim and Robin are, and the only way we can find them is by finding him. Come on, let's go with the inspector. <laughs> Get it straight, Mr. Sims. You say you were sitting right here in this chair when the monkey burglar came in, huh? Yes, that's right, Inspector. He came in through that window. Must have climbed 18 stories straight up the face of the building. There's no fire escape, you know. Hear that, Batman? So what? Robin is the only acrobat in Metropolis. Show me another youngster who can do that. Well, how do you know this fellow was a youngster? Well, from what I could see, I judge he was 15 or 60. Robin's only 14. That's close enough. Go on, Mr. Sims. How was he dressed? Much as that man is. Skin tight costume, cape, hood, and a mask that covered the top half of his face. Uh-huh. Wait a minute, wait a minute. His costume was just like Batman's, you say? Yes. Only he had a tight red jacket under his cape, and his gloves and boots were green. Oh. Robin to a T. Well, satisfied now, Batman? Of course not. I still insist the monkey burglar is impersonating Robin. Oh, baloney. I still say Robin is the monkey burglar. And by George, I'll Just find... a moment, please, Inspector. Is yes. this yours, Mr. Sims? Oh, what's that, Mr. Kent? Take a look at it. What is it? It looks like a coin, a half dollar. It isn't, though, Batman. Well, Mr. Sims? No, I never saw this before. Hey, where'd you find that, Kent? Caught between the carpet and the baseboard, right under the window through which Mr. Sims says the monkey burglar came in. Yeah, let me see it. Here you are, Inspector. What Thanks. is it, Clark? Well, I'm not sure, Batman, mm, but it looks like... Silver coin. On one side, it's in gray with a gymnast performing on parallel bars. Gymnast? Mark. Yeah. And on the other side, it says S-I-A-A. S-I-A-A? Yeah. Hey, what does that mean, I wonder? You've got me. Sure you never saw this before, Mr. Sims? Quite sure, Inspector. Looks to me like a medal, Inspector. I'm sure that's what it is, Kent. And the figure of the gymnast indicates it's an athletic medal, the kind awarded in gym contests. That's right, Batman. Now, since Mr. Sims says he never saw it before, and it was found right under the window in this room, I'd say our monkey burglar friend dropped it. Ah, just of a minute. Of course. He's a crackerjack athlete. We know that much. Sure. Now all we have to do is find out what those letters stand for on the back of the medal and trace it. Uh, would you let me have it, Inspector? Nothing doing, Batman. This is police evidence. I know that, just but all Just I... tell me this. Did Robin ever win a medal like this? No, and if you're trying to insinuate... Easy, the... Batman, easy. Now, I'll keep your shirt on. Don't forget that your skirts aren't quite clean in this business yet. What? You heard me. Oh, I'll look into this metal business in the morning. In the morning? Well, sure. It's past midnight now. But Robin and Jim... They're in trouble, and this metal is the only clue we've turned up yet. Yes, I know. But don't look for too much from it. Why? Because Mr. Sims just moved into this apartment, and the metal might have been dropped by a workman laying the carpets, or a painter, or even by a previous tenant. Well, that's pretty far-fetched. I think that Never this is just... Never mind the... what you think, because so far your thinking's been all wet. Good night, Mr. Sims, and I'll do all I can to recover your jewelry. Thank you, Inspector. 
Good night. Come on, Kent. Batman. Departing from the Sims' apartment, Kent and Batman leave Inspector Henderson and search throughout the night for Robin and Jimmy Olsen. But in vain. The next morning, deeply worried, Kent enters Editor Perry White's office in the Daily Planet. Morning, Chief. Oh, there you are, Kent. I had just spoken to Inspector Henderson, and he says there's no word on Jim or Robin yet. Oh, I know. I just come from headquarters. I can't understand it. If it was the monkey burglar and his gang who grabbed Robin, why did they take Jim? Because being with Robin, he saw them and could identify them. Great, Caesar. Then that can mean we'll never... Where's the phone, Chief? Oh, I'll take it. Hello? This is Mr. Perry White? Yes, who is... Does a young fellow named Jim Olson work for you? Jim Olson? Yes, what about it? What about Jim? Wait a minute. Well, you'd better get out here right away, then. Something's happened to him. What? Oh, what do you mean? Where is he? He's here at my place. It's Reese's General Store near River Falls, where Highway 16 crosses Orange Avenue. I know where that is, but... Well, like I said, you'd better get right out here. Uh, but wait, uh, what is the matter with the... So long. Confound it, he hung up. For Pete's sake, Chief, what's happened? I don't know, I don't know, but this sounds bad. Come on, let's get going. Seizing his hat and coat, Perry White rushes from his office, followed by Clark Kent. What will they discover at Reeser's General Store? We'll be back in a moment for the dramatic climax of today's episode. So stand by. You know, I don't know why it is, but there always seems to be a lot of rivalry between the fellas and the girls in our neighborhood. Believe me, the fellas don't want to let those girls get ahead of them in anything. So there's a real race on nowadays, collecting those bright-colored comic buttons in that new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pet. Every single kid in that block is mighty busy. Exchanging duplicates, for instance. Boy, that's swell fun. Uh, suppose you have two comic buttons with Cindy on them, uh, but you don't have a Superman button. So uh, you find which one of your pals has an extra Superman and whether he needs Cindy in his collection. And you make the trade. Yes, sir, everything about this new series of 18 different comic buttons is doggone exciting fun. So uh, you better ask Mom to get you plenty of Kellogg's pet. You can't buy these comic buttons anywhere, and you don't send in any money, not even a box stop. But you find your exciting prizes in every package of Kellogg's Pep you open. And boy, doesn't Pep make a nifty dish for breakfast. Mm -mm. Those toasted flakes of real whole wheat are so crisp and fresh, so loaded with that catchy sunshine flavor that, well, you just show me a fellow or gal who can resist them. So tomorrow, start your day with a dish of P-E-P, -E the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. As we continue now, Clark Kent and Perry White have just arrived at Reeser's small general store outside the village of River Falls. There, Reeser, a red-faced middle-aged man, leads them toward a room at the back of the store. This young fellow who says his name's Olson came into my store just before I called him. I could see there was something wrong with him. His eyes were glassy and he was breathing hard. Uh, never mind that, Mr. Reeser. Where is he now? Right in this room. There he is, on the couch. <gasps> what? Great Scott Kent. Look, Jim. For heaven's sake, what happened to him? Gasping, Clark Kent and Perry White hurry to the couch on which Jimmy Olsen lies pale and motionless. What has happened to the young cub reporter? How did he get to Reese's general store? And what of Robin, who is still missing? There are thrills and more surprises in tomorrow's swift-moving episode, so don't miss it. Be sure to tune in tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, breakfast is a picnic all year round when there's Kellogg's variety on the table. That's the white, green, and red Kellogg package with ten individual packages, each one a serve-yourself portion of one of your favorite Kellogg cereals. Different Kellogg cereals to choose from, and whatever you pick, you know it'll be crisp and fresh and good because it's Kellogg's. One day you'll want Kellogg's Pep, the next uh, Rice Krispies, and then Corn Flakes, and right on down the line. So ask Mom to get Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. 
This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, despite the misgivings of all concerned, Clark Kent is certain that the Monkey Burglar's gymnastics medal will be the clue that proves Robin's complete innocence. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, the other day, there was a bunch of fellows and girls gathered together over at the playground, and they were so busy comparing notes on their collections of comic buttons from packages of Kellogg's Pep that one father told me he had to ask the kids three times if they wanted to go to the movies. Yes, sir, it's that much fun to collect those Pep comic buttons. You don't want to stop. First off, there's the exciting moment when Mom opens a new package of Pep. Maybe it'll be a duplicate button, a little moose or, or, or goofy or superman or, or some other button that you've already collected. That's extra fun, you know, to get a duplicate because then you can swap with your pals. And, of course, it's a thrill to wear your whole collection pinned on your jacket or your dress or cap for everybody to see. So hop to it, gang. Remind Mom to get you plenty of Kellogg's Pet. That's the only way you can get these comic buttons. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop, and you can't buy them anywhere. But you'll find your exclusive prize in every package of Kellogg's Pep you open. And is Pep terrific when it comes to good eating at breakfast? Whole wheat flakes, sunny and golden toasted, crisp and fresh as can be. Pep is called the sunshine cereal. It's loaded with catchy sunshine flavor. So ask mom to stock up on P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now the adventures of Superman. Identified by two millionaire victims as the spectacular thief known as the Monkey Burglar, a youth who, wearing the costume of Batman's young companion, has been scaling the walls of skyscraper apartment buildings to commit robbery, Robin was arrested and jailed. With great difficulty, Superman and Batman persuaded Inspector Henderson to release the boy in order to set a trap for the Monkey Burglar. Then Robin was taken to Jim Olsen's house, and several hours later, both youngsters were abducted. Later that night... While Superman, Batman, and the police searched for them, the monkey burglar struck again. The following morning, a man phoned Editor Perry White to inform him that a young man claiming to be Jim Olsen had walked into his small general store and, after asking that White be notified, collapsed. Kent and White dashed out, and as we join them now, they are driving the revived but still weak Jim Olsen back to the Daily Planet. Listen. How are you feeling now, Jim? Better? Yeah, Mr. Kent. Much better, thanks. Oh, poor kid. That must have been a horrible experience. It wasn't pleasant, Mr. White. I can tell you that. No, I'm sure it wasn't. Poor Robin. Heaven knows what's happening to him. You have no idea where they took him? Well, how could I? I? I told you I was knocked out. Easy, Jim. Easy. Here we are back at the planet. You see, Batman will probably be waiting for us in the chief's office, and you can tell all of us the whole story. Come on. Talked with your mother, Jim, and told her you're okay. Oh, gee, thanks, Chief. Now, where is that Batman? Oh, he'll probably be here in a minute. I just called his home and he left. Well, we can't sit here waiting for him all day. I'm bursting with curiosity. Uh, why don't you start talking, Jim, and then we can bring Batman. No, up no, no, Chief. He... No, let, let's wait just a little while. Give Jim a chance to relax some more. Well, okay, but if he doesn't come. Oh, here's Batman now. Hello, Clark. Hello. Sorry I'm late. Well, another minute and we wouldn't have waited. Wait for what, Mr. White? I did. Great guns. Jim, Jim Olson. Hiya, Batman. I wanted to prepare you for this, Batman, but... But, but you... how did you get here? Where'd you come from? When did you... I don't know exactly. You don't know? No, I... Look, Batman, it's, it's a long story. Oh, where's Robin? I... I don't know. Good grief, what's going on no, here? No, no, take it easy, Batman. Take it easy? How can I take it easy when Robin... Wait a minute, wait a minute. I'll tell you briefly how we found Jim, and then he can take it from there and tell all of us what happened before that. Yes. 
We deliberately held him up until you got here so we could all get the story together. Well, thanks, but but poor Robin... Well, I... He'll be all right, Batman. I hope... Sure he will. Now, sit down and listen, will you? Okay. About an hour ago, we got a telephone call from a man who runs a general store in River Falls. He told us that Jim had staggered into his place and after identifying himself and asking that we be called, collapsed. Well, the chief and I rushed out there and found Jim conscious, but still very weak. Yes. We didn't want him to talk right away, so we carried him into Ken's car and brought him here. Now, I think he feels well enough to talk. Right, Jim? Yeah, I'm okay now. Well, then, for heaven's sake, tell us what you know. Okay, but I don't know much. Nothing at all about what happened after we left the house because I was out cold. Poor kid. Knocked out? By whom? Well, here's the story. Robin and I were talking in my house when the doorbell rang. I opened it, and two men carrying guns forced their way in. Great shooter. Each of them grabbed one of us. Robin yelled to fight them. Then the guy he was tussling with hit him over the head with his gun butt and knocked him out. Oh, no. I turned to yell, and then I remember seeing a million stars, and... Well, a second later, everything went black. The dirty cowards. Who were the men? Did you get a look at them, Jim? No, I didn't, Mr. Kent. You see, they had handkerchiefs over their faces, and their hats were pulled down low. Uh Uh-oh. All I know is that one was a skinny, wiry guy, and the other one was a husky bruiser. I see. That's not much help. It certainly isn't. No, but go on, Jim. What happened then? Well, the next thing I remember is waking up on the floor in the back of a car. One of the two thugs, the big one, was in the back seat with me. Another one, a different one, was driving. What about Robin? He wasn't there. What? He wasn't? No, Batman. I I don't know what happened to him. Oh, great Lucifer. Clark... That must mean that Robin is... Easy, easy, Batman. Let's hear the rest of this before jumping to conclusions. How did you get away, Jim? Well, I didn't really get away. The men let me go. Really? They did. That's right, Chief. They stopped the car and made me get out and then told me to walk back on the dirt road we were on. It was way out in the country someplace and dark. Did they tell you where the road led? Uh Uh-huh. They said I'd come to a highway that would lead me to Metropolis. I see. Go on. Well, I must have walked for hours. The dog chased me once and I ran. Top of that, I was dizzy from that knock on the head. No but... wonder you fainted. Yes. Look, Jim. But Robin, what happened to him? Gosh, I don't know, Batman. I, I didn't see him. Then as the car pulled away, I tried to get the license number, but there was mud on it. Besides, my head was going around. I'm worried, Clark. Do you think the monkey burglar's gang has Robin? They must have. They took him away so he wouldn't be able to prove he was at Jim's house when the Sims' apartment was being robbed. Oh, if that's so, why didn't they let him go after the robbery, the way they did Jim? Well, that's what worries me, Chief. Me too. Now, how are we going to find him, Clark? We haven't even a single clue to where he may be. Oh, yes, we have. What? What's that? Did you forget the gymnast's medal, the one we found in the Sims' apartment? Oh, yes. Well, what about it? Well, I'm certain the monkey burglar dropped it. And if he did... We'll have the identity of the monkey burglar. Well, that's not going to be easy to trace. You bet it is. Inspector Henderson may have traced it by now. Let's go over there and see. Say, what's all this about a medal? We'll tell you about it on the way to headquarters, Jim. Let's get going. Well, Inspector, now that you've heard Jim's story, do you still think Robin's abduction was phony? I certainly do, Batman. Why, what? Why do you say that, Inspector? Because I still think Robin is the monkey burglar. What? That his gang put on that phony act last but night. what about Jim? They tapped Jim on the head and took him along, just to make it look good. Oh, oh now, I look, Inspector. I tell you, Inspector. it wasn't phony. And I say it was. By George, I'm... Now, listen. Good. I've taken just about as much of wait this as I Wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's not get into an argument again. But, Clark, There's I... only one way to prove Robin's innocence, and that's to find the real monkey burglar. Stop wasting your time, Kent. Look, what about that medal I found in the Sims' apartment, Inspector? Have you identified it yet? Yeah. Yeah, I got a report on it just before you came in, Kent. Good. What'd you find out? That it's a medal for winning first place in a gymnastics contest. Yes? Won in the annual State Interscholastic Athletic Association Championship. That adds up all right, because we know the monkey burglar is a crack athlete. Right. But the important thing is the name of the winner of that medal. Did you get that, Inspector? Not yet. I was just going over to the State High School Athletic Office to check their files when you fellas came in. What are we waiting for? Let's all go over there now. Oh, now, take it easy, Batman. Naturally, I'm going through on this clue. But the chances are we'll find the medal belongs to some perfectly innocent person. One of the workmen in the Sims apartment... Is I don't might... think so. I'm sure you're wrong, Inspector. I think that medal was dropped by the monkey burglar, and as soon as we trace it, we'll be on his trail. Come on, we've no time to waste. Let's get over to the high school athletic office. Accompanied by Inspector Henderson, our friends leave police headquarters to trace the gymnastics medal. Their only clue to the monkey burglar and to Robin. What will they discover? 
We'll be back in a moment to find out, so stand by. You know, I can't seem to figure out who's getting the most fun out of collecting comic buttons in this new series from packages of Kellogg's Pep. The fellas or the girls. I see the fellas busy as anything over at the playground, comparing notes and, and swapping duplicates. And then right down the block, I see a bunch of girls owing and eyeing over each other's collection and, and swapping duplicates, too. And I see a lot of girls' dresses and boys' caps sporting lots of these uh, bright-colored comic buttons. So, you know, I've just about decided that both fellas and girls get a great big kick out of collecting pep comic buttons. And no wonder, they're so doggone good-looking. Real true-to-life pictures of 18 different comic strip favorites, like Judy and, and Corky and Superman himself. And these pep comic buttons are so easy to get. All you do is to ask Mom to keep you supplied with Kellogg's Pet. You don't buy these prizes, and you don't send in any money, not even a box stop. But... You get a comic button every time you open a package of Kellogg's Pep. And say, here's something else Pep gives you. A mighty nifty dish for breakfast. Yes, sir, Kellogg's Pep tastes so keen and, and so catchy and crisp and delicious that, well, you practically can't resist it. So ask Mom for P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. After dropping the exhausted Jimmy Olsen at his home, Clark Kent, Batman, and Inspector Henderson proceeded to the offices of the State High School Athletic Association. We join them there now as they are speaking to Mr. Bogart, the director. Now, as I understand it, Mr. Bogart, this medal was awarded for the gymnastic championship in a state high school meet, right? That's right, Inspector. Can you give us the name of the boy who won it, Mr. Bogart? Well, yes. As a matter of fact, Mr. Kent, I can give you the names of ten boys who won it. Ten, ten boys? Well, how's that? Well, we've been giving medals like this for the past ten years. Oh, I see. Uh -oh. But this one couldn't have been won more than a year or two ago. The monkey burglar is only a youngster. How can we be sure of that, Kent? He may be small and look young in that mask and costume. Well, yes, oh, but I... Rats, we know he's young. We know his name, too. Oh, now, so look. let's stop wasting time. We're not wasting time. Certainly not. It's worth a try, anyhow. Uh, would you get the records, please, Mr. Bogart? Be glad to, Mr. Kent. Thank you. I'm afraid we're barking up the wrong tree, Kent. Chances are this medal was won years ago. And I think it was won last year, or a year before at most. I sure hope so. And we can't afford to overlook this clue, Inspector. It's our only lead to finding Robin and clearing him of this charge. Yes, and it's got to pay off. It must. Well, for your sake, I hope it does. Here are the records, gentlemen. As you'll see, there are ten names. All right, let's have them, Mr. Bogart. I've got a strong hunch that one of them is the monkey burglar. <laughs> Eagerly, Clark Kent and Batman scan the paper on which is listed ten names, representing ten boys who won the state high school gymnastics championship within as many years. Will one of those boys turn out to be the monkey burglar? Meanwhile, what of the missing Robin? What is happening to him? Will this clue lead our friends to Batman's young companion? We'll learn much more tomorrow, fellows and girls, when we find out what has happened to Robin. So don't fail to be with us then. Tune in, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at this same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Just think of the circus of fun, gang, when Mom sets Kellogg's variety out on the table at breakfast. There's the business of picking out your own favorite Kellogg cereal from this handy white, green, and red package with the ten individual packages. You'll take Kellogg's Corn Flakes or, or Pep or Rice Krispies or one of your other Kellogg favorites, and you'll have your own private box of cereal to open yourself. Then, for Sister, there's the cutout doll on the bottom of the tray to dress up and to play all sorts of games with. So ask Mom to get you Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. 
Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg Pep. P E P Pep. Kellogg Pep, the Sunshine Serial presents the Adventures of Superman. <laughs> Today, Superman and Batman continue their search for Robin, unaware that the boy is doomed to death by the monkey burglar's henchmen. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, nowadays, when you read the funny papers, you're reminded of those comic buttons in the new series all the gang's collecting from packages of Kellogg's Pet. And when you take a look at any of your pet comic buttons, you're reminded of your favorite character's adventures right in the funny papers. It's swell fun because those pictures are so doggone true to life that, well, you'd almost think that you're going to hear the siren on Chief Brandon's police car or hear Superman's famous up, up, and away. You see, every single one of those 18 different pictures is an accurate reproduction of one of your funny few favorites. It's done up in bright color, too, so that you'll feel like strutting around when you wear your pep comic buttons on your jacket or your dresser cap. And remember, you get these prizes the easy way. You can't buy them anywhere, and you don't send in any money, not even a box stop. You just look for your prize inside every package of Kellogg's Pep you open. And say, speaking of prizes, how about the good eating you get in Kellogg's Pep, too? Pep is so crisp and, and fresh and toasty, it's full up to the brim with catchy sunshine flavor. You know, Pep is called the Sunshine Cereal. It's a prize in good breakfast eating. So ask mom for lots of P-E-P. The Sunshine Cereal Kellogg's Pep. And now the adventures of Superman. As you remember, Batman's young companion Robin is in the hands of a gang behind the so-called Monkey Burglar, a daring young acrobat who, dressed as Robin, has been scaling the walls of skyscraper apartment buildings and robbing the wealthy occupants. In an attempt to find Robin, Clark Kent and Batman visited the last apartment robbed by the mysterious thief. And there, Kent found a high school medal, emblematic of the state gymnastics championship, which he and Batman believed to be an important clue dropped by the monkey burglar. But at the High School Athletic Association, our friends learned that ten such medals had been won in the last decade by ten different boys, thus giving them ten suspects. As we continue now, Kent, Batman, and Inspector Henderson, still battled, are returning to police headquarters in a taxi cab. Listen. It takes time to track down ten different boys, Clark. Meanwhile, heaven only knows what's happening to Robin. Or, or even where he is. Take it easy, Batman. We don't have to track down all ten boys who won the medals. How else do we know which one is the monkey bird? Yeah. How do you figure that, Kent? Unless you're willing to admit it's Robin. Oh, no, don't start that routine again, Inspector. Okay, okay. What's your angle, Kent? Well, I don't think we have to track down all ten boys on this list because the monkey burglar has been identified as being about 15 or 16 years old. Uh-huh. And a boy who was in high school 10, 9, or even 5 years ago would be older than 15 or 16 now. That's right. So all we have to do is check the boys who won the medal in, well, say the last four years. Is that all right with you, Inspector? Oh, sure. Help yourself, Kent. Personally, I'm all washed up with this metal angle. For my money, it's a wild goose chase. Now, look, Inspector, this I'm, is no... I'm all through listening to you fellas. Because the mayor, the newspapers, the citizens' committee, every big shot in town is on my neck. I but know. Lord, I've got just 24 hours to put the monkey burglar behind bars. If I don't do it, well, I'm out on my ear. And unless something happens soon to clear this case... I'm going to take you in, Batman. Me? Yes, you. What for? I told you before, I'm not satisfied that you don't know where Robin is or what he's been up to. Now, look here. Well, that's right. You heard right. me, and you can consider it a warning. Why, how do you like that, Clark? I don't. Well, here's headquarters. Coming in with me, Kent? No, thanks. Batman and I are going to work on this list of medal winners. Yes, and I'll bet we'll make you eat your words, Inspector. Yeah, I doubt it. Well, again, I say for your sake, I hope so. Thanks. So long. So long, Inspector. Uh, driver, go on to 1228 Bridge Street. Okay. Uh, what's that address, Clark? That's where a boy named George Kenline lives. He won the state in that championship in 1945. Why'd you pick him first? Because he's first on the list. Oh. Oh, you better check your costume, Batman. I think it would be better for you to appear simply as Bruce Wayne. Okay. Make it snappy. We're turning into Bridge Street now. <laughs> Apartment 3G, wasn't it, Bat? Uh, I mean, Bruce? Yes, that's what it said in the mailbox, Clark. Okay, here we are. Mm, I'm just hoping to get the jackpot right off. We well, you know in a minute. Here comes a woman answering a knock. Well, how do you... Oh, well, you're actually busy. Mm-hmm. Quiet. 
Yes. Uh, pardon me, are you Mrs. Henline? Yes. What? We mean? understand that your son, George, won the state high school gymnastics championship three years ago. Is that right? Why, yes, it is. George is a wonderful athlete. Oh? As a matter of fact, he may be on the next Olympic team. Well. Uh, that's what he said in his last letter. His letter? Uh, what do you mean, Mrs. Henline? Why, well, he's in Germany, you know. German? German? Well, yes. With the Army of Occupation. Uh-oh. But mm-hmm. do come in, and I'll be glad to tell you what you wanted all about, George. Oh, well, thanks very much, but it won't be necessary now. We wanted to talk with your son, but since he's out of the country... We're sorry we troubled you, will you? Thanks, and goodbye, Mrs. Henline. No trouble at all. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, that's that for number one. All right, come on, Bruce. All right. Who's next, Clark? Well, let's take a look. Uh, Frank Ames, 126 Crescent Drive. Okay, let's go. Well, Mr. Ames, we understand that your son Frank won the high school gymnastic championship two years ago. Is that right? Yes, that's right, Mr. Kent. Frank's quite an athlete. Well, may I ask why you're inquiring about that? Yes, certainly. You see, I'm a reporter for the Daily Planet. My friend Bruce Wayne. Oh, yes. reporters. Well, quite a few of you gentlemen of the press have been here to get a story since Frank went to training camp. What? Training camp? Why, yes. I assumed you knew he signed a contract with the Red Sox baseball team and went south to their training camp last week. No, I... Frank's an excellent pitcher, you know. Oh, oh yes. He went south last week? That's right. Frank number two. I beg your pardon? Oh, uh, it's our mistake, Mr. Rain. Mistake? I'm afraid I don't understand. Well, we were looking for a different story. And a different boy. Yes, so we'll apologize for bothering you and get along. Thanks very much, though. Goodbye, Mr. Rain. Let's go, Clark. Right. On to prospect number three. I see you're getting set for a trip to Superman. Right. Well, where to now? Next stop is downstate in Bensonville to see a boy named Phil Edwards who won the state gymnastic championship in 1943. Well, I hope this one pans out. I'm beginning to think we may be barking up the wrong tree. I don't think we are. Yeah. All set. You ready? Yep. Let her rip. Okay. Up and away! <laughs> My son Phil did win the state gymnastics championship in 1943. I see. Could you tell me where he is now, Mrs. Edwards? Certainly. He's in college now. In college? Yes. He's an excellent student, and he manages to keep up his athletics, too. He's on the team at State College. Uh, is uh, this the picture of your son, Mrs. Edwards? That's right. Oh, he's a fine-looking boy. Yeah, he must be over six feet tall. He's exactly six feet two inches tall. Well, that lets him out, Clark. Lets him out? Of course. Oh, no, no, nothing, nothing. Nothing at all. Th- thank you, Mrs. Edwards. Thanks very much. Come on, Bruce. We have one prospect left. Three tries and three blanks. Maybe Inspector Henderson was right, Clark, when he said some perfectly innocent person dropped the medal. Uh-uh, no, sir. My hunch still says the monkey burglar dropped it, and we've got one more chance to prove it. And who's our last prospect? A boy named Billy Riggs, who lives on Morton Street in Metropolis. He won the medal last year. I see. There we are. Now, you all set for a quick trip by a Superman Express? Yes, but this is our last chance. If Billy Riggs isn't the monkey burglar, we may never find Robin. Last chances have paid off for me before, Bruce. Well, I've got my fingers crossed, Superman. Right. Here we go. Up and away! Leaping high into the sky with Bruce Wayne, Superman rockets back to Metropolis, following the final clue which may or may not lead our friends to the mysterious monkey burglar and so to the missing Robin. Are they on the right track? We'll be back in a moment to find out, so stand by. Say, you know how it is when you get excited about something? You know, sometimes you get your words all mixed up. Well, the other day, a young pal of mine got so excited when his mother opened a new package of Kellogg's Pet. Here's what he said. Gee, Mom, just what I need in my collection. Vitamin Zinhart. <laughs> well, of course, he was talking about Vitamin Flintheart, of those funny paper characters on the Pet comic buttons in that new series, All the Gang's Collecting. And believe me, any one of those 18 new and different buttons is something to get excited about. The colors are so clear and bright, they but they stand out like anything against that gleaming white background. Yes, sir. Seems like you're not in the swing these days unless you're collecting those swell prizes. So you better keep going on your collection. Ask Mom to get you a good supply of Kellogg's Pets. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy these collie buttons anywhere. You just look inside every package of Kellogg's Pets you open, and there's your prize. And what else do you get from a box of pets? Well, a mighty terrific dish for breakfast. 
Yes, sir. A bowl of those sunny, golden, toasted whole wheat flakes is just the thing to start off your day with a bang. So, ask Mom for lots of tea. E. P. The Sunshine Cereal, Kellogg's Pet. Now, in a small apartment in the squalid tenement district of Metropolis, we find the thin, wiry man called Spider, and Jonesy, his husky henchman, engaged in conversation. Oh. Spider. And Robin Kid sure is a little wildcat. But Slim and I got him tied up now, so he'll stay tied. Good. <laughs> I gotta laugh when I think about how the cops are sure he's the monkey burglar. Yeah, we got him fooled all right, huh? Yeah. I want to keep him fooled till this last caper is over. The one we pull tonight. Boy, is this one up to at least a hundred grand. Hey, that's a lot of cabbage. And how? With that and what we already got, we can retire after tonight, don't we? Yeah, well, that'll be okay with me. You know, the kid's been giving me the jitters. You mean Robin? No, I'm monkey kid. Complaining all the time, and especially since he lost his good luck piece. What good luck piece? Didn't he tell you? He always carries some little medley one in a high school gym meet or something. Says it's his good luck piece. So what? Well, so this morning he couldn't find it. Now he went home to see if it's there. He went home? Yeah. Why'd you let him do that for you, lunkhead? Well, I figured it might calm him down if he finds his dopey medal. Anyhow, you let him go home before. Yeah, huh? but not in the daytime when he's supposed to be in school. Hey, I never thought of that. Oh, ah, well, maybe it don't matter anymore. Because we'll be all done with him after tonight, anyhow. Look, you, uh, you're just gonna let him go then, Spider? Are you kidding? With all he knows? Uh, I didn't think you would. Uh, how about the Robin kid? Yeah, we're gonna let the cops find him. The cops? But Robin's seen me, and he's seen you, too. Don't be so dumb, Jonesy. Robin ain't gonna be able to talk when the cops find him. Oh, you mean... Sure. The cops think Robin is the monkey burden. Okay. So they're gonna find him tonight. After we pull this last caper. But like I say... He ain't going to be able to tell him he ain't the monkey burglar. And neither is Billy Rick, the real monkey burglar. His little eyes gleaming, Spider pronounces doom for Robin. And for the boy named Billy Riggs, the real monkey burglar. Will Superman and Batman meet Billy Riggs, who is the one person who might yet be able to lead them to Robin in time to save the youngster's life? What will happen? A great deal happens in tomorrow's exciting episode. So don't fail to be with us. Tune in tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. <laughs> Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pet, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, get a load of this. In Kellogg's Variety, there are ten individual packages of cereal for you to choose from. Every morning, you can pick out your own private box of cereal. And it'll be one of your Kellogg's favorites, like Pepper, or Rice Krispies, and Corn Flakes. Boy, that's a circus of fun. That's Kellogg's Variety, the handy white, green, and red package with all those crisp, fresh Kellogg cereals. Some flakes, some shredded, some pops. Made from corn, wheat, or rice. Ask Mom to get Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the Sunshine Cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, Superman and Batman trail Robin's captor to his den, only to find that the spider's lair is empty.
Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, it would be a doggone shame if you should miss out on a single one of those swell comic buttons in that new series Kellogg's Pep is putting out. Because every single one of those 18 different buttons is so bright colored and gleaming that, well, they look mighty smart pinned on your jacket or your dress or cap. And every single picture of your favorite comic strip characters is a dead ringer for one of your friends you've been following in the funny papers for a long, long time. Old favorites like Brenda Starr and Tess Trueheart and Superman himself. So get busy on your collection, gang. It's easy as anything. You don't have to send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy these pep comic buttons anywhere. You get them just by asking Mom to get you some Kellogg's Pep and looking inside each package for your prize. Yes, sir, Kellogg's Pep is a prize package, all right. Such a super delicious dish for breakfast that, well, you practically can't resist it. Those toasted flakes of good whole wheat are crisp and, and golden and loaded with that catchy sunshine flavor. Good for you, too. Sure, Mom knows that. It gives you energy vitamin B1 plus added amounts of that good old sunshine vitamin D that's so important these wintry days. So ask Mom to get you lots of P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. A small silver medal emblematic of the state high school gymnastics championship is the only clue Superman and Batman have to the so-called monkey burglar who has been impersonating Robin and whose confederates are holding Batman's young companion. Ten boys, they learned, had won such a medal. But by a process of elimination, Superman and Batman finally reached the name of Billy Riggs, who, as we know, is the monkey burglar. Now, as our friends set out for Billy's house, a man called Spider, who had engineered the abduction of Robin, is completing plans which will accomplish the end of both Robin and his young impersonator. As we continue now, we find the wiry Spider in his small apartment, where he is explaining his plan to a heavy-set man, his confederate, Jonesy. Listen. Now, uh, here's the setup, Jonesy. Tonight, as I said, our monkey burglar pulls his last job. And this one will be worth about a hundred grand. Hey, that sounds good to me. Where is all this, though, Spider? It's in the apartment of a rajah. A what? A rajah. He's uh, kind of like a king over in India. Oh. Well, this rajah's over here for the United Nations meeting, see? And he's got the dough and hard cash and lots of jewels that he keeps around his apartment in the Crescent Tower. Uh -huh. It's like hitting a jackpot. Yeah. And when we get that dough, I'll close up my gym. We'll go traveling, Jonesy. We'll see the world and never have to steal another nickel. Hot dog. Now, about the two kids, Billy and that Robin character. We'll take care of them right after the job tonight, like I said. Okay, swell. Hey, it's almost six o'clock. Where's Billy? I told you. He went home to look for that middle he lost. The one he calls his lucky piece. Yeah, I know, but he ought to be back by now, though. I told him there was a big job here for tonight. Don't worry, he'll be back soon. He'd better be. Now get this, Jonesy. As soon as Billy gets back, see that he gets dressed up in his Robin costume and we'll get going. It'll be dark by then. Okay. And oh, yeah. We'll want two cars tonight. Two? What for? Well, I'll ride with Billy in the coupe. You and Slim follow in the sedan with Robin. By the way, he's tied up and gagged, ain't he? You bet he is. Okay. You better go out to the garage now and check the cars. Then as soon as Billy gets back and change, we'll get started. This is the big night, Jonesy. As Spider and Jonesy prepare for the monkey burglar's final job and for the end of young Robin, Superman and Batman in their guises of Clark Kent and Bruce Wayne have arrived at another tenement apartment hardly a mile away. There they are admitted by Billy Riggs' mother. A gentlewoman whose pleasant face is lined with care. Sit down, Mr. Kent and Mr. Wayne. Thanks. Right. Thank you. I suppose one of you is the new truant officer. What? Why, well, no. You see, I've we been were... expecting you. You see, I know Billy's been playing hooky a lot lately. Yes? Yes, but as I told his principal, Mr. Thompson, Billy is really a good boy. And he used to like school, but he's so crazy about gymnastics. He won the state high school championship last spring, you know. Yes, we know. And now his heart is set on being a circus acrobat. Oh? He's very good at it, too, you know. Why, you should see him climb ropes and do tricks on flying rings. Oh, yes, I... But then, when his school got so overcrowded, he could only go half days, and he wasn't allowed to practice in the gym. He 
Well, he just lost interest in school. Yes, I know. It's a shame that we don't have enough schools and playgrounds in Metropolis, but uh, about Billy's playing hooky, Mrs. Riggs, do you know that... Oh, I've talked to him, Mr. Kent. I've explained to him how important an education is. Oh, yes, but that's not what I meant. But as I say, his first and only interest is in getting to be a circus acrobat. Uh And so when he met this man who said he would help him and who had this wonderful big gymnasium that Billy could practice in and earn money, too, well, Billy's been going there day and night. He has, eh? Say, Billy's been working... Working in a gym at night? Oh, yes. He's worked practically every night for the last two weeks. Uh-oh. Uh, how's he been doing, Mrs. Ray? Oh, very well. He's been good to me, too. He bought me that new radio phonograph in the corner. Oh, yes, I noticed that. And a vacuum cleaner and two new dresses and a hat. Hmm. Seems to be making quite a lot of money for part-time work, don't you think? Oh, well, I forgot to tell you, Mr. Wayne, that this man who owns a gymnasium thinks Billy is bound to be a great success as a circus performer. So he's sort of acting as Billy's manager and agent. Agent, and he's been advancing him a little money as well as paying him a salary for working in his gymnasium. I see. Now tell me, Mrs. Riggs, yes. do you happen to know if Billy still has the medal he won at the state championships last spring? Why, why, it's strange you should ask me that, Mr. Kent. Really? What? Yes, you see, Billy was here just a little while ago about that very medal. He was? Yes, it, it seems he lost it. And lost it? Oh, boy. Yes, and he was quite upset about it. We looked all over, turned the house upside down, you might say, but we couldn't find well, it. Well, that proves it, Clark. Billy is the most... Easy, Bruce. What did you say, Mr. Wayne? Oh, uh, nothing, nothing important. Uh, tell me, Mrs. Riggs, did Billy go back to the gymnasium? Why, yes, I guess he did. Uh, where is it, do you know? Uh, it's downtown on 8th Avenue. I'm not quite sure just where, What's but, the name um... of the man who owns it? Oh, I don't know his name. Mm. But Billy calls him the Spider. Spider? Jupiter. That may be Spider Gans. You know him, Bruce? And how? And I know where his gym is, too. Prize fighters train there. Well, come on, let's run down and have a look around the place. Check. Wait, Mr. King. I'm uh, sorry, Mrs. Riggs, we've no time to waste. Thanks for your trouble, though. Bye. This is Spider Gans' gym, Clark. Oh. You see him around? Spider, I mean? No, I don't. I don't see any boy young enough to be Billy Riggs either, Bruce. Do you? No, but wait, I know that character in the black jersey. He's an ex-pug. He's a fight trainer now. Hey, Mickey. Mickey Hogan. Hi, Mr. Wayne. Be with you in a minute. Okay. Hey, how come you're so well acquainted around here? Well, Bruce Wayne is supposed to be a rich playboy, you know. And as such, I'm interested in prize fights and fighters. Oh, I see. Incidentally, I happen to know that Spider Gans is a bad apple. Really? Yes, he's been mixed up in plenty of fixed fights. But he's too clever to be caught. Hey, that makes all this add up even more. Yes, and... Hold it. Here comes Mickey. Hiya, Mr. Wayne. How you been? Ain't seen you at the fights in a long time. Oh, I've been pretty busy, Mickey. Uh, By the way, this is Clark Kent of the Daily Planet. Mickey Hogan. Glad to know you, Mickey. Same here. Uh, Look, Mickey, uh, do you happen to know where uh, Billy Riggs is? Riggs? What do you want with him? Oh, nothing. Just that my friend here heard a rumor that the boy's been working out with Spider, who's grooming him to be the next lightweight champ. So, as a good reporter... Kent wants to do a story on him. Ah, well, ain't nothing in that. The kid ain't no fighter. He isn't? Nah, he just works out of the gym apparatus. Oh, I see. Well, just the same, I'd like to do a story on him, so if you'll tell me where to find him, I'll be much obliged. Well, I don't know if I can tell you that. Why? Well, uh... Uh, Maybe this will make it easier, Mickey. Yeah, 20 bucks. Gee, thanks, Mr. Wayne. You're welcome. Think you can remember where Billy Riggs is now? Yeah, I guess so. Uh, well, Spider don't want us to talk about the kid on the count he's supposed to be in school, see? Oh, yeah, sure. Where is he, Mickey? I'm not sure right now. He was here just a little while ago looking for some metal or something he lost, see? Yes? The Spider called up and talked to him on the phone. He went out of here on the double, over to Spider's house, I think. Uh-oh. Where does Spider live, Mickey? On 12th Street. Number, uh, uh, let me see now. Uh, 221. 221 12th Street? Yeah, that's right. But, hey... For the love of Pete, don't tell Spider I told you. Don't worry, Mickey. No, don't worry. Come on, Bruce, let's go. Say, wait a minute, Bruce. Hmm? I think we'd better change to our Superman and Batman costumes. This alley will do fine for that purpose. Yeah, right, Kent. Boy, wait a minute. Huh? We weren't so smart, Clark. Why? What's the matter? Mickey decides to phone Spider and tell him we were asking for Billy Riggs. Don't you worry about that. We'll be there before Spider can hang up the phone. Because in case you've forgotten, we're traveling by Superman Express. Oh, that's right. Now, if only Robin is there. We'll know in two shakes. All right, I'm all set. How about you? I'm ready, willing, and able. Okay, hang on, then. Here we go. Up and away! (laughs) 
Leaping up from the dark alley with Batman, Superman streaks away to Spider Gan's apartment. Will they arrive in time to avert the fate arranged for Robin? We'll know more when we return for the tense climax of today's episode. So stand by. The other day, I heard a fellow and a girl arguing over which is the best-looking comic button in that new series Kellogg's Pep is putting out. She voted for Superman, said he's the most handsome. Uh, He held for Goofy because he's the funniest. Then, of course, I put in my two cents worth for that tough little guy, Spud. And you know what we decided? Well, we decided that there just isn't any best-looking comic button because they're all types, and they're all mighty nifty, too. Of course, we all agreed that it's a load of fun collecting these pep comic buttons and that every fellow or girl will want to collect all 18 in this new series. Favorites like Brenda Starr and Cindy and Spud and, and the Little Moose and, and Goofy and Beezy and Superman and all the rest. So keep working on your collection, gang. Ask Mom to get you some more Kellogg's pep. You know, that's the only way you can get these prizes. You can't buy them anywhere and you don't send in any money, not even a box stop. But there's a comic button inside every package of Pep. That's Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Pep, the golden toasted whole wheat flakes with a catchy sunshine flavor. Pep, the breakfast cereal that tastes so toasty and good these cold mornings to start off breakfast right. Remind Mom to get you some P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. As we continue now, Superman and Batman have just arrived at the door of Spider Gan's apartment. Batman is about to ring the bell. But Superman, whose X-ray vision has pierced the thick door, stops him with... No use, Batman. We're too late. Too late? What do you mean? The apartment has been cleaned out. Cleaned out? Yes. Spider, Billy Riggs, and Robin are gone. Oh, no. What will we do? Now, how can we ever find Robin? Feeling completely helpless, the two tall figures in costumes and capes stand outside Spider Gan's empty apartment... Now entirely at a loss as to how to find Batman's young companion. As we know, Spider and Billy Riggs, followed by Jonesy with the trussed-up Robin, left the apartment only a short time ago on an expedition which was to see the last exploit of the monkey burglar and which was to culminate in his finish and Robin. Now Superman and Batman seem to be stymied. But you can depend on their doing something and soon. What it is, you'll learn on Monday when we bring you one of our most exciting and suspenseful episodes. So be sure to tune in Monday, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at this same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, how'd you like to pick out your own favorite Kellogg's cereal every morning and open your own individual package yourself? Well, ask Mom to get Kellogg's Variety. That's the white, green, and red Kellogg package with ten one-serving packages of your favorite Kellogg cereals, like Kellogg's Corn Flakes and Rice Krispies and Pet. And you know they're good because you've always liked Kellogg cereals. Every day you get your choice, and you treat yourself to one of your favorite Kellogg cereals for breakfast. So ask Mom to get Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us on Monday for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, while Superman and Batman follow their last slim clue, the villainous spider prepares for Robin's immediate death. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. Say, here's something I noticed the other day. Among all those characters whose pictures are on the new series of comic buttons Kellogg's Pep is putting out, 
There's not one villain. Yes, sir. You can say something good about every single one of those 18 different funny paper friends. Like a Chief Brandon, for instance. He's a brave officer of the law. And Beezy from Harold Dean. He's always good for a laugh. And Superman himself, a real hero. What's more, you can say lots of good things about the way those pep comic buttons are done up. The colors are so bright and clear on that gleaming white background that, well, you're mighty proud to wear them pinned on your jacket or your dress or cap. And for downright exciting fun, you can't beat the thrill of, of getting a new button every time Mom opens a new package of Kellogg's Pep. That's the only way you can get them, you know. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop, and you can't buy them anywhere. But... You get a comic button every time you open a package of Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. That's the good whole wheat cereal with the catchy sunshine flavor. The tender, crisp, golden toasted flakes that keep you coming right back for more. So ask Mom for lots of P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now the adventures of Superman. Convinced that Robin is being held by a clever gang of thieves to blind the police to the real identity of the monkey burglar, the daring young acrobat who has been scaling tall apartment buildings and robbing their occupants, Superman and Batman have traced a single clue to a 16-year-old boy named Billy Riggs. Then, following the boy's trail, they tracked him to the home of Spider Gans, a parrot-faced man who runs a gymnasium and who is really the brains behind the monkey burglar's operations. But when they arrived at Spider's home, Hopeful of finding Robin there, they found the place empty. Discouraged and worried for the safety of his young companion, Batman turned to Kent and said, We're too late, Superman. I'm afraid now we'll never see Robin alive again. And Batman is nearly right. For at this moment, Robin, securely bound and gagged, lies on the floor in the back of a sedan driven by one of Spider's henchmen. While up ahead... Spider himself drives a dark coupe in which, seated beside him, is Billy Riggs, the real monkey burglar. Listen. Now, look, Billy. This job I got lined up for you tonight's a left-handed cinch. Yeah? Sure, there are only 14 floors and in the back of a house facing on an alley with no guards, no nothing. What makes that so easy? Well, you've done better than that. You even climbed up a wall to the 22nd floor, and this yeah, is... Yeah, I know, I know. Look what's eating you, kid. You ain't scared all of a sudden, are you? Sure I am. What? I'm always scared, Spider. Scared silly, because I don't like this kind of stuff. Now, look, Billy. I wasn't cut out to be a crook. I never wanted to do anything like this. You know that. Sure, sure, but All I ever wanted was to be a champion acrobat and get good enough to be a circus star. You said you were going to help me. I am, Billy. I am. Now, just give me some... Ah, that's what you said before each robbery. Just give me some time, you said. That's right. Just one more job and we'll have enough money for expenses to build a big act. And keep going until we get a booking with a big-time circus. But every time it's the same thing all over again. Now, listen, kid. Listen, listen, listen. All I've done is listen to you. And now look where I am. Behind the eight ball with all the cops in Metropolis looking for me. Then what am I? A crook. That's enough, kid. Oh, no, it isn't. I'm going to... I said that's enough. Now, you just shut up and listen to me for a minute. First of all, I want you to know that this caper we're pulling tonight is the biggest one yet, and definitely the last. Oh, yeah? Yeah. There's over a hundred thousand bucks worth of folded money and jewels in the apartment you're going to visit tonight, see? A hundred thousand? That's right. Now, that together with what we already got will put us on easy street for... Oop! Hey, almost missed that red light. Don't want to get stopped by no cops tonight, not even for only passing the light. Oh, look, Spider... Who's got so much valuable stuff in his apartment? One of them Indian rajahs here for the United Nations meeting. And brother, is he loaded. Oh, gee whiz. I don't want to rob a... Well, a guy like that. Why? What difference does it make? Well, a U.N. delegate. Well, he's a guy who's here to stop wars. Ah, cut the drool. Eh, lights change. No, Spider, I'm not going to do it. What's that? You heard me. I quit right now. Oh, no, you don't. Yes, I do. You can't make me cry. Can't I? No, you can't. Now, stop and let me out of here. Not so fast, kid. Let me out of here. You'll do just as I say or else. Or else what? I'll turn you over to the cops. You'll turn me over? You bet I will. I'll tell them I caught you climbing into my apartment. They'll slap you in the can so fast it'll make your head spin. Then they'll throw away the key for at least 20 years. How'd you like that, huh? They wouldn't believe you. I'll tell him you made me do it. I'll You'll tell be him... wasting your breath, sonny boy. No, no. I... Now, be a smart kid. Pull this one last job for us and everything will be Jake, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'll do it. Add up, boy. Now we'll have all the dough we need. You'll have your circus career and everything will be just hunky-dory. Batman, 
man, there's no point just standing here in front of Spider's apartment with long faces and the feeling that all is lost. I'm afraid that just about sums up the situation, Superman. Robin is... Well, he... Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's not like you to give up so easily. But what else can we do? This is the end of the trail and Robin's not here. Nonsense. The very fact that the boy's not here indicates that this is not the end of the trail. Then where does it go from here? Well, that's what we've got to find out, and fast. Yes, but how? Well, I don't know exactly. That's it. Maybe we can pick up a clue inside Spider's apartment that'll put us on the trail again. Oh, say, that's a possibility. But can we just break in there, I mean, without a warrant or anything? I know it's illegal, but there's a life at stake. Right, nine for doing it. Okay, stand back. Mr. Spider Gans, here we come. <laughs> Here we are, Billy. This is the alley behind the Rajah's apartment, Billy. Now, uh, you know what you're to do? Yeah, yeah. Good. But I'm still worried about losing my medal. It was my good luck piece, you know. Ah, forget it. Hey, who's that? Relax. It's Jonesy. Just pulled up in back of us. Oh. Okay, pile out. Bye. Yeah, Jonesy? Everything okay? Just dandy. Well. Now, look, Billy. The Rajah's apartment is the one on the far corner to your right on the 14th floor. Get up there as fast as you can. Scoop up everything you can find and beat it down there without losing any time, savvy? Yeah. When you're ready to come down, give us a whistle and we'll have the motors running and ready for a fast getaway. Okay. All set now, kid? Uh-huh. Right, get going. Hey, Jonesy. Yeah. Come here. Everything's going swell, huh, Spider? So far. How's that Robin kid? Tied up tighter in a drum. What do we do with him? I got it all figured out how we fix it so the cops find his body. His body? That's right. Now listen. This is what you're to do. Give him a sharp rap on the head and knock him out, see? Okay, but be quiet and get this. When you're sure he's unconscious, take him out of the car and carry him over to where the alley comes out on the street. You got that? Yeah. Then what? Take the ropes and gag off him and let him lay there. And when Billy comes down, we jump in the car, see? Yeah. And when the cops find Robin, he's a dead monkey burglar. Boy, what a hunk of brain you've got, Spider. Okay. I see Billy made the Rajah's place. Go on over and check on Robin now. Quiet and careful. figure of Jonesy fades into the dark shadows of the alley. Spider Gans lurks in the inky blackness beneath the Rajah's window, an evil smile of anticipation on his face. Will his nefarious scheme for the destruction of Batman's young companion Robin be successful? We'll know more in a moment when we rejoin Superman for the exciting climax of today's episode. So stand by! Say, you know what a certain young fellow told me the other day? Well, he said that he's been saving on his allowance lately because he has a swell hobby. Sure, it's collecting comic buttons in that new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pet. You see, you don't have to send in a single penny for these swell prizes, not even a box stop. And yet you can have loads of fun with them, like trading duplicates, for example. Now, here's how that works. Suppose you get two buttons with Tess Trueheart on them, but you don't have either Pat Patton or Superman in your collection. So you find out which one of your pals has an extra Pat Patton or a Superman to swap. And there you are. Then, of course, there's the thrill of wearing your collection of pep comic buttons on your jacket or your or your dress or cap. Boy, you certainly don't want to miss out on all that fun. So ask Mom to keep you supplied with plenty of Kellogg's Pep. Because that's the prize package that brings you these exciting comic buttons. Remember, you can't buy them anywhere, but there's a comic button inside every package of Kellogg's Pep you open. And say, there's a prize of good eating, too. Because Pep is the whole wheat flake cereal with a comeback for more flavor. Yes, sir, Kellogg's Pep is so loaded with that catchy sunshine flavor, you practically can't resist it. So, ask Mom for P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. As we rejoin them now, Superman and Batman, in a desperate effort to find a clue that may lead them to Robin, have gained entry to Spider's apartment and are now engaged in making a thorough search. Oh, just look at this place, Superman. It's cleaned out. Yes, I see. No clothes, no papers, nothing. Nothing of any value to us, at any rate. Perfect evidence the spider doesn't live here anymore. Hmm, nor ever intends to again. Ah, that dirty rat. If I could only get easy, my hands Batman, on it. Easy, Batman, easy does it. Okay. 
But you will admit we're licked now. Uh Uh-uh, not yet. What else can we do? Keep looking. For what? I don't know. Oh, that's great. Waste time here looking for heaven only knows what while somewhere poor Robin is... Scott. What's the matter? I think I've got it. Got what, man? For Pete's sake? The clue we've been looking for. You have? Look, we know pretty definitely now that Spider Gans is behind Billy Riggs, the youngster who was the real monkey burglar, right? Yes, yes, but... That would indicate that Spider fixed the apartments to be robbed, wouldn't it? Well, certainly it would. Okay. Now, look. Look at this newspaper clipping I found tucked under the seat of that easy chair. Well, say, isn't that a picture of the Rajah of Surat? Uh-huh. The guy was here as a United Nations delegate? Right. Well, what's significant about that? Well, don't you see, Batman? The man's wearing jewels worth a king's ransom. Oh, yes. Furthermore, he's immensely wealthy, and one of his reported eccentricities is to have on hand at all times tremendous amounts of cash in addition to jewels. Great Jupiter. You understand now what finding this in Spider's apartment means? Of course. He must have planned to have his monkey burglar rob the Rajah. Better than that. My hunch says he's pulling that job tonight. Then, for Pete's sake, let's go there and Ah, wait a minute. Not so fast. Clipping's torn and we have in his address. So we'll have to look in the Daily Planet files. Well, let's hurry. We may be too late. Keep your fingers crossed. Up with this window. Now, hang on. Here we go to the Daily Planet. Up and away! Leaping out and into the night sky, Superman carries Batman swiftly to the Daily Planet, where they expect to find the Rajah's address which they hope will lead them to Robin and the capture of the real monkey burglar. But Spider and his cohorts have been working fast and are, at this moment, getting set to make their getaway, including the destruction of Robin. Will Superman and Batman arrive on time to save what appears to be a hopelessly desperate situation? We'll know tomorrow when this exciting story comes to a smashing climax. So don't fail to be with us then. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, you can save mom a lot of work and give yourself a load of fun with Kellogg's Variety at Breakfast. Sure, open up one of those individual boxes of your favorite Kellogg cereal, pour on milk, and eat right out of the box. That's the Kell Bowl Pack. It saves washing dishes, and it's more fun than a picnic. You know, Kellogg's Variety is the white, green, and red Kellogg package with ten one-serving packages of favorites like Kellogg's Pep and, and Rice Krispies and Corn Flakes. So be sure that Mom gets Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Today, Superman is almost too late to save the life of Batman's young companion, Robin, who leads the furiously desperate spider a merry chase before this exciting story comes to a thrilling climax. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, it's no ordinary sort of happening, that big moment when Mom opens a new package of Kellogg's Pet. You want to be right there, because you're on edge to see which comic button is inside. Maybe it's a brand new one, a funny paper character that you don't have in your collection yet. Or maybe it's a duplicate, and that's even more fun because then you can trade with your pals. These pep comic buttons are so doggone smart looking, the colors are so clear and bright that, well, you're going to want to collect all 18 in that new series. That's right, 18 new and different comic strip characters. Brenda Starr, for instance, and Cindy and Spud and and the little moose, Beezy and Goofy, and Superman, of course. And say, did I remember to mention that these pep comic buttons are easy to get? Why, you don't even have to send in a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. All you do is to ask Mom to get you some Kellogg's Pep and look inside the package for your new comic button. And say, look out for some good eating fun at breakfast, too, when Pep heads the menu. Those whole wheat flakes are loaded with a catchy sunshine flavor that sure hits the spot. It's good for you, too. Sure, it gives you energy, vitamin B1, and your whole daily minimum need of sunshine vitamin D that helps build strong bones and teeth. Yes, sir. Mom's glad to get you P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. 
And now, the adventures of Superman. Anxious to find Robin, Batman's young companion, Superman and Batman followed a trail that led them to the home of Spider Gans, an underworld character who has misled a daring young acrobat into operating as the monkey burglar. However, our friends arrived to find the place empty. Unwilling to admit defeat, Superman searched every inch of the deserted apartment and was rewarded by the discovery of a torn newspaper clipping, a clue that indicated another bold robbery planned by Spider for his monkey burglar. The victim was to be the fabulously wealthy Raja of Serac, a U.N. delegate who had just taken an apartment in Metropolis. But the Raja's address had been torn off. As our story continues today, we find Superman and Batman at the Daily Planet, where, alone in the empty offices, they are going through a file of back issues. Listen. I don't know if already going all through Mondays and Tuesdays, papers. The story about the Raja's not in either of them. Keep looking. Here's another. Okay. But even if we do find the Raj's address, that doesn't necessarily mean we'll walk right into Spider and Robin, does it? My hunch says it does. Okay, but it's still just a hunch. Even if it works out, how do we know Spider hasn't already gotten rid of Robin? Oh, now look, Batman. Robin's not just an ordinary 14-year-old. Yes, I know. So but... I wouldn't worry too much. After all, you've trained him pretty well to take care of himself. Oh, that's right, but he's no match for a game. Granted. Why waste time arguing? This is the only clue we've got, so let's follow it through. Okay, Superman, I'll keep looking. Good. I'm still sure this lead is going to pay off. Superman's hunch is good But Batman's feeling of impending doom for Robin Is also well founded For at this moment Spider is seated in a small car Parked in the dark shadows of an alley Right under the windows of the Rajah's apartment Behind his car is another, a sedan In the back of which Robin lies on the floor Bound and gagged As we join him now Spider's crafty eyes are drawn up to the 14th floor In response to a whistle this is the signal that Billy Riggs, the talented young acrobat whom Spider has forced to operate as the monkey burglar, has done his work, is ready to descend with his loot. Turning swiftly to Jonesy, his burly henchman, Spider issues his low-voiced orders. Okay, Jonesy. Billy's coming down now. You know what you're to do? Sure, I wrap that robin kid over the noggin and knock him out. Right. Then I take the gag out of his face on time and carry him out the way the alley meets the street. Right. Then as soon as Billy gets in the car, we get going. And then the cops find what they think is a dead monkey burglar, huh? Yeah. No, no wait, Spider. What about Billy? I'll take care of him later. Personal. Now get going. Work fast and clean. Don't worry, Spider. This kind of a job is right up my alley. <laughs> Get easy, Robin, old kid. You ain't gonna be uncomfortable for long now. Now, relax like a good fella, and Papa will put you to sleep. As the hulking murder bent, Jonesy leans over his blackjack raised to strike at Robin's head. The seemingly helpless boy swiftly pulls his knees up to his chest. Then, uncoiling with the speed and power of a steel spring, Robin drives his rope feet into Jonesy's unprotected midriff. <laughs> Sniping with pain, Jonesy drops his head sharply and collides with a well-aimed pair of feet, driven by Robin's strong young legs. And taking the blow on the point of his chin, the thug drops unconscious and rolls off the running board onto the pavement. Then, alerted by the sound of the scuffle, Spider leaps out of his car and comes on the run to see what has happened. Jonesy! Jonesy, what? Holy smokes, the big lugs out like a light. Well, that settles it. I'll get my gun and put a slug into the little rat. <laughs> The spider, angered, rushes back to his car for a gun. A slim, costumed figure slips silently out of the dark shadows and quietly opens the door on the other side of the sedan in which Robin lies. Throwing a heavily laden sack on the rear seat, he slips a knife out of his pocket and slashes swiftly at the ropes that bind Batman's young companion. A moment later, Robin, freed, tears the gag from his mouth. Oh, thanks, pal, but who... Oh, never mind that now. Just Lucifer, listen. Lucifer, you're wearing my costume. Yeah, yeah, now listen. Sheepers, you're the monkey bird. All right. But if you don't stop gabbing, we'll be a couple of dead monkeys. Spider's sore. I know. I knocked out his boy, Jones. Uh-huh. For that, he's fixing to knock you off. I couldn't let him do that. Oh, thanks again. we got to work fast if we're going to stop him. So Hold it. Go. Here comes our playmate now. Jiggas, what do we do? Look, you lie low until you hear the body fall. Oh, wait, what are you going to... No time for explanations. Just be set to get this wagon rolling and fast. Be seeing you. <laughs> Moving with the silent speed and grace of a cat, Robin steps out of the car and vaulting to its roof. Crouches like a panther set for a kill. 
Then when the unsuspecting spider comes into range, he springs forward and down, landing on the man's shoulders, knocking him to the pavement where he lies momentarily stunned. Quickly recovering his equilibrium, Robin jumps up, yelling, Get her going, partner! Split second later, a car motor roars into life. And as it streams off to a running start, Robin leaps aboard, slamming the door shut behind him. But at the very moment that the now penitent monkey burglar drives Robin away to what they both mistakenly believe is freedom and safety, in the office of the Daily Planet, Batman calls excitedly to Superman. Superman, look. What? Here it is. The picture story of the Raj of Serac. Well, where's his metropolis apartment, does it say? Yes, sir. let's see. It's the Crescent Towers Apartments. Okay. Now, here's where we find Spider and rescue Robin from him. If we're not too late. Let's hope we're not. Come on, get set. We're going out this open window. I'm ready. Let's go. Right. Up and away! <laughs> We are on the roof of the Crescent Towers, Batman. Good. Let's get down to the Raj's apartment. Uh-oh. What's the matter, Superman? Afraid we're too late again. What? How do you know? I can see by the excitement in the Raj's apartment that the monkey burglar has come and gone. Oh, no, no. Look, maybe he and Spider are still somewhere nearby with Robin. Uh-uh. At least not within my range of vision. Oh, well, what do we do now? There's only one thing left to do. Scour the city from the air. Hang on. Here we go again. Up and away! <laughs> Is Spider still behind us, Robin? Yeah, Billy. We can't seem to shake him. This skunk. Didn't take him long to come to and jump into his car, did it? Not long enough. I should have hit him harder. Well, hang on, pal. I'm going to try to lose him in some of these side streets. I'm set. The worst that can happen is we pile up. And anything's better than falling into Spider's hands again. You said it, chum. Here we go. <laughs> Driving with a recklessness born of desperation, Billy Riggs, ex-monkey burglar, tears around corners on two wheels, waving in and out of narrow streets, barely averting accidents many times in an effort to shake the enraged Spider. But Spider, mad with a thirst for vengeance, will not be shaken. Finally, the car bearing the two boys screams around a corner and comes to a shrieking four-wheel stop. Robin Law Creepers, a dead-end street. Yeah, and here's Spider right behind us. That spells dead end for us, Billy. I do mean dead end. Trapped, Robin and the boy who had been forced to impersonate him can only sit and face what seems to be certain death as guns in hand. Spider and his battered henchman Jonesy approach them. What will happen? We'll know in a moment when we return for the exciting climax of this story. So stand by! You know, gang, one of the best things about collecting comic buttons in that new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pet is that everybody can share in the fun. Sure, all your pals are doing it too, so that you have lots of fellows and girls to trade duplicates with. You see, you don't have to spend any of your allowance to get pet comic buttons. You don't even have to send in a box stop. And yet, you get collect true live pictures of your favorite comic strip characters, 18 of them in all, like Cindy and Judy and Corky and Superman. Boy, what a thrill it is to wear your collection pinned right on your jacket or your dress or cap for everybody to see how smart looking they are and how nifty they look too. But remember, there's only one way you can get these exclusive prizes. You can't even buy them anywhere. All you do is to ask mom to get you some Kellogg's Pep and a big button and say you're going to like Pep for another reason too, because it tastes so keen. Why, Kellogg's Pep is so full up with catchy, golden toasted flavor, your appetite's going to sit right up and take notice every single morning. Those whole wheat flakes sure do warm up your appetite on a cold and frosty morning. So ask Mom for P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. As we rejoin them now, Robin and Billy Riggs are facing guns held in the hands of Jonesy and the snarling spider. But you thought you could get away from Spider, huh? Now look, Spider. Shut up. Okay, Jonesy, we fire together. You take Billy and I'll take this fresh punk Robin. One, two, three, and out. Hey. Oh, 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 Good, Batman. Wow, Spider never knew what hit him. Are you all right? Sure, Batman. Boy, where'd you fall from, heaven? Well, not exactly. I'd say it was just in time to save you from a trip to heaven, Robin. You too, Billy. You Thanks bet. to you, Superman. Incidentally, how did you two get together? And why was Spider about to rub out his monkey burglar? And how come whoa, did you... Whoa, whoa, easy, Batman. I'd suggest you gather up our unconscious friends and drive them over to see Inspector Henderson. The boys can answer all your questions there. Wait a minute, Superman. Can't we do something about Billy? What do you mean? I mean, like, going easy on him. That's or... up to the courts, Robin. Right, Batman. 
Okay, fellas, go on and wind up the case of the monkey burglar. I've got a hunch a reporter named Clark Kent will be in a hurry to make the early morning edition of this yarn. And something tells me he'll be waiting for you in the inspector's office. So long now. Up and away! <laughs> A short time later, Superman and his guise of reporter Clark Kent is in the office of Inspector Henderson, where, together with Batman, he listens and makes notes for a Daily Planet scoop story on the monkey burglar, as Robin and Billy Riggs give evidence against Spider and Jonesy. But if Superman thinks his work is done for the day, he is very much mistaken. For at this same time, this very night, a small group of men are gathered around a table in the study of a palatial metropolis residence. And these men, known among themselves as Knights of the White Carnation, a brewing a menace more potent than any Superman has yet encountered. Tomorrow, gang, we meet the Knights of the White Carnation and learn how their dark plans are uncoiling like some deadly snake ready to strike at you and me. So don't fail to be with us then. Be sure to tune in tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, what's your favorite Kellogg's cereal for breakfast? Kellogg's Rice Krispies? Corn Flakes? Pep? Well, you can take your pick of ten individual boxes of different Kellogg's cereals every morning if you'll get Mom to set out Kellogg's Variety. That's the white, green, and red Kellogg package with a grand lineup of Kellogg favorites. Some are flaked and some popped and some shredded, made from corn, wheat, or rice. Yes, sir, breakfast is a picnic all year round when Kellogg's variety is on the table. So ask Mom for Kellogg's variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Superman is unaware that while Metropolis sleeps, an ugly menace to America is being prepared to strike against the freedom and well-being of all Americans. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. Say, have you noticed how many different kinds of characters there are in that new series of comic buttons Kellogg's Pep is putting out? There are blondes, you know, like Cindy, and uh, redheads like Brenda Starr, and kids like Judy and Corky, and heroes like Superman. Yes, sir, among those 18 different funny paper characters, you'll find all sorts of pictures. That's one reason that these pet comic buttons look so nifty when you wear them pinned on your jacket or your dresser cap. They really show up. As for doggone good fun, well, nothing beats the thrill of getting a new button whenever Mom opens a new package of pet. And trading duplicates with your pals, too. And are these buttons easy to get? You don't have to send in a single penny, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. All you do is to ask Mom to get you some Kellogg's Pep and look inside the package for your prize. And say, while you're about it, get a load of how terrific these toasty whole wheat flakes taste at breakfast on a cold morning. Mmm, mmm, crisp and tender and, and fresh as can be. And loaded with a catchy sunshine flavor that keeps you digging right in for more. You know, Pep is called the Sunshine Cereal. Gives you good old sunshine vitamin D. So ask Mom to get you some P-E-P. The Sunshine Cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. As our story opens today, our scene is the handsome townhouse of Vincent Kirby, member of an old and aristocratic metropolis family. In the rich, oak-paneled library of the house, six men are seated around a table. In each of their lapels, a white carnation stands out against the dark, conservative material of their business suits. A number of identical newspaper clippings, obviously a reproduction of a photograph of a basketball team, are scattered on the table. 
fingering one of the clippings, Vincent Kirby clears his throat. <clears throat> I call your attention, gentlemen, to this photograph of the Metropolis High School varsity basketball team, which appeared in the Daily Planet February the 24th. Now you'll note the caption above the picture reads, Undefeated Metropolis 5 Grooming for State Championship. The caption below the picture states, The Metropolis High School basketball team undefeated in 16 games. Winner of the All-City Crown is now pointing for the state championship test at the Armory tomorrow night. The quintet Coach Reed will place on the court includes, left to right, Casimir Pulaski, Michael Kelly, Tony Rizzuti, Phil Kaplan, and Jack Wilson. <clears throat> now, gentlemen, I call your attention to the fact that of the five basketball players named, only one, Jack Wilson, is an American. The rest are foreigners. Doesn't it seem rather odd to you that in a great American city like Metropolis, four out of the five members of our championship basketball team should be foreigners? Isn't it a little shocking to discover that names like Pulaski, Kelly, Rizzuti, and Kaplan overbalance a good American name like Wilson, four to one? I think a very good point. Yes, gentlemen, it is shocking. Not only shocking, but disgraceful. Not only disgraceful, but dangerous. Now, as you know, I organized the Knights of the White Carnation, of which you are all members, to fight for the preservation of Americanism and to defend ourselves against the poisonous propaganda of foreigners whose only desire is to overthrow our democratic government. And I call upon you now to join with me to eliminate such things as this newspaper clipping indicates. Foreigners taking the places of decent American boys. Just a moment, Mr. Kirby. Huh? Yes, can't you? Don't you think you're going a little off the handle, Mr. Kirby? I beg your pardon? What I'd like to say is this. Has it occurred to you that perhaps the reason Pulaski, Kelly, Rizzuti, and Kaplan are on the Metropolis varsity team is that they're better basketball players than my son or yours? I assure you, Canfield, American boys can play basketball fully as well as foreigners. And furthermore, whether they can or not, I, for one, refuse to stand by and permit our boys, our American boys, to suffer by comparison with foreigners. If necessary, we'll get rid of the foreigners, not only off the team, but out of the school. Now, you got anything to say to that, Canfield? Yes, I have. To begin with, I can assure you the four boys named in this newspaper clipping are not foreigners. What would you call them? Americans. Really? Does Pulaski sound like an American name to you? Casimir Pulaski? I suppose you'll tell me his ancestors came over on the Mayflower. <laughs> no, but one of his ancestors, the Polish patriot, General Pulaski, was in this country before your people ever dreamed of coming here. He fought in the American Revolution. And if you study the Metropolis Street Guide, you'll find that Pulaski Street was named after him. And another thing, wouldn't you be proud to have your oldest son enrolled at West Point? Yes, but I don't see what that has to do with the question at hand, Canfield. It has this much to do with it. Another famous Polish patriot, a man named Kosciuszko, designed and built the original West Point Military Academy. I don't believe it. You're at liberty to consult either a history book or an encyclopedia on that. Topic. I'm not interested in consulting anything. My only purpose I'm is to see that... I'm beginning to understand what your purpose is, Mr. Kirby. When I consented to join your Knights of the White Carnation, I was under the impression it was going to be a group of intelligent metropolis businessmen dedicated to the preservation of the American Constitution and the Bill of Rights. A group that would actively combat the influences of communism, fascism, and all other isms created to destroy freedom of speech, action, and religion. Well, that's exactly what it is. I'm afraid not. I see it now as a group of narrow, bigoted men attempting to create intolerance, prejudice, and hatred among different races and creeds. And I see you, Mr. Kirby, as an individual fully as dangerous as Hitler or Mussolini. How dare you say a thing like that? How dare you? Unfortunately, it's true, Mr. Kirby. You could easily be another Hitler. This meeting could just as easily have taken place in pre-war Germany. I demand an immediate apology for those those slanderous remarks, Mr. Canfield. You'll get no apology, Kirby. But what you will get is this white carnation, which I'm ashamed to say I wore even for a moment. You picked a white flower as your symbol, because white indicates purity. But all the surface purity in the world can't cover the rotten odor of hatred. And I don't like the smell of it. Can't feel you've said enough to make it clear that you don't belong You're here. You're right, I don't. I'm getting out, Kirby, as fast as I can. But before I go, let me warn you. 
Not only am I withdrawing from this hate-mongering group you call the Knights of the White Carnation, but I'm going to fight you tooth and nail and expose you on the front page of every decent newspaper in America. Good night. Gentlemen, gentlemen, please. Now, there's nothing to become alarmed about. Canfield's a fool. Our mistake was inviting him to join us in the first place. Yes, but now he can ruin everything we plan to do. You heard what he said. He threatened to expose us to the press. You seem to forget that I own a controlling interest in the Metropolis Daily Sentinel. Yes, but you don't own the Daily Planet or the Blade or the Ledger. Canfield is a friend of Perry White, editor of the Planet. And the Planet is the most powerful newspaper in the state. What difference does that make? Are we afraid of anything? Well, no, but I feel uh, that we... However, I agree that Canfield might make things difficult for us. We should have tried to pacify him. You can't pacify a rattlesnake, Williams. But you can make him harmless by pulling his fangs. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Pull Mr. Canfield's fangs. How? Just leave it to me. What is Vincent Kirby planning to do? How can he stop Charles Canfield from exposing the Knights of the White Carnation? We'll know in a moment when we return for the exciting climax of today's episode. So keep listening. You know, gang, I don't believe I know a fellow or girl who doesn't get a kick out of following Superman's adventures in the funny papers and listening to him right on the radio. So it's mighty swell that Kellogg's Pep included him in this new series of comic buttons you're all collecting. There he is, big and powerful and handsome, his bright red cape flying in the wind. And all the other pictures of your favorite comic strip characters are, are just as true to life. From Pat Patton and, and Tess Trueheart right on through Chief Brandon and Vitamin Flintheart and Judy and Corky. There were 18 new and different comic strip characters in all, you know. And you'll want to have the fun of collecting them all. So hop to it, gang. Remind Mom to keep you stocked up with plenty of Kellogg's Pet. You know, that's the prize package where you get your comic buttons. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy these comic buttons anywhere. But you get one in every package of Pep you open. That's Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Pep, the golden toasted whole wheat flakes with that catchy sunshine flavor. Pep, the dish that tastes just as good as it is good for you. So get Kellogg's Pep, gang. That's P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. As we continue now, still seething at the attitude of men he had always considered decent, honorable citizens, Canfield has returned to his home. And parking his car in the garage adjoining the house, walks down the driveway. As he nears the street, a man with his coat collar up around his neck and the snap brim of a felt hat shielding his face steps out of the darkness. Got a match, mister? Sorry, never carry them. Don't smoke. You're Charles Canfield, ain't you? Why, yes. Civic worker was last night the victim of an armed bandit who stabbed and killed him on the sidewalk outside his residence at 965 Lake Drive. Uh, Can't drop whatever you're doing. What? Uh, get down to police headquarters. Now, look, Chief, I just uh, started... Don't, no, don't argue with me. Do as I say. What about this monkey burglar story? Uh, I just Turn began. your notes over to Lois. Turn them over. Uh, let her finish it. Okay, well, what's all the rush? I just learned that Charles Canfield was murdered last night. Yes, I know. It came in on the teletype early this morning. Another of those mugging killings. Yeah, that's what you think. What do you mean that's what I think? According to Inspector Henderson's statement... That's exactly why I want you to get down to headquarters. Tell Henderson we want the truth. The truth about what? Now, look. Canfield called me at home last night. It was pretty close to midnight. He said he was phoning from a booth in a drugstore. Yes? He made a date to have lunch with me today. I don't get the connection. He said he had a story that would blow Metropolis wide open. Great Scott, you... Canfield was murdered, Kent. And I think he was murdered to keep him quiet. Yes, Mr. White, Charles Canfield was murdered. Not only to keep him quiet 
but because he dared defend the truly American principle of fair play and equality against a group of men preaching the doctrine of hate. The Knights of the White Carnation have struck their first vicious blow, and the petals of their flowers are touched with blood. What will happen now? Can Clark Kent, even a Superman, track them down before they strike again? This is only the beginning of one of Superman's most exciting adventures. So be sure to join with him each weekday at this same time as the Man of Steel meets the poisonous challenge of the Knights of the White Carnation. Listen tomorrow, same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, there's almost no end to the fun you can have with Kellogg's variety. That's the white, green, and red Kellogg package with ten individual packages of your favorite Kellogg cereals like Corn Flakes and Rice Krispies and Pep. Every morning you can pick out your own private box of cereal. Makes breakfast a picnic. And sister will get a kick out of the cutout dolls on the bottom of the tray. Cut them out and dress them up and play all sorts of games with them. So tell mom to be sure to get Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P, 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 Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, while Superman makes an effort to get behind the murder of Charles Canfield, the men who call themselves the Knights of the White Carnation strike another blow at democracy. Hello there, gang. This is your pal, Dan McCullough. You know, when there are both boys and girls in a family, there's pretty sure to be a lot of good-natured rivalry. And that's just exactly what's happening with the collections of that new series of comic buttons from packages of Kellogg's Pep. Brothers and sisters are racing like anything to see who can collect the most different funny paper characters. Yes, there's a lot of excitement every time Mom opens a new package of Pep. And there's a great business of trading duplicates, too. And, of course, you're always mighty proud to pin a new Pep comic button with the others on your jacket or your dresser cap. Now, you'll want to collect all 18 of these new series buttons. Vitamin Flint Heart and, and Spud and Superman and all the rest. And if you don't want to be left behind, you better ask Mom to get you some more Kellogg's Pep. That's how easy it is to get these prizes. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. But you get a comic button in every package of Kellogg's Pep you open. And you get something else, too. A doggone delicious dish for breakfast. Pep is called the Sunshine Cereal. Those whole wheat flakes are brim full of catchy sunshine flavor. The kind of sunny flavor that's so good on a cold morning. So ask Mom for lots of P-E-P. The Sunshine Cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. At a secret meeting of six prominent metropolis businessmen who call themselves the Knights of the White Carnation, Vincent Kirby, their leader, draws attention to a photograph of the Metropolis High School basketball team published in the Daily Planet. Venomously, Kirby pointed out that four of the boys on the team were obviously of foreign descent and, as such, should not be permitted to play. Angered by this hate-mongering attitude, Charles Canfield, a wealthy industrialist, called Kirby un-American. He then resigned from the group and frankly announced he would do everything in his power to expose the Knights of the White Carnation to the public. Alarmed, Kirby made a phone call, and early the following morning, Clark Kent and Perry White learned that Charles Canfield had been found dead with a knife in his back. As we continue now, we find Kent, who, as we know, is Superman, and cub reporter Jimmy Olsen at police headquarters, where they are trying to get a statement from Inspector Henderson. Listen. Hello, 
Gentlemen. I've already issued a statement. I've said that Canfield was apparently killed by a stick-up man, a mugger, as he was about to enter his home on Lake Drive. That's all we know at present. I'm sure it isn't all you know. Yeah? What makes you so sure? Because even I know more than that. Yes, so do I. Say, what are you trying to do? Trick me into talking? Oh. Inspector, how could you ever dream of such oh, a thing? we never do a thing like that, Inspector. Now, you keep your two cents out of this half pint. Half pint? Leaping lizards, Now, look kid. here, Kent. I want to... Believe me, Inspector, this is all on the level. We have some valuable information, and we're ready to make a bargain. You talk, and we'll talk. Huh? What, uh... What kind of information? Information that may lead to the arrest of the man who killed Charles Canfield. I don't believe it. Meaning to imply that I'm not telling the truth? That I'm a liar? Is that it? Now, now, take it easy, Ken. Well, take it just... easy. All right, all right. We ought to know better than to try to keep anything from you. Come on up to the crime detection lab, and I'll show you what we've got. Here's the story the way we shape it up. When Canfield's body was found on the sidewalk in front of his house, nothing was missing from his pockets but his wallet. He had a gold fountain pen and a pencil set, a diamond stick pin and this watch, a watch worth at least a thousand dollars, all of which might add up to one thing. It wasn't just an ordinary holdup. Right. Whoever did it wanted it to look like a holdup and grabbed his wallet, but forgot the rest of the stuff. Or else he got frightened away before he had a chance. You may have something there, Jim. We thought of that, but it doesn't gel because the body was discovered by the milkman at 5.30 in the morning. Now, there are only two houses on that street. Evidently, nobody walked by after Canfield was night. So the chances of the guy being scared off are slim. Well, then the net of it is you believe it was a planned murder that was supposed to look like a stick-up. Now, now, wait a minute. I didn't say anything of the sort. And don't you go printing that or I'll have you thrown into jail for, for intimidating an officer of the law. Who am I intimidating? Me! Trying to put words into my mouth. Now, all I said relax, was... Relax, that... Inspector, relax. Strangely enough, I agree with you. Huh? What about? I agree with you that Canfield was murdered. I never said I know that. you didn't, but the information I have matches up with that theory. Yeah, it fits like a piece of a jigsaw puzzle. Huh? Well, I talked. Now it's your turn. Well, here it is. Last night about midnight, Charles Canfield called the editor of the planet, Perry White, from a drugstore phone booth. He made an appointment for lunch with him today and told him he had a story that would blow Metropolis wide open. Is this on the level, Kent? Strictly on the level. Around midnight, huh? Uh-huh. Hmm. The medical examiner figured he was killed between midnight and 1 a.m.? That was after he made the phone call. That clinches it. Kent, I want to thank you. Hey, how about me? Well, you too, Half Pint. Oh, Inspector, please stop calling me that. <laughs> half Pint Olson, the demon reporter. Hey, you too? Now, I can't fool around. I've got to go to work. And, Kent, hmm? you won't blast this on the front page until we get our teeth into it, will you? Of course not. Uh, I will, unless you cut out that half pint stuff. Uh, you know what I'll do to you. What? Uh, now, look. <laughs> All joking aside, this is a serious matter. Canfield, as far as we know, didn't have an enemy in the world. He was well-liked, respected, and one of the leading businessmen of the city. He was chairman of the community chest, president of the Chamber of Commerce on the hospital board and the board of charities, and one of the directors of the Metropolis Trust Company. A wealthy, solid citizen who never had a word of scandal attached to either himself or his family. In fact, he never even got a ticket for parking. And yet, and yet someone hated him enough to murder him in cold blood. It doesn't make sense. Maybe we're wrong. Maybe it was still just a stick-up man who didn't have brains enough to take the watch and the rest of the stuff. I doubt it, Jim. No clues on the body, Inspector? No indications to where Canfield had been? Uh, nothing we could find. Outside of personal effects, all he had in his pockets was this uh, newspaper clipping. Oh, let me see. Hey, it looks like a clip from the planet. Oh, it is. It's my story. What? Your story? Yeah, I write the high school sports news, you know. Oh. This is the story I did yesterday on the Metropolis High basketball team. See, here's a picture of the team. Mm -hmm. They play their first round for the state championship tonight at the Armory. They're a cinch to win. Now, why would Canfield be carrying a clipping about a high school basketball team? Yeah, you've got me. But I don't think it's important one way or the other. I'm not so sure about that. Jim. Yeah? Say the Metropolis team's playing at the Armory tonight? Mm-hmm, against Cedar Falls. Uh -huh. And they'll win in a walk. With Pulaski and Kaplan and Rosetta... Did you get tickets for the game? Well, what do I need tickets for? I sit in the press box. Oh. Well, is, is it all right for me to sit there? Oh, sure, it's all right. You really want to go? Uh-huh. Hey, what's on your mind, Kent? I'll tell you after I see the game, Inspector. Let's go, Jim. Well, here are our seats, Mr. 
And pretty good, huh? Swell, Jim. Say, quite a turnout here tonight. Yeah, full house. You figure Metropolis can't lose, is that it? Oh, not a chance. Lasky and Kaplan are crackerjack forwards. Jack Wilson's the best center in the state. Uh-huh. And when it comes to guards, Michael Kelly and Tony Rizzuti are tops. Oh, uh, here come one of the teams. And oh, that's Cedar Falls. Hey, they look big and fast, Jim. Oh, sure, but we'll take them. You know, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. <laughs> Hey, look at them snap that ball around. Not bad at all. Oh, will you see our boys? They'll be out in a minute. Watch Pulaski drop him in from midcourt. He's terrific. Say, uh, by the way... Yeah? How come you wanted to see this game tonight? I meant to ask you. I like basketball. Oh, go on. That's not the reason. You got some kind of an idea. Something you don't want to tell me, huh? Not at all, Jim. It's just that... Uh... Well, here comes the Metropolis team. Oh, yeah. That's Jack Wilson. He's captain and center, running in front with the ball. Looks like a good man. Yeah. And the next one... Hey, that's funny. What's the matter? That's not our team. Not your team? No. Except for Jack Wilson, none of our first-team players are on the floor. Is that so? Yeah. Those guys on the floor are all subs. Maybe the coach decided to start the second team. No. He gave me the starting lineup this afternoon. There's something wrong, Mr. Kent. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure something's gone wrong. Worried and puzzled, Jimmy Olsen and the huge crowd in the armory roar out in protest as only one member of the Metropolis High first team takes the court for the championship game. What does this mean? We'll find out in a moment when we return for the startling climax of today's episode. So keep listening. You know, gang, it's a good idea, now and then, to check over your collection of comic buttons in that new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pet and see how you're coming along, because you won't want to miss out on a single one. No, sir, you'll want Tess Trueheart and Goofy and Beezy and uh, Superman and all the rest of those 18 new and different comic buttons. What's more, you wouldn't want to miss the excitement of trading duplicates with your pals. And you're mighty proud to wear your collection pinned on your jacket or your dress or your cap because they're so doggone smart-looking, bright-colored and gleaming as anything. And you know, the best part is, these pep comic buttons are so easy to get. You don't have to send in a single penny, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. All you do is to make sure that Mom keeps you supplied with Kellogg's Pep. Because there's a comic button inside every package of Pep you open. And is there a load of good eating in a package of Kellogg's Pep? Pep looks so doggone golden and inviting that, well, you can hardly wait to start right in. And your first spoonful of these sunny whole wheat flakes tastes so good, you settle right down for a real session, believe me. So ask Mom to get P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. Clark Kent, Jimmy Olsen, and a capacity crowd in the armory have been startled to see the Metropolis High basketball team take the floor for a championship game with a quintet consisting of four substitutes and one regular. Puzzled, Jim turns to Kent and says... The coach told me just this afternoon that he's starting the first team. Now this setup with four subs has me worried. That seems strange, Jim. Considering that this is the opening game for the state championship. Yeah. That's why I'm sure something's wrong. Yeah? We won't have a chance against Cedar Falls without our regulars. Must be some explanation, Jim. Oh, wait a minute. Here it comes. See, there's a man walking out on the floor with a public address microphone. See? Where? Over there. Oh, oh, yeah. That's Coach Reed. Oh? Quiet. He teaches science, uh, too. Quiet, everybody. I had him when I went to Metropolis. May I have your attention, please? Ladies and gentlemen, I know you're all wondering why four members of Metropolis High's team are not on the floor tonight. You said it. I have been asked to announce that the reason for the absence from the floor of Tony Rizzuti, Casimir Pulaski, Bill Kaplan, and Michael Kelly is that they have been suspended from the team. What? Suspended? they are suspected of having dealt with professional gambling. What? Uh-oh, there's your answer, Jim. Answer nothing. It's a lie. A dirty, rotten lie. <laughs> and enraged, Jimmy screams out his answer to the announcement made by the coach of the Metropolis team. An answer echoed in the pounding feet and shouted protests of the huge crowd. Strangely enough, the four boys who have been suspended were the same four boys, Vincent Kirby, the cold, ruthless leader of the Knights of the White Carnation labeled foreigners. 
Is there some connection between the suspension and Kirby's group of hate mongers? We'll know more tomorrow, gang, when Clark Kent as Superman takes a hand. So don't miss it. Be sure to listen. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Hey, what do you have, gang? Kellogg's Corn Flakes, Rice Krispies, or Pep? Or one of your other favorite Kellogg cereals? Well, you can take your pick every morning at breakfast when Mom sets out Kellogg's Variety. That's the white, green, and red package with ten individual packages, each one a serving just for you. One day you'll choose a shredded cereal, next day one that's pot, and next day a flake cereal made from corn, wheat, or rice. Everyone's a treat because it's a favorite Kellogg cereal. Makes breakfast a picnic of fun. So remind Mom to get you Kellogg's Variety. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, Clark Kent is sure he is on the right track of a tie-in between a bigoted plot and a cruel murder, little realizing that the chief villain has marked him as the next victim. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, uh, somebody told me the other day that collecting comic buttons in that new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pep is just like an exciting treasure hunt. Sure, because you never know just which button you're going to find in the package. Maybe a brand new one that you don't have yet, like the uh, Little Moose or, or Spud or Superman himself. Or maybe it'll be a duplicate, and that's even more fun because then you can swap with one of your friends. And boy, do you feel like strutting around when you wear your collection of pep comic buttons pinned on your jacket or your dress or cap. They are true-to-life pictures, you know, done up in bright red, blue, and yellow, and black on a gleaming white background. Mighty snappy looking, so keep going, gang. Remind Mom to get you plenty of Kellogg's pep and look for your comic button inside every package you open. That's right. You don't have to send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy these comic buttons anywhere, but you get a prize in every package of pep. A prize in good eating, too, because these good whole wheat flakes are loaded with catchy sunshine flavor. A comeback for more flavor that teases you to eat lots. And that makes Mom glad because pep is good for you, too. So ask her to get P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. Now the adventures of Superman. The Knights of the White Carnation a secret organization of metropolis businessmen led by Vincent Kirby has embarked on a vicious campaign of racial and religious hatred. As his first move, Kirby announced an attempt to break up the metropolis high school basketball team because four of its star players are of foreign ancestry. Then, when Charles Canfield, a prominent industrialist, objected to prejudice of that kind and threatened to expose Kirby and his friends, Canfield was mysteriously stabbed and killed. Yesterday, as you recall, Clark Kent and Jimmy Olsen attended the opening game of the state championship tourney at the Armory, where Metropolis High was scheduled to play Cedar Falls. But to everyone's amazement, when the Metropolis team took the court, four of its star players were missing. And the coach made an announcement to the effect that they had been suspended for having dealt with professional gamblers. As we continue now, the huge crowd is on its feet, stamping in rhythm on the board seats, shouting angry demands for the return of the four suspended players. Jimmy Olsen, clutching at Clark Kent's arm, screams above the din to make himself heard. It's a lie, Mr. Kent. It's a dirty, rotten lie. Take it easy, Jim. But I know those fellows. I know every one of them. They wouldn't have anything to do with gamblers if it killed them. Attention, Coach is trying to quiet them down. That chance he's got. Oh, this crowd is really angry. I don't blame them. Metropolis hasn't had a championship basketball team in ten years. Now that we've got one, look what happens. I'm going down to find out about this. Now, wait a minute, Jim. Down where? Down in the court. The 
want to talk to the coach. There's something wrong. Oh, wait, Jim. You'll never get through that crowd. I'll, I'll go with you. I don't like the looks of this. Angry crowds can get out of hand, and before you know it, people are hurt. Could be. I've seen it happen. You know where you're going? Yeah, we've got to go under the grandstand to get to the court. I think it's this way. Jim, wait. What's the matter? Something's wrong. What? Great Scott. What is it, Mr. Get Kent? to a phone quickly, Jim. Call the police emergency squad. But I... Don't ask questions. Hurry, it's Jim. Okay, but... Hurry, it's a matter of life and death. I had to get rid of him somehow. One of the steel girders supporting the grandstands beginning to bend and crack from that stamping. Off with these clothes. This is a job for Superman. Leaping up into the air, Clark Kent, now miraculously transformed into the broad-shouldered figure of Superman, straddles the weakened steel girder supporting the grandstand, embraces the center of it and hands the grip the gold medal as though it were held in the jaws of a vise. Straining every muscle in his powerful body, the veins in his neck standing out like whip cords. He literally supports the entire grandstand as it sways under the weight of thousands of screaming, stamping human beings, none of whom are aware of the danger they are in. This girder snaps, they're doomed. I've got to hold it until the police arrive and quiet them down. I've got to. Suddenly off in the distance, Superman hears the eerie wail of police car sirens drawing closer and closer. In a matter of moments, the doors of the huge armory are thrown open, and squads of emergency police swarm in. Soon the mob is quieted. An announcement is made that the game has been called off, and under police direction, the crowd files out. Not until then does Superman release the weakened girder and drop to the concrete floor beneath the grandstand. Five minutes later, now somewhat recovered from the terrific strain, he hears Jimmy Olsen's voice calling to him. Mr. Kent! Mr. Kent! Uh-oh. I have to get back into Kent's clothes in a hurry. Mr. Kent, where are you? Over here, Jim. Under the grandstand. Oh, I was wondering whether you'd still be here. Oh, I've been here all the time. Say, so, so what happened to you? What? Right. Oh, golly, you look like someone put you through a ringer. Do I? Well, I guess I was worried for a while. That steel girder was pretty weak. What steel girder? That one up there supporting the grandstand. That's why I told you to get the police to, to clear the crowd out. We've been lizards. We better report it. I will. Did you find the coach? No, but I talked with Jack Wilson. He's the team captain. Oh? The only one of the regulars left on the team. Uh -huh. He said he has something to tell me. He's getting dressed now. We'll meet him outside and take him back to the office. Okay. There's a story behind all this, Mr. Kent, and I've got a hunch it's a good one. Come on. story now. Well, there isn't much to tell, Jim. We were all sitting around the dressing room waiting for our chance to warm up on the court when Coach Reed came in. He looked kind of white and scared. He pointed at Tony and Cass and Kaplan and Mike Kelly, and he said, you four aren't playing tonight. You can get dressed and go home. No explanation, Jack? No, sir. And when Tony asked how come, he said he couldn't discuss it, to get dressed and beat it. Oh, those poor guys must have gone nuts. Oh, they couldn't say anything. They were like they were struck dumb. So I said something. I said I wasn't going to play either. Good boy. Then the coach took me aside and said I had to play for the sake of the team. He told me he got orders from the principal to throw the fellows off the team. From Mr. Raiden? Yeah. You mean Mr. Raiden told the coach to bounce those four off the team? No, it wasn't really Mr. Raiden. He got orders from somebody else. A man named Mortimer. Well, who's he? I know, Jim. Who is he? Henry Mortimer, chairman of the school board. Well, what's he got to do with the basketball team? That's what I want to know, Jim. And I'm going to find out tonight. Of the night, Mr. Mortimer, but as chairman of the school board, you should be able to answer a few questions and uh, perhaps issue a statement. I have nothing to say at this time, Mr. Kent. If you wish to interview me, I suggest you call my office in the morning and arrange an appointment with my secretary. Oh, so that's how it is. Yes, Mr. Kent, that's how it is. Now, if you'll excuse Just me. Just a minute. You were the one who issued the order suspending Rizzuti, Kaplan, Pulaski, and Kelly from the Metropolis High School basketball team, right? I informed the principal of the school that the young men in question were to be temporarily forbidden to play. Why? Because of evidence that they were in collusion with professional gamblers. Where's the evidence? I want to see it. I'm sorry, Mr. Kent, but you can't see it. Because it doesn't exist? How dare you? If you don't leave at once, I'll call the police. Oh, I'll leave. I'll leave. But before I do, let me tell you something. 
You were directly responsible for making a public statement to the effect that four high school students were involved with gamblers. You as much as branded them as crooks. You informed the thousands of people who were at the armory tonight and the millions more who will read about it in the papers that those four boys are dishonest and not to be trusted. I did no such thing. There are laws against slander, Mr. Mortimer, particularly criminal slander. People have gone to jail for what you've done, but that's not the worst of it. You may have heard that last night a man named Charles Canfield was stabbed and killed on the street outside his house. I have a faint suspicion that there's a connection between his death and the dismissal of the four basketball players. I don't know what you're talking about. Perhaps not, but let me warn you. I think you're getting yourself mixed up in something dangerous. You may be the next one to end up with a knife in your back. Pointing an accusing finger at the chairman of the Metropolis School Board, Clark Kent watches the nervous, prissy little man turn ghastly white. We'll learn what happens in a moment, so keep listening. You know, one of the exciting things about collecting those swell comic buttons in the new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pet is that you already know the characters. Sure, you've been following their doings in the funny papers for ages. So uh, when you get a button with Chief Brandon's picture on it, for example, well, it's uh, sort of like meeting up with an old friend. And the same goes for Brenda Starr and, and Superman and all the rest of the 18 different funny paper characters. And that's one reason why you won't want to miss out on a single one. And another reason is the fun of trading duplicates and wearing these smart-looking pep comic buttons pinned on your jacket or your dress or your cap. So you better get busy. Make sure that Mom gets you some more Kellogg's Pep over the weekend. Because that's the only way you can get these comic buttons. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. They're Pep's exclusive prizes. And Pep's the cereal to make breakfast something terrific, too. Those tender whole wheat flakes are crisp and, and fresh and full up with catchy sunshine flavor. Mighty good and mighty good for you. Just the thing to warm up your appetite on a frosty morning. That's P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. Frightened by Clark Kent, who warned him that he might end up with a knife in his back, Henry Mortimer, chairman of the Metropolis School Board, lost no time in contacting Vincent Kirby, the man who instructed him to suspend the four high school basketball players. As we continue now, it is almost midnight. Kirby has just ushered Mortimer into the study of his sumptuous townhouse. He closes the door behind him. All right, now. What's so important that made you think it necessary to get me out of bed in the middle of the night? A man named Kent came to see me. He's a newspaper reporter. The Daily Planet? Yes. He, he said I, I was guilty of criminal slander in accusing those poor boys of dealing with gamblers. And you believed him? That wasn't all. He said I, that I was getting mixed up in something dangerous. And he warned me that I might end up with a knife in my back like... Like Charles Canfield. What? What's that? He well, said... never mind. I heard you. Mr. Kirby, you know I didn't want to do it. You know I didn't agree with you when you said those boys were foreigners. But you forced me to do it. You said I'd lose my appointment if I didn't. And, and now... now you're getting cold feet, is that it? I don't want to get mixed up in anything. You don't want to die with a knife in your back. Please don't say things like that. I should have known better than to get mixed up with a chicken heart like you. Please, Mr. Stop Kirby. Stop whining. You're perfectly safe. Nothing's going to happen to you. Tomorrow you can make another announcement. Put the four dirty little foreigners back in the team. And now on, I'll handle this myself in my own way. And in case Mr. Clark Kent calls on you again, you might tell him that he won't look very pretty with a knife in his back either. With his steel gray eyes slitted and his mouth drawn in a hard, thin line, Vincent Kirby, cold-blooded leader of the Knights of the White Carnation, creators of hatred and intolerance takes matters into his own hands. Kirby has flung a challenge at Clark Kent, who, so far as he knows, is a mild-mannered reporter. But unknowingly, his challenge has been made to Superman. And that means he's in for plenty of action. Action is the keynote of this exciting story from now on, gang. So don't miss a single minute of it. Whatever you do, don't forget to be with us again on Monday when the Man of Steel begins his relentless campaign to expose the vicious knights of the White Carnation. Be sure to tune in again Monday. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pet. For excitement, the adventures of Superman.
Superman is the copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at this same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Up in the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's Superman! Kellogg's Pep! P, 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 Pep! Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman! Today, Clark Kent learns that although four boys on the Metropolis High basketball team have been cleared of all bribery charges, they are now threatened by a new danger. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. Say, uh, you don't want to miss out on any fun, do you? Well, you better join up with the other kids who are collecting that exciting new series of comic buttons from packages of Kellogg's Pet. Because you don't want to be out in the cold when the fellows and girls compare notes and tell how many different pep comic buttons they've collected so far and swap their duplicates. And say you wouldn't want to miss wearing those nifty-looking buttons on your jacket or your dress or cap because they really are nifty, bright-colored and flashy, with the pictures of your funny paper favorite standing out clear and sharp as anything. Old friends like uh, Tess Trueheart and, and Beasy and Superman himself. Now, there were 18 new and different buttons in this new series, so you better hop to it. Ask Mom to get you plenty of Kellogg's Pep. That's the only way you can get these Pep comic buttons, you know. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop, and you can't buy them anywhere. But there's a prize in every package of Kellogg's Pep. And say, there's a load of good eating, too. A super delicious dish for breakfast, because these golden toasted whole wheat flakes are full of catchy sunshine flavor. Crisp and fresh as can be. So ask Mom for P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. Calling themselves the Knights of the White Carnation, a group of race haters determined to break up the Metropolis High School basketball team because of their intolerance for four of the star players who are of foreign ancestry. Their first act was to arrange for the murder of a prominent businessman who had threatened to expose them. Then Vincent Kirby, leader of the hate group, persuaded the chairman of the school board, a man who owed his position to Kirby's influence, to bar the four Metropolis stars on a charge that they were dealing with professional gamblers. Clark Kent, who, as we know, is Superman, threw the weight of the Daily Planet behind his demand that Mr. Mortimer, the school board chairman, either submit evidence against the boys or withdraw his charges. Frightened, Mortimer went to Kirby, who told him to reinstate the boys, saying they would be taken care of in another way. As we continue late the following afternoon, we find cub reporter Jimmy Olsen in Kent's office at the Daily Planet. Listen. Any word from Mortimer yet, Mr. Kent? No, not yet, Jim. She whiz the game with Cedar Falls goes on tonight. If Rizzuti, Kaplan, Pulaski, and Kelly can't play, we'll get skunk. I know, but... That'll be awful. This is the opening game for the state championship. Look, Jim, there's something far more important than a game involved. It's that those four boys are accused of conspiring to throw a game. That's a criminal offense in this state. Well, Cheapest? You mean they may go to jail? If they're proved guilty, they will. But they're not guilty. I know them. They're swell guys. I know, Jim. You heard what Coach Reed said, too. Yes, but And that Mr. Is... Raiden, the principal of Metropolis High, he doesn't believe it either. Neither do I, I but I that... tell you, somebody's trying to frame him, that's what. That may very well be, Jim. But Mr. Mortimer, chairman of the school board, said he has evidence that the boys were in the pay of gamblers. Oh, yeah? Well, where is his evidence? Well, Why doesn't he come up with Jim, it? take it easy. Mr. Mortimer promised to complete his investigation today. Either produce the evidence or withdraw the charges against the boys by six o'clock. So you just... But it's almost six now. Ten minutes off. All right, now relax. 
Mortimer will issue a statement one way or the other. You can depend on that. Well, I can't see what's holding him up. The game starts at 8.30, and without Tony and Cass... Hey, and... Jim, get a load of this. Huh? What, Beanie? This flash just came over the city wires. Here, read it for yourself. What's up, Beanie? Oh, hello, Mr. Kent. I didn't notice you. <laughs> That's all right. It's all excitement what about. Leaping lizards. Ain't that something, Jim? Listen to this, Mr. Kent. What? Henry Mortimer, chairman of the school board, announced today that following a complete investigation of bribery charges against four Metropolis High School basketball stars... He has found the evidence inconclusive and is immediately reinstating the four athletes. Hey, that's wonderful, Jim. Oh, ain't it, yeah. though? Now we can't lose tonight. You said it. Boy, am I happy. Good news, all right. Hey, you better get that flash to the city desk right away, Beanie. I'm on my way. See you, Mr. Kent. You bet. Well, there you are, Jim. Yeah. But I'll bet Mortimer wouldn't have worked so fast if you hadn't put the heat on him, Mr. Kent. Oh, I don't know. But I do think he should have made a more careful investigation before he suspended the boys, though. Oh, he sure should have. Wait. Well, just a moment, Jim. That's my phone. Hello? Jim Olson? Yes, he's right here. Just a moment, please. For me? Uh-huh. Somebody who sounds excited. Oh. Hello, Jim Olson. Who? Oh, yes, Mr. Reed. Listen, we just heard about Mr. Mortimer clearing... What? You have? Oh, I see. Oh, sure I can. You bet. I'll be right over, and I'll bring Mr. Ken along. Right, right away. So long. It's all excitement, Jim. Now, that was Mr. Reed. You know, Metropolis High Coach. Yes? He said something just happened. What? A terrific story. He wants me to come right over to his house and to bring you along. Well, so... What are we waiting for? Let's go. <laughs> your face all cut and bruised, Mr. Reed. You look like you were in a fight. Well, I I was, Jim. You were? Well, who with? Why didn't you... Hold it, Jim. Hold it. Mr. Reed asked us out here to listen to a story, not to ask questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I've got a story, all right, Mr. Kent. A terrific story. Go right ahead, spill it. We're all ears. Yeah, shoot. All right. Earlier this evening, I was just sitting down to supper when the bell rang. I went to the door and a man was standing there, a... A tall, wiry fellow with a sallow face and sharp, glittering little eyes. As soon as I opened the door, he stepped in. You're Dick Reed, coach of the Metropolis High basketball team, ain't you? Yes, who are you? Just call me Joe. All right, Joe. What are you going to see me about? About the game tonight. Oh, what about it? Let's, uh, let's close the door. That's better. Now, I just heard those four kids, the ones who were suspended last night, got a clean bill of health. Yes, that's right. What about it? Just this. I don't want those boys to play tonight. What's that? You heard me. Now, it's worth a thousand bucks to me to keep those boys from playing. Now, look here, Joe, or whatever your name is. Wait a minute. Just wait a minute. Don't tell me you can't use a thousand bucks because I know you get peanuts for teaching high school and coach a basketball. I'll admit the teaching profession isn't very well paid, but I don't see what... Reed, don't be a chump. With Pulaski, Kaplan, Rizzuti, and Kelly in the lineup tonight, the suckers figure Metropolis will take Cedar Falls like falling off a log, see? What suckers? The betters, the betters. They're breaking their necks for a chance to bet three to one on Metropolis. Oh. And I'm taking those bets, see? So you can make yourself a thousand bucks by making sure Cedar Falls wins. So that's it, huh? Yeah. Simple, ain't it? All you gotta do to keep those four kids out of the game is to say you're not satisfied the reputations are all clean or they're too jittery after what just happened to play good. Get it? Yes. Yes, I get it, all right. Well, what do you say? Beat it. Now, wait a minute. You heard me. The door's open, so get out before I throw you out. Look, don't be stupid. Get out, I've said, before I lose my temper. I happen to like athletics, but I don't like crooked gamblers who try to dirty it up. Okay, stupid. If you don't want to play ball with me, I'll have to really get tough, and that'll be just... You can't bluff me, you cheap crook. Get out. You're asking for this, boy. Now I'll... Then he whipped out a knife and went after me with it. Gee whiz, a knife? Yes. Fortunately, I managed to beat him off, and he ran down the steps and disappeared in the dark. But did you report this to the police? Not yet, Mr. Kent. You've got to do so at once. You're in danger. Oh, I don't think that fellow will tackle me again. Uh, you can't be sure, Mr. Reed. What's more, I think those four players, Rizzuti, Pulaski, Kelly, and Kaplan, are in danger, too. I think Mr. Kent's right. Say, I didn't think of that. Look, uh, where are the boys now? Why, why they're at home. I get... No. 
Now, wait a minute. It's 7 o'clock. They'll be on their way to the high school. We're to meet there at 7.15 and drive to the armory. Uh-oh. Jim, get Inspector Henderson on the phone. Okay, Mr. Kent. Ask him to send a police escort to Metropolis High. We'll escort Mr. Reed to the school, and the police can take over from there. Hurry! As Jim goes out to contact the police... Coach Reed's late opponent, Joe, is walking up a dark street near Metropolis High School. The husky man wearing a shabby overcoat and cap. That dirty Reed, he almost broke my arm. He was tough, Joe, huh? Yeah, but I'll fix him. There's more than one way to skin a cat. What do you mean? If he lets those four kids play tonight, Metropolis will win. Oh, no, they won't, Fargo. Sure they will. Those kids are good. It won't matter how good they are. Wait a minute. Hold it. What you stopping for? This is where we stand and wait. See that apartment building across the street? Yeah, yeah. What about it? Just keep your eyes open and do what I tell you. And Metropolis will lose tonight sure as shoot. His small eyes glittering in his sallow face. The wiry Joe crouches in the dark shadows with his companion Fargo. How does he plan to make certain that Metropolis High will lose tonight? We'll be back in a moment to find out. So stand by. Say, here's something about that new series of comic buttons that now come in packages of Kellogg's Pet that's sure to make a hit with you. You'll have these Pet comic buttons a long, long time because they're enameled on real sturdy metal. And those bright colors are long-lasting, too. Why, you'll want to keep right on wearing those smart-looking buttons pinned on your jacket or your dress or cap so that everybody can see how many you've collected. And as for doggone good fun, why, you can't beat the excitement of trading duplicates. And you know, each character is straight from the funny papers. There's Pat Patton and uh, Tess Trueheart, Chief Brandon, Vitamin Flintheart, and Judy and Corky, and Superman, of course. Eighteen new and different buttons and all. So you better get busy, gang. Remind Mom to keep you supplied with plenty of Kellogg's Pep. Because these are the prize packages where you get your comic buttons. You can't buy them anywhere, and you don't send in any money, not even a box top. But whenever you open a package of Kellogg's Pep, there's your comic button. And say, think of all that super delicious eating Pep gives you for breakfast. Those good whole wheat flakes are packed with wonderful, catchy sunshine flavor. So ask Mom for P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. In the shadows of a dark street across from an apartment building, the man called Joe suddenly stiffens and presses the arm of his companion, Fargo. As two boys emerge from the building and start across the street. Okay, Fargo, get ready. Here they come. You you sure they're the right ones, Joe? Yeah, that's Cass Pulaski and Tony Rizzuti. You know what to do now? Yeah. Just leave it to me. Okay, Fargo, let him have it! Leaping on the two young high school athletes, Joe and Fargo strike out at them savagely. And unprepared for the cowardly attack, Cass Pulaski and Tony Rizzuti stagger, then fall to the pavement. Is it only a grim stroke of fate that Cass Pulaski and Tony Rizzuti... Two of the boys marked for danger by the intolerant knights of the White Carnation have been struck down on the eve of a big game by vicious thugs. They'll know more tomorrow, gang. So don't miss the next exciting episode when Superman and his friends encounter new and startling developments in their campaign to expose the hate-mongering knights of the White Carnation. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P-Pep. 
Bob's Pep, the Sunshine Cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, Clark Kent's suspicions are confirmed as Metropolis High's basketball team faces further obstacles put in their way by the vicious, hate-mongering Knights of the White Carnation. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, I saw some of the gangs start off to the movies the other day, and I noticed that the whole crowd had to wait while one of the fellas went back to the house for his cap that he'd forgotten. Yes, sir, he felt kind of out of things without his collection of comic buttons from packages of Kellogg's Pet. He wanted to wear that cap with the comic buttons pinned on it so everybody could see how many he'd collected. And believe me, he has a right to be proud of them. They're so doggone slicking, the colors stand out so bright and sharp, every single picture is a real eye-catcher. A little moose and, and vitamin flint heart and Superman and all the rest. Yes, sir, gang, you'll want to collect every single one of these 18 buttons in that new series. And you can, too. Sure, they're that easy to get. You just ask Mom to get the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep, and look for your prize inside every package you open. That's right. You don't have to send in any money, not even a box stop, and you can't buy them anywhere. But there's one as a prize in every package of Pep. And say, Pep's a prize when it comes to good eating at breakfast, too. Crisp and fresh and golden whole wheat flakes Full up with catchy sunshine flavor. Good for you, too. Mom knows that. So remind her to get plenty of P.E.P., the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. Because four players on the Metropolis High School basketball team are of foreign ancestry, Vincent Kirby, wealthy leader of a hate-mongering group calling themselves the Knights of the White Carnation, made an attempt to discredit the boys and have them removed from the team. This was foiled by Clark Kent, who, as we know, is Superman. But Kirby, who had not hesitated to commit murder, was far from through. That evening, following an unsuccessful attempt to bribe Paul Reed, coach of the Metropolis High team, to throw a state championship game, two men ambushed Casimir Pulaski and Tony Rizzuti, two of the young players, and beat them unmercifully. As we continue now... The men have disappeared in the darkness, and Cass and Tony are painfully picking themselves up from the pavement. Listen. Tony. Brother. Tony, are you okay? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so, Cass. How about you? I don't know. Oh, my stomach feels like, like it's not the bulldozer. Yeah, I know what you mean. Where did those guys go, anyway? Yeah, they ran away. Cowards. Well, let's get going, Cass. Oh, boy. I, I can hardly walk. Yeah, me too. What are those dirty rats beat us up for anyway? Search me. Maybe they were muggers. Nah, I had two dollars in my pocket and it's still here. So they weren't muggers. I guess not. And then why all, all this... You've got me. Come on, we'll find a policeman. No, oh, no, wait, Cass. We can't tell the police about this, not yet, anyhow. Huh? Why not? Well, you know. They, they might hold us down at headquarters asking questions and stuff. We've got a game to play tonight, remember? Say, that's right. I forgot all about the game. Gee, I... I don't know if I can play, though. My stomach's still... You've got to play, Cass. It's the opening game for the state championship. Yeah, I know, Tony, but... depending on us, Cass. Phil and Mickey and Jack and Coach Reed. Well, the whole school's depending on us to help win this game and the championship. Gee, that's right. But I'll bet the coach won't let us play when he hears we were beat up. Oh, don't let's tell him about it till after the game. Here, come here. I'll, I'll brush the dirt off your clothes, then you can do the same for me. Okay. How will you explain being all bruised up? Oh, you don't look bruised. I don't? No. There. Just clean up your face a little and nobody will know a thing. Say, you don't look beat up either, Tony. I guess it's because the guy just hit me in the stomach. Yeah, that's where he got me too, mostly. Oh, boy, it hurts when I bend. Yeah, me too. It will probably be all right by the game time. How do I look? Okay. How about me? All right. Come on, let's get going. Game's set to start pretty soon. <laughs> The officials are walking out on the floor now. That means the game's going to start. Uh-huh. Got my fingers crossed for Metropolis, Jim. I'll relax. I tell you, we'll take Cedar Falls by at least 20 points. You hope. Well, you'll see. Here we go. 
That's Jack Wilson getting ready to jump at center. He's our captain. Yeah, I know. And Tony Rizzuti and Phil Kaplan at the forward. Oh, they're the forwards? There they go. Come on, team. boy, Jack. boy, Phil. Shoot it, Tony. That's it. Uh-oh. Tony missed the shot. Yeah, too bad. Come on. Cover your man, Tony. Pass, get down the floor with that guy. Ball scored first. Well, don't feel too bad about it. I don't look at that score back and then some. Sure. Atta boy, Jack. Say, did you see him steal that ball and look at the Phil? Uh huh, nice play. Phil set it up for Tony. Go on, Tony, shoot. Oh. Tough luck. Tony missed the shot. Gee, that's two he missed in a row. What's the matter with him? Well, the Cedar Falls guard had him well covered. But Tony's so fast, he always makes a monkey out of his guard. Cover and cash. Don't let him shoot. From him for a setup shot. Yeah, four to nothing. Favor Cedar Falls. Come on, gang, let's roll up some score. Boy, look at that fast break, Mr. Kent. Uh-huh. Boy, look at that Kaplan boy take the ball off the floor. Look at him go. Yeah, he's terrific. And how? Now watch. He's gonna feed it to Tony for the shot. There it goes. Oh. Tony got trapped by his guard. Holy smokes, what is the matter with him tonight? Seems tired, Jim. Could he be tired? The game just started. I know, but he's still. Stop that shot, Pulaski. Stop it. Uh-oh. She whiz. That Cedar Falls forward left Pulaski tied to the post. What's the matter with him? I don't know. He seems rather tired, too. Next to nothing favors Cedar Falls. I don't... Atta boy, Phil. Isn't that a swell shot, Mr. Kent? Certainly was. Now, honey. Six to two now. Watch his come back. Oh, jeepers. Tony slipped and dropped the ball. And there goes Cedar Falls with it. And another score. Our team isn't clicking, Jim. Oh, you said it. Pulaski, a plenty sour tonight. Come on, 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 come on,
Kent and Jimmy Olsen have just burst into the Metropolis High School dressing room in the armory, where Jimmy's eyes widen in surprise as he sees Sergeant Healy of Inspector Henderson's staff and two uniformed police officers surrounding two pale-faced boys, Casimir Pulaski and Tony Rizzuti. Oh, Sergeant Healy, what's going on here? Oh, hello, Kent. We're taking Pulaski and Rizzuti down to see the D.A. What? The D.A.? Yep. Come on, boys. Get into your street clothes fast. Well, look, Healy, what's the charge? Yeah, why you... Sorry, gents. Can't talk to the press yet. Come on, you two. Get a move on. Yeah, but wait, Sergeant. What do you think? We'll see about that after you've had a talk with the D.A. Well, now, wait, Sergeant. Can't we talk to... Keep out of this, Kent. Hey, Cass. Tony, what's this all about? I says we threw tonight's game, Jim. Threw tonight's game? That's right. You know us, Jim. You you know we wouldn't do a thing like that. Of course you wouldn't. Now, listen, Sergeant. Take your breath, Jim. But... But you... Look, Sergeant. I... I've got orders to take these two boys in, and nobody's going to talk me out of well, it. Well, nobody's trying. Well, ask here, Rudy, you're going to get dressed until we take you in the way you are. Oh, but wait, wait, wait. Just Sergeant. one thing, Sergeant, please. Specifically, just what is the charge against these boys? You can tell me that. All right, Kent. These two kids are charged with taking money from a gambler to lay down in tonight's game against Cedar Falls. Now, wait a minute. That's a lie. Yeah, it's a dirty we lie. We don't even know any gamblers. Of course not. It's... Just a moment, Jim. Now, look here, Sergeant. There must be some mistake. Oh, no, there isn't, Kent. We've got these boys dead to rights. Oh, Lonnie, maybe they didn't play very well. Wait a minute, Jim, wait. These two boys, together with Kelly and Kaplan, were accused of being in collusion with gamblers yesterday, Sergeant. But the chairman of the school board, after an investigation, gave them a clean bill of health. That's right. Oh, yeah? Well, get this, Kent. The school board chairman couldn't get all the dope, but the district attorney did. What do you mean? He had us pick up a professional gambler named Jip Monroe this evening. Monroe sang like a canary. He sang? What did he say? Monroe confessed to paying these two kids, Pulaski and Rizzuti, $50 apiece to throw to the Why, that, that's the truth. That's a dirty lie. Try to make the DA believe that. Come on, get your overcoats on now and we'll get going. You boys are under arrest. What does this mean? A professional gambler, said Sergeant Healy, confessed to bribing Casimir Pulaski and Tony Rizzuti to throw tonight's game. We know this is not true. And we also know that Vincent Kirby, leader of the hate-mongering Knights of the White Carnation, swore to get Casimir and Tony and the two other stars of the Metropolis High team because they are of foreign ancestry. Is this another frame-up engineered by the Knights of the White Carnation? And if so, what can Superman, who is assured of the boy's innocence, do about it? There are more surprises and excitement in store for you in tomorrow's thrilling episode as Superman battles through a web of mystery and hate. So be sure to tune in tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Snap, crackle, pop. What's that, gang? Why, it's the one and only Snap, Crackle, and Pop cereal, Kellogg's Rice Krispies. Sure, you've seen those famous little elves and cartoons and on the Rice Krispies package. And you know how they dish out those golden bubbles of oven-popped rice. So crisp, they snap, crackle, and pop when you pour on milk. That's their song of crispiness. Yes, sir, Kellogg's Rice Krispies are fun to listen to and fun to eat. So ask Mom to get you the one and only Snap, Crackle, and Pop cereal, Kellogg's Rice Krispies. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, Superman fights to clear the names of two boys who have been enmeshed in a web of intolerance, spun by the hate-mongering Knights of the White Carnation. (laughs) 
Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. Say, uh, wouldn't you be excited if uh, sometime when you're reading the funny papers, Chief Brandon or uh, the Little Moose or Superman would speak to you? <laughs> of course, that can't really happen, but you almost feel as if it could when you look over your collection of comic buttons in that new series Kellogg's Pep is putting out. Because these pictures of your favorite comic strip characters are really true to life. Every single one of these 18 different buttons is straight from the funny papers. And it's printed up in bright comic strip colors, too, on white enameled metal buttons that look mighty keen on your jacket or your dresser cap. So how's about reminding Mom to get you some more of that sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep? Because that's the only way you can get these nifty comic buttons. You don't have to send in a single penny, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. But you get a comic button every time you open a new package of Pep. And say, that's really a thrill. And you get another thrill when you spoon into your morning dish of pet, believe me, because that catchy golden toasted sunshine flavor is something super delicious. Something to make you want to eat lots. So hop to it, gang. Ask Mom to get you plenty of P-E-P. The sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. Sensational events have taken place in the last 48 hours since a group of hate mongers called the Knights of the White Carnation resolved to remove four players from the Metropolis High School basketball team because the boys are of foreign ancestry. First, a prominent citizen named Charles Canfield, who was about to expose the intolerant Knights, was murdered. Then, two of the high school basketball players, Casimir Pulaski and Tony Rizzuti, were ambushed before a championship game and savagely beaten. Then, following the game, which Metropolis lost, Pulaski and Rizzuti were arrested charged with accepting $50 each to throw the game. As we continue now, Clark Kent, who as we know is Superman, is in the office of District Attorney Frank Agnew. Listen. I tell you, Mr. Agnew, you're making a mistake. It's ridiculous even to assume that two boys like Pulaski and Rizzuti would throw the game. Really? Were you in the army tonight, Mr. Kent? I mean to see the game. Yes, I was. Well, I was there too. It was obvious to everyone that Pulaski and Rizzuti were trying to lose. Oh, nothing of the sort. I had a talk with the boys after their arrest. They told me they'd been ambushed in front of their house this evening by two men and beaten up. Did you know that? I know. Well, it happened a short while before the game, and that's why they played so badly. Well, if that's true, why didn't they report it? Because they were afraid they wouldn't be allowed to play. They knew the team couldn't win without them. Very noble. Oh, now, look, Mr. Ragnall, just because you're the district attorney... I'm sorry if I seem to disbelieve, Kent, but I saw those boys in uniform and there wasn't a mark on them. Why, no, there wasn't. They said they'd been beaten only in the solar plexus. Oh, come now, Kent. Don't tell me you buy that. Certainly I do. I'm surprised. A smart reporter like you falling for such a trumped-up alibi? Well, I don't think it's trumped up. I believe them. Look, Kent, things like this have happened before. When somebody waves $50 under their noses, kids forget about their reputations and their duty to their school and teammates and grab at the money. I don't believe that. Well, I can prove it. Get your hat and come along. Where? To the city jail. I've got a little surprise there for you. Let's go. There we are, Kent. I'd like you to meet Jip Monroe. Jip Monroe? You mean the gambler? That's the one. Now, listen, Jeff. What's on your mind, P.A.? I understand you were taken upstairs a few minutes ago to meet two boys. Ah, yeah, that's right. Did you recognize them? Sure. They're Pulaski and Rizzuti, two kids from Metropolis High. Are they the boys you bribed to throw tonight's basketball game? Yeah, they're the ones. You hear that, Kent? Yes, but... Uh, you want to tell me what you paid them? Why not? I give them 50 bucks apiece. I can't believe it. That's all for now, Jeff. Let's go, Clark. We'll grab a cab back to City Hall. Well, satisfied now, Kent? No. No, I'm not, Mr. Agnew. But you heard what you Yes, but I think Jip Monroe was lying. Ridiculous. Why would he deliberately ask for a jail sentence by confessing a crime he didn't commit? That's what bothers me. I mean, why he did confess so readily. Because he knows he's trapped. Oh. Mr. Mortimer, chairman of the school board, what? had some evidence which led us to Monroe, you see. Mr. Mortimer, huh? Uh-huh. You see, I've been working a long time to drive the crooked gamblers out of athletics. When I got the goods on Chip, I made him realize he'd be smart to cooperate with me. Look, Mr. Agnew, for my money, this whole mess is a frame-up. A frame-up? Yes, I'm convinced those high school boys are being framed. Oh, now, look. And I intend Kent. to find out why. Uh, let me out here, please, driver. Oh, wait, Kent. Let me drop you at your house. Thanks, but I'm not going home. Where are you going? What's all this about a frame-up? Can't you tell me more? Not now. Give it all to you on a silver platter when it's cooked and ready. Good night. Let's see, where can I change? 
Ah, this alley is nice and dark. And, yes, it's deserted. Now, <clears throat> off for these clothes. So, the district attorney got his tip to Jip Monroe for Mr. Mortimer, huh? Well, Mortimer struck me as a pretty sly character if I ever saw one. So I think I'd better check into that. But first, a quick trip as Superman to see Perry White. There we are, all set. Up and away! Ken, what brings you all the way out here at this hour? I'll tell you in a minute, Chief. Mind if I come in and close the door? No, no, of course not. Come on in. Thanks. Now, what is it? Get into your hat and overcoat. We're going back to town. For what for? It's almost one o'clock in the morning. I know, but you've got to bail a couple of boys out of jail. Their families don't have the money. You mean those two basketball players? That's right, Cass Pulaski and Tony Rizzuti. You see, they've been arrested I for... know, I know. Jim Olson's been beating my ear about it on the phone. He thinks they were framed. I'm pretty sure they're being framed. And what's more, I think I know by whom. Yeah? Who? By the same person or persons who murdered Charles Canfield. Canfield? Mm-hmm. Well, what do you mean? Remember that newspaper clipping from our paper that was found in Canfield's pocket? Well, yes, of course. The story about the Metropolis High School basketball team. That's but what right. Is that... It included a picture of the team. And if you remember on Canfield's clipping, four of the players' names were underlined in red ink. Yes, I remember that. Wait but a what's minute. That... Wait, wait, listen. Yesterday, Mr. Mortimer, chairman of the school board, accused all four of those boys of being in collusion with gamblers. When I made him admit he didn't have the evidence to back his charges up, he reinstated the boys. I know, I know, but, but I still... Tonight, don't... after two of the boys are beaten up so that they can't play well... Mortimer directs the DA's office to an unknown gambler who all too readily breaks down and confesses that he bribed the boys to throw the game. Hey, that does sound a little fishy, doesn't it? It sounds plenty fishy, Chief. I think Canfield's story had something to do with what's been happening to the Metropolis High School basketball team and that he was killed to prevent him from telling it to oh, you. Oh, wait a minute, Kent. Wait a minute. Isn't that jumping to conclusions? Well, maybe, but I believe I'm right. And if I am... I'm afraid this business won't stop with the murder of Canfield and the cowardly framing of innocent boys. Mm. Meanwhile, you don't want those two boys to spend the night in jail, do you, Chief? No, no, of course not. I'll grab your hat and coat. We'll run downtown to bail Tony and Cass out. Then I'm going to get to the bottom of this. A few minutes later, as Clark Kent and Perry White start back to Metropolis to bail Tony Rizzuti and Casimir Pulaski out of jail, six well-dressed men are gathered around a table in the library of Vincent Kirby's imposing stone townhouse facing the park. In the lapel of each man's coat is a large, white, dewy, fresh carnation. And before each man is a galley proof of the first page of a newspaper. As Vincent Kirby clears his throat, the men look up. <coughs> Hello, Knights of the White Carnation. I've called this special meeting to report the progress we have made thus far in our campaign to clear Metropolis athletics of foreigners. Now, tonight, I show each of you a galley proof of page one of tomorrow's Daily Blade, which, as you know, I control. <laughs> Now, as you see, the headline and main story have to do with the arrest of two Metropolis high school boys, Tony Rizzuti and Casimir Pulaski, both of whom are charged with accepting money for throwing tonight's basketball game. <laughs> However, gentlemen, the work of the Knights of the White Carnation in this affair is far from over. As a matter of fact, this is only the beginning, because our interest, not only in driving a few boys off an athletic team, our ultimate goal is to drive every boy and girl of foreign ancestry out of our schools. You agree? Right. Yeah, right. Good. Now, listen to this, gentlemen. I have a surprise plan for which the preparatory work is already done. The foundations are already laid. Tomorrow, we go into real action. And by tomorrow night, every foreigner in Metropolis will be trembling in his shoes. Cold eyes gleaming and thin, cruel lips curled back from his teeth in a beast-like snarl. Vincent Kirby, leader of the intolerant Knights of the White Carnation, voices his mysterious threat against American boys and girls. What is it? We'll know more in a moment when we return for the startling climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, gang, have you got a favorite among those comic buttons in that new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pep? Maybe you like Vitamin Flithart best. He's kind of comical with his shaggy white hair and, and shaggy fur coat. Or maybe Brenda Starr, because she's so pretty. Or maybe Superman himself, because he's so doggone handsome in his bright blue jersey and red Superman insignia. 
Of course, no matter which is your favorite, you'll want to collect all 18 pep comic buttons in this new series. And you want the fun of trading duplicates with your pals, too. And say, you wouldn't miss the thrill of wearing your pep comic buttons pinned on your jacket or your dress or your cap. So, how about asking Mom to be sure to get you some Kellogg's Pep? That's the only way you can get these swell comic buttons, you know. You don't send in either money or a box stop, but inside every package of Kellogg's Pep you open, there's a nifty new comic button for your collection. And what else do you get from a package of pep? Mighty terrific eating. Why, a bowl of those whole wheat flakes for breakfast gives you a head start on a happy day. And it gives you energy, vitamin B1, and good old sunshine, vitamin D. And is this a tasty way to take in all that good nourishment? I mean, pep's terrific. So ask Mom to get P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. As our story continues, it is the next morning... Clark Kent enters Perry White's office in the Daily Planet, where the gray-haired editor who was speaking on the telephone beckons to him. Now, here he is now. Hold the wire. Oh, Kent, somebody wants you on the phone. Oh, thanks, Chief. Say, where's Jim? Do you know? I want to see him. He was called out to Metropolis High School. Seems something happened out there. Oh. Hello, Kent speaking. Oh, yes, Mr. Reed. Why, yes, I suppose I could. What's up? Jim Olson asked you to call me? What's the matter? Wait a minute, Chief. Trouble? Why, what's happening? Well, what is it, Ken? Hold it, Chief, please. It's already started. Well, yes, I can... Hello? Wait a minute, Coach. Oh, he hung up. Oh, well, what's happening, Ken? No, 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 wait. Where are you going? To Metropolis High School and fast. See you later, Chief. Leaving Perry White's office, Clark Kent hurries out into a deserted storeroom, quickly strips off his business suit, and in a moment is set to leap from a window in his true identity of Superman. Up! Up! And away! Flashing through the sky like a red and blue meteor, the Man of Steel heads for Metropolis High School, where he has just been told Jimmy Olsen and others are in danger. What has happened at Metropolis High? Has Vincent Kirby, hate leader of the intolerant Knights of the White Carnation, made good his threat to strike again at democracy? We'll know more tomorrow, gang, so don't miss the next exciting action-packed episode. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, do you know the only cereal that goes snap, crackle, and pop when you pour on milk? Kellogg's Rice Krispies. Sure, you've seen those famous little elves snap, crackle, and pop in cartoons and on the Rice Krispies package. And you've heard those golden bubbles of oven-popped rice sing out at breakfast time. That means they're crisp, crisp as crisp can be. So have yourself a bowl full tomorrow morning. Ask Mom for the one and only Snap, Crackle, and Pop cereal, Kellogg's Rice Krispies. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Superman zooms to Jimmy Olsen's rescue and moves closer toward exposing the vicious plot of the bigoted Knights of the White Carnation. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. Say, uh, I'm going to pass out a little advice right now to all the fellas in the gang. You know, I've discovered that the girls are coming mighty close to collecting more comic buttons in that new series from packages of Kellogg's Pep than the fellas. And you don't want that to happen, so you better get busy. That's my advice. 
and say it's a load of fun, isn't it, gang? Mighty exciting when Mom opens a new package of pep to see which button is inside. Maybe it'll be Judy or Corky, or uh, the little moose, or Superman himself. Or maybe it'll be a duplicate so that you can trade with one of your pals. And that pep comic button is bound to be mighty keen looking. Bright comic strip colors on a sparkling white background. A real humdinger. But you know what the best part is? It's so easy to get these pep comic buttons. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. All you do is to ask Mom to get you some Kellogg's Pep and look inside every package you open for your prize. And say you can look forward to some mighty good eating, too, when Pep heads the breakfast menu. These good whole wheat flakes have that good flavor that makes you want to eat hearty. They're loaded with catchy sunshine flavor. That's P-E-P, gang, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. Angry because four star players on the Metropolis High School basketball team are of foreign ancestry, a secret group of vicious hate mongers who call themselves the Knights of the White Carnation set out to drive the boys off the team. And before an important game, two of the boys, Tony Rizzuti and Cass Pulaski, were beaten up. As a result, Metropolis High was defeated. Then, that night, a professional gambler falsely stated that he had bribed Rizzuti and Pulaski to throw the game, and they were arrested. Certain the boys were victims of a frame-up, Clark Kent arranged for their release on bail. But the next morning, he received a phone call from the Metropolis coach, telling him that cub reporter Jimmy Olsen was in danger at the high school. As Superman, Kent left for Metropolis High, where at this moment, Jimmy stands in the gymnasium, his back against a closed door, threatened by hundreds of shouting, milling students. Listen. Oh, go ahead, not just a minute, fellas. Listen to me, will you? They're not crooks. You've got it all wrong. Listen. Shouting wildly, the angry mob of students surges forward against the locked door, placing Jimmy Olsen and others who have gone down in danger of being trampled. The crowd is about to throw itself against Coach Reed's door when suddenly there is a great burst of wind, and a figure in blue costume and flowing red cape flashes into the gymnasium above the heads of the milling mob and thuds down before the cracking of his door. Wait a minute. Hold everything. What goes on here? Superman. Yeah, Superman. Stand back, everybody. Well, I'm okay. Don't let this mob into Coach Reed's office. Right, what's wrong, Jim? The team's in there. The because they say they threw the game last night. Oh, so that's it. Wait a minute. Just a minute, please, fellas. Stop yelling and listen to me, will you? Wait a minute. Hold it. Now, look. You know this isn't the American way of doing things. Only poor sports and cowards form mobs and take the law into their own hands. That's telling them, Superman. How about the team throwing the game? Yeah. Now, wait a minute. To begin with, I don't believe Pulaski and Rizzuti threw the game last night. Oh, oh, the the that's a lot of baloney. Jim's right. I have reason to believe that the gambler mentioned in the papers lied, and that Pulaski and Rizzuti were framed. Framed? Hey, Jim, what's Yes, I say they were framed, and I'm going to prove it. Now, for heaven's sake, clear out of here and go back to your classrooms, all of you. Be thankful that nobody was seriously hurt. Come on, Jim, let's go see the coach. Are you okay? Oh, sure, Coach. I, I was just coming out. I would have been in a bad way, though, if Superman hadn't showed up just when he did. Why? Why, it is Superman. That's right, Coach Reed. Where are the members of the team? Well, I, I managed to slip them out to the principal's office against their will, of course, while Jim was holding the fort here. I see. Look, please don't get the wrong idea of our students, Superman. They would never have taken part in a riot like this if they hadn't been stirred up by outside agitators. Outside agitators? That's right. Yeah, and those dirty pamphlets. Pamphlets? Well, well you yeah. see, they... oh, Just a moment. Wait a minute. I, I, I want to know all about this, but I can't stay at the moment. Suppose you, Coach Reed, and you, Jim, give Clark Kent all the details. He'll, uh, he'll see that I get them. Well, Jim asked me to phone Kent, Where but Where is I... he? He'll be in the principal's office in a few minutes. So long now. Up and away! <laughs> Raiden is to know more about what started the excitement this morning. Jim and Coach Reed here say outside agitators were involved. Is that true? So I understand. But I'm sure Mr. Reed can tell you more than I know. Well, I'll tell you, Mr. Kent. It all started... Uh, excuse me, a... Jim. Wait a minute. Suppose we let Coach Reed tell us what he knows first, huh? Oh, okay. Go ahead, Coach. Well, I, I was a little late getting to school this morning because the district attorney wanted to see me about this gambling charge. Uh-huh. But as I understand it, when the students began arriving... 
They found two men in front of the building passing out these pamphlets. And disgraceful things, completely un-American. Yeah, you ought to see them, Mr. Kent. I'd like to. Is there one here? Yes, I've got one. Here. Take a look at that. Thanks. Great Scott. Students of Metropolis High, the athletes who sold you out last night and discredited you and your school are foreigners. Foreigners? Can you imagine that? A dirty lie. Those boys are all good Americans. Of course they are. Go on. Read what else it says. Okay. These foreign boys and their families have different ideals from yours. They will do anything for money, and unless they are stopped, they will ruin our great country. How about that? Easy, Jim. It's up to you to show them they don't belong in our schools. Don't delay. Act now. How do you like that, Mr. Kent? I don't, Jim. Why, this is the sort of poison that turns Americans against each other. It's the dirtiest, most vicious thing in the world. And the most unfair. Yes. And this is the kind of stuff these fellows were passing out to the students and, and talking to them, getting them all stirred up against Tony Rizzuti and, and Cass Pulaski. Of course, that started the riot, naturally. The students had their hearts set on winning the state championship this year, you know. When these agitators made them believe their four stars had sold them out... And it isn't true, Mr. Kent, believe me. I know all four of these boys. I've worked and played with them. And they're swell youngsters, excellent students, popular with their schoolmates. It's fairly obvious to me that a gang of hate mongers are behind this whole thing. And they're out to discredit the four-star players on your team. Then use that to discredit all American youngsters of foreign extraction. Oh, no. Yes. And what's more, I think Charles Canfield knew that and was murdered to prevent him from revealing the identity of the hate spreaders. Cheapers. Canfield. You, you mean the millionaire who was found dead the other night? Yes, you see, just before he was killed, Mr. Reed, he phoned Perry White, editor of the Daily Planet, and told him he had a story that would blow this town wide open. Oh, That's so. When he was found, he had a newspaper clipping in his pocket with the photograph of the Metropolis High School team. And the names of four of the players were underlined. Say, that's well, right. I remember now. The underlined names were those of the four boys whom these hate spreaders call foreigners. So now we know the kind of men we're up against. Uh, not men, rats. Right, Jim. And unless I miss my guess, they won't stop with Canfield's murder in this one incident. I think they're out for bigger game. That is, to spread hate and violence through Metropolis. We've got to find them and lock them up before they run wild. You're very right, Mr. Kent. But how can we do that when we don't even know who they are? Their agents disappeared after passing out their poison pamphlets and starting the riot. Oh, wait a minute. Some of the students ought to be able to identify them. Jack Wilson saw them. Jack Wilson? Captain of the team? Uh-huh. He's the one who phoned me to come down here. Where is he, Jim? I told him to wait in the study room upstairs. Would you like to see him, Mr. Kent? I certainly would. Very well. If you'll wait a moment, I'll have him sent down here. Now, tell me this, Jack. Did you get a good look at these agitators? I sure did, Mr. Kent. Well, that is one of them. And what did he look like? Well, he was a tall, thin guy, uh-huh. about 30 years old. Yeah. Pale, pasty face and small kind of glittering eyes set close together. Say... That sounds like a perfect description of the man who tried to bribe me to keep Pulaski, Rizzuti, Kaplan, and Kelly on the bench last night. What's more, he answers the description of one of the two men who beat up Rizzuti and Pulaski after the, before the game last night. Cheapers. Then he's the guy we want. Right, Jim. This gives us something to start with. Now, look. I'm going over to the district attorney's office and get a search started for this fellow. The rest of you spread the word around school to be on the watch for those men, because it's just possible that they'll show up again. I'll call an assembly of all the students, Mr. Kent. I'll put this whole matter before them and warn them to notify me if those men appear again. Swell, Mr. Raiden. Jim, yeah? you better stick around here for a while and report progress. Okay. But be careful. In fact, all of you be careful. If you see the men we want, report them at once, but don't tangle with them. We know now they're the type of hate-mongering snake who won't stop even at murder. So be careful. <laughs> Repeating his warning to avoid danger, Clark Kent leaves Metropolis High School for the district attorney's office. Unaware that the man he is about to begin his search for, the tall, thin man with the pasty face and small, glittering eyes, is just emerging from a car in an alley near the school building. That means there's more action ahead in the exciting climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, gang, what's more fun than prizes? And what prizes are more fun or as easy to get as those nifty comic buttons in that new series you're all collecting from packages of Kellogg's Pet. First off, it's exciting to see which button is inside every time Mom opens a package of Pet. There were 18 new and different buttons in this series, you know. Old funny paper favorites like Brenda Starr and and Cindy and Spud and the Little Moose and uh, Goofy and Beezy and Superman, of course. And say, if you happen to get a duplicate, well, that's even more fun because then you can trade with your pals and you still get a new button for your collection to wear with your others on your jacket or your dresser cap. 
So get busy, gang. Collect all 18 different buttons in this new series. Just ask Mom to get you some Kellogg's Pet. That's all you do. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy these prizes anywhere. You just look inside every package of Pep you open, and there's your new comic button. And say, Pep's a prize package for good eating at breakfast, too. Remember that. Crisp and tender whole wheat flakes and fresh as can be. And loaded with that catchy sunshine flavor. That's the Sunshine Cereal Gang. It's super delicious. So ask Mom for P-E-P. The Sunshine Cereal, Kellogg's Pep. As we continue now, shortly after Clark Kent's departure, it is the luncheon period at Metropolis High School. Jack Wilson, center and captain of the basketball team, is sauntering toward Jim Olsen in the schoolyard when Jim calls to him to hurry. Hey, Jack. Jack Wilson, come here, quick. What's the matter, Jim? What's cooking? That that guy. The one who passed out pamphlets and made speeches. Yeah, what about him? He just came out of the lunch wagon across the street. He did? Uh Uh-huh. He's talking to a couple of the students. Uh, See? There, There he goes now. Gosh, that's the guy, all right. Come on, we'll tell Mr. Raiden and he can call the police. No, wait. He's going down the street now. He'll be gone before we can get help. Well, what'll we do? Come on with me. We'll follow him. But wait, Jim. Mr. Kent... I know, but we'll be careful. Come on, we've got to see where he goes and what he's up to. But gee whiz... Come on, before he gets away. Afraid that the agitator might get away, Jimmy Olsen and Jack Wilson disregard Clark Kent's warning and set out after the tall, thin man who was walking rapidly toward a nearby alley. This man, as we know, is responsible for beating up Tony Rizzuti and Casimir Pulaski and is the associate of the murderous Knights of the White Carnation. Will he lead Jimmy and Jack to an important discovery or into danger? We'll know tomorrow, gang, so don't miss tomorrow's thrill-packed episode. Be sure to tune in. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at this same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, answer me this. What does Snap, Crackle, and Pop stand for? That's right, Kellogg's Rice Krispies, those golden bubbles of oven-popped rice that snap, crackle, and pop in milk. They're so crisp, they why they fairly sing. You've probably heard them at breakfast time. And you've seen those famous little elves snap, crackle, and pop in cartoons and on the Rice Krispies package. So tomorrow morning, ask Mom for the cereal that's fun to listen to and fun to eat. The one and only snap, crackle, and pop cereal, Kellogg's Rice Krispies. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, Clark Kent is waiting for Jimmy Olsen and Jack Wilson to contact him, not realizing that the boys have become dangerously entangled in the very plot they all are trying to solve. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, it would be uh, kind of too bad to lose out, you know, to let your friends get ahead of you in collecting those nifty comic buttons in that new series Kellogg's Pep is putting out. Because these buttons are so easy to get. You don't have to spend any of your allowance, and you don't even have to send in a box stock. And uh, you wouldn't want to miss the fun of trading duplicates either, and showing off your collection on your jacket or your dresser cap. So keep right on working on your collection. You know, there are 18 new and different buttons in all. 
Every single one an old funny paper favorite like uh, Vitamin Flintheart or Pat Patton and Superman, of course. And every single one is a colorful, true-to-life picture. But remember, you can't buy these Pep County buttons anywhere. You get them the easy way, one in every package of Kellogg's Pep you open. And say you get something else, too. A super delicious whole wheat breakfast cereal that tastes just as good as it is good for you. Yes, sir. Pep helps start your day right with energy vitamin B1 and good old sunshine vitamin D. And say Pep gives your appetite a lift with that catchy sunshine flavor and loads of crisp golden toasted goodness. So remind Mom to get you some P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. Although Clark Kent is certain that hate mongers are responsible for the murder of a prominent citizen and for the false arrest of two Metropolis High School athletes on the charge of throwing a basketball game, he does not yet know who the bigots are. His only clue is the description of a man who passed out vicious, hate-smearing pamphlets to the high school students and then stirred them into a near riot against what were intolerantly called foreign athletes. Leaving cub reporter Jimmy Olsen at the school with orders to contact him at once if the man was seen again, Kent left for the district attorney's office. A short time later, Jimmy and Jack Wilson, the captain of the team, spotted the agitator leaving a lunch wagon near the school. As we continue now, they are following him down a quiet, tree-lined street. Listen. Suppose he turns around, Jim. What if he does, Jack? All he'll see is just a couple of high school kids out for a walk during lunch period. Yeah, but this guy is bad medicine. He beat up Cass Pulaski and Tony Rizzuti last night. And Mr. Kent says he's mixed up in the murder of Mr. Canfield, the millionaire. Sure, that's why we've got to follow him and see where he goes. Then we can call Mr. Kent, get the police out, and grab him. But you heard Mr. Kent say we shouldn't take any chances. To just call him or the police if we saw this fellow. But how are we going to stop off and call up anybody and still not lose this guy? Tell me that. Oh, gosh, I don't know, but... Uh-oh, wait. He's turning around. Stop, you dummy. You want him to know we're trailing him? Well, oh, come on. Gee whiz, Jim. Come on, I tell you. See, he's going on. Oh, yeah. Boy, my heart jumped right up into my mouth when he turned around. Relax. I've trailed plenty of bad actors. Guy's just as dangerous as this one. All you have to do is keep on your toes, but not act as if you're trailing. Wait. He's going to cross the street. No, don't follow him across yet. Just slow down a little and see where he goes. Okay. I guess you know all the ropes, Jim. I know a few. I'm a reporter, you know. Yeah, I know. Hey, look. He's going into that alley. Uh Uh-huh. Come on. Gotta go after him. After him into the alley? Sure, come on. Golly, Jim. Frankly, I... I'm not too keen about following that guy into an alley. You want to see Cass and Tony cleared, don't you? Well, sure, but... Well, the only way we can do it is by trailing this guy. Wait. Hold it, Jack. Now what? He stopped at that car. See? Behind the old lumber yard. Yeah, I see him. Quick, duck behind this telephone pole. Can you see what he's doing? Yeah. He's getting into the car. Oh, this is where he loses us. I tried to get his license number. Can you make it out, Jack? Kind of tough. There's mud on it. Probably put it there on purpose, the rat. I can make out a Y. And the number six. Mm. That's all I can see, too. Cheap as if only you were headed this way. Then he'd pass us and maybe we could get his number. Well, he is. What do you kids so think you're doing? Huh? Jim, behind you. A little spying, maybe, huh? Oh, us? No, we were Jim, just... this is one of the guys who was at school this morning. She was. Come on, break away. No, you <laughs> don't stand still or I'll bat your brains out. Stand still, I said. You can't get away. Okay, uh... Okay, we're not trying to get away. Oh, no. No, you What's see... What's the matter, Fargo? I caught these two kids trailing you, Joe. Well, they were. No, no we, we were just... Uh... Bring them here. Right. Go on, you two. Walk over to that car. Oh, wait, let go, will you? Relax, Jack. This is what we wanted. Come on. Ah, oh, you're being smart. Hey, this is bad, Jim. Oh, it's perfect. Um, we wanted to meet these guys, didn't we? Huh? Sure. Didn't we want to get in with them? You know. What? Maybe even get to work with them. Work with them? Hey, what are you kids talking about? Well, you see, mister, we like what you said in those pamphlets you passed out at school today. We we agree with you 100%, see? Oh, well, you do, oh, huh? Yeah, so we thought... Wait that... a minute. Tell it to my, to my uh, friend here. What's going on here, Fargo? I don't know, Joe. This freckled character is handing me some line about wanting to get in and work with us. Is that so? Uh, yeah, you see, Mr. Weep... Shut that... up and get into the car. Now, look, mister, we... Get in, I said, in the back. Okay, sure, we'll get in. We want to talk to you anyhow. Come on, Jack. 
jeepers, Jim. What do we do if I had just followed my lead? I'm going to back with the kids, Fargo. You get in front and be ready for a quick getaway if I give you the word. Okay, Joe. Now, look, you kids, I want the truth and fast. What's the idea of following me? Well, you see, mister, it's like I started to tell your friend. Jack and I heard you talking outside school this morning, and we read the pamphlets you passed out, and we... Well, we agree with what you said about Pulaski and Rizzuti and the other foreigner basketball players giving us a dirty deal. You do, huh? That's right. You see, we... Hey, wait a... Wait a minute. Aren't you Jack Wilson, captain of the Metropolis High team? Why, yes, I I am, but... Jack Wilson, what are you trying to do? Pull a fast one on me? No, I... Hold it. What's your name, kid? Me? Uh, Jim. Uh, Jim Adams. Adams, huh? That's a good American name. Yeah, and I'm a good American, all right. That's why I wanted to talk to you, see? Jack and I want to get back at the guys who threw the game last night. I don't know if you should go for this, Joe. After all, I would tell quiet, you. Quiet, Fargo. I'm handling this. Okay, okay. Now, you boys want to get back at the dirty little foreigners who threw the game on you, huh? We sure do, don't we, Jack? Then how? Well, maybe I'll give you the chance. Tonight. How would you like that? Oh, boy, that's swell. Wh- what do you want us to do? If you're on the level, I'll tell you tonight. Okay. Just say where and when. Both of you be in Pete's lunch wagon across the street from the school at 8 o'clock. Call you on the phone there and tell you where to meet me. Can't you, uh, tell us now? You heard me. I'll phone you at the lunch wagon tonight at 8. Okay, let's go, Jack. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Here's a couple of flowers. Wear them when you come to meet us tonight. White carnations. What's the idea? Never mind the idea. Just do as I say. And if you do a good job, you'll not only get back at those basketball players, but you'll make a little money besides. Money? Yeah. Now fade. Be at the lunch wagon at 8 o'clock for my phone call. Don't forget to wear the white carnations when you come where I tell you to. Oh, we won't forget. Come on, Jack. We'll be there, mister. Okay. Get going, Fargo. <laughs> Jim, do you think we ought to... Save your breath for a run, Jack. We've got to see Mr. Kent, and fast. Come on. What happened then, Jim? Nothing, Mr. Kent. They drove away, and we came right over here to the planet. Let's see. You're to be at this lunch wagon at 8 o'clock, right? Yeah. This guy, Joe, said he'd phone us there and tell us where to meet him. All right, now get this. When he phones you, I want you to call me at once and tell me where he told you to come. I'll be at the district attorney's office, understand? Uh Uh-huh. And you and the D.A. will meet Joe instead of us, huh? That's the idea, Jim. Now, What about uh, these flowers, the white carnations that he told us to wear? Yeah, what do you think that's for, Mr. Kent? Well, they're obviously for purposes of identification. We'll find out more about that later. Now, you boys got everything straight? Sure. We go to the lunch wagon tonight and wait for Joe's phone call. Right. Then we call you at the D.A.'s office and you and the D.A. take it from there. Right. After you call me, you two are to go right to the D.A.'s office and wait there for us. No more going places on your own. Is that understood? Oh, sure. And how? I don't want to meet those guys again. Especially at night. All right, then. Everything's set for tonight. If all goes well, we'll have those hate peddlers and murderers behind bars by morning. What will happen at the lunch wagon tonight? We'll be back in a moment to find out, so stand by. Say, you like to have pictures of your favorite friends, don't you? Well, there's one reason why those comic buttons in the new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pet are making such a hit with you fellows and girls. Because those comic strip characters are old friends. You've followed their adventures in the funny papers for a long, long time. So collecting those pet comic buttons is bound to be mighty exciting. And are these pictures true to life? Chief Brandon looks so dignified and official, and Goofy has that silly grin on his face, and Superman looks as if he's all ready to take off to the skies. Yes, sir, those 18 new and different pep comic buttons are really slick. You'll be proud to wear them pinned on your jacket or your dress or cap, so don't let your pals get ahead of you. You keep working on your collection. Ask Mom to get you plenty of Kellogg's pet. You don't send it any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy these commie buttons anywhere. You just look for one inside every package of pep you open. And say, look for some downright good eating at breakfast, too, because that's what pep's famous for. Those good whole wheat flakes are loaded with golden toasted sunshine flavor that makes a hit on a frosty morning. That's P-E-P, gang. The sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. 
As we continue now, it is evening. Jimmy Olsen and Jack Wilson, trying not to betray their nervousness, are sitting at the counter in Pete's lunch wagon across the street from Metropolis High School. There are no other customers, and the proprietor, a stout, bald-headed man, is polishing a coffee urn at the far end of the counter. After eight, Jim. Why doesn't that guy phone? Relax, Jack. He'll call. Jim, look. Holy smokes. It's that guy, Joe. What's he doing here? I thought he was going to call Hiya, us. Hiya, boy. Hiya. I thought you were going to call us. We decided to come down and pick you up ourselves instead of phone it. Let's go. Go? Where? I'm going to give you a chance to get back at those dirty little foreigners who threw the basketball game last night. Oh, well... Come on, we're in a hurry. But, uh, but you were supposed to call us up. You heard him. We changed our minds. Gee whiz, Jim, what do we do? Come on, come on. What are you stalling for? Oh, we, we're not stalling. It's just... Go ahead. Start walking out to that car. Go on. <laughs> faces pale, Jimmy Olsen and Jack Wilson walk to the door of the diner on rubbery legs, their eyes casting desperate appeal at the lunch wagon proprietor who, unconcerned, pays no attention to them. Jim's plan to trap the agitators and murderers has backfired. Now the boys themselves are trapped. What will happen now as Clark Kent and the district attorney wait tensely for a phone call from Jimmy and Jack, a phone call which now cannot be made. Whatever you do, gang, don't miss Monday's thrilling episode when the new plot against American boys and girls planned by the intolerant knights of the White Carnation is further unfolded. Monday's episode is packed with chills and thrills, so be sure to tune in. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, you know what it means when Kellogg's Rice Krispies go snap, crackle, and pop in milk? Why, it means they're crisp. Crisp as crisp can be. Sure, Kellogg's Rice Krispies are the only cereal so crisp they snap crackle, and pop. That's why you see so much of those three famous little elves snap, crackle, and pop in cartoons and on the Rice Krispies package. They stand for the crispiness of Kellogg's Golden Bubbles of Oven Popped Rice. The one and only snap, crackle, and pop cereal, Kellogg's Rice Krispies. And be sure to be with us on Monday for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. While Clark Kent worries about not hearing from Jimmy Olsen and Jack Wilson, the young boys, completely enmeshed in the hate-mongering plot, face immediate peril of their very lives. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. Say, did you ever check up and see whether the fellas or the girls in your crowd have collected the most different comic buttons from that exciting new series that now come in packages of Kellogg's Pep? Well, from what I've seen, both fellas and girls are mighty busy with their collections. And no wonder why it's a heap of fun to get a brand new button whenever Mom opens a new package of pet. Maybe it'll be Vitamin Flintheart, or a Pat Patton, or Superman himself. And say, if it's a duplicate, well, that's even more fun, because then you can swap with one of your pals. And you know what the best part is? These 18 pep comic buttons are so easy to get. You don't have to send in a single penny, not even a box stop, and you can't buy them anywhere. But every time Mom opens a new package of Kellogg's Pep, there's your slick-looking comic button inside. 
And say, Pep gives you something else, too. A super delicious dish for breakfast. Yes, sir, Pep is called the Sunshine Cereal. It's loaded with catchy sunshine flavor, golden toasted and good. And Pep is on the beam with sunshine vitamin D, too. That good old vitamin that helps build strong bones and teeth. And energy vitamin B1. Yes, sir, Kellogg's Pep is sure a prize package any way you look at it. That's P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now the adventures of Superman. As you remember, agents for the hate-mongering Knights of the White Carnation beat up two star players of the Metropolis High School basketball team before a championship game. And then, when Metropolis lost, a professional gambler falsely testified that he had bribed the boys to throw the game. The next morning at school, the same group precipitated a riot against the accused players. But Cub reporter Jimmy Olsen and Jack Wilson, captain of the team, trailed the agitators. Pretending to agree with their hate-smearing tactics, Jim and Jack offered to help the bigots and were told to be at a certain lunch wagon that evening when they would receive further instructions by telephone. After contacting Clark Kent, the two boys went to the lunch wagon. But to their dismay, the agents appeared in person and ordered them into a car. As we continue now, we find Kent in the office of District Attorney Frank Agnew. Listen. Ten minutes past eight, Mr. Agnew. We should have heard from the boys by now. Relax, Kent. They said they'd call us as soon as this agitator phoned them, didn't they? Yes, but he was supposed to ring them at eight o'clock. Well, apparently he hasn't done so yet. It's my hunch he won't. Why not? Well, I don't know exactly. Look, Kent, do you really think there's a hate gang involved in this mess? I certainly do. I believe they framed the two basketball players and murdered Charles Canfield, the millionaire, to keep him from exposing their subversive un-American activities. Well, if you're right, those fellows are very clever, because they fooled me and they fooled Inspector Henderson and the whole police department. They are clever. Oh, why doesn't Jim call? Relax, will you, Kent? It's only 8.12. How can I relax when I know that those hate peddlers are more dangerous than rattlesnakes? I know, but the boys are in no great danger. I'm sure of that. Well, I'll wait just a few minutes more. If we don't hear from Jim by then, I'm going out to that lunch wagon. While Clark Kent anxiously paces the floor of the district attorney's office, a small black sedan carrying Jimmy Olsen, Jack Wilson, and the two agents for the Knights of the White Carnation has traveled across the city and come to a stop in a dark alley behind the huge, unlighted bulk of Metropolis's Benjamin Franklin High School. Commanded by the thin, pasty-faced man called Joe... The two boys leave the car and walk up the alley beside him, while the other man remains at the wheel. Okay, hold it, kids. Here we are. This is the Ben Franklin High School. Yeah, I know. What are we doing here? It's so loud, Wilson. Now, here's what I want you to do. Each of you take a bunch of these handbills. Here. Huh? Well, what are these? I told you, handbills. Like the ones I passed out of Metropolis High this morning. Oh. These are gummed on the back, see And I want you boys to paste them up in the halls on the students' lockers. Every place where all the kids can see them when they come to school tomorrow. You you mean inside the school? That's right, Chief. Uh Uh-oh. But but what's the idea? Just this. To get the real American kids sore at the foreigner kids so that they'll get to fighting each other, see? Jeepers. Then maybe I can work work up a good riot here tomorrow like I did at your school this morning. But gee whiz. uh, But what? Wilson. Oh, nothing. Look, don't you want to see the dirty little foreigners get kicked around and maybe get so scared they'll quit school? I, I... Uh, Yeah, yeah, sure. Shut up, Jim. Well, what, Wilson? You getting chicken hearted? No, no, Or were you trying to put something over when you said you wanted to play ball with us? Now, wait, don't get us wrong, Joe. It's just that you told us we were going to get back at the guys on our basketball team for throwing the championship game, see? So this... Yeah, that's it. This... This isn't exactly what we were expecting to do. I see. It doesn't hit right at those foreign kids on our team, Sure so. it does. These handbills tell how Pulaski and Rizzuti and Kaplan and Kelly threw the game. And they show that no foreigners can be trusted. You get it? Oh, yeah, sure, but just the same... You see, we want to get all the kids in Metropolis so sore they'll turn on every kid with a name like Pulaski or Rizzuti or Kaplan or Kelly. Then when that happens, your basketball players will be run out of school. Or worse. Jeepers. Yeah. I get it, all right. Okay, now as soon as I get this handkerchief wrapped around my hand, I'll break a window and let you into the school. Yeah. 
All set now. Here it goes. Christ, Jim, what'll we do? I don't know yet, Jack. Keep your fingers crossed. Maybe we should run for it. No, we wouldn't have a chance. But we can't go through with this. No, but we got to make it look like we are. But, Jim... Okay, come here, kids, and hurry. Now, here's a flashlight. Now, climb inside and start pasting up those handbills. Uh, look, Joe, suppose somebody hears us. There's nobody in the place to hear you. But, but what if somebody shows up? At night, no. But if anybody does, I'll be right out here with Fargo. We'll take care of any nosy guys. Go on, I'll get going. Oh, okay. Come on, Jack. Yeah. All right, Jim. Remember, do a good job or you'll be a couple of sorry kids. I don't like the way he said that, Jim. Neither do I. Oh, boy, are we in a spot. If only he'd phoned us at the lunch wagon like he said he would, so we'd have had a chance to call Mr. Ken. Maybe he figured we might do something like that so he wasn't taking any chances. Yeah, maybe. Look, Jim, you're not figuring to paste up those dirty handbills like he said, are you? Are you kidding? Of course not. Then how do we get out of this mess? I don't know. Yes. I've... I've got to think. Wait. Hey. How about hiding these handles someplace, then going back out after a while and saying we pasted them? Oh, it's too risky. Joe might decide he wants a look at the job. If he sees we double-crossed him, it'll be too bad. Yeah, that's right. Wait, I've got it, Jack. Come on. Huh? Where are you going, Jack? To the principal's office. The principal's office? What for? Well, there must be a phone in there. A phone? Oh, you mean... Uh-huh. We'll call Mr. Ken at the DA's office, tell him where we are, and then we'll get busy slapping up these handbills until he and the police get out here. We can tear them down later. Boy, that's a swell idea. Wait, what are you stopping for? First, we've got to find the principal's office. What will I throw the ladder around? There it is, right across the corridor. Yeah, come on. Oh, boy, if only this works. It's got to. Yeah, it's our only chance to trap those hate murderers. And... Oh, here we are. Oh, gosh. I just thought of something. What? What if this door is locked? Oh, brother. Well, there's only one way to find out. Here goes. Hot dog, it's open. Yeah, there's the phone on the desk. Come on, Jack. Keep your fingers crossed, but hard. Their hearts beating rapidly, Jimmy Olsen and Jack Wilson hurry to the telephone on the principal's desk to call Clark Kent. Will their plan work? We'll be back in a moment to find out. So stand by. You know, gang, you can have fun with your collection of comic buttons in that new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pep. Any kind of weather, any day of the week. Both fellas and girls can get a kick out of it, too. For instance, uh, when you meet up with one of your pals, there's that business of comparing notes on how many you've collected so far. And say it's even more fun trading duplicates. You know, like an extra button with Pat Patton's picture in exchange for Tess Trueheart, if you don't have one like that yet. Or, uh, or the little moose, uh, traded for Judy or Corky. Or maybe, uh, Brenda Starr for Superman. Yes, sir, for fun and for doggone good looks, these pep comic buttons are really keen. And they're so easy to get. You can collect all 18 buttons in this new series just by asking Mom to keep you supplied with plenty of Kellogg's pep. You don't have to send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy these prizes anywhere. But there's a comic button inside every package of Pep you open. And that's only one reason that you like Pep. You get a kick out of Pep's catchy sunshine flavor. That golden toasted goodness that goes so good first thing in the morning. Pep's crisp freshness, too. Yes, you like everything about P-E-P. The sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. In the principal's dark office in Benjamin Franklin High School, Jack Wilson, his hand shaking with excitement, is holding the flashlight as Jimmy Olsen dials the number of the district attorney to summon Clark Kent and the police. Oh, jeepers, hurry up, Jim. Give me a chance. I've got a dial, don't I? Yeah, but... There. They're ringing. Put no. that phone down, you little rat. Who said that, huh? Put that phone down, I said her. Holy smokes, it's Joe. Yeah, that's right. Uh, hey, careful with that knife. You dirty little double crosses. I ought to cut your hearts out right now. Who, us? Ooh, Look, we... Joe, we were only going to... Yeah, yeah, I see what's going on. You were only going to turn me into the cops, weren't you? No, you see, Shut you know, up. We... Lying won't help you now. Nothing will. What? 
What do you mean? Did you think I was so dumb I'd just take your word that you were on my side? No, this was a test, see? I was checking up on you. But now wait. Quiet. You're all through talking and all through everything else. Turn around and walk back out to the alley. Go on, walk. And fast. Small eyes filled with hate, Joe, the tall, thin hate monger, menaces Jim Olsen and Jack Wilson with a long knife as he forces them to turn and walk back to the dark alley. Meanwhile, alarmed at the failure of the boys to call him from the lunch wagon, Clark Kent is creeped there as Superman. And as we join him now, he is questioning the stout, bald-headed proprietor, Pete. They two men called for the boys. That, that's right, Superman. Then they all went in a car. I, I didn't know there was anything wrong. What kind of a car? Well, I, I didn't notice, except it was a dark sedan. You say one of the men was tall and thin and pasty-faced? Yeah, that, that's right. It was Joe, the man described by Coach Reed and Jack Wilson. How's that, Superman? Never mind. I've got to find those boys before something serious happens to them. Thanks, Pete, and good night. Up and away! <laughs> Leaping high from the little lunch wagon, Superman streaks away through the night skies to begin a desperate search for Jimmy Olsen and Jack Wilson. What is Joe, agent for the evil knights of the White Carnation, planning for the two boys? And how will Superman find them in time? For all the answers, don't miss tomorrow's thrill-packed episode, fellows and girls. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, you know how crisp Kellogg's Rice Krispies are? So crisp, they snap, crackle, and pop in milk. Sure, that's their song of crispness. Means that those golden bubbles of oven-popped rice are crisp as crisp can be. Whenever you see those famous little elves snap, crackle, and pop in cartoons or on the Rice Krispies package, think of how light and delicate and crisp this grand breakfast dish is. Tomorrow morning, ask Mom for the one and only snap, crackle, and pop cereal, Kellogg's Rice Krispies. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the Sunshine Serial, presents The Adventures of Superman. Today, while Clark Kent anxiously paces the DA's office, certain that Jimmy Olsen and Jack Wilson have stumbled into some great danger, the boys are helpless prisoners of the murderous Vincent Kirby. Bigoted leader of the Knights of the White Carnation. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, it's something like a picture gallery, a collection of those comic buttons in that new series from packages of Kellogg's Pet. Because every one of those 18 characters is really famous. Take uh, Vitamin Flintheart, for instance. You've followed his adventures for years and years. And Brenda Starr. Everybody knows how pretty she is. And Superman himself. And all the wonderful things he does. So it's a real thrill to wear those comic buttons pinned on your jacket or your dress or cap. Not to mention that they're so keen looking and bright. And here's it a load of fun to swap duplicates with your pals. And it's fun to get a new comic button every time Mom opens a new package of Kellogg's Pet. That's the only way you can get these prizes, you know. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. But you get a comic button in each package of Kellogg's Pep you open. That's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Pep, the golden toasted whole wheat flakes with a catchy sunshine flavor. Pep, the crisp, fresh breakfast cereal that's so good for you with its added energy vitamin B1 and sunshine vitamin D. Yes, sir, gang, Mom's mighty glad to have you eat lots of P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. 
And now, the adventures of Superman. In a malicious attempt to spread intolerance among Metropolis youngsters, the hate-mongering Knights of the White Carnation manufactured evidence that led to the arrest of two high school athletes on the charge of throwing a basketball game. Then, when Cub reporter Jimmy Olsen and Jack Wilson, captain of the team, stumbled on the trail of an agent for the hate organization, they offered to work for him in order to obtain evidence against the bigots. That night, the agent, known to them only as Joe, took them to another high school, where he ordered them to break in and paste up vicious, race-smearing handbills. Making their way into the principal's office, Jimmy and Jack were about to phone Clark Kent when Joe entered and caught them. As we continue a short time later... Vincent Kirby, wealthy and aristocratic leader of the Knights of the White Carnation, answers the phone in his library. Listen. Hello? Mr. Kirby? Yes? Is it Joe, Joe McMillan? McMillan? Didn't I tell you never to call me at my home? Yeah, but this is important. Well, it'd better be. Well, what is it? You know those two kids I told you about? The ones who followed me today and said they wanted to work with us? Yes? Well, I found out they're spies. Spies? Yeah. One of them who said his name was Jim Adams isn't a high school kid at all. His real name is Jim Olson, and he's a newspaper reporter. A reporter? Are you sure? Positive. What's more, I caught the little punk just as he was calling up the district attorney. Good heavens, did he complete the... Don't worry, I stopped him before he could shoot his mouth off. Good. Uh, where are these boys now? I got them at my place, and I thought before I do anything, I'd better check with you. All right. Stay where you are. I'll be right out. Okay, Mr. Kirby. So long. One of them, Mr. K- uh, Mr. K. Uh, which one is this, Joe? This is Jim Olson, a reporter for the Daily Planet. How do you know? He had his wallet on him with his identification and press card. Well, who are you? What's the idea of wearing a mask? You afraid I'll run I'll it? ask good questions. Now, why did you pose as a high school student and say your name was Adams? What are you trying to find out? As if you didn't know. Answer me. My answer is you better let Jack and me go. Oh, I- oh. Let go of my arm. Talk fast and answer the questions, kid, or I'll break your arm. Let go. Ow. Well, Olson. You gonna talk? Dirty cowards if I was just a little bigger. Never mind. Talk. Okay, okay, let go. I just as well know we're on to what you're up to. Really? This should be interesting. Go on, Olson. Tell us what made you stick your foolish young neck out. Well, I used to go to Metropolis High School. Cass Pulaski and Tony Rizzuti, the... Two boys who were arrested for throwing the championship basketball game the other night are friends of mine. Oh, they are, right? Quiet, Joe. Go on, Olson. I was sure they didn't throw the game. And the gambler who testified he bribed them was lying. I couldn't figure out why he was framing Tony and Cass. Until this morning. So? And what did you discover this morning, Olson? Well, when I found out that your boy Joe here was around the school passing out pamphlets that smeared Tony and Cass and... Generally stirring up the students against all others who happen to have foreign-sounding names, I knew then what was cooking. You did, huh? Yeah, because I've seen hate mongers work before. And when I told Mr. Kent, I mean, another Planet reporter about it, we figured out right away that some dirty hate mongers had framed Cass and Tony in order to spread race prejudice among the school kids. Indeed. You're a real bright boy, ain't you? Well, no way, I... Joe. So you and Mr. Clark Kent figured all this out, huh? I presume you mean Clark Kent. Huh? Oh, no, wait, I, I didn't say anything. I about... know. And I'm reasonably sure you were referring to Mr. Kent because he's made a nuisance of himself before. No, wait. Mr. Kent didn't have anything to do with this, I tell you. It was all my idea. Yeah, we'll get to him later. Put Olsen back in the other room with the Wilson boy, Joe. Tell Fargo to watch them. Then come back here. Okay. Come on. Olsen. No, wait. What's the idea of keeping Jack and me here? What are you going to do to us? You'll find out, you dirty little spy. Now go on, get going. But, but, now wait a minute. Shut up and get in there. Why, you dirty... Take man. care of this rat, Fargo. Oh, uh, Joe? Say, this isn't so good, Mr. Kirby. This Olsen kid and that Kent guy have got our play all figured out. Relax. There's nothing to worry about as long as they don't know who's behind it. But they may have others spying on us. This Kent sounds like a smart apple. Yes, he's very clever. Too clever, as a matter of fact, because from something he said to Mr. Mortimer, the chairman of the school board, he even suspects that we murdered Charles Canfield. Holy smokes. Now, don't get excited. He can't ever prove it. But how can he even suspect? Listen, we got to take care of that guy in a hurry. I don't want to go to the chair. Don't get excited, I said. We'll take care of everything and everybody in due time. Yeah, yeah, now, but... fortunately, we got Olsen and the Wilson boy before they could do any harm, and we're going to make use of them. Very good use of them. How do you mean? You'll see. First, I'm going to call up Clark Kent. Kent, what are you calling him for? For a very good reason, Joe. But you don't... Be quiet a minute. 
Is Clark Kent there, please? I wonder if you could tell me where to locate him. It's quite important. Do you say the district attorney's office? The district attorney. Oh, very well. I'll try him there. Thank you. Good night. Listen, Mr. Curtin. Uh, hand me the phone book, please, Joe. Oh, wait a minute. I said hand me the phone book, please. I want to look up the district attorney's number. Kent is there with him. Will you please tell me why you want to talk to Kent when right now that guy is dynamite? I'll explain everything later. Hand me the phone book. I'm worried about Jim Olson and the Wilson boy, Mr. Agnew. Why, Kent? Well, because I'm afraid that man Joe is suspicious of the boys. Which is why he called for them personally instead of phoning them as he said he would. Now, look, Kent, according to Olson's story, Joe said he had a job for them, didn't he? Uh, yes, but... Well, when they've done the job, whatever it is, then we'll hear from them. Now, that worries me, too. What if he's... Wait a on... Here's my phone. This attorney's office. Agnew speaking. Uh, hello. Is Clark Kent there, please? Yes, just a minute. For you, Kent. For me? Yeah. Here. Oh, thanks. Clark Kent speaking. Uh, Mr. Kent, my name is Davis. Yes, Mr. Davis? Uh, two boys were just in my store. Uh, they wanted to use the telephone, but both booths were occupied. Oh? Uh, and then one of them said his name was Jim Olson. Jim Olson? What about Jim Kent? Wait, Mr. Agnew. Uh, Olson said that he and his friend were in a great hurry and asked me to do him a big favor. Yes, Mr. Davis, go on. Well, he asked if I would call you at the district attorney's office and tell you that he and Jack were all right. Oh? And not to worry if you didn't hear from them tonight. Uh, that they had a hot lead on the basketball frame-up and were following it. What? Listen, Mr. Davis, where are you located? Oh, yes. They also asked if uh, you would phone their mothers and tell them not to worry. I, I think that's all. Good night. Uh, wait a minute. W- w- where is your store, Mr. Davis? Uh, hello. Hello, Mr. Davis. Hello. Hello. What is it, Kent? Hello. Oh, he hung up. Will you please tell me who that was? And what about Jim and Jack Wilson? It was a fellow named Davis who said Jim and Jack had just been in his store, and since both phone booths were occupied, Jim left after asking him to call me here and tell us not to worry. Hmm? That he and Jack were following up a hot lead on the basketball frame-up. Oh, where is this fellow Davis? That's what I was trying to find out, but he hung up without answering. Probably in a hurry. Well, Kent, anyhow, it's a relief to know the boys were apparently okay, isn't it? Not too sure they're okay, Mr. Agnew. But this fellow just said so. Yes, but there was something phony about that call. Phony? What do you mean? Well, Jim wouldn't go off on his own again that way after I gave him strict orders not to. And my hunch says that he and Jack Wilson are in trouble. Real serious trouble. Uneasy, Clark Kent frets, a sixth sense telling him that his young friends are in trouble. And as we know, they are. Why did Kirby make that call to Kent? We'll know in a moment when we return to the exciting climax of today's episode. So stand by. You know, every once in a while, it's a good idea to take stock of your collection of comic buttons in that new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pet and see just exactly how you're coming along. Because uh, you don't want to miss out on a single one of those 18 new and different comic buttons. You want to get right in on that fun that all the fellows and girls are having. And you want to be in there pitching when they're swapping duplicates. You know, these bright colored buttons really show up when you wear them pinned on your jacket or your dresser cap. They're pictures of your favorite comic strip characters like Cindy and, and Spud and, and Superman himself. 18 of them in all. Every single one a real humdinger. So remind Mom to keep you stocked up on Kellogg's Pet because that's the only way you can get these nifty prizes. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop, and you can't buy them anywhere. But every time you open a package of Pep, there's your comic button inside. And there's some mighty swell eating, too. Believe me, Kellogg's Pep is so crisp and fresh, these toasted whole wheat flakes are so loaded with that catchy sunshine flavor that... Well, you practically can't resist them. So ask Mom for lots of P-E-P. The Sunshine Cereal, Kellogg's Pep. As our story continues, we return to Joe McMillan's apartment, where Vincent Kirby has just replaced the telephone after speaking to Clark Kent. His eyes wide in shocked amazement, McMillan recovers his voice and turns to Kirby. Look, Mr. Kirby, what was the idea of that call to Kent? Why did you say you were somebody named Davis and Austin and Wilson were okay? Simple, Joe. I did that because I don't want Kent or the police looking for the boys, yet. Oh, I get it. I want them to think they're all right, until they find them. What do you mean, until they find them? You see, Joe, I have a very special use for those two boys. Yeah? Like what? Well, within the next 24 hours, you're going to see hate sweep through Metropolis. Red-hot, murderous hate. 
directed against all people of foreign ancestry in the city. Well, yes, but... Joe. This is the moment the Knights of the White Carnation have been waiting for. <laughs> His cold, aristocratic face reflecting maniacal cruelty, Vincent Kirby, leader of the un-American Knights of the White Carnation, contemplates with evil pleasure the wave of falsely inspired hatred, which he plans to make run like red fire through Metropolis within the next 24 hours. What is the murderous Kirby's plan? And how will Superman, who only suspects that Jimmy Olsen and Jack Wilson are in danger, find and save them and prevent the hate mongers from starting a race riot based, as always... On a pyramid of lies. Tomorrow's episode is packed with thrills and suspenseful excitement, gang. So don't miss a minute of it. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at this same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Snap, crackle, pop. Hey, that's a swell song to hear at the breakfast table, isn't it, gang? Means your bowl of Kellogg's Rice Krispies is crisp as crisp can be. Means doggone good eating. Why, these golden bubbles of oven puff rice are so fresh and crisp, they snap, crackle, and pop when you pour on milk. That's why those famous little elves named Snap, Crackle, and Pop are, are around so much these days in cartoons and on the Rice Krispies package to remind you to ask Mom for the one and only Snap, Crackle, and Pop cereal, Kellogg's Rice Krispies. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P, Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. While Clark Kent searches frantically for Jimmy Olsen and Jack Wilson, bigoted Vincent Kirby plans a vicious smear campaign with the imprisoned boys as his unwilling tools. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. Say, Ed, how you coming along with your collection of comic buttons in that new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pet? You got any duplicates around that you uh, want to swap with your pals? And uh, are you all your pep comic buttons pinned firm and sturdy on your jacket or your dresser cap so everybody can tell how many you've collected? Say, you want to keep track of these prizes, you know. They're mighty good looking. They're pictures of favorite funny paper characters like uh, Brenda Starr and Spud and the Little Moose and Cindy and Superman, of course. Yes, sir, you'll want to collect all 18 of them. So hop to it, gang. Ask Mom to get you a package or two of Kellogg's Pep. That's the prize package where you get these swell prizes. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. But there's a comic button in every package of Pep you open. And say, Pep's a prize package when it comes to good breakfast eating, too. Crisp and fresh and, and golden toasted. Tastes just as sunny and golden as you'd expect when it's called the Sunshine Cereal. Believe me, these toasty whole wheat flakes give breakfast and your day a grand start. So ask Mom for P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now, the adventures of Superman. In an attempt to trap Joe McMillan, an agent for a group of vicious bigots who have begun a campaign to spread race hatred in the city schools, Cub reporter Jimmy Olsen and Jack Wilson, captain of the Metropolis High School basketball team, were caught and taken to a hideout. McMillan summoned Vincent Kirby, the wealthy and aristocratic leader of the hate mongers, who telephoned Clark Kent, and, posing as a storekeeper, told Kent that Jimmy had asked him to forward a message that the two boys were safe and on the trail of a big story. That done, Kirby turns back to McMillan, exultant, his eyes gleaming with maniacal excitement. Listen. Now, Joe, within 24 hours, you will see hate 
Murderous hate raged through Metropolis like fire. And no youngster of foreign ancestry would be safe on the streets of the city. Are you serious, Mr. Kirby? You bet I am. You see, this is the moment the Knights of the White Carnation have been waiting for, Joe. Look, you're going too fast for me, Mr. Kirby. I don't get it. All right. Listen. Now, we've already got a lot of high school kids furious with those two basketball players, Pulaski and Rizzuti, because they think they threw the championship game the other night, right? Well, sure, that's right, but I don't... You get... even managed to get a pretty good riot started, didn't you? We sure did, but what's well, that... now, Joe, such riots will take place in every school in Metropolis. How do you figure to do that? I intend to use the two spies you caught. You mean Jim Olsen and Jack Wilson? That's right. They've got good American names, and Wilson is captain of the Metropolis high team. So? So when Olsen and Wilson disappear, and everyone is led to believe that foreign youngsters were responsible for their disappearance, we'll have the spark we need to set off citywide riots against foreigners. You see? Well, yeah, but how are you going to make everybody think foreign kids are responsible? I'll show you. Here. Wait till I get my mask on again, Joe. There. Now, bring in Jim Olsen. <laughs> Olson, I want you to phone in a little story to your newspaper, the Daily Planet. Yeah? What kind of a story? A story to the effect that you and Jack Wilson have uncovered evidence revealing that Metropolis High's Phil Kaplan and Michael Kelly were also paid off by gamblers to help Rizzuti and Pulaski throw the championship basketball game the other night. Hey, what an idea. Are you kidding? Your story, Olson, must also say that you and Wilson will present your evidence to the district attorney in the morning. That's all, huh? That's all. Well, get this, Mr. Mask Face. The only story I'll write is to repeat that Cass Pulaski and Tony Rizzuti didn't throw the game. And that tin horn gambler who said they did lie. Also, that Phil Kaplan and Mickey Kelly weren't involved with any gamblers either. Now, look here, Olsen. Furthermore, my story, when I write it, will say you guys deliberately framed Cass and Tony for the sole purpose of starting race trouble in our schools. Isn't that true? He's a real bright boy, ain't he, Mr. K? He certainly is, Joe. That's why I'm sure you'll see that it's to his advantage to do as I say. Oh, yeah? I can see what you guys are up to. A story like that came now, out. Now, Olsen, be smart and do as I say. Pick up the phone and give that story to your newspaper. Like fun, I will. You will, all right. That's what you think. Neither you nor anybody else can make me do a dirty thing like that. Oh, no, we'll see about that. Oh. Now! I don't care. Uh, Break my arm. I won't do it. You'll sing another tone in a minute, buddy. I won't. Dirty hate spreaders. I don't care what you do to me, but... But I won't help you in your rotten Let work. him go, Joe. Oh, just give me a couple oh. more seconds. Let him go, I said. Won't be any good to us if his arms are broken. Well, okay. But how are you going to make him phone in that store? You can't make me. I think we can, Olsen. Listen carefully. You wouldn't want to see anything happen to your friend, Jack Wilson, would you? What do you mean? Now, the other night before the game, Pulaski and Rizzuti were beaten up, remember? Sure. Joe here and Fargo, that big mug in the other room, beat them up. So they wouldn't be able to play well, and it would look as if they were throwing the game. Yes. Well, those boys didn't get a very bad beating, Olsen. No. They lived. You follow me? Huh? No, I... You see, Joe and Fargo are very skillful at that sort of thing. If they were to beat up Wilson now, and I neglected to tell him to go easy on him, Wilson might not live. No, might have bought it. No, you, you wouldn't do it. You, you're just trying to scare me. You think so? Joe, tell Fargo to bring the Wilson boy in here. Yes, sir. No, wait. You wouldn't do it. Hey, Fargo, bring that Wilson punk in here. We're going to do a little job on it. Okay, Joe. This I'm going to like. No, wait. You, you wouldn't dare. Uh, wait. I'll do what you want. I thought you would. Take it back, Fargo. Anything you say. All right, please go, Wilson. Close the door, Joe. Okay. All right, Olson, pick up the phone and give your story to the Daily Planet. You, you mean now? Naturally. I want it in the first edition tomorrow. But, but it's night. The planet is a daily paper. I know all about that. There's a night man on duty to take stories and a night city editor. So quit stalling and phone in the story. But, but wait a minute. Now go on, Olsen. Pick up that phone. Wait a minute. I can't dictate a story right off the top of my head. Anyhow, there are no rewrite men there at night. So if you want this in the first edition tomorrow, you'll have to let me write it up. Yeah, very well. Shouldn't take you more than five minutes to write it up. You got a pen? Yeah, but I haven't any paper. It's funny over there in that desk. Now, get busy. Oh, okay. Boy, what an idea. I think I've got it all figured out, Mr. Kirby. Quiet, you fool. Don't mention my name. Why, he can't hear. After this story breaks in the planet tomorrow, you come out with another story in your paper, The Blade, saying Olsen and Wilson didn't show up at the DA's office because foreign kids grabbed them. Right? Exactly. 
Well, Olson, what's holding you up? Take it easy, will you? I'm not a very fast rider. He's swallowed. I'll give you exactly five minutes, no more. Then you phone the story to the planet, or it'll be the end of Jack Wilson. With his forehead furrowed and caught, perspiration beating his thin, freckled face, Jimmy Olsen sits at Joe McMillan's desk, composing his story for the Daily Planet, a desperate prayer propelling his laboring pen. Gosh, only these three brats don't catch on to what I'm going to say. And if only Mr. Kent is at the planet tonight to see the story. It's got to work. It's got to. What does Jimmy mean? What desperate chance is he taking? We'll return in a moment for the tense climax of today's episode. So stand by. Say, I know you fellas in the gang don't want to let the girls get ahead of you in anything. And particularly when it comes to collecting comic buttons in that new series from Packages of Kellogg's Pet. So you better hop to it. Because I've seen a good many young ladies wearing a good many comic buttons pinned to their jacket or dress. Look mighty keen, too. Yes, sir, these pep comic buttons are so bright colored and gleaming, you want to collect all 18 in that new series. You'll want Pat Patton and Tess Trueheart and, and Chief Brandon and Vitamin Flintheart, Judy and Corky, and all the rest. So hop to a gang. Remind Mom to get you some Kellogg's Pet. Because that's the only way you can get these comic buttons. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop, and you can't buy them anywhere. But you get these prizes, along with some doggone swell eating in every package of Kellogg's Pep. Yes, sir, if you're hep to pep, your breakfast bowl full of these sunny whole wheat flakes is a real treat. Pep tastes golden and good. So ask Mom to get P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And say, gang, there's a special surprise coming up for you in a couple of days... Boy, oh boy, will you get a kick out of this one. Keep listening. I'll be telling you all about it soon. As Jimmy Olsen labors over the story Vincent Kirby has commanded him to write for the Daily Planet, Clark Kent is at the office of his friend Candy Myers, the private detective, to whom he has just confided his fears. See, Candy, the DA isn't convinced that Jim and Jack Wilson are in trouble, but I am. That phone call from a supposed storekeeper saying that the boys are okay sounded phony to me. Why, Kent? Because in the first place, he hung up too fast when I asked him where his store was. Well, he might have been busy, customers or something. Uh, maybe, but there's also this. The agent for the hate mongers, the fellow called Joe, came for Jim and Jack at the lunch wagon tonight instead of phoning them as he'd arranged to do. That makes me believe he suspected they might be spies. Uh-oh. If he does, the boys are in trouble. I'm sure they are. I want you to put every man in your organization on the case at once, Candy. Never mind the expense. The planet will pay you. Ah, forget the pay. Jim's a friend of mine. Well, also, I'll do anything I can to slap those hate rats behind bars. Good. What do we got to work on? What clues, I mean? Well, not very much, I'll admit. Except we know what this fellow Joe looks like. Yeah, tall, thin, pasty face. Nothing distinctive there. Oh, I know. Then there's his handbill Joe passed out of Metropolis High. Did you look at it? Hmm. No printless label on it, Kent. No. Hard to trace. What else? Well, just the white carnations. White car... Oh, you mean the flowers Joe gave Jim and Wilson? That's right. Now, maybe if you can find the florist who sold the carnations to Joe, see, it's just possible that he buys a lot of them. That's a sweet assignment covering all the florists in town, especially at night. Well, I'll help you cover them. We've got to act fast, Candy. You don't have to tell me that. I'll call all my boys off any other case they're on and put them on this. Where will you be, Kent? Uh, oh, well, I'll, I'll keep in touch with you, Candy. And for heaven's sake, let's have some action now. <laughs> Clark Kent and Candy Myers begin their desperate search for Jimmy Olsen and Jack Wilson. The night reporter in the almost deserted Daily Planet City room walks hurriedly to the night city editor's desk. Hi, Sam. Hey, take a leg. look at this story. Jim Olsen just phoned in. Uh-oh. Two other kids involved in the high school basketball scandal, eh? Isn't that something? It sure is. You say Jim phoned this in? Uh-huh. Well, that's funny. I thought Jim and Mr. Kent were positive those kids had been framed. That's they were mistaken. Yeah. Uh, Jim say he was coming in? No, he said to run the story exactly as is. Okay, I'll put it in a box on page one. If Jim calls in again, tell him his story. He'll be on page one in the first edition. Shaking his head, the Night City editor prepares to place the hate-smearing story that Jim was forced by the leader of the Knights of the White Carnation to write on page one of the Daily Planet. We know Jim was praying for Clark Kent to see that story. 
But Kent as Superman is now searching the city for his young friends, following only the slimmest of clues. What will happen? The moment was never tenser, fellows and girls, so don't miss tomorrow's exciting episode. It's packed with thrills, so be sure to tune in tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, let me tell you about a breakfast cereal that's fun to listen to and fun to eat. It's Kellogg's Rice Krispies, the Snap, Crackle, and Pop cereal. Sure, you've seen those famous little elves snap, crackle, and pop around in cartoons and on the Rice Krispies package, and you know how they can dish out the crispiness of those golden bubbles of oven-popped rice. So freshly crisp, they snap, crackle, and pop when you pour on milk. Remind Mom to get you the one and only Snap, Crackle, and Pop cereal, Kellogg's Rice Krispies. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, while Clark Kent continues to track down a slim clue to the whereabouts of Jim Olsen and Jack Wilson, he is unaware that the cub reporter is a victim of the brutal hate mongers. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. You know, there's literally no end to the excitement when you're collecting those swell comic buttons in that new series Kellogg's Pep is putting out. No sooner have you added a new button to your collection than you're looking forward to getting another one when Mom opens a new package of Pep. And then there's that business of swapping duplicates with your pals, too, and comparing notes to see who's collected the most different Pep comic buttons. There were 18 in this new series, you know, and everyone is mighty smart-looking and mighty amusing, too, uh, like the one of the little moose with his feather headdress or Goofy with his silly grin. And say, here's how easy it is to collect these exciting prizes. You don't send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. You just ask Mom for Kellogg's Pep and look for your comic button in every package you open. That's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Pep, the golden toasted whole wheat flakes with that catchy sunshine flavor. Ask Mom for P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And say, remember that surprise that I told you about yesterday? Now, I can't tell you all about it yet, but I can give you a little hint. There's a new pep collection for you to start on, and it's a honey. A little later, I'll tell you when this offer starts, so stick around. And now, the adventures of Superman. When cub reporter Jimmy Olsen and Jack Wilson, captain of the Metropolis High School basketball team, fell into the hands of the Knights of the White Carnation, a secret group of vicious hate spreaders... Vincent Kirby, wealthy and aristocratic leader of the group, saw his chance to stir up race riots in all the city schools. Threatening Jack's life, Kirby forced Jimmy to phone in a story to the Daily Planet, falsely stating that four players on the Metropolis High team had accepted bribes to throw a championship game. As we continue now, Superman, who has searched vainly through the night for Jimmy and Jack, has resumed his guise of reporter Clark Kent, and we find him in Editor Perry White's office in the Daily Planet. Listen. Between us, Candy Myers, his men, and I visited every florist shop that was open last night and drew blanks. Candy and his boys are covering the rest of them now. What in the world are you talking about, Kent? Those white carnations that the agitator, Joe, whatever his name is, gave Jim and Jack Wilson yesterday. What about those white carnations? Well, it's my hunch that the hate mob used them for identification purposes. I just thought if we could find a florist who's been selling white carnations to a man answering Joe's description, we could trace him and so find Jim and young Wilson. Find them? Uh Uh-huh. What for? 
you mean, what for? Are you well, kidding? Of course not. Of course not. Jim and the Wilson boy are okay. They are? Well, of course they are. Well, how do you know? Holy cow. Don't you read your own paper? I now? haven't had a chance to look at a paper this morning. What is it? Hurry up, Chief. Put me out of my misery. Oh, here. Read it for yourself. Let's see. Uh, that box on page one. Uh-huh. Two more high school players involved in basketball scandal. Kaplan and Kelly revealed as taking bribes by young planet reporters. What the? Terrible, isn't it? Where did you get this story, Chief? Why, Jim phoned it in last night. Jim phoned it in? Sure. That's how we knew he was okay. Apparently, he and Jack Wilson dug up the evidence and then... But, but Jim couldn't have phoned this story. I tell you, he did. It's impossible. None of those basketball players took bribes to throw the game. It was all a frame-up. Jim knew that, and so did Jack, so they That's couldn't... how much you know about it. Read the story. But I tell Print you... it exactly as Morgan the Nightman took it over the phone from Jim. Now, go on, go on, go on. Read it. All right. Forfeiting honor for fortune... Four basketball players are now involved in the forbidding scandal which is raking high school athletics fore and aft and forcing attention on the most forlorn scene in four score years. See, Jim wrote that lead, Chief? Yeah. Pretty flowery, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Sam Eller, who was on the city desk that night, uh, wanted to rewrite it. But Murphy said it. Uh, he insisted that uh, Jim wanted it to go just exactly as it is. He did, eh? Yes. Since it was a scoop for the kid, uh, Sam decided to let it go. That would take Jim in hand and teach him how to write a decent lead. Jim didn't write this story, Chief. Well, why do you say that, Kent? I tell you, Morgan spoke to him. Don't you think Morgan knows Jim's voice by now? Well, he ought to, but... Well, he does. Wait a minute. I'm getting an idea. Well, if it's as bad as your last one's no, about no, no, this wait. basketball business, you wait, just say... Wait, wait, hold it. According to the rest of this story, Jim and Jack Wilson were to appear in the district attorney's office at 9 o'clock this morning and present their evidence against Kaplan and Kelly. That's right, and they're probably there now. I doubt it. Oh, yeah? Well, call the DA and see for yourself. Just what I'm going to do. I'll take it. Never mind, I'm right here. Hello, Clark Kent speaking. Oh, hello, Mr. Agnew. I was just going to call you. At the DA? Yes. Well, that's what I was going to call about. Are, are they there? They're not, eh? Jim and Wilson aren't in his office? No, Chief. Well, what the... Yes, I know it's 10 o'clock, but I... You did, eh? I see. No, they're not here, but I think I know what this is all about. Now, listen, Captain. Please, Chief, wait a minute. I'll be right over to explain, Mr. Agnew. Right. So long. Well, if Jim isn't there, Kent, then where, where is he? He's in the hands of the hate mob, of course. They must have made him phone in that story last night. Made it? Certainly. It's as plain as the nose on your face, Chief. Here, wait a minute. Look at Jim's story. Now, read his lead again. He couldn't have written a lead that badly unless he wanted to. And obviously he did want to because that lead is a code. Are you serious? Sure, look. He says, forfeiting honor for fortune, four basketball players are now formally involved in the forbidding scandal which is raking high school athletics four and a half and forcing attention, etc., etc. You notice all those fours? Why, yes, but... Uh... Well, I think that's Jim's code for the message in the story. The letter four for every fourth word. Oh, great season. Wait a minute, let's try underlining every fourth word in the next paragraph like this, see? This morning, Jim Olson of the Planet and Metropolis High Captain Jack Wilson will appear in the office of troubleshooting Frank Agnew. All right, read those underlined words, Chief. Olson and Jack in trouble. Exactly. Kent. Well, that, that, and that, underlining that every mean... fourth word following, we get, let's see. We need help. Phony story. Do not print. Great Caesar's coat. You see, Chief, those hate mongers are using Jim and our paper to frame two other innocent American boys, Kaplan and Kelly, whom they call foreigners, and in that way to create race trouble among our youngsters. And that means Jim and Jack Wilson are in even more serious danger than I thought. No, 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 wait a minute, Kent. Wait a minute. Uh, maybe it's we're no just jumping... kidding ourselves. Jim and Jack must know who the hate gang is now. And since that gang has committed murder, abduction, assault and battery, sedition, conspiracy, almost every rotten crime in the books, you don't think they're going to turn Jim and young Wilson loose to expose them, do you? No. No, of course not. Well, well, just don't stand there, Kent. Do something. Do something. If only I knew where to look. Uh, get the deep guy on the phone. Uh, get Inspector Henderson. Get the FBI. Now, wait a minute, Chief. Wait a minute. Do something, will you? Right. Let's not lose our heads. Uh, it's Jim's head that I'm worried about. I know, I know. Now, listen. The first thing to do is to rip Jim's story out of the planet before it can do any more damage. Yes, yes, of, of course. But, 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 but Jim, Jim and the Wilson boy, if we only had a single clue to them... We've got two clues. The white carnations and the rotten pamphlet the agitators passed out. But you said those clues were blanks. So far, yes, but they've got to pay off. Don't give up, Chief. We're not licked yet. See you later. <laughs> Clark Kent leaves the Daily Planet to resume the search for Jimmy Olsen and Jack Wilson. The two boys are alone in a locked, windowless room in Joe McMillan's apartment, where we find Jimmy peering through the keyhole. What gives out there? Miller just went out. How about Fargo? That big lug is still here. He's getting some rope out of a closet. Rope? What for? Millen told him to tie us up and take us down through the basement to the alley door where he'll have the car. 
Then they're going to take us up to some mountain lodge. Jeepers, what for? Can't you figure it out? We're supposed to show up at the DA's office this morning to present evidence against Phil Kaplan and Mickey Kelly. See? Well, we won't. So what happens then? Well, when we don't show up and just disappear, this dirty hate gang will say Kaplan, Kelly, Pulaski, and Rizzuti and their pals did something to us to keep us from testifying against them. Dirty rats. Yeah. Then this outfit will pass out more pamphlets that smear kids they call foreigners. That way they figure to start race riots all over the city. Jeepers, we've got to do something about that, Jim. I don't know what to do. Now, I was hoping Mr. Kent would see that story I phoned into the planet last night. That he'd know the story was a phony. I guess he didn't see it in time. How do you know? Because McMillan was just on the phone to the big shot. You know, the guy with the mask. The one he calls Mr. K. And he was tickled when he heard the story came out in the planet. Jeepers, what are we going to do, Jim? I don't know. I don't want to go up in any mountains with these guys. You know too much, and... Well, I've got a hunch we might never come back. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Gosh, if we could only... Wait, Jack. Maybe this is our chance. What do you mean? Well, Fargo is all alone now. When he comes in here to tie us up, let's try to make a break for it. What? We wouldn't have a chance. Wait, he's strong as an ox. Would you rather just give up without a fight? No, of course not. Okay, then. Wait. He's got the rope. He's coming to the door. He is? Yeah, now look, Jack. When he opens the door, I'll throw this chair at him, see? But gosh, he'll Jim... throw up his hands to block it. Then we make our break then. The door out of the apartment is straight across the living room. Okay, but if we fumble Don't it, Think we're... about that. Get set, Jack. Here he comes. <laughs> Lifting the cheap kitchen chair, Jimmy Olsen braces himself. Jack Wilson gets set beside him as Fargo, the burly henchman of the hate mongers, unlocks the door. What will happen? We'll be back in a moment to find out, so stand by. You know, every once in a while, there seems to be a difference of opinion between the members of the gang. Uh, lots of fellows and girls have a different idea of where is the best place to wear your collection of comic buttons from packages of Kellogg's Pep. Some say that they look best pinned on your jacket or your dress. Others insist that they go better on your cap. But actually, gang, no matter where you wear them or how you use them, they're mighty smart looking. And these pep commie buttons are so true to life. Uh, Tess Trueheart and, and Cindy and Superman and all the others look so real they could almost speak. And you know, to top it all, these prizes are so easy to get. You don't have to send in any money, not even a box stop. And you can't buy them anywhere. But there's a comic button inside every package of Kellogg's Pep you open. And there's a load of mighty delicious eating in these golden toasted whole wheat flakes, too. Kellogg's Pep tastes so catchy and sunny that, well, your spoon just naturally keeps going right back for more. So ask Mom to get you plenty of P-E-P, the sunshine cereal, Kellogg's Pep. And now for that big news. Tomorrow's the day. Sure, tomorrow I'm going to tell you all about the terrific new collection Kellogg's Pep has for you and how to get started on it. So take it from me, it's a super duper. So be on hand tomorrow. As we continue now, the burly Fargo opens the door of the room in which Jimmy Olsen and Jack Wilson are imprisoned. Then quickly, Jimmy heaves a chair at the man's head. What the... Okay, Jack, come on. I'm with you, Jim. Oh, now you don't, you little punk. Let go. He's got me, Jim. Oh, but I've got Let you. Let go of him, you rat. Uh, Run, Jim. You'll come, get away. No. Come here, Olsen. Throw a chair at me, huh? I'll fix you, but good. No. Jim, look out. He's got the chair. Grab his arm, Jack. No, don't, yeah. Fargo. Oh. That'll show you, you little punk. I'll try to get away. Jim. Jim. Oh, golly. Oh, golly. <laughs> His eyes filling with tears, Jack Wilson kneels beside the limp, motionless figure of Jimmy Olsen. What has happened to the boy reporter? Has Jimmy, like Charles Canfield, the millionaire who dared to defy the Knights of the White Carnation, also become a fatal victim of the men of hate? This story of a fight against the forces of hate and intolerance now becomes even more suspenseful. So don't miss tomorrow's startling and exciting episode, fellows and girls. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman.
Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at this same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. Say, gang, here's an easy question. What's the snap, crackle, and pop cereal? Why, Kellogg's Rice Krispies, of course. The only cereal so crisp it goes snap, crackle, and pop in milk. Whenever you see those famous little elves snap, crackle, and pop in the cartoons or on the Rice Krispies package, you think of how crisp these golden bubbles of oven-popped rice can be. And when you hear their song of crispiness in your cereal bowl, you know that you're in for some good eating. Yes, sir, it's the one and only snap, crackle, and pop cereal, Kellogg's Rice Krispies. And be sure to be with us tomorrow for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P, 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 Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. While Clark Kent pursues his one slim clue to Jimmy Olsen and Jack Wilson's whereabouts, the boys are helpless prisoners of Vincent Kirby's murderous henchmen. Hello there, gang. This is your pal Dan McCullough. Well, this is the big day. I can now give you all the details of that wonderful collection that I've been talking about. There's a special one for the boys and one for the girls. And we're going to start with the girls, you know, ladies first. But stick around, boys, because you come next. Now, for the girls, Kellogg's Pep has a shiny, silver-like charm bracelet and 12 different charms to go with it. Now, for the bracelet only, you send one box top from Super Delicious Pep and 10 cents. That's a diamond cash to Superman, Department 1R, Battle Creek, Michigan. That's for the bracelet only. And there are 12 nifty charms, so write down which ones you want. They're nifty small-scale models of a piano, a cuckoo clock, binoculars, a Scotty dog, a violin, and a telephone, among others. Now, if you didn't get them all down, along with your first daughter, you'll get a printed slip with the names and pictures of all the 12 charms. And you can check them off as you order them till your collection is complete. Now, here's how you get started on your charm collection. For each of the charms that you want, send one pep box top and one dime, plus the names of the charms you want, to Superman Department 1R, Battle Creek, Michigan. That's one dime and one pep box top for each of the charms, and one dime and one pep box top for the charm bracelet. Just remember, girls, to print your name and address clearly on your orders, and mail them to Superman Department 1R, Battle Creek, Michigan. And say, boys, in just a few minutes, it'll be your turn to hear what Kellogg's Pep has for you, so stick around! The Adventures of Superman. As you remember, cub reporter Jimmy Olsen and Jack Wilson, captain of the Metropolis High School basketball team, were captured while trailing Joe McMillan, an agent for the intolerant Knights of the White Carnation, who are conducting a vicious campaign to create race riots in the city schools. While Superman searched for the missing boys, they made a desperate attempt to escape from McMillan's apartment, where they were being held. In the ensuing struggle, Jimmy was struck on the head with a chair wielded by a strong-armed ruffian named Pargo. And the young reporter fell to the floor, unconscious. As we continue now, Jack Wilson leans fearfully over Jim's limp, motionless body. Listen. Jim. Jim! Never mind him, Wilson. Get up. You and me are going places. Jim! He doesn't answer. He, he's dead. I don't think so. Jim's but dead. But yes, he got it coming to him. Now, get you up You killed him, Fargo. Shut up. You murdered him in cold blood. He never did anything to you, but you killed him. Shut up, I said. You'll pay for this. I'm going to get the police. Wait I'm a gonna... minute. <laughs> Let go of me. I think you're going. Let go, you, you rotten hate murderer. You're going to go into the police. Huh? You bet. I'm going to get the, the police. dirty little spy. I'll fix you like a ghost. <laughs> hey, what's going on? Let man? go of me. Cut it out, you are. Cut it out, I said. What for, Joe? Why don't you let me finish it? Don't be a sap. I'll let him go. Okay. Jim. Poor Jim. Hey, what happened, Olsen? Fargo killed him. What's the matter with you, Fargo? Have you gone nuts? He tried to get away, Joe. I didn't mean to knock him off. But you did. You're a murderer. You're both murderers. Shut up, Wilson. Now listen, Fargo. I won't shut up. I'll holler. I'll get the police here. I'll get all the police. Shut up. Cut it. I'll let you run in the room and lock the door, Fargo. Okay. Come on, Wilson. Come on. 
Now get in there. Remember, yell just once and that'll be all, brother. Well, you messed this up good, Bart. Kirby didn't want these kids rubbed out. Well, Olsen asked for it. He was... Wait a minute, wait a minute. I think he's alive. He is? Yeah, his heart's beating. But he's in pretty bad shape. You must have given him an awful clout. I guess I did. What do we do with him? Kirby wants us to take both kids up to his lodge in the mountains and keep him there while he spreads the weight around that foreign kids grabbed him. That's too risky. I mean, now, because if Folsom fades out and we're caught with him, it'll be curtains. I know, but we gotta do what Kirby says. Now, where's that rope? It's around someplace. But let's stop go. talking and get that rope. We gotta work fast. Hurry. <laughs> Hello, Clark Kent speaking. Kent, this is Bill Jackson, one of Candy Meyer's operators. Oh, yes, Jackson. What's up? I think I found the flower shop where that guy Joe buys his white carnations. You did? Yeah. The florist recognized the guy when I described him. He doesn't know where he lives, though. Uh Uh-oh. But he thinks his delivery boy might. We're waiting for the kid to come back from a delivery now. Good. Where is this shop? On 2nd and Maple. Smite's florist shop. I'll be there in two seconds, Jackson. These clothes. This is a job for Superman. Now, if only I'm not too late to help Jim and Jack Wilson. There, all set. Up with this window. Now, out to that florist shop. Up and away! Hello, Jackson. Huh? That delivery boy get back yet? But, holy Jemima, Kent, how did you get here so soon? Well, never mind that. How, how about the delivery boy? But I just talked to you on the phone. Well, you're not wasting time. Where's that delivery boy? He's not back yet. Oh? Oh, but here comes the florist, Mr. Smythe. I want you to hear what he has to say. Okay. Oh, Mr. Smythe, this is Mr. Kent. You know the Daily Planet reporter I told you about. Yes, how do you do, Mr. Kent? How do you do, Mr. Smythe? Uh, Jackson here tells me you've been selling white carnations to a man we're very eager to find. Well, a certain man has been buying quite a few white carnations for me lately. He never buys any other kind of flower. But I don't know... I wonder if you'd describe him for me. Well, he's a tall, thin man, about 30, I'd say. Uh Uh-huh. A sallow complexion and rather strange eyes. Small and, uh, glittery. That's our man, Kent. Yes, it certainly sounds as if it might be. Do you know his name, Mr. Smythe? No, I don't, although I seem to recall that another man who came in with him once or twice called him Joe. Joe? He is our man. Look, uh, Mr. Smythe, I I understand your delivery boy knows where he lives. I think he may know because about a week ago, this man came in to purchase some white carnations, Uh and he asked me if my delivery boy, Robert, could run a small errand for him. I see. He's quite a good customer, and since Robert wasn't busy at the moment, I said, oh, oh... Here's Robert now. Good. Uh, come here, please, Robert. Yes, Mr. Smythe? Uh, look, Robert, Mr. Smythe tells us that a few days ago you took a package to the post office for one of Mr. Smythe's customers. I did? Yes, a tall, thin man with a pasty face and small, glittering eyes. He comes in here frequently to buy white carnations, remember? Oh, him, yeah, yeah, I remember. Well, listen, do you recall where he lives? Sure, about three blocks up 2nd Street. He's got an apartment over Baron's pool hall. Now you're talking... Which apartment, Robert? Well, there's only one, Mr. Kent. Good boy, Robert. Thanks a lot. Let's go, Jackson. Here's the door, Kent. I'll ring. Never mind. Look out, Jackson. What are you going to do? Break this door open. Uh, No, wait. Look out, Kent. You can't... Holy Jemima, you did it. Yes, but just as I thought nobody's here, we were too late, Jackson. They've left with the boys. Now, take it easy. We don't know for sure that Jim and the Wilson boy were here. Oh, yes, they were. Look. What? This hat. It's Jim's. Are you sure? Yes. See, his initials, J.O., are on the inside band. Yep, you're right, Kent. I know I am. But heaven only knows where they are now or what's happened to them. I'm stumped, Jackson. Now I'm really worried. Holding Jim Olsen's hat in his hand, Clark Kent realizes that the only clue he had to his young friends has paid off, but too late. What will he do now? We'll return in a moment for the tense climax of today's episode. So stand by. Attention, fellas. Here's where I tell you all about the swell new collection you can start. 
Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, has a super-duper keychain for you. Sure, a big silver-like He-Man chain that you'll be proud to wear. And there are 12 nifty lucky pieces you can attach to the chain. Now, here's how you get started on this wonderful collection. For the keychain only, send one box top from Super Delicious Pep and 15 cents, that's a dime and a nickel, to Superman Department 1R, Battle Creek, Michigan. Then there were 12 lucky pieces you can start collecting. You know, a nifty small-scale models of a locomotive, a football, a skull and crossbones, a trolley car, a skate, and a Scotty dog, among others. Now, this is a get-acquainted offer, and so in the package, when you receive your first order, you'll find a printed slip with the names and pictures of all the 12 lucky pieces on it. I bet you when you see them, you'll want to keep ordering until your collection is complete. Now, here's how you get the lucky pieces. For each one, send one pep box stop and a dime, plus the names of the lucky pieces you want, to Superman, Department 1R, Battle Creek, Michigan. That's one dime and one pep box stop for each of the lucky pieces you want. And for the keychain, send 15 cents. That's a dime and a nickel and one pep box stop. Remember, fellas, print your name clearly on your order when you send it in. And be sure that you have the address right. Send your letters to Superman, Department 1R, Battle Creek, Michigan. As Clark Kent is momentarily stymied in Joe McMillan's apartment, the thin, pasty-faced agent for the Knights of the White Carnation is driving a station wagon along a country highway leading into the Blue Hills. Beside him sits Fargo. Behind, under a canvas tarpaulin, lie the unconscious Jimmy Olsen and Jack Wilson, who was bound and gagged. I think maybe you're right, Fargo. We're sitting on a keg of dynamite. Sure we are, Joe. If this Olsen kid dies and we're caught with him, we'll give the chair. Yeah. I don't like this setup, not at all. And why don't you listen to me, Joe? Let's finish the kitchen dump in some place. Then we can make a clean getaway. Oh, yeah? What about Vincent Kirby? He's a dangerous baby to cross, and you know it. So what? Will he help us out if we get caught with these kids? No, no, not him. I'm afraid he'd say he never saw us before. Sure he would. He don't care about us, except that there was dirty work for him. He's always awful careful to keep his own nose clean when there's a job to do. Yeah. Nobody can prove he told me tonight that millionaire can't feel how to frame those basketball players or anything else. You see, that's what I mean. We gotta think of our own skins. Uh, I think you're right, Fargo. Look, I tell you what. Yeah, what? Maybe he's gonna check with me at the lodge in an hour, either in person or by phone, see? Yeah. Well, right after that, today, we'll finish Austin and the Wilson kid, like you suggest. And then we'll scram. Now you're talking, Joe. Now you're talking. <laughs> Sailing the fate of Jimmy Olsen and Jack Wilson, the murderous agents for the hate-mongering Knights of the White Carnation head into the hills. Meanwhile, having fruitlessly searched Joe McMillan's apartment, Clark Kent, accompanied by Private Detective Jackson, has suddenly stopped short at the doorway of the small windowless room in which Jimmy and Jack had been held prisoner. Wait, Jackson. Stay where you are. What's the matter, Kent? Look over there on the floor. I don't see any... In the corner, don't you see those flower petals? Oh, what about them? They're the petals of white carnations, and I think they've been arranged to give us some kind of a message. A message? Yes. Don't you notice how they seem to follow a definite pattern? Oh, uh, yes, but I don't know, Kent. Jim can't... or Jack must have left this as a message for us. Probably a clue to where they're being taken. Oh, it could be. Let's see... Wait can... a minute, don't move, Jackson. And don't talk, just think. If we can figure this out, I think we'll have the answer to where the boys are. <laughs> His face drawn in concentrated thought. Clark Kent, who is Superman, crouches above the small pile of faded carnation petals. Searching for the message, he is sure the boys left there for him. Is Kent right? Did Jack Wilson, in a few minutes alone in the room before he was taken away, conceive a means of getting a message to Kent? And if so, will Kent be able to interpret it in time to locate his young friends before they fall victims to the frightened agents for the men of hate? This is a tense and exciting moment in our story, gang. So whatever you do, don't miss Monday's exciting episode. Yes, be sure to tune in again on Monday. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. Superman is a copyrighted feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and is brought to you Monday through Friday at the same time by Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal. (laughs) Snap, crackle, pop. What's that, gang? Why, it's the one and only Snap, Crackle, and Pop cereal, Kellogg's Rice Krispies. Sure, you've seen those famous little elves in cartoons and on the Rice Krispies package. 
And you know how they dish out those golden bubbles of oven-popped rice. So crisp, they snap, crackle, and pop when you pour on milk. That's their song of crispiness. Yes, sir, Kellogg's Rice Krispies are fun to listen to and fun to eat. Ask Mom to get you the one and only Snap, Crackle, and Pop cereal. Kellogg's Rice Krispies. And be sure to be with us on Monday for the thrilling adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. Kellogg's Pep. P-E-P Pep. Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, presents... The Adventures of Superman. Today, as Superman streaks to the rescue of Jim Olsen and Jack Wilson, the hate-mongering knights of the White Carnation meet again to plan further vicious deeds against democracy. Hello there, gang. This is your pal, Dan McCullough. Say, I'll bet you're all excited about the swell new collections Kellogg's Pep has for you boys and girls. And you know, I can't blame you. The one for the girls is nifty. I'll tell you all about that one in just a minute. Now, for you fellas, you know, it's a super-duper keychain. A big silver-like He-Man chain that you'll be proud to wear. And there are 12 lucky pieces you can attach to the chain. Now, here's how to get started on this humdinger of a collection. Uh, You got a pencil and paper handy? You don't want to miss any of this. For the keychain only, you send one box stop from Super Delicious Pep and 15 cents, you know, that's a dime and a nickel, to Superman Department 1R, Battle Creek, Michigan. That's just for the keychain. And, of course, you'll want to start collecting the lucky pieces. There were 12 in all. Nifty, small-scale models of a locomotive and a, and a football and binoculars, a skull and crossbones, a trolley car, and a Scotty dog, among others. Send for just as many as you like to start with. And in the package with your first order, you'll find a printed slip with the names and the pictures of all the lucky pieces on it. So you can keep ordering until your collection is complete. Now, for each lucky piece, send one pep box stop and one dime, plus the names of the lucky pieces you want, to Superman Department 1R, Battle Creek, Michigan. That's one dime and one pep box stop for each of the lucky pieces, and for the keychain, send 15 cents. That's a dime and a nickel and one pep box stop. But please remember to print your name and addresses clearly on your order. And be sure that you get the address right. Mail all orders to Superman Department 1R, Battle Creek, Michigan. Now, stick around, girls, because I'm going to tell you all about your collection in just a few minutes. And now, the adventures of Superman. When cub reporter Jimmy Olsen and Jack Wilson, captain of the Metropolis High School basketball team, tried to escape from the apartment of Joe McMillan, an agent for the viciously intolerant Knights of the White Carnation, Jimmy was slugged and lost consciousness. By order of Vincent Kirby, wealthy and aristocratic leader of the hate terrorists... McMillan took the boys to a secluded mountain lodge. But on the way up there, he and Fargo, his strong-arm companion, decided that their own safety depended on doing away with the two youngsters. Meanwhile, hunting desperately for his young friends, Clark Kent, accompanied by Bill Jackson, a private detective, followed their trail to McMillan's empty apartment. And as we join him there now, Kent and Jackson are puzzling over an odd pattern of white carnation petals on the floor of the room in which Jimmy and Jack had been imprisoned. Listen. These carnation petals couldn't have just fallen this way, Jackson. They're arranged in a definite pattern. See? An indented line moving upwards. Mm. Now that you mention it, Kent, it does look as if somebody laid them out that way. Mm -hmm. But who and why? I think either Jim or Jack Wilson did it to tell us where they are. Now, if we can just figure it out. Let's see. Mm. I can't make anything out of it. Oh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, Jackson. I think I've got it. Now, what's your guess? Look, notice how the line keeps going up, then dipping, then going up again? Uh Uh-huh. Well, that could indicate a series of hills. Hills? Yes, or even mountains. Some of these peaks are pretty tall. Boys might have tried to tell us that the hate mongers took them into the hills somewhere or up in the mountains. Say, maybe you're right, Kent. Oh, but where does that get us? There are a lot of hills around Metropolis, you know. Yes, but it won't take me long to search them. Now, listen, it won't take you long, huh? What do you think you are? Oh, uh, well, well, Skip, we've no time to waste. You contact the district attorney and the state police. Tell them what we know and to move fast. I'll see you later. But wait, Kent. Where are you going? Be surprised, brother. Get busy now. I think we're headed for the payoff. 
Hurrying from Joe McMillan's apartment, Clark Kent stops in a deserted alleyway and swiftly resumes his true identity of Superman. Then, up and away! Leaping high above the great city, the Man of Steel streaks away through the late afternoon skies to begin his search among the small hills across the Metropolis River. For an hour he searches there, ranging and darting above the wooded crests like some giant hawk. And then, failing to find any sign of his quarry, he veers and rockets away through the gathering twilight to the range of mountains 50 miles away, known as the Blue Hills. Meanwhile, in the huge beam-sealing living room of Vincent Kirby's magnificent lodge, situated on a flat shelf of rock beneath a towering peak in the Blue Hills, Joe McMillan, the sallow, glittering-eyed agitator and killer for the Knights of the White Carnation, completes a phone call. Turns to face Fargo, his beefy, heavy-shouldered companion. Get this, Fargo. Kirby wants us to play nursemaid to Olsen and Jack Wilson up here while he spreads the word that foreign the kids grab him. That's how he figures to stir up race riots in the school. Yeah, him and his race riots. What about us? Supposing the Olsen kid kicks off and we're caught up here with him. Then what? Don't worry. We're not going to get caught up here or any place else with those kids. Now you're talking, Joe. What are we going to do? We're going to play safe, that's what. Only Kirby and the two kids know we snatched them. Kirby won't dare open his face and we'll make sure Olsen and Wilson can't. You mean we get rid of the kids like I wanted to all along? You bet we do, Fargo. We'll take them out in the woods right now and make sure they stay there. Then we'll put a lot of distance between us and Vincent Kirby. Come on, get that Wilson kid and let's go to work. <laughs> This Olsen kid is getting heavy, Joe. How much further are we going? Just a little way, Fargo, to a spot I know where the woods are thicker. I don't want anybody to find these kids for a long while. What do you mean? What are you going to do to us? You'll find out soon enough, Wilson. Only Joe. Yeah. Stay on the path, sonny boy, or I'll tie up your legs, too, and drag you. Okay, okay. Listen, you oughtn't to be carrying Jim like this. He's unconscious. He needs a doctor. He won't need a doctor where he's going. What do you mean? Is where you find out. This is far enough, Fargo. Okay. Now, look, you better... Shut up. Drop Olsen, Fargo. That'll be a pleasure. Be careful, you stupid lug. Jim's hurt. Ain't that too bad. Okay, let's get it over with. You put a slug on Olsen, I'll take care of Wilson. Right. No, don't. Oh, wait. Put those guns down. That's it, Fargo. One, two... Hey, hey, what the... Well, looks as if I got here just in time. I'll take those guns. Oh, let go. Oh, oh, hey, cow, Superman. Let him have a joke. I'll fix his clock. Oh, you want to play like that, eh? Okay, sweet dreams to you. Oh, and to you. Oh. Boy, what a haymaker. Listen, Superman. Yes? Did you find those carnation petals I left in Joe's, Joe's apartment? That's right, Jack. What happened to Jim here? Well, Fargo hit him on the head with a chair. What? Poor guy's been unconscious most of the time since. Uh-oh, we've got to get him to a doctor in a hurry. Up with him. There. Now, get under my other arm, Jack. Okay. All set? Sure. Okay, here we go. Up and away! You sure Jim will be all right, Doctor? Yes, I'm quite sure he will, Mr. Kent. Oh, that's fine. Of course, he'll have to remain in the hospital for a little while. Oh, sure. In a week or two, he should be as good as new. Oh, is that a relief? Oh, uh, by the way, Mr. Kent, yeah. the nurse tells me that Mr. Agnew, the district attorney, is waiting for you downstairs. Oh. He says it's very important. Yes, I know. I'll join him at once. Uh, doctor, please give my regards to Jim, will you? And tell him I'll be in to see him as soon as he can receive visitors. Yes, I'll be glad to do that, Mr. Kent. Thanks, Lord, Doctor. Goodbye. <laughs> I, uh, I think I know what you're going to tell me, Mr. Agnew. You can't possibly know, Kent, because nobody knows this except Superman and myself. Really? Superman, eh? That's right. But since you've been so valuable to the police on this case, I'm going to give you a break and let you be in on the killing. Well, well, thanks. Okay, now get this. The two fellows Superman caught, Joe McMillan and Fargo, talked to me and Superman, 
And they told that us... That Vincent Kirby, a member of one of the oldest and most aristocratic families in Metropolis, is the leader of the hate mongers who call themselves the Knights of the White Carnation. What the... No, wait and a minute. that Kirby ordered the murder of Charles Canfield, the millionaire, because Canfield was going to expose them. But... Furthermore, Kirby framed the high school basketball players on false gambling charges and arranged the abduction of Jim Olson and Jack Wilson in order to stir up race hatred and riots among the youngsters of the city. Is that the story? Yes, but how in thunder did you know, Ken? Ah, uh-huh. that would be telling. I uh, gather that we move in on Kirby now, huh? You said it. Gee, I can hardly wait. Okay, then, let's go. What will happen when Clark Kent and the district attorney confront Vincent Kirby? We'll be back in a moment to find out, so stand by. Well, girls, it's time for you now. Yes, here are all the details of that wonderful collection Kellogg's Pep has for you. It's a shiny, silver-like charm bracelet and 12 different charms to go with it. Some of the best-looking things you ever saw. Now, here's how you get them. Uh, have you got a pencil and paper handy? Okay. For the bracelet only, you send one box stop from Super Delicious Pep and 10 cents, that's a diamond cash, to Superman, Department 1R, Battle Creek, Michigan. That's for the bracelet only. And now we come to the charms, and there were 12 all terrific, nifty small-scale models of a piano and a cuckoo clock and binoculars, a Scotty dog and a violin and a telephone, among others. Now, if you didn't get to writing them all down, that's okay, because, uh, you see, this is a get-acquainted offer. And so in the package with your first order, you'll find a printed slip with the names and pictures of all the 12 charms. And you can keep ordering them till your collection is complete. Now, here's how to get started on your charm collection. For each of the charms, send one box top from Kellogg's Pep, the sunshine cereal, and one dime, plus the names of the charms you want, to Superman, Department 1R, Battle Creek, Michigan. That's one dime and one pep box top for each of the charms, and one dime and one pep box top for the charm bracelet. Just remember, gang, to print your name and address very clearly, and send your order to Superman, Department 1R, Battle Creek, Michigan. Now get busy. See who can be the first to have the complete collection. Accompanied by a dozen plainclothes detectives, District Attorney Frank Agnew has driven Clark Kent to the home of Vincent Kirby. There, as the detectives post themselves in the darkness outside Kirby's imposing stone mansion, Agnew rings the bell. And when the butler opens the door, he is seized and taken away before an outcry can be raised. Then the DA leads Kent quietly across the lofty flagstone foyer to a closed oaken door in front of which he stops. Very quiet, kid. The meeting of the Knights of the White Carnation is going on now, here in Kirby's library. Oh, I see. Now, wait. I'll open the door a crack so we can see without being seen. Slowly and carefully, he turns the doorknob, and the heavy door moves inward an inch or two on silent hinges. Oh, great Scott! There's Burton Wood! And, and Martin Hart! And Phineas Cameron and George Adams, all important men! Each one as big as Vincent Kirby. Right. They, wait. Kirby's standing up. He's going to talk. Oh. Knights of the White Carnation, the moment we've been waiting for is now at hand. As you know, the entire city of Metropolis is stirred up over the disappearance of Jim Olson and young Jack Wilson. Tomorrow, my newspaper, The Daily Blade, will say... That evidence points to Olson and Wilson having been abducted by the foreign-named basketball players at Metropolis High School in order to prevent the two boys from testifying against the players mentioned in regards to bribery. Hear that, Kent? Yes, are these babies going to be surprised? And how? Pamphlets which have already been prepared will be distributed outside every school in the city. Reprinting our story and urging the students to act now against all boys and girls with foreign-sounding names like Rizzuti and Pulaski and Tacker. Why the dirty rats, Mr. Right now. I can promise you, gentlemen, that by this time tomorrow, foreign blood will run in the streets, and no youngster of foreign ancestry will be safe outside his home. That's the way I've heard enough, Kent. Let's go in. I'm with you. Don't move, Mr. District Attorney. What in the... Or you either, Mr. Kent. You can't... I have a gun pointed at each of your backs. Just make one move, and these guns go off. Stiffening, Clark Kent and District Attorney Agnew feel the guns at their backs and realize they have been trapped in the headquarters of the Men of Hate. Clark Kent, as we know, is Superman. But how can he act to save the district attorney's life without revealing his identity of Superman to the world? Don't miss tomorrow's smashing episode, fellows and girls. 
when Superman pulls a new and startling stunt. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow. Same time, same station. And remember, for breakfast, it's Kellogg's Pep. For excitement, the adventures of Superman. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The adventures of Superman. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. When the planet Krypton, home of a race of supermen, exploded into dust, the sole survivor was an infant boy who had been shot to earth in a sealed rocket. Today, that boy grown to manhood is known as Superman, sworn enemy of the forces of evil. To aid him in his never-ending fight for truth and justice, he masquerades as Clark Kent, crime reporter for a great metropolitan newspaper. His secret is carefully guarded. No one is aware that Kent is Superman. No one but you. Join with us now on ABC as we embark on one of Superman's transcribed adventures as the Man of Steel finds himself pitted against an unseen enemy in The Mystery of the Walking Dead. A feeble yellow light burns endlessly outside one of the death house cells of state prison. Beyond the black steel door with its tiny barred opening hemmed in by blank walls of ash-gray concrete, a man is seated on an iron cot. He is thin and gaunt, with great dark eyes and hollow sunken cheeks. He is an East Indian, and his name is Krishna. Soon they will come to shave his head and slip the leg of his prison trousers. And soon after that, they will lead him from his cell, and he will walk the last mile into everlasting darkness. But now he sits quietly. The yellow light passing through the barred opening in the cell door lays an eerie pattern across his lean, swarthy face. Suddenly his jaw tightens, and he rises from the cot and moves to the steel door, his long, sensitive fingers curling about the bars like snakes. He waits patiently, while the hollow footfalls of the guard patrolling the corridor draw closer and closer. When they reach the cell, he speaks. I have a request to make. What is it? You will please to inform the warden it is my desire to speak with him. Be along pretty soon now. I cannot wait for soon. It is my desire to speak with him at once. Do you question the wish of a condemned man? Easy, easy. You will please to inform him. Almost hypnotized by the huge dark eyes glaring at him through the bars, the prison guard turns and retraces his steps along the corridor. Meanwhile, in the editorial offices of the Metropolis Daily Planet, now almost deserted with the last edition off the presses, Lois Lane, the paper's star girl reporter, is anxiously pacing the floor, while Clark can't plead with her to relax. You'll end up with a nervous breakdown if you're not careful, Lois. Look, why don't you go home and what take a nice... What time is it? 9.30. You're crazy. Your watch must have stopped. Why, it was 9 o'clock... I'm sorry, Clark. Sorry for what? Screaming at you. You're right. I will have a nervous breakdown if I'm not careful. It isn't worth it, I know, but they're going to kill a man up there tonight. He's going to die. Lots of men will be dying tonight all over the world. But I'm not responsible for them. You're not responsible for Krishna either. I dug up the story. I had him arrested. I testified against him in court. I sent him to the chair. All of which was no more than he deserved. Now, don't waste any sympathy. I'm not wasting sympathy, Clark. You don't understand. If they chained him to a wall and kept him in a dungeon for the rest of his natural life, I wouldn't give it another thought, really. But whatever he's done, he's still a human being. A creature of flesh and blood, and they're going to kill him. What you're trying to say is I'm not trying to say anything. I just want it to be over and done with. I sat in that courtroom for three weeks watching him get tangled in his own web. Looking at him and wondering what was going through his mind. Asking myself why a cultured intelligence... Religious man. Oh, now, wait a yes, minute. Yes, he was religious in his own way. A way that gave him a license to prey on the superstitious fears of helpless women, I suppose. To steal from them, to, to pauperize them, to murder them. Oh, of course not. Krishna but... used his kind of phony black magic religion as a means to an end. He used it as a smokescreen. 
How can you possibly call him religious when you know he has human blood on his hands? And furthermore... I'll take it. Hello? Uh, Miss Lewis Lane, please. Who's calling? Uh, Warden Reed at State Prison. Oh, hello, Warden. This is Clark Kent. Oh, hello, Kent. How are you? Is it Warden Reed? Yes, fine, thanks. And you? Uh, getting along. Good. What does he want? I don't know yet. I tell you where I called, Kent. Uh-huh. Is Miss Lane there? Well, she's standing right beside me. Well, then you can pass it on. Okay, go ahead. Uh, as you know, Krishna goes to the chair tonight. The Court of Appeals refused him a new trial this morning, and the governor turned him down on a stay early this evening. Yes, I know. Well, just a few minutes ago, he sent for me. He said he had, had a final request to make. Oh? I told him we'd grant it if it were humanly possible. He said we had to grant it because it was the only way he would clear his conscience. What was the request? He says he wants to see Miss Lane before he dies. What? What is it, Clark? Hold it a minute, Warden. Okay. What's happened, Clark? Is anything wrong? Now take it easy. Well, tell me. Just don't stand there. Krishna wants to see you before he goes to the chair. Why? Oh, some nonsense about clearing his conscience. Your answer, of course, is no. Hello, Warden. No, uh, Clark, yes, wait. Oh, oh, Clark. Just a minute, Warden. All right. Now, Lois, don't go off the deep the end. The man you... is going to die, Clark. He well, only has a few hours left. What difference does it make? Have you ever been in a prison death house? Have you ever seen a condemned man's face? My feelings don't matter. Let me have the phone. Now, don't please, do it, Lois. Clark, please, Lois, I... oh. Hello, Warden. This is Lois Lane. Oh, yes, Miss Lane. I'll be at the prison in... in 20 minutes. Now, you understand, Miss Lane, you're under no obligation to this man, and consenting to accede to his request is purely voluntary on your part. Yes, I understand. Oh, I think it's ridiculous to expose Clark, her to... now, we had all this out on the way up... This is as far as you go, Kent. I won't allow Miss Lane in the death house alone. She won't be alone. There'll be two guards and myself. Why can't I accompany Stop her? Stop it, Clark, please. It's regulations, Kent. Oh. We'll be back in a few minutes. Uh, close up, Regan. I'm sorry if Mr. Kent seems insistent. Not at all. Frankly, I agree with him. This can't be a very pleasant experience for you. Well, this is the cell, Miss Lane. Miller, you and Harkin stand out here. I'll go in. Yes, sir. Open up. Krishna, Miss Lane is here to see you. Thank you. Thank you kindly. Yes, step in, Miss Lane. You have three minutes. May I speak with the young lady alone? No, you may not. Very well. Please to be seated, Miss Lane. If you don't mind, I'd rather stand. As you wish. I requested to speak with you, Miss Lane, because I do not desire that you forever carry within your heart the knowledge that you bore false witness against me. That isn't true. I testified when I... Please, there is little time and I have much to say. I bear you no malice for what you have done to me. The body is but the dwelling place of the soul. You have spoken against only this feeble thing of blood and nerve and sinew that they will destroy. That they will singe and burn until the flesh is no more. Please. But neither you nor they can reach beyond the pale of death. Please, don't. I, Krishna, will return in spirit, in voice, yes, even in substance. I will rise like a phoenix from my lifeless corpse, like a new messiah, and you will hear my voice. You will look upon my countenance, and then you Stop will it. know... That's enough, Stop Krishna. It. I have more to say. Oh, Step outside, Miss Lane. Do you deny the final wish of a condemned man? You had your wish. Lock up, Miller. There is no escape. So it is spoken in the Kabbalah, and it shall come to pass that he will rise from the grave, and he shall be the walking dead. And there shall be no escape from him, even unto eternity. I don't like to second guess, Lois, but if you'd only listened to me, you could have avoided that horrible experience. Please, Clark, let's not talk about it. I, I, I've had all I can take for the night. Do you mind if I turn on the radio? No, of course not. You're not going back to the office, you know. I'm taking you right to your apartment. No, I've got to. I've got to do a story. And it I'm shall not... come to pass that he will rise from the grave. Clark. And he shall What's be matter? the walking dead. Clark. And there shall be no escape That's from him. That's his voice. What? Even unto him. That's what he screamed at me. What's he talking about? Krishna's voice. Didn't you hear it? Lois, what's gotten into you? That's a radio program. Turn it off. Turn it off. Now, listen to me, Lois. Clark. Take me home. Please. Take me home! You sure you're 
you're going to be all right, Lois? Yes. What time? Uh, 11.15. Oh. Then it's all over. Huh? You went to the chair at 11. Oh, Lois, you've got to stop thinking about that. I know, I will. Good night, Clark. I'm sorry I, I've been behaving so stupid. Oh, forget it. I'll see you in the office. Okay, good night. Good night. Oh. Hope I never have to go through anything like that again as long as I live. Those eyes. Those huge, dark eyes. Burning holes in me. And that horrible scream. How can that be at this hour of the night? Hello? And it shall come to pass that he will... Ah! When I lifted the phone, his voice came over the wire and it said the same thing. The same thing he screamed at me from the cell. The same thing I heard on the radio. Uh, Lois, I don't have to tell you about the power of fear. You know what it can do to people. I, I, I'm not afraid of anything. You refuse to believe that. Yes, you are. But... You're afraid of the unknown. Well, that you is... exposed yourself to that half demented fanatic and he threatened you with mystic mumbo-jumbo. And now you're hearing things. Clark, look, I, I'm not crazy. I, I'm terribly upset, but I'm not crazy. The phone rang, and when I lifted the receiver... I know, I know, I know. Now, you listen to me. I'm going to call the prison. I don't... If the warden tells you that Krishna went to the chair at 11 o'clock, that he's dead, will you stop all this nonsense? You don't have to call. It isn't necessary. Well, I think it is. Number, please. Uh, operator, this is an emergency call to Warden Reed at the state prison in Malvern. What is your number? Hanover 62392. And your name? Clark Kent. One moment, please. Thank you. Lois, I'm going to let you talk to him so there won't be any question about it. This thing could make nervous wrecks of both of us. Yes. Believe me, when I was standing out in the hall waiting for the elevator and I heard you scream, I thought you were being murdered. How did you get in? Huh? Oh, I, I forced the door open. But how how could you, Clark? That door has a double lock. Yeah, I know, but uh, when you're desperate, you do a lot of things you ordinarily couldn't do. I, I guess I just sort of made believe I was Superman. Ready and... with Warden Oh, thank you. Hello? Uh, yes, Kent? Warden, I'm calling from Miss Lane's apartment. I'm going to put her on the phone, and I want you to tell her that Krishna's execution went off as scheduled. I'm sorry, Kent, but it didn't. What? He cheated the chair. I don't understand. Clark, what happened? Wait a minute. What, what? Hello? Hello? Yeah, yes, Warden, I'm here. I thought we were disconnected. No, no, I'm, I'm still on. You say he wasn't executed? Uh, no, we found him dead in his cell at 10 minutes to 11. Heart attack. I see. Uh, I'm just as well satisfied. You know how I feel about execution. Oh, yes, 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 I know. Well, that's that. Thanks, Warden. That's quite all right. Bye. Goodbye. Okay, he's dead. You just said he wasn't executed. I heard you say he that. He died in his cell from a heart attack. Clark, I knew something like this was going to happen. What? I just had a feeling it would. Something like he what? He isn't dead. I know he isn't. You know what you're he, he saying. He isn't now, dead, wait Clark. a minute. You're calling Warden Reed a liar and you're calling me a liar. You don't understand. Lois. They think he's dead. Lo they just think that. Lois, look at me. Look at me, I said. What's happened to you? Are you losing your mind? Clark, please. Try to understand There's Nothing me. to understand except that you, a sane, logical, intelligent person in the 20th century, are allowing yourself to be influenced by primitive witchcraft, by, by black magic. Now, wait a minute. Just let me tell you something. What? I spent a lot of time in Krishna's so-called Temple of Truth getting the story. I know you did. And I saw an awful lot of things that couldn't be explained. This man has a kind of power. But sure, that's what I'm trying to tell you, the power of suggestion. Clark, that isn't Look, what I Look, wait mean. a minute now, wait. If people kept telling you that you looked bad, that, that you were sick, if they kept harping on it over and over again, do you know what would happen? I... You'd get sick, Lois. You might even die. Well, good heavens, there are people who talk themselves into imaginary illnesses, let alone having anyone else do it. That isn't what I mean. Do you know what catalepsis is? Sure, a state of trance. Yes, well, I saw Krishna put people into cataleptic trances. Their bodies stiffened as though they were dead and rigor mortis had set in. Well? I saw that with my own eyes, Clark, and if he can do that for others, why can't he do it for himself? Oh, now, Lois, it's one thing to work black magic in, in a half-darkened voodoo temple. I tell you, it's quite I... another thing to do it in a prison cell with a prison doctor standing by. Now, you take my word for it. Krishna is dead. Dead and gone. 
Don't answer that, Clark. Why not? Please, please don't answer it. Lois. Clark, don't Lois, answer let it. Let go of my arm. Now, don't be stupid. Call it stupid. Call it anything you want, but please Hello. don't answer it. And it shall come to pass that he will rise from the grave and be We'll return in just a moment to the adventures of Superman and the mystery of the walking dead. But first, a word from your ABC announcer. I'd like to talk to you now about America's community chest, which is currently campaigning for funds to continue its fine work. Its goal is $185 million, and all of it will be spent for the maintenance and administration of red feather services to the community. These services are vital to the health and welfare of millions of our citizens. Typical of these services are aid to the handicapped and homes for the aged, hospitals, maternity homes, neighborhood houses, visiting nurses, and children's aid. And then the community chest helps support such fine organizations as the Boy and Girl Scouts, Salvation Army, the USO, Traveler's Aid, and the YM and the YWCA's. The community chest is a thoroughgoing American idea that wins a warm response from all of us. We can be sure that our nation is sound at the core when citizens unite wholeheartedly and of their own free will build a good community spirit in their own hometowns. Give freely this year to your local community chest. And now back to the adventures of Superman and the mystery of the walking dead. Obsessed with the thought that Christian, an East Indian mystic, is not dead, despite the prison warden's report that he died in his cell of a heart attack 15 minutes before his scheduled execution, Lois Lane, whose newspaper expose of the mystic's Temple of Truth helped convict him, spent a tortured, sleepless night. It is now the following morning. Clark Kent is in the warden's office at the state prison. And you say the doctor's certain beyond the question of a doubt that when he examined Krishna, he was dead. Here's the report, Kent. Coronary occlusion. Uh-huh. Was an autopsy done on the body? No, we're not equipped for that up here. No. Unclaimed bodies are sometimes turned over to medical schools or hospitals, but generally speaking, most of them are claimed by relatives or friends for burial. What happened to Krishna's body? I believe it was claimed last night. Oh. It should be in one of these reports... Ah, yeah, here it is. Claimed by Midtown Mortuary Service on behalf of a brother, Ali Yatanga Naba. That was last night? Yes. Body was found around 1046, stretched out on the cot in the cell. Did you see it? Yes, of course. When the guard notified me, I went to the cell with the doctor. And you saw Krishna's body? Yes. Why are you making a point of that, kid? Well, I'll tell you why. Miss Lane and I left here last night at 1015. At about 10.25, she turned on the car radio. Yes? The voice she heard, she says, was Krishna's. And the words he spoke were the same words he screamed at her from his cell. (laughs) That's impossible, Kent. At 10.25, he was in his cell, either dead or alive. That's what puzzles me. She heard his voice again over the phone at 11.15, and I heard it ten minutes later. You what? But that could be explained. How? Since when do dead men talk over the telephone? Well, assuming he wasn't dead, that he was in a a cataleptic trance. Oh, no. If his body was claimed before 11.15 and he was brought out of the trance, he could have made those phone calls. Kent, the man died of a heart attack. Dr. Bronson has been the staff physician here for 15 years, and I assure you that when he pronounced Krishna dead, he was dead. I'm sorry he's not on duty now, so he could tell it to you himself. Oh, no, but... d- d- don't misunderstand me, Warden. I'm not questioning him for a moment. It- it's just that, well, uh, there doesn't seem to be any other explanation. Unless you believe in the supernatural. If I were you, I'd forget about it. Well, it's too late for that. Miss Lane is in a state of collapse, and frankly, I'm getting worried. No, I've got to track this down, find an explanation for it. Mm-hmm. I'll stop off at the Midtown Mortuary before I go back to Miss Lane's apartment. They'll tell you he was dead. Well, if they do, Fine. Then, if the dead can come to life, I want to know about that, too. You're not holding anything back, are you, Clark? Now, why should I hold anything back? Well, I told you what the warden said, and I told you what I learned at the mortuary. They received the body at 11.30, it was embalmed this morning, and it's now lying in state at the Temple of Truth. Yes, but then, how did we hear his voice last night? You can't say it was my imagination, because you heard it, too. I don't know, but we've established one thing at any rate. He's not alive. He's dead. 
Was he alive when I heard him on the radio? You couldn't have heard him. I did. He was in his cell, Lois. Now, that was definitely your imagination. What you heard was the end of a mystery program. Was it? Here. This is yesterday's paper talk. Well? There were no mystery programs on between 10 and 10.30 last night. I went even further than that. I checked all the programs on at that time. They were music and uh, uh, a comedy show and quiz shows and news. There was nothing else. And you still think he's alive. Don't ask me what I think. I'm telling you what I know, what I heard, what you heard. Okay, then there's only one thing to do. What? Krishna's body is lying in state at the Temple of Truth. You and I are going over there to see it. I wonder he could afford five lawyers at his trial. This place must have cost a fortune to build. Clark, I, I'm afraid to go in there. All the attendants know. Oh, drop the veil over your face. Let's see what it looks like. Oh, no one could possibly recognize you, Lois. Sure, it's all right. Sure, don't worry now. Come on. dark in here. No one would recognize you even without the black veil. I hope you're right. Your membership cards, please. Huh? I, I beg your pardon? We are admitting only members of the temple today. Oh, well, uh, uh, we're members, but we've forgotten our cards. We've come a long way to pay our respects to Krishna. May I have your names? Our names? If you please. Oh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Oh! What did you do? Knock him out. Oh, no. Where can I jump in? I don't know. Think, think. I can't stand here holding him in my arms. Wait a minute. Uh, uh, there's a cold room behind that pillow. Okay, I'll be right back. All right. He stowed away. Yes. But look, what'll happen when he comes to He'll be out long enough for us to look around. Now, the casket's up front. Let's join the line passing it. Get why? They can't do anything to us. I don't know. Well, then where do all these people come from? Evidently, they're planning to carry on without Krishna. Looks that way. I wonder how the police feel about that. And the DA's office. Mark, see that woman looking into the casket? She owns half of downtown Gravelin. She testified for Krishna at the trial. It's amazing how people can be deluded. Isn't it? Okay, we're next. Get a good look at it. Well, you're convinced now. Yes. The doors will now be locked. Clark. All members will please be seated. What do we do now? Nothing, nothing. Let's take these two aisle seats. Yes, the bottle of okay. Wait, don't worry. Look. Lights are dipping over the casket. We're in for something. God, you don't know these people. Please, let's get out of here. We can't get out now. The doors are locked. Oh. Why did I ever let you talk me into this? Why? Just a dim over the casket now. The organ music stopped. I wonder what... And so it is spoken in the Kabbalah. And it shall come to pass that he he will rise from the grave. That's his voice, Clark. Where is it coming from? That's just the beginning. You're going to see something in just a moment. See it? He's rising from the casket. He's coming to life. This is too much. I'm going out to call Inspector Henderson. You can't get out. The doors are locked. I'll get out. You sit tight. No, no. Don't leave me. I'll be right back. Slipping from his seat, Clark Kent hurries up the aisle of the darkened temple, unnoticed by the audience who stare transfixed at the seeming miracle taking place before their eyes. Ducking into an alcove, he quickly removes his horn-rimmed glasses and strips off the dark business suit that serves as his disguise, revealing himself in the familiar blue costume and red cape of Superman. Stepping out of the alcove, his eyes sweep the huge auditorium. Suddenly he stiffens. Lois is missing from the seat where he left her. On a raised platform behind the casket... The figure of Krishna stands erect now, bathed in a cold blue light, hands extended to the congregation. But Lois is nowhere to be seen. The organ begins its deep, throbbing notes again, wailing like a lost soul. Superman starts for the aisle, but as he does, two men close in on him out of the shadowed darkness. Where do you think you're going? That's my business, but I know where you're going to sleep. <laughs> oh, you want some 
too should I too, eh? All right, glad to oblige. There. Turning to the aisle again, Superman is just in time to see a blinding flash of light envelop the figure of Krishna. Smoke billows up from the casket at its feet. When it clears, the figure is gone. Meanwhile, with a gun in her back, Lois is being forced down a narrow corridor behind the temple platform. As she reaches the end of the corridor, a door opens, and a voice says... Come in, Miss Lane. Come in, I said. Oh, no. You did not expect to see me again in life, did you, Miss Lane? You... You better not try anything. I didn't come here alone. Your friend is no longer in a position to help you. Please. In fact, I might say you are beyond all human help. Oh, no. Your life is now in my hands, and I have sworn by all the gods of Vishnu... To make you suffer for what you did to me. Stay away from me. Yes. Stay away from me. Cringe. Cringe against the wall. What would you give now to have the floor open and swallow you? What? Nothing. I'm not afraid of you. You you don't dare to touch me. (laughs) The police know that I came here today. (laughs) That, Miss Lane, is a feeble threat. You are aware I cannot be destroyed. You know I am invincible. But you can be destroyed. Oh. And you are going to be destroyed. Oh, no, no, you're choking me. I will choke the breath of life from your body. Can you feel the blood pounding in your temples? Can you feel your lungs bursting? This is the moment before your death. The glorious, throbbing moment before death. You're getting weak now. You no longer struggle. Die. I, I say, I will avenge thee. You avenge nothing. No, oh, no, my friend. No guns and no knives. The party's over. Release me. I'll release you to the police. You all right, Lois? Yeah. I think we'll just pin this snake up against the wall and let him talk. There. Put me down. Tell Miss Lane who you are. Tell her you're not Krishna. Tell her. I am. You're breaking it. I'll break every bone in your body unless you talk. Who are you? I am Krishna's brother. Is Krishna dead? Talk. Yes. Yes. Where's his body? Under the platform. The casket had a false bottom, didn't it? You dropped his body down and you rose up from it. Well? Yes. You were the one who made those phone calls to Miss Lane, weren't you? Yes. Anything else you want to know, Lois? No. That's enough. Okay, then we can go straight to police headquarters. <laughs> How did Superman happen to be at the temple? Well, now, that's an interesting question. I wish I could answer it for you. You mean you don't know? No, that, that's not quite true. Well, if you do know, why can't you tell me? That's an interesting question, too. Honestly, you're impossible. <laughs> you know, incidentally, we never did find out about that radio broadcast. Oh, I forgot to tell you. The Temple of Truth was on the air that night over a small local station. No, how strange. It was just coincidence. You happened to tune in while Krishna's brother was mouthing that mumbo-jumbo. Yes, wasn't it? Matter of fact, I missed the boat. When the warden told me his brother claimed the body, I should have put two and two together. Because if I'd known it was a twin brother, it would have been easy. Well, it's all over now. Oh, incidentally, did I tell you the Superman called me? Lois? Did he? Mm-hmm. Twice. Oh, he's really wonderful. Thanks. Huh? I said thanks for Superman. The Adventures of Superman come to you now each week at this same time over many of these ABC stations. Listen again next week when Superman solves a murder and a mystery in the case of the Courageous Cobbler. Superman is a copyrighted transcribed feature appearing in Superman DC comic magazines and brings you radio's most fabulous character in exciting stories of action, adventure, and mystery. So be sure to listen when you hear the familiar cry... Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky. It's a bird. It's a plane. It's Superman. The role of Superman is played by Bud Collier, Lois Lane by Joan Alexander. Music is composed and played by John Garth. Be sure to listen next week to The Case of the Courageous Cobbler on The Adventures of Superman.
This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.